Book 13. 1.1 Trode. Let this, then, mark the boundary of Phrygia. I shall now return again to the Propontis and the coast that comes next after the Aesopus River, and follow the same order of description as before. The first country on this seaboard is the Trode, the fame of which, although it is left in ruins and in desolation, nevertheless prompts in writers no ordinary prolixity. With this fact in view, I should ask the pardon of my readers and appeal to them not to fasten the blame for the length of my discussion upon me rather than upon those who strongly yearn for knowledge of the things that are famous and ancient. And my discussion is further prolonged by the number of the peoples who have colonized the country, both Greeks and barbarians, and by the historians, who do not write the same things on the same subjects, nor always clearly either, among the first of these is Homer, who leaves us to guess about most things and it is necessary for me to arbitrate between his statements and those of the others, after I shall first have described in a summary way the nature of the region in question. 1.2 The seaboard of the Propontis, then, extends from Cyzacene and the region of the Aesopus and Granicus rivers as far as Abydus and Cestus, whereas the parts round Ilium and Tenedos and the Trojan Alexandria extend from Abydus to Lectum. Accordingly, Mount Ida, which extends down to Lectum, lies above all these places. From Lectum to the Caicus River, and to Cani, as it is called, are the parts round Assis and Adramedium and Atarnius and Pitany and the Elatic Gulf, and the island of the Lesbians extends alongside, and opposite, all these places. Then come next the parts round Syme, extending to the Hermus and Phocia, which latter constitutes the beginning of Ionia and the end of Aeolus. Such being the position of the places, the poet indicates in a general way that the Trojans held sway from the region of the Aesopus River and that of the present Cyzacene to the Caicus River, their country being divided by dynasties into eight, or nine, portions, whereas the mass of their auxiliary forces are enumerated among the allies. 1.3 But the later authors do not give the same boundaries, and they use their terms differently, thus allowing us several choices. The main cause of this difference has been the colonizations of the Greeks, less so, indeed, the Ionian colonization, for it was farther distant from the Trode, but most of all that of the Aeolians, for their colonies were scattered throughout the whole of the country from Cyzacene to the Caicus River, and they went on still farther to occupy the country between the Caicus and Hermus rivers. In fact, the Aeolian colonization, they say, preceded the Ionian colonization by four generations, but suffered delays and took a longer time, for Orestes, they say, was the first leader of the expedition, but he died in Arcadia, and his son Penthilus succeeded him and advanced as far as Thrace sixty years after the Trojan War, about the time of the return of the Heraclade to the Peloponnesus, and then Archelaus the son of Penthilus led the Aeolian expedition across to the present Cyzacene near the Scelium, and Gra, the youngest son of Archelaus, advanced to the Granicus River, and, being better equipped, led the greater part of his army across to Lesbos and occupied it. And they add that Clues, son of Doris, and Malos, also descendants of Agamemnon, had collected their army at about the same time as Penthilus, but that, whereas the fleet of Penthilus had already crossed over from Thrace to Asia, Clues and Malos tarried a long time round Locris and Mount Phrysius, and only later crossed over and founded the Freeconian Syme, so named after the Locrian mountain. 1.4 The Aeolians, then, were scattered throughout the whole of that country which, as I have said, the poet called Trojan. As for later authorities, some apply the name to all Aeolus, but others to only a part of it and some to the whole of Troy, but others to only a part of it, not wholly agreeing with one another about anything. For instance, in reference to the places on the Propontis, Homer makes the Trode begin at the Aesopus River, whereas Eutyxus makes it begin at Priapus and Artis, the place on the island of the Cyzacene that lies opposite Priapus, and thus contracts the limits, but Damis contracts the country still more, making it begin at Perium, and, in fact, Damis prolongs the Trode to Lectum, whereas other writers prolong it differently. Charon of Lampsacus diminishes its extent by 300 stadia more, making it begin at Praxis, for that is the distance from Perium to Praxis, however, he prolongs it to Adramedium. Silax of Carianda makes it begin at Abydus, and similarly Ephorus says that Aeolus extends from Abydus to Syme, while others define its extent differently. 1.5 But the topography of Troy, in the proper sense of the term, is best marked by the position of Mount Ida, a lofty mountain which faces the west and the western sea but makes a slight bend also towards the north and the northern seaboard. 9 This latter is the seaboard of the Propontis, extending from the strait in the neighborhood of Abydus to the Aesopus River and Cyzacene, whereas the western sea consists of the outer Hellespont and the Aegean Sea. Mount Ida has many foothills, is like the Scolopendra in shape, and is defined by its two extreme limits, by the promontory in the neighborhood of Zelia and by the promontory called Lectum the former terminating in the interior slightly above Cyzacene. In fact, Zelia now belongs to the Cyzacene, whereas Lectum extends to the Aegean Sea, 
being situated on the coasting voyage between Tenedos and Lesbos. When the poet says that Hypnus and Hera came to many fountained Ida, mother of wild beasts, to Lectum, where first the two left the sea, he describes Lectum in accordance with the facts, for he rightly states that Lectum is a part of Mount Ida, and that Lectum is the first place of disembarkation from the sea for those who would go up to Mount Ida, and also that the mountain is many fountained, for there in particular the mountain is abundantly watered, as is shown by the large number of rivers there, all the rivers that flow forth from the Idaean mountains to the sea, Rhesus and Heptoporus and the following, all of which are named by the poet and are now to be seen by us. Now while Homer thus describes Lectum and Zelia as the outermost foothills of Mount Ida in either direction, he also appropriately distinguishes Gargarus from them as a summit, calling it topmost. And indeed at the present time people point out in the upper parts of Ida a place called Gargram, after which the present Gargra, an Aeolian city, is named. Now between Zelia and Lectum, beginning from the Propontis, are situated first the parts extending to the Straits at Abydus, and then, outside the Propontis, the parts extending to Lectum. 1.6 On doubling Lectum one encounters a large wide open gulf, which is formed by Mount Ida as it recedes from Lectum to the mainland, and by Cany, the promontory opposite Lectum on the other side. Some call it the Idaean Gulf, others the Adromedine. On this gulf are the cities of the Aeolians, extending to the outlets of the Hermus River, as I have already said. I have stated in the earlier parts of my work that, as one sails from Byzantium towards the south, the route lies in a straight line, first to Cestus and Abydus through the middle of the Propontis, and then along the coast of Asia as far as Caria. It behooves one, then, to keep this supposition in mind as one listens to the following, and, if I speak of certain gulfs on the coast, one must think of the promontories which form them as lying in the same line, a meridian line, as it were. 1.7 Now as for Homer's statements, those who have studied the subject more carefully conjecture from them that the whole of this coast became subject to the Trojans, and, though divided into nine dynasties, was under the sway of Priam at the time of the Trojan War and was called Troy. And this is clear from his detailed statements. For instance, Achilles and his army, seeing at the outset that the inhabitants of Ilium were enclosed by walls, tried to carry on the war outside and, by making raids all round, to take away from them all the surrounding places, twelve cities of men I have laid waste with my ships, and eleven, I declare, by land throughout the fertile land of Troy. For by Troy he means the part of the mainland that was sacked by him, and, along with other places, Achilles also sacked the country opposite Lesbos in the neighborhood of Thebe and Lyrnesus and Pedasus, which last belonged to the Leliges, and also the country of Eurypolis the son of Telephus. But what a man was that son of Telephus who was slain by him with the bronze, that is, the hero Eurypolis, slain by Neoptolemus. Now the poet says that these places were sacked, including Lesbos itself, when he himself took well-built Lesbos, and he sacked Lyrnesus and Pedasus, and when he laid waste Lyrnesus and the walls of Thebe. It was at Lyrnesus that Brishace was taken captive, whom he carried away from Lyrnesus, and it was at her capture, according to the poet, that Mines and Epistrophus fell, as is shown by the lament of Brishace over Patroclus, Thou wouldst not even, not even, let me weep when swift Achilles slew my husband and sacked the city of divine Mines, for in calling Lyrnesus the city of divine Mines the poet indicates that Mines was dynast over it and that he fell in battle there. But it was at Thebe that Chrysis is taken captive, we went into Thebe, the sacred city of Aetian and the poet says that Chrysis is part of the spoil brought from that place. Thence, too, came Andromache, Andromache, daughter of great-hearted Aetian, Aetian who dwelt neath wooded Placus in Thebe Hypoplacia, and was lord over the men of Cilicia. This is the second Trojan dynasty after that of Mines. And consistently with these facts writers think that the following statement of Andromache, Hector, woe is me. Surely to one doom we were born, both of us thou in Troy in the house of Priam, but I at Thebe, should not be interpreted strictly, I mean the words thou and Troy, but I at Thebe, or Thebe, but as a case of Hyperbaton, meaning both of us in Troy thou and the house of Priam, but I at Thebe. The third dynasty was that of the Leliges, which was also Trojan, of Altus, who is lord over the war-loving Leliges, by whose daughter Priam begot Lycaon and Polydorus. And indeed those who are placed under Hector in the catalogue are called Trojans, the Trojans were led by great Hector of the flashing helmet. And then come those under Aeneas, the Dardanians in turn were commanded by the valiant son of Anchises and these, too, were Trojans, at any rate, the poet says, Aeneas, counsellor of the Trojans. And then come the Lycians under Pandarus, and these also he calls Trojans, and those who dwelt in Zelia beneath the nethermost foot of Ida, Aphne, who drink the dark water of the Aesopus, Trojans, these in turn were commanded by Pandarus, the glorious son of Lycaon. And this was the sixth dynasty. 
and indeed those who lived between the Aesopus River and Abydus were Trojans, for not only were the parts round Abydus subject to Asius, and they who dwelt about Percot and Praxius and held Cestus and Abydus and goodly Arisbe these in turn were commanded by Asius the son of Herdicus, but a son of Priam lived at Abydus, pasturing mares, clearly his father's, but he smote Demacoan, the bastard son of Priam, who had come at Priam's bidding from his swift mares, while in Percot a son of Hisitaean was pasturing kine, he likewise pasturing kine that belonged to no other, and first he rebuked mighty Melanippus the son of Hisitaean, who until this time had been wont to feed the kind of shambling gate in Percot, so that this country would be a part of the Trode, as also the next country after it as far as Adrastia, for the leaders of the latter were two sons of Merops of Percot. Accordingly, the people from Abydus to Adrastia were all Trojans, although they were divided into two groups, one under Asius and the other under the sons of Merops, just as Cilicia also was divided into two parts, the Theban Cilicia and the Lyrnesian but one might include in the Lyrnesian Cilicia the territory subject to Eurypolis, which lay next to the Lyrnesian Cilicia. But that Priam was ruler of these countries, one and all, is clearly indicated by Achilles' words to Priam, and of thee, old sire, we hear that formerly thou wast blessed, how of all that is enclosed by Lesbos, out at sea, city of Makar, and by Phrygia in the upland, and by the boundless Hellespont. 1.8 Now such were the conditions at the time of the Trojan War, but all kinds of changes followed later for the parts round Sisychus as far as the Praxis were colonized by Phrygians, and those round Abydus by Thracians, and still before these two by Bebersis and Dryopes. And the country that lies next was colonized by the Traers, themselves also Thracians, and the plain of Thebe by Lydians, then called Meonians, and by the survivors of the Mysians who had formerly been subject to Telephus and Teuthras. So then, since the poet combines Aeolus and Troy, and since the Aeolians held possession of all the country from the Hermus River to the seaboard at Sisychus, and founded their cities there, I too might not be guilty of describing them wrongly if I combined Aeolus, now properly so called, extending from the Hermus River to Lectum, and the country next after it, extending to the Aesopus River, for in my detailed treatment of the two, I shall distinguish them again, setting forth, along with the facts as they now are, the statements of Homer and others. 1.9 According to Homer, then, the Trode begins after the city of the Cyzacene and the Aesopus River. And he so speaks of it, and those who dwelt in Zelia beneath the nethermost foot of Ida, Aphne, who drink the dark water of the Aesopus, Trojans, these in turn were commanded by Pandarus the glorious son of Lycaon. These he also calls Lycaeans. And they are thought to have been called Aphne after Lake Aphnitus, for Lake Dasilitus is also called by that name. 1.10 Now Zelia is situated on the farthermost foothill of Mount Ida, being 190 stadia distant from Sisychus and about 80 stadia from the nearest part of the sea, where the Aesopus empties. And the poet mentions severally, in continuous order, the places that lie along the coast after the Aesopus river, and they who held Adrastia and the land of Apesis, and held Pitiaea and the steep mountain of Teria these were led by Adrastus and Amphius of the linen corslet, the two sons of Merops of Percot. These places lie below Zelia, but they are occupied by Cyzacene and Priapony even as far as the coast. Now near Zelia is the Tarsius River, which is crossed twenty times by the same road, like the Heptaporus River, which is mentioned by the poet. And the river that flows from Nicomedia into Nicaea is crossed twenty-four times, and the river that flows from Philoe into the Elian country is crossed many times, Scarthan twenty-five times, and the river that flows from the country of the Cocinii into Alabanda is crossed many times, and the river that flows from Tiana into Soli through the Taurus is crossed seventy-five times. 1.11 About Stadia above the outlet of the Aesopus River is a hill, where is shown the tomb of Memnon, son of Tithonus, and nearby is the village of Memnon. The Granicus River flows between the Aesopus River and Priapus, mostly through the plain of Adrastia, where Alexander utterly defeated the satraps of Darius in battle, and gained the whole of the country inside the Taurus and the Euphrates River. And on the Granicus was situated the city Sidon, with a large territory of the same name, but it is now in ruins. On the boundary between the territory of Sisychus and that of Priapus is a place called Harpagia, from which, according to some writers of myths, Ganymede was snatched, though others say that he was snatched in the neighborhood of the Dardanian promontory, near Dardanus. 1.12 Priapus is a city on the sea, and also a harbor. Some say that it was founded by Milesians, who at the same time also colonized Abydus and Proconnesus, whereas others say that it was founded by Cyzacene. It was named after Priapus, who was worshipped there, then his worship was transferred thither from Ornii near Corinth, or else the inhabitants felt an impulse to worship the god because he was called the son of Dionysus and a nymph, for their country is abundantly supplied with the vine, both theirs and the countries which border next upon it, I mean those of the Pariani and the Lampsacene. At any rate, 
Xerxes gave Lampsacus to Themistocles to supply him with wine. But it was by people of later times that Priapus was declared a god, for even Hesiod does not know of him, and he resembles the Attic deities Orthane, Conazalus, Tycon, and others like them. 1.13 This country was called Adrastia and Plain of Adrastia, in accordance with a custom whereby people gave two names to the same place, as Thebe and Plain of Thebe, and Migdonia and Plain of Migdonia. According to Callisthenes, among others, Adrastia was named after King Adrastus, who was the first to found a sanctuary of Nemesis. Now the city is situated between Priapus and Perium, and it is below it a plain that is named after it, in which there was an oracle of Apollo Actius and Artemis. But when the sanctuary was torn down, the whole of its furnishings and stonework were transported to Perium, where was built an altar, the work of Hermocreon, very remarkable for its size and beauty, but the oracle was abolished like that at Zelia. Here, however, there is no sanctuary of Adrastia, nor yet of Nemesis, to be seen, although there is a sanctuary of Adrastia near Sisychus. Antimachus says as follows, there is a great goddess Nemesis, who has obtained as her portion all these things from the blessed. Adrastus was the first to build an altar to her beside the stream of the Aesopus River, where she is worshipped under the name of Adrastia. 1.14 The city Perium is situated on the sea, it has a larger harbour than Priapus, and its territory has been increased at the expense of Priapus, for the Parians curried favour with the Italic kings, to whom the territory of Priapus was subject, and by their permission cut off for themselves a large part of that territory. Here is told the mythical story that the Ephiogenius are akin to the serpent tribe, and they say that the males of the Ephiogenius cure snakebitten people by continuous stroking, after the manner of enchanters, first transferring the livid colour to their own bodies and then stopping both the inflammation and the pain. According to the myth, the original founder of the tribe, a certain hero, changed from a serpent into a man. Perhaps he was one of the Libyan Scilly, whose power persisted in his tribe for a certain time. Perium was founded by Milesians and Erythraeans and Perians. 1.15 Pitya is in Pityus in the territory of Perium, lying below a pine-covered mountain, and it lies between Perium and Priapus in the direction of Linum, a place on the seashore, where are caught the Linusian snails, the best in the world. 1.16 On the coasting voyage from Perium to Priapus lie both the old Proconesus and the present Proconesus, the latter having a city and also a great quarry of white marble that is very highly commended, at any rate, the most beautiful works of art in the cities of that part of the world, and especially those in Sisychus, are made of this marble. Aristeus was a Proconsian the author of the Aramaspian epic, as it is called a charlatan if ever there was one. 1.17 As for the mountain of Teria, some say that it is the range of mountains in Pyrrhasis which are occupied by the Sizacini and are adjacent to Zelia, where a royal hunting ground was arranged by the Lydians, and later by the Persians, but others point out a hill forty stadia from Lampsicus, on which there is a sanctuary sacred to the mother of the gods, entitled Terius Sanctuary. 1.18 Lampsicus, also, is a city on the sea, a notable city with a good harbour, and still flourishing, like Abydus. It is about 170 stadia distant from Abydus, and it was formerly called Pityessa, as also, it is said, was Chios. On the opposite shore of the Chersonesus is Callipolis, a small town. It is on the headland and runs far out towards Asia in the direction of the city of the Lampsassini, so that the passage across to Asia from it is no more than 40 stadia. 1.19 In the interval between Lampsicus and Perium lay a city and river called Pisis, but the city is in ruins. The Piscini changed their abode to Lampsicus, they too being colonists from the Milesians, like the Lampsassini. But the poet refers to the place in two ways, at one time adding the first syllable, and the land of Apisus, and at another omitting it, a man of many possessions, who dwelt in Pisus. And the river is now spelled in the latter way. Kearney, which lies above Lampsicus in the interior of Lampsachine, is also a colony of the Milesians, and there is another Kearney on the outer Hellespontine Sea, which is 140 stadia distant from Ilium and is said to be the birthplace of sickness. Anaximenes says that there are also places in the Erythrean territory and in Phocis and in Thessaly that are called Kearney. And there is an Iliocolone in the territory of Perium. In the territory of Lampsicus is a place called Gergithium which is rich in vines, and there was also a city called Gergitha from Gergiths in the territory of Syme, for here too there was a city called Gergiths, in the feminine plural, the birthplace of Cephalon the Gergithian. And still today a place called Gergithium is pointed out in the territory of Syme near Larissa. Now Neoptolemus, called the Glossographer, a notable man, was from Perium, and Charon the historian and Adamantus and Anaximenes the rhetorician and Metrodorus the comrade of Epicurus were from Lampsicus, and Epicurus himself was in a sense a Lampsacenian, 
having lived in Lampsicus and having been on intimate terms with the ablest men of that city, Idomeneus and Leontius and their followers. It was from here that Agrippa transported the fallen lion, a work of Lysippus, and he dedicated it in the sacred precinct between the lake and the Euripus. 1.20 After Lampsicus come Abitus and the intervening places of which the poet, who comprises with them the territory of Lampsicus and part of the territory of Perium, for these two cities were not yet in existence in the Trojan times, speaks as follows, and those who dwelt about Percot and Praxis, and held Cestus and Abitus and goodly Arisbe these in turn were led by Asius, the son of Herticus, who was brought by his sorrel horses from Arisbe, from the river Celius. In speaking thus, the poet seems to set forth Arisbe, whence he says Asius came, as the royal residence of Asius, who was brought by his horses from Arisbe, from the river Celius. But these places are so obscure that even investigators do not agree about them, except that they are in the neighborhood of Abitus and Lampsicus and Perium, and that the old Percot, the site, underwent a change of name. 1.2 One of the rivers, the Celius flows near Arisbe, as the poet says, if it be true that Asius came both from Arisbe and from the Celius River. The river Praxis is indeed in existence, but no city of that name is to be found, as some have wrongly thought. This river also flows between Abitus and Lampsicus. Accordingly, the words, and dwelt about Praxis, should be interpreted as applying to a river, as should also those other words, and those who dwelt beside the goodly Sophisus River, and those who had their famed estates about the Parthenius River. There was also a city Arisba in Lesbos, whose territory is occupied by the Methymnians. And there is an Arisbus River in Thrace, as I have said before, near which are situated the Thracian Cebrinians. There are many names common to the Thracians and the Trojans, for example, there are Thracians called Seans, and a river Scaeus, and a Sean wall, and at Troy the Sean gates. And there are Thracian Xanthians, and in the Trode a river Xanthus. And in the Trode there is a river Arisbus which empties into the Hebrus, as also a city Arisbe. And there was a river Rhesus in the Trode, and there was a Rhesus who was the king of the Thracians. And there is also, of the same name as this Asius, another Asius in Homer, who was maternal uncle to horse-taming Hector, and own brother to Hecabe, but son of Demas, who dwelt in Phrygia by the streams of the Singarius. 1.22 Abitus was founded by Milesians, being founded by permission of Gygus, king of the Lydians, for this district and the whole of the Trode were under his sway, and there is a promontory named Gigas near Dardanus. Abitus lies at the mouth of the Propontis and the Hellespont, and it is equidistant from Lampsicus and Ilium, about 170 stadia. Here, separating Europe and Asia, is the Heptastadium, which was bridged by Xerxes. The European promontory that forms the narrows at the place of the bridge is called the Chersonesus because of its shape. And the place of the bridge lies opposite Abitus. Cestus is the best of the cities in the Chersonesus, and, on account of its proximity to Abitus, it was assigned to the same governor as Abitus in the times when governorships had not yet been delimited by continents. Now although Abitus and Cestus are about thirty stadia distant from one another from harbour to harbour, yet the line of the bridge across the strait is short, being drawn at an angle to that between the two cities, that is, from a point nearer than Abitus to the Propontis on the Abitus side to a point farther away from the Propontis on the Cestus side. Near Cestus is a place named Apabathra, where the pontoon bridge was attached to the shore. Cestus lies farther in towards the Propontis, farther up the stream that flows out of the Propontis. It is therefore easier to cross over from Cestus, first coasting a short distance to the Tower of Hero and then letting the ships make the passage across by the help of the current. But those who cross over from Abitus must first follow the coast in the opposite direction about eight stadia to a tower opposite Cestus, and then sail across obliquely and thus not have to meet the full force of the current. After the Trojan War Abitus was the home of Thracians, and then of Milesians. But when the cities were burned by Darius, father of Xerxes, I mean the cities on the Propontis, Abitus shared in the same misfortune. He burned them because he had learned after his return from his attack upon the Scythians that the nomads were making preparations to cross the strait and attack him to avenge their sufferings, and was afraid that the cities would provide means for the passage of their army. And this too, in addition to the other changes and to the lapse of time, is a cause of the confusion into which the topography of the country has fallen. As for Cestus and the Chersonesus in general, I have already spoken of them in my description of the region of Thrace. Theopompus says that Cestus is small but well fortified, and that it is connected with its harbour by a double wall of two plethora, and that for this reason, as also on account of the current, it is mistress of the passage. 1.23 Above the territory of the Abidini, in the Trode, lies Astyra. This city, which is in ruins, now belongs to the Abidini, but in earlier times it was independent and had gold mines. These mines are now scant, being used up, like those on Mount Molus in the neighbourhood of the Pactolus River. 
From Abydus to the Aesopus the distance is said to be about 700 stadia, but less by straight sailing. 1.24 Outside Abydus lies the territory of Ilium the parts on the shore extending to Lectum, and the places in the Trojan plain, and the parts on the side of Mount Ida that were subject to Aeneas. The poet names these last parts in two ways, at one time saying as follows, the Dardanii in turn were led by the valiant son of Anchises, calling the inhabitants Dardanii, and at another time, Dardani, the Trojans and Lycians and Dardani that fight in close combat. And it is reasonable to suppose that this was in ancient times. The site of the Dardania mentioned by the poet when he says, At first Dardanus was begotten by Zeus the cloud gatherer, and he founded Dardania, for at the present time there is not so much as a trace of a city preserved in that territory. 1.25 Plato conjectures, however, that after the time of the floods three kinds of civilization were formed the first, that on the mountain tops, which was simple and wild, when men were in fear of the waters which still deeply cover the plains, the second, that on the foothills, when men were now gradually taking courage because the plains were beginning to be relieved of the waters, and the third, that in the plains. One might speak equally of a fourth and fifth, or even more, but last of all that on the sea coast and in the islands, when men had been finally released from all such fear, for the greater or less courage they took in approaching the sea would indicate several different stages of civilization and manners, first is in the case of the qualities of goodness and wildness, which in some way further served as a foundation for the milder qualities in the second stage. But in the second stage also there is a difference to be noted, I mean between the rustic and semi-rustic and civilized qualities, and, beginning with these last qualities, the gradual assumption of new names ended in the polite and highest culture, in accordance with the change of manners for the better along with the changes in places of abode and in modes of life. Now these differences, according to Plato, are suggested by the poet, who sets forth as an example of the first stage of civilization the life of the Cyclopes, who lived on uncultivated fruits and occupied the mountain tops, living in caves, but all these things, he says, grow unsown and unplowed for them. And they have no assemblies for counsel, nor appointed laws, but they dwell on the tops of high mountains in hollow caves, and each is lawgiver to his children and his wives. And as an example of the second stage, the life in the time of Dardanus, who founded Dardania, for not yet had sacred Ilios been builded to be a city of mortal men, but they were living on the foothills of many fountained Idaho and of the third stage, the life in the plains in the time of Ilus, for he is the traditional founder of Ilium, and it was from him that the city took its name. And it is reasonable to suppose, also, that he was buried in the middle of the plain for this reason that he was the first to take up his abode in the plains, and they sped past the tomb of ancient Ilus, son of Dardanus, through the middle of the plain past the wild fig tree. Yet even Ilus did not have full courage, for he did not found the city at the place where it now is, but about thirty stadia higher up towards the east, and towards Mount Ida and Dardania, at the place now called Village of the Ilians. But the people of the present Ilium, being fond of glory and wishing to show that their Ilium was the ancient city, have offered a troublesome argument to those who base their evidence on the poetry of Homer, for their Ilium does not appear to have been the Homeric city. Other inquirers also find that the city changed its site several times, but at last settled permanently where it now is at about the time of Croesus. I take for granted, then, that such removals into the parts lower down, which took place in those times, indicate different stages in modes of life and civilization, but this must be further investigated at another time. 1.26 It is said that the city of the present Ilians was for a time a mere village, having a small and cheap sanctuary of Athena, but that when Alexander went up there after his victory at the Granicus River he adorned the sanctuary with votive offerings, gave the village the title of city, and ordered those in charge to improve it with buildings, and that he adjudged it free and exempt from tribute, and that later, after the overthrow of the Persians, he sent down a kindly letter to the place, promising to make a great city of it, and to build a magnificent sanctuary, and to proclaim sacred games but after his death Lysimachus devoted special attention to the city, and built a temple there and surrounded the city with a wall about forty stadia in circuit, and also incorporated into it the surrounding cities, which were now old and in bad plight. At that time he had already devoted attention to Alexandria, which had indeed already been founded by Antigonus and called Antigonia, but had changed its name, for it was thought to be a pious thing for the successors of Alexander to found cities bearing his name before they founded cities bearing their own. And indeed the city endured and grew, and at present it not only has received a colony of Romans but is one of the notable cities of the world. 1.27 Also the Ilium of today was a kind of village city when the Romans first set foot on Asia and expelled Antiochus the Great from the country this side of Taurus. At any rate, Demetrius of Skepsis says that, when as a lad he visited the city about that time, he found the settlement so neglected that the buildings did not so much as have tiled roofs. And Hegesinax says that when the Galatea crossed over from Europe they needed a stronghold and went up into the city for that reason 
but left it at once because of its lack of walls. But later it was greatly improved. And then it was ruined again by the Romans under Fimbria, who took it by siege in the course of the Mithridatic War. Fimbria had been sent as quester with Valerius Flaccus the consul when the latter was appointed to the command against Mithridates, but Fimbria raised a mutiny and slew the consul in the neighborhood of Bithynia, and was himself set up as lord of the army, and when he advanced to Ilium, the Ilians would not admit him, as being a brigand, and therefore he applied force and captured the place on the eleventh day. And when he boasted that he himself had overpowered on the eleventh day the city which Agamemnon had only with difficulty captured in the tenth year, although the latter had with him on his expedition the fleet of a thousand vessels and the whole of Greece, one of the Ilians said, Yes, for the city's champion was no Hector. Now Sulla came over and overthrew Fimbria, and on terms of agreement sent Mithridates away to his homeland, but he also consoled the Ilians by numerous improvements. In my time, however, the deified Caesar was far more thoughtful of them, at the same time also emulating the example of Alexander, for Alexander set out to provide for them on the basis of a renewal of ancient kinship, and also because at the same time he was fond of Homer, at any rate, we are told of a recension of the poetry of Homer, the recension of the casket, as it is called, which Alexander, along with Callisthenes and Anaxarchus, perused and to a certain extent annotated, and then deposited in a richly wrought casket which he had found amongst the Persian treasures. Accordingly, it was due both to his zeal for the poet and to his descent from the Iacidae who reigned as kings of the Molossians where, as we are also told, Andromache, who had been the wife of Hector, reigned as queen that Alexander was kindly disposed towards the Ilians. But Caesar, not only being fond of Alexander, but also having better known evidences of kinship with the Ilians, felt encouraged to bestow kindness upon them with all the zest of youth, better known evidences, first, because he was a Roman, and because the Romans believe Aeneas to have been their original founder, and secondly, because the name Iulius was derived from that of a certain Iulus who was one of his ancestors, and this Iulus got his appellation from the Iulus who was one of the descendants of Aeneas. Caesar therefore allotted territory to them and also helped them to preserve their freedom and their immunity from taxation, and to this day they remain in possession of these favors. But that this is not the site of the ancient Ilium, if one considers the matter in accordance with Homer's account, is inferred from the following considerations. But first I must give a general description of the region in question, beginning at that point on the coast where I left off. 1.28 After Abydus, then, comes the Dardanian promontory, which I mentioned a little while ago and also the city Dardanus, which is seventy stadia distant from Abydus. Between the two places empties the Rhodius River, opposite which, in the Chersonesus, is Sinosema, which is said to be the tomb of Hecabe. But some say that the Rhodius empties into the Aesopus. This too is one of the rivers mentioned by the poet, Rhesus, Heptoporus, Caresus, and Rhodius. Dardanus was an ancient settlement, but it was held in such contempt that it was oftentimes transplanted by some of the kings to Abydus and then resettled again by others on the ancient site. It was here that Cornelius Sulla, the Roman commander, and Mithridates surnamed Eupater met and arranged the terms for the conclusion of the war. 1.29 Nearby is Ophrenium, near which, in a conspicuous place, is the sacred precinct of Hector. And next comes the lake of Telios. 1.30 Then come Redium a city situated on a hill, and, adjacent to Redium, a low-lying shore, on which are a tomb and sanctuary of Aeus, and also a statue of him, which was taken up by Antony and carried of to Egypt, but Augustus Caesar gave it back again to the Roaeans, just as he gave back other statues to their owners. For Antony took away the finest dedications from the most famous sanctuaries, to gratify the Egyptian woman, but Augustus gave them back to the gods. 1.31 After Redium comes Sigaeum, a destroyed city, and the naval station and the harbour of the Achaeans and the Achaean camp and Stumalim, as it is called, and the outlets of the Scamander, for after the Samoais and the Scamander meet in the plain, they carry down great quantities of alluvium, silt up the coat, and form a blind mouth, lagoons, and marshes. Opposite the Sigean promontory on the Chersonesus are Elusa and the sanctuary of Protesilaus, both of which I have mentioned in my description of Thrace. 1.32 The length of this coast, I mean on a straight voyage from Redium to Sigeum, and the monument of Achilles, is sixty stadia, and the whole of it lies below Ilium, not only the present Ilium, from which, at the harbour of the Achaeans, it is about twelve stadia distant, but also the earlier Ilium, which lies thirty stadia farther inland in the direction of Mount Idaho now there are a sanctuary and a monument of Achilles near Sigeum, as also monuments of Patroclus and Antilochus, and the Ilians offer sacrifices to all four heroes, both to these and to Aeus. But they do not honour Heracles, giving as their reason his sacking of the city. But one might say that, although Heracles did sack it, yet he sacked it in such a way as still to leave it a city, even though damaged, for those who were later to sack it utterly, 
and for this reason the poet states it thus, he sacked the city of Ilios and widowed her streets, for widowed means a loss of the male population, not a complete annihilation. But the others, whom they think fit to worship with sacrifices and to honor as gods, completely annihilated the city. Perhaps they might give as their reason for this that these waged a just war, whereas Heracles waged an unjust one on account of the horses of Laomedon. But writers set over against this reason the myth that it was not on account of the horses but of the reward offered for Hesione and the sea monster. But let us disregard these reasons, for they end merely in controversies about myths. And perhaps we fail to notice certain more credible reasons why it occurred to the Ilians to honor some and not others. And it appears that the poet, in what he says about Heracles, represents the city as small, if it be true that with only six ships and fewer men he sacked the city of Ilium. And it is clearly shown by this statement that Priam became great and king of kings from a small beginning, as I have said before. Advancing a little farther along the shore, one comes to the Achaeum, where begins the part of the mainland that belongs to Tenedos. 1.33 such, are the places on the sea. Above these lies the Trojan plain, which extends inland for many stadia in the direction of the east as far as Mount Idaho the part of this plain alongside the mountain is narrow, extending on one side towards the south as far as the region of Skepsis, and on the other towards the north as far as the Lycians of Zelia. This is the country which the poet makes subject to Aeneas and the sons of Antenor, calling it Dardania, and below this is Cebrinia, which is level for the most part and lies approximately parallel to Dardania, and in it there was once a city called Cebrine. Demetrius suspects that the territory of Ilium subject to Hector extended inland from the naval station as far as Cebrinia, for he says that the tomb of Alexander is pointed out there, as also that of Oingwan, who, according to historians, had been the wife of Alexander before he carried off Helen. And, he continues, the poet mentions Cebrionis, bastard son of glorious Priam, after whom, as one may suppose, the country was named or the city too, which is more plausible and Cebrinia extends as far as the territory of Skepsis, and the Scamander, which flows between, is the boundary, and the Sprini and Skepsians were always hostile to one another and at war until Antigonus settled both peoples together in Antigonia, as it was then called, or Alexandria, as it is now called, now the Sprini, he adds, remained with the rest in Alexandria, but the Skepsians, by permission of Lysimachus, went back to their homeland. 1.34 From the mountain range of Ida in this region, according to Demetrius, Two spurs extend to the sea, one straight to Redium and the other straight to Sigaeum, forming together a semicircular line, and they end in the plain at the same distance from the sea as the present Ilium. This Ilium, accordingly, lies between the ends of the two spurs mentioned, whereas the old settlement lies between their beginnings. And, he adds, the spurs include both the Semesian plain, through which the Samoais runs, and the Scamandrian plain, through which the Scamander flows. This is called the Trojan plain in the special sense of the term and here it is that the poet represents most of the fights as taking place, for it is wider, and here it is that we see pointed out the places named by the poet Arrhenius, the tomb of Asiades, Batia, and the monument of Illus. The Scamander and Samoais rivers, after running near to Sega Eum and Redium respectively, meet a little in front of the present Ilium, and then issue towards Sega Eum and form Stumalim, as it is called. The two plains above mentioned are separated from each other by a great neck of land which runs in a straight line between the aforesaid spurs, starting from the present Ilium, with which it is connected, and stretches as far as Cebrinia and, along with the spurs on either side, forms a complete letter. 1.35 A little above this is the village of the Ilians, where the ancient Ilium is thought to have been situated in earlier times, at a distance of 30 stadia from the present city. And 10 stadia above the village of the Ilians is Calicolone, a hill, past which, at a distance of five stadia, flows the Samoais. It therefore becomes easy to understand, first, the reference to Ares, and over against her leapt Ares, like unto a dreadful whirlwind, in shrill tones cheering the Trojans from the topmost part of the city, and now again as he sped alongside Samoais or Calicolone, for if the battle was fought on the Scamandrian plain, it is plausible that Ares should at one time shout his cheers from the Acropolis and at another from the region near the Samoais and Calicolone, up to which, in all probability, the battle would have extended. But since Calicolone is forty stadia distant from the present Ilium, for what useful purpose would the poet have taken in places so far away that the line of battle could not have reached them? Again, the words, and towards Thymbra fell the lot of the Lycians, are more suitable to the ancient settlement, for the plain of Thymbra is near it, as also the Thymbrius River, which flows through the plain and empties into the Scamander at the sanctuary of the Thymbrian Apollo, but Thymbra is actually fifty stadia distant from the present Ilium, and again, Arrhenius, a place that is rugged and full of wild fig trees, lies at the foot of the ancient site, so that Andromache might appropriately say, Stay thy host beside Arrhenius, 
where best the city can be approached and the wall scaled, but Araneus stands at a considerable distance from the present Ilium. Further, a little below Araneus is Phegus, in reference to which Achilles says, but so long as I was carrying on war amid the Achaeans, Hector was unwilling to rouse battle away from the wall, but would come only as far as the sea and gates in Phegus. 1.36 However, the naval station, still now so called, is so near the present Ilium that one might reasonably wonder at the witlessness of the Greeks and the faint-heartedness of the Trojans. Witlessness, if the Greeks kept the naval station unwalled for so long a time, when they were near to the city and to so great a multitude, both that in the city and that of the allies, for Homer says that the wall had only recently been built, or else it was not built at all, but fabricated and then abolished by the poet, as Aristotle says, and faint-heartedness, if the Trojans, when the wall was built, could besiege it and break into the naval station itself and attack the ships, yet did not have the courage to march up and besiege the station when it was still unwalled and only a slight distance away, for it is near Sigeum, and the Scamander empties near it, at a distance of only twenty stadia from Ilium. But if one shall say that the harbour of Achaeans, as it is now called, is the naval station, he will be speaking of a place that is still closer, only about twelve stadia distant from the city, even if one includes the plain by the sea, because the whole of this plain is a deposit of the rivers I mean the plain by the sea in front of the city, so that, if the distance between the sea and the city is now twelve stadia, it must have been no more than half as great at that time. Further, the faint story told by Odysseus to Eumaeus clearly indicates that the distance from the naval station to the city is great, for after saying, as when we let our ambush beneath the walls of Troy, he adds a little below, for we went very far from the ships. And spies are sent forth to find whether the Trojans will stay by the ships far away, far separated from their own walls, or will withdraw again to the city. And Polydamus says, on both sides, friends, bethink ye well, for I, on my own part, bid you now to go to the city, afar from the walls are we. Demetrius cites also Hestia of Alexandria as a witness, a woman who wrote a work on Homer's Iliad and inquired whether the war took place round the present Ilium and the Trojan plain, which latter the poet places between the city and the sea, for, she says, the plain now to be seen in front of the present Ilium is a later deposit of the rivers. 1.37 Again, Polites, who was wont to sit as a sentinel of the Trojans, trusting in his fleetness of foot, on the topmost part of the barrow of aged societies, was doing a foolish thing, for even though he sat on the topmost part of it, still he might have kept watch from the much greater height of the Acropolis, at approximately the same distance, with no need of fleetness of foot for safety, for the barrow of Asiades now pointed out as five stadia distant on the road to Alexandria. Neither is the clear running space of Hector round the city easy to understand, for the present Ilium has no clear running space, on account of the ridge that joins it. The ancient city, however, has a clear running space round it. 1.38 But no trace of the ancient city survives, and naturally so, for while the cities all round it were sacked, but not completely destroyed, yet that city was so utterly demolished that all the stones were taken from it to rebuild the others. At any rate, Archeanax of Metelene is said to have built a wall round Sigeum with stones taken from there. Sigeum was seized by Athenians under Fernan the Olympian victor, although the lesbians laid claim to almost the whole of the Trode. Most of the settlements in the Trode belong, in fact, to the lesbians, and some endure to this day, while others have disappeared. Pittacus of Metelene, one of the seven wise men, as they are called, sailed against Fernan the general and for a time carried on the war, but with poor management and ill consequences. It was at this time that the poet Alcaeus says that he himself, being sorely pressed in a certain battle, threw away his arms. He addresses his account of it to a certain herald, whom he had bidden to report to the people at home that Alcaeus is safe, but his arms have been hung up as an offering to Ares by the Attic army in the sanctuary of Athena Glaucopes. But later, on being challenged to single combat by Fernan, he took up his fishing tackle, ran to meet him, entangled him in his fishing net, and stabbed and slew him with trident and dagger. But since the war still went on, Periander was chosen by both sides as arbiter and ended it. 1.39 Demetrius says that Timaeus falsifies when he informs us that Periander fortified Achilleum against the Athenians with stones from Ilium, to help the army of Pittacus, for this place, he says, was indeed fortified by the Mytileneans against Sigeum, though not with such stones as those, nor yet by Periander. For how could the opponent of the Athenians have been chosen as arbiter? Achilleum is the place where stands the monument of Achilles and is only a small settlement. Sigeum, also, has been raised to the ground by the Ilians, because of its disobedience, for the whole of the coast as far as Dardanus was later subject to the Ilians and is now subject to them. In ancient times the most of it was subject to the Aeolians, so that Ephorus does not hesitate to apply the name Aeolus to the whole of the coast from Abydus to Syme. 
Thucydides says that Troy was taken away from the Mytileneans by the Athenians in the Pachacian part of the Peloponnesian War. 1.40 The present Ilians further tell us that the city was, in fact, not completely wiped out at its capture by the Achaeans and that it was never even deserted. At any rate the Locrian maidens, beginning a little later, were sent every year. But this too is non-Homeric, for Homer knows not of the violation of Cassandra, but he says that she was a maiden at about that time, for he slew Othryonius, a sojourner in Troy from Cabesus, who had but recently come, following after the rumor of war, and he was asking Cassandra in marriage, the comeliest of the daughters of Priam, without gifts of wooing, and yet he does not so much as mention any violation of her or say that the destruction of Aeus and the shipwreck took place because of the wrath of Athena or any such cause. Instead, he speaks of Aeus as hated by Athena, in accordance with her general hatred, for since they one and all committed sacrilege against her sanctuary, she was angry at them all, but says that he was destroyed by Poseidon because of his boastful speech. But the fact is that the Locrian maidens were first sent when the Persians were already in power. 1.41 So the Ilians tell us, but Homer expressly states that the city was wiped out, the day shall come when sacred Ilios shall perish, and surely we have utterly destroyed the steep city of Priam, by means of counsels and persuasiveness, and in the tenth year the city of Priam was destroyed. And other such evidences of the same thing are set forth, for example, that the wooden image of Athena now to be seen stands upright, whereas Homer clearly indicates that it was sitting, for orders are given to put the robe upon Athena's knees hom. Eel. 6. Compare that never should there sit upon his knees a dear child. For it is better to interpret it in this way then, as some do, to interpret it as meaning to put the robe beside her knees, comparing the words and she sits upon the hearth in the light of the fire, which they take to mean beside the hearth. For how could one conceive of the dedication of a robe beside the knees? Moreover, others, changing the accent on gamma omicron nu alpha sigma iota nu accenting it gamma omicron upsilon nu sigma iota nu, like theta upsilon iota sigma iota nu, in whichever of two ways they interpret it, talk on endlessly. There are to be seen many of the ancient wooden images of Athena in a sitting posture, as, for example, in Phocia, Massalia, Rome, Chios, and several other places. Also the more recent writers agree that the city was wiped out, among whom is the order Lycurgus, who, in mentioning the city of the Ilians, says, who has not heard that once for all it was raised to the ground by the Greeks, and is uninhabited. 1.42 It is surmised that those who later thought of refounding the city regarded that site as ill-omened, either on account of its misfortune or also because, in accordance with an ancient custom, a curse had been laid upon it by Agamemnon, just as Croesus, after he destroyed Sidon, whither the tyrant Glaucaius had fled for refuge, put a curse on any persons who should refortify the site, and that they therefore avoided that place and fortified another. Now the Astypalians who held possession of Redium were the first to settle Polium, now called Polisma, on the Samoais River, but not on a well-protected site, and therefore it was soon demolished. It was in the time of the Lydians that the present settlement was founded, as also the sanctuary. It was not a city, however, and it was only after many ages, and gradually, as I have said, that it increased. But Hellenicus, to gratify the Ilians, such as the spirit of that man, agrees with them that the present Ilium is the same as the ancient. When the city was wiped out, its territory was divided up between the inhabitants of Sigaeum and Redium and several other neighboring peoples, but the territory was given back when the place was refounded. 1.43 The epithet many fountained is thought to be especially applied to Mount Ida because of the great number of rivers that flow from it, particularly in those parts below it where lie the territory of Dardanus even as far as Skepsis and the region of Ilium. Demetrius, who as a native was acquainted with the topography of the country, says in one place as follows, there is a hill of Ida called Cotylus, and this hill lies about 120 stadia above Skepsis, and from it flow the Scamander, the Granicus, and the Aesopus, the two latter flowing towards the north and the Perpontus and constituting a collection of streams from several sources, while the Scamander flows towards the west from only one source, and all the sources lie close together, being comprised within a distance of twenty stadia. But the end of the Aesopus stands farthest away from its beginning, approximately five hundred stadia. But it is a matter of argument what the poet means when he says, and they came to the two fair flowing streams, where well up the two springs of eddying Scamander, for the one flows with soft water, that is, with hot water, and the poet adds, and round about a smoke arises from it as if from a blazing fire, whereas the other even in summer flows forth cold as hail or chill snow. But, in the first place, no hot waters are now to be found at the site, and, secondly, the source of the Scamander is not to be found there, but in the mountain, and it has only one source, not two. It is reasonable to suppose, therefore, that the hot spring has given out, 
and that the cold one is evacuated from the Scamander through an underground passage and rises to the surface here, or else that because of the nearness of the Scamander this water is called a source of the Scamander, for people are wont to ascribe several sources to one and the same river in this way. 1.44 The Scamander is joined by the Andiris, which flows from caressing, a mountainous country settled with many villages and beautifully cultivated, it extends alongside Dardania as far as the regions of Zelia and Pitiia. It is said that the country was named after the Caresis River, which is named by the poet, Rhesus, Heptoporus, Caresis, and Rhodius, and that the city of the same name as the river was torn down. Again, Demetrius says as follows, the Rhesus River is now called Roites, unless it be that the river which empties into the Granicus is the Rhesus. The Heptoporus, also called Polyporus, is crossed seven times by one traveling from the region of the beautiful pine to the village called Melini and the Asulpeum that was founded by Lysimachus. Concerning the beautiful pine, King Attalus I writes as follows, its circumference is 24 feet, and its trunk rises to a height of 67 feet from the root and then splits into three forks equidistant from one another, and then contracts again into one head, thus completing a total height of two plethora and 15 cubits. It is 180 stadia distant from Adramedium, to the north of it. The Caresis flows from Malus, a place situated between Peliskepsis and the Achaeum, the part of the mainland that belongs to the Tenidians, and it empties into the Aesopus. The Rhodius flows from Clendria and Gordus, which are sixty stadia distant from the beautiful pine, and it empties into the Aeneas. 1.45 In the dale of the Aesopus, on the left of the stream, one comes first to Polycna, a place enclosed by walls, and then to Peliskepsis, and then to Elizonium this last name having been fabricated to support the hypothesis about the Halicines, whom I have already discussed, and then to Caresis, which is deserted, and caressing, and the river of the same name, which also forms a notable dale, though smaller than that of the Aesopus, and next follow the plains and plateaus of Zelia, which are beautifully cultivated. On the right of the Aesopus, between Polycna and Peliskepsis, one comes to Nia Common Argyria, and this again is a name fabricated to support the same hypothesis, in order to save the words, where is the birthplace of silver? Now where is Alibi, or Alipi, or however they wish to alter the spelling of the name? For having once made their bold venture, they should have rubbed their faces and fabricated this name too, instead of leaving it lame and readily subject to detection. Now these things are open to objections of this kind, but, in the case of the others, or at least most of them, I take it for granted that we must give heed to him as a man who was acquainted with the region and a native of it, who gave enough thought to this subject to write thirty books of commentary on a little more than sixty lines of Homer, that is, on the catalogue of the Trojans. He says, at any rate, that Peliskepsis is fifty stadia distant from Aenea and thirty from the Aesopus River, and that from this Peliskepsis the same name was extended to several other sites. But I shall return to the coast at the point where I left off. 1.46 After the Sigian promontory in the Achilleum one comes to the Achaeum, the part of the mainland that belongs to the Tenidians, and to Tenedos itself, which is not more than 40 stadia distant from the mainland. It is about 80 stadia in circumference, and has an Aeolian city and two harbours and a sanctuary of Smynthian Apollo, as the poet testifies, and dust rule mightily over Tenedos, O Smynthian. Round it lie several small islands, in particular two, which are called the Calidni and are situated on the voyage to Lectum and some give the name Calidna to Tenedos itself, while others call it Leucophrys. In it is laid the scene of the myth of Tenes, after whom the island was named, as also that of Sickness, a Thracian by birth and, according to some, father of Tenes and king of Kearney. 1.47 Both Larissa and Kearney used to be adjacent to the Achaeum, formerly being on the part of the mainland that belonged to the Tenidians, and then one comes to the present Chrysa, which was founded on a rocky height above the sea, and to Hamaxidus, which lies below Lectum and adjacent to it. At the present time Alexandria is adjacent to the Achaeum, and those other towns, like several others of the strongholds, have been incorporated with Alexandria, among them Sebrine and Neandria, and Alexandria holds their territory. But the site on which Alexandria now lies used to be called Sigia. 1.48 In this Chrysa is also the sanctuary of Smynthian Apollo, and the symbol which preserves the etymology of the name, I mean the mouse, lies beneath the foot of his image. These are the works of Scopus of Paros, and also the history, or myth, about the mice is associated with this place. When the Teucrians arrived from Crete, Calinus the elegiac poet was the first to hand down an account of these people, and many have followed him, they had an oracle which bade them to stay on the spot where the earth-born should attack them, and, he says the attack took place round him Exodus, for by night a great multitude of field mice swarmed out of the ground and ate up all the leather in their arms and equipment, and the Teucrians remained there, and it was they who gave its name to Mount Ida, naming it after the mountain in Crete. 
Heraclides of Pontus says that the mice which swarmed round the sanctuary were regarded as sacred, and that for this reason the image was designed with its foot upon the mouse. Others say that a certain Teucer came from the Deme of Tros, now called Zypetiones, in Attica, but that no Teucrians came from Crete. As a further sign of the close relationship of the Trojans with the people of Attica they record the fact the Erichthonius was one of the original founders on both tribes. Now this is the account of the more recent writer, but more in agreement with Homer are the traces to be seen in the plain of Thebe and in the Chrysa which was once founded there, which I shall soon discuss. The name of Smintheus is used in many places, for in the neighborhood of Hamaxodus itself, apart from the Smintheum at the sanctuary, there are two places called Smintheia, and there are others in the neighboring territory of Larissa. And also in the territory of Perium there is a place called Smintheia, as also in Rhodes and in Lindus and in many other places. And they now call the sanctuary Smintheum. Apart, at any rate, lie both the Halesian plain, of no great size, and inland from Lectum, and the Tragassi and Salt Pan near Amaxodus where salt is naturally caused to congeal by the Atesian winds. On Lectum is to be seen an altar of the twelve gods, said to have been founded by Agamemnon. These places are all in sight of Ilium, at a distance of about 200 stadia or a little more, and the same is the case with the places round Abydus on the other side, although Abydus is a little closer. 1.49 On doubling Lectum one comes next to the most notable cities of the Aeolians, and to the Gulf of Adramedium, on which the poet obviously places the majority of the Lelages, as also the Cilicians, who were twofold. Here too is the shore land of the Mytileneans, with certain villages belonging to the Mytileneans who live on the mainland. The same gulf is also called the Idaean Gulf, for the ridge which extends from Lectum to Mount Ida lies above the first part of the gulf, where the poet represents the Lelages as first settled. 1.50 But I have already discussed these matters. I must now add that Homer speaks of Apetasus, a city of the Lelages, as subject to Lord Altus, of Altus, who is lord over the war-loving Lelages, who holds steep Petasus on the Satnius. And the site of the place, now deserted, is still to be seen. Some write, though wrongly, at the foot of Satnius, as though the city lay at the foot of a mountain called Satnius, but there is no mountain here called Satnius, but only a river of that name, on which the city is situated, but the city is now deserted. The poet names the river, for, according to him, he wounded Satnius with a thrust of his spear, even the son of Oinops, whom a peerless naiad nymph bore unto Oinops, as he tended his herds by the banks of the Satnius, and again, and he dwelt by the banks of the fair flowing Satnius in steep Petasus. And in later times it was called Satnius, though some called it Saphnioes. It is only a large winter torrent, but the naming of it by the poet has made it worthy of mention. These places are continuous with Dardania and Skepsia, and are, as it were, a second Dardania, but it is lower lying. 1.51 To the Aseans and the Gargarians now belong all the parts as far as the sea off Lesbos that are surrounded by the territory of Antandrus and that of the Cebrinians and Neandrians and Amaxidans, for the Antandrians are situated above Amaxidus, like it being situated inside Lectum, though farther inland and nearer to Ilium, for they are 130 stadia distant from Ilium. Higher up than these are the Cebrinians, and still higher up than the latter are the Dardanians, who extend as far as Paleskepsis and Skepsis itself. And Tandris is called by Alcea city of the Lelages. First, and Tandris, city of the Lelages, but it is placed by the Skepsian among the cities adjacent to their territory, so that it would fall within the territory of the Cilicians. For the territory of the Cilicians is continuous with that of the Lelages, the former, rather than the latter, marking off the southern flank of Mount Idaho, but still the territory of the Cilicians also lies low and, rather than that of the Lelages, joins the part of the coast that is near Adramedium. For after Lectum one comes to a place called Polymedium, at a distance of forty stadia, then, at a distance of eighty, to Assis, slightly above the sea, and then, at a distance of one hundred and twenty, to Gargra, which lies on a promontory that forms the Adramidine Gulf, in the special sense of that term, for the whole of the coast from Lectum to Cani is also called by this same name, in which is also included the Elatic Gulf. In the special sense of the term, however, only that part of it is called Adramidine which is enclosed by that promontory on which Gargra lies and the promontory called Pira, on which the Aphrodisium is situated. The breadth of the mouth across from promontory to promontory is a distance of 120 stadia. Inside is Antandrus, above which lies a mountain called Alexandria, where the judgment of Paris is said to have taken place, as also Aspanius, the market for the timber from Mount Ida, for here people bring it down and sell it to those who want it. And then comes Astyra, a village with a precinct sacred to the Astyrian Artemis. And quite near Astyra is Adramedium, a city colonized by the Athenians, which is both a harbour and a naval station. 
outside the gulf and the promontory called Pira lies Sisthene, a deserted city with a harbour. Above it, in the interior, lie the copper mine and preparing entrarium and other settlements like these two. On the next stretch of coast one comes to the villages of the Mytileneans, I mean Corophantus and Heraclea, and after these places to Atea, and then to Atarnius and Pitany and the outlets of the Caicus River, and here we have already reached the Elatic Gulf. On the far side of the river lie Elia and the rest of the gulf as far as Cany. But let me go back and discuss in detail the several places, if anything worthy of mention has been passed over, and first of all, Skepsis. 1.52 Pali Skepsis lies above Chabron near the highest part of Mount Ida, near Polygna, and it was then called Skepsis, whether for another reason or from the fact that the place is visible all round, if it is right to derive from Greek words names then used by barbarians, but later the inhabitants were removed 60 stadia lower down to the present Skepsis by Scamandrius the son of Hector and Ascanius the son of Aeneas, and their two families are said to have held the kingship over Skepsis for a long time. After this they changed to an oligarchy, and then Milesian settled with them as fellow citizens, and they began to live under a democracy. But the heirs of the royal family nonetheless continued to be called kings and retained certain prerogatives. Then the Skepsians were incorporated into Alexandria by Antigonus, and then they were released by Lysimachus and went back to their homeland. 1.53 Demetrius thinks that Skepsis was also the royal residence of Aeneas, since it lies midway between the territory subject to Aeneas and Lyrnesus, to which latter he fled, according to Homer's statement, when he was being pursued by Achilles. At any rate, Achilles says, Dost thou not remember how from the kind, when thou wast all alone, I made thee run down the Idaean mountains with swift feet? And thence thou didst escape to Lyrnesus, but I rushed in pursuit of thee and sacked it. However, the oft repeated stories of Aeneas are not in agreement with the account which I have just given of the founders of Skepsis. For according to these stories, he survived the war because of his enmity to Priam, for always he was wroth against goodly Priam, because, although he was brave amid warriors, Priam would not honor him at all, and his fellow rulers, the sons of Antenor and Antenor himself, survived because of the hospitality shown Menelaus at Antenor's house. At any rate, Sophocles says that at the capture of Troy a leopard skin was put before the doors of Antenor as a sign that his house was to be left unpillaged, and Antenor and his children safely escaped to Thrace with the survivors of the Henidae, and from there got across to the Adriatic Henidus, as it is called, whereas Aeneas collected a host of followers and set sail with his father Anchises and his son Ascanius, and some say that he took up his abode near the Macedonian Olympus, others that he founded Capae near Mantinea and Arcadia deriving the name he gave the settlement from Capus, and others say that he landed at Egesta in Sicily with Elymas the Trojan and took possession of Eryx and Lilibion, and gave the name Scamander and Samoais to rivers near Egesta, and that thence he went into the Latin country and made it his abode, in accordance with an oracle which bade him abide where he should eat up his table, and that this took place in the Latin country in the neighborhood of Lavinium, where a large loaf of bread was put down for a table, for want of a better table, and eaten up along with the meats upon it. Homer, however, appears not to be in agreement with either of the two stories, nor yet with the above account of the founders of Skepsis, for he clearly indicates that Aeneas remained in Troy and succeeded to the empire and bequeathed the succession thereto to his son's sons, the family of the Priamidae having been wiped out, for already the race of Priam was hated, by the son of Cronus, and now verily the mighty Aeneas will rule over the Trojans, and his son's sons that are hereafter to be born. And in this case one cannot even save from rejection the succession of Scamandrius and Homer is in far greater disagreement with those who speak of Aeneas as having wandered even as far as Italy and make him die there. Some write, the family of Aeneas will rule over all, and his son's sons, meaning the Romans. 1.54 From Skepsis came the Socratic philosophers Erastus and Cariscus and Neleus the son of Cariscus, this last a man who not only was a pupil of Aristotle and Theophrastus, but also inherited the library of Theophrastus, which included that of Aristotle. At any rate, Aristotle bequeathed his own library to Theophrastus, to whom he also left his school, and he is the first man, so far as I know, to have collected books and to have taught the kings in Egypt how to arrange a library. Theophrastus bequeathed it to Neleus, and Neleus took it to Skepsis and bequeathed it to his heirs, ordinary people, who kept the books locked up and not even carefully stored. But when they heard bow zealously the Italic kings to whom the city was subject were searching for books to build up the library in Pergamum, they hid their books underground in a kind of trench. But much later, when the books had been damaged by moisture and moths, their descendants sold them to a pelican of Teos for a large sum of money, both the books of Aristotle and those of Theophrastus. But a pelican was a bibliophile rather than a philosopher, and therefore, seeking a restoration of the parts that had been eaten through, he made new copies of the text, filling up the gaps incorrectly, and published the books full of errors. 
The result was that the earlier school of peripatetics who came after Theophrastus had no books at all, with the exception of only a few, mostly exoteric works, and were therefore able to philosophize about nothing in a practical way, but only to talk bombast about commonplace propositions, whereas the later school, from the time the books in question appeared, though better able to philosophize and Aristotelize, were forced to call most of their statements probabilities, because of the large number of errors. Rome also contributed much to this, for, immediately after the death of a pelican, Sulla, who had captured Athens, carried off a pelican's library to Rome, where Tyranni and the grammarian, who was fond of Aristotle, got it in his hands by paying court to the librarian, as did also certain booksellers who used bad copyists and would not collate the text the thing that also takes place in the case of the other books that are copied for selling, both here and at Alexandria. However, this is enough about these men. 1.55 from Skepsis came also Demetrius, whom I often mention, the grammarian who wrote a commentary on the marshalling of the Trojan forces, and was born at about the same time as Crates and Aristarchus, and later, Metrodorus, a man who changed from his pursuit of philosophy to political life, and taught rhetoric, for the most part, in his written works, and he used a brand new style and dazzled many. On account of his reputation he succeeded, though a poor man, in marrying brilliantly in Chalcedon, and he passed for a Chalcedonian. And having paid court to Mithridates Eupater, he with his wife sailed away with him to Pontus, and he was treated with exceptional honor, being appointed to the judgeship from which there was no appeal to the king. However, his good fortune did not continue, but he incurred the enmity of men less just than himself and revolted from the king when he was on the embassy to Tigranes the Armenian. And Tigranes sent him back against his will to Eupater, who was already in flight from his ancestral realm, but Metrodorus died on the way, whether by order of the king or from disease, for both accounts are given of his death. So much for the Skepsians. 1.56 After Skepsis come Andira and Pioneer and the territory of Gargra. There is a stone in the neighborhood of Andira which, when burned, becomes iron, and then, when heated in a furnace with a certain earth, distills mock silver, and this, with the addition of copper, makes the mixture, as it is called, which by some is called mountain copper. These are the places which the Lelages occupied, and the same is true of the places in the neighborhood of Assis. 1.57 Assis is by nature strong and well fortified, and the ascent to it from the sea and the harbour is very steep and long, so that the statement of Stratonicus the Sidorist in regard to it seems appropriate, go to Assis, in order that thou mayest more quickly come to the doom of death. The harbour is formed by a great mole. From Assis came Cleanthes, the Stoic philosopher who succeeded Zeno of Cetium as head of the school and left it to Chrysippus of Soli. Here too Aristotle tarried, because of his relationship by marriage with the tyrant Hermaeus. Hermaeus was a eunuch, the slave of a certain banker, and on his arrival at Athens he became a pupil of both Plato and Aristotle. On his return he shared the tyranny with his master, who had already laid hold of the districts of Atarnius and Assis, and then Hermaeus succeeded him and sent for both Aristotle and Xenocrates and took care of them, and he also married his brother's daughter to Aristotle. Memnon of Rhodes, who was at that time serving the Persians as general, made a pretense of friendship for Hermaeus, and then invited him to come for a visit, both in the name of hospitality and at the same time for pretended business reasons, but he arrested him and sent him up to the king, where he was put to death by hanging. But the philosophers safely escaped by flight from the districts above mentioned, which were seized by the Persians. 1.58 Merzalus says that Assis was founded by the Methymnians, and Hellenicus too calls it an Aeolian city, just as also Gargra and Lamponia belong to the Aeolians. For Gargra was founded by the Aeolians, but it was not well peopled, for the kings brought into it colonists from Miltopolis when they devastated that city, so that instead of Aeolians, according to Demetrius of Skepsis, the inhabitants of Gargra became semi-barbarians. According to Homer, however, all these places belong to the Lelages, who by some are represented to be Carians, although by Homer they are mentioned apart, towards the sea are the Carians and the Peonians of the curved bow and the Lelages and the Cauconians. They were therefore a different people from the Carians, and they lived between the people subject to Aeneas and the people whom the poet called Cilicians, but when they were pillaged by Achilles they migrated to Caria and took possession of the district round the present Halicarnassus. 1.59 However, the city Pedasus, now abandoned by them, is no longer in existence, but in the inland territory of the Halicarnassians there used to be a city Pedassa, so named by them, and the present territory is called Pedasus. It is said that as many as eight cities were settled in this territory by the Lelages, who in earlier times were so numerous that they not only took possession of that part of Caria which extends to Mindus and Bargelia, but also cut off for themselves a large portion of Pisidia. But later, when they went out on expeditions with the Carians, they became distributed throughout the whole of Greece, and the tribe disappeared. 
of the eight cities, Mausolus united six into one city, Halicarnassus, as Callisthenes tells us, but kept Syangela and Mindus as they were. These are the Padasians of whom Herodotus says that when any misfortune was about to come upon them and their neighbors, the priestess of Athena would grow a beard, and that this happened to them three times. And there is also a small town called Padassum in the present territory of Stratonicea. And throughout the whole of Caria and in Miletus are to be seen tombs, fortifications, and traces of settlements of the Lelages. 1.60 After the Lelages, on the next stretch of coast, live the Cilicians, according to Homer, I mean the stretch of coast now held by the Adromidini and Atarnadi and Pitnae, as far as the outlet of the Caicus. The Cilicians, as I have said, were divided into two dynasties, one subject to Aetean and one to Mines. 1.61 Now Homer calls Thebe the city of Aetean, we went into Thebe, the sacred city of Aetean, and he clearly indicates that also Chrysa, which had the sanctuary of Sminthi and Apollo, belonged to Aetean, if it be true that Chrysis is taken captive at Thebe, for he says, we went into Thebe, and laid it waste and brought hither all the spoil. And this they divided aright among themselves, but they chose out Chrysizer the son of Atreus, and that Lyrnesus belonged to Mines, since Achilles laid waste Lyrnesus and the walls of Thebe and slew both Mines and Epistrophus, so that when Brishes says, Thou wouldst not even let me, when swift Achilles slew my husband and sacked the city of divine Mines, Homer cannot mean Thebe, for this belonged to Aetean, but Lyrnesus. Both were situated in what was afterwards called the plain of Thebe, which, on account of its fertility, is said to have been an object of contention between the Mysians and Lydians in earlier times, and later between the Greeks who colonized it from Elis and Lesbos. But the greater part of it is now held by the Adromitani, for here lie both Thebe and Lyrnesus, the latter a natural stronghold, but both places are deserted. From Adramedium the former is distant 60 stadia and the latter 88, in opposite directions. 1.62 In the territory of Adramedium lie also Chrysa and Scylla. At any rate there is still today a place near Thebe called Scylla, where is a sanctuary of the Scyllian Apollo, and the Scylaeus River, which runs from Mount Ida, flows past it. These places lie near the territory of Antandrus. The Scyllian in Lesbos is named after this Scylla, and there is also a Mount Scylla in between Gargra and Antandrus. Days of Kearney says that the sanctuary of the Scyllian Apollo was first founded in Kearney by the Aeolians who sailed from Greece. It is also said that a sanctuary of Scyllian Apollo was established at Chrysa, though it is not clear whether he is the same as the Smynthian Apollo or distinct from him. 1.63 Chrysa was a small town on the sea, with a harbour, and nearby, above it, lies Thebe. Here too was the sanctuary of the Smynthian Apollo, and here lived Chrysa's but the place is now utterly deserted and the sanctuary was transferred to the present Chrysa near Amaxidus when the Cilicians were driven out, partly to Pamphylia and partly to Amaxidus. Those who are less acquainted with ancient history say that it was at this Chrysa that Chryses and Chrysisived, and that Homer mentions this place, but, in the first place, there is no harbour here, and yet Homer says, and when they had now arrived inside the deep harbour, and, secondly, the sanctuary is not on the sea, though Homer makes it on the sea, and out from the seafaring ship stepped Chrysus here then did Odysseus of many wiles lead to the altar, and place in the arms of her dear father, neither is it near Thebe, though Homer makes it near, at any rate, he speaks of Chrysus having been taken captive there. Again, neither is there any place called Scylla to be seen in the territory of the Alexandrians, nor any sanctuary of Scylla and Apollo, but the poet couples the two, who does stand over Chrysa and sacred Scylla. But it is to be seen nearby in the plain of Thebe and the voyage from the Cilician Chrysa to the naval station is about 700 stadia, approximately a day's voyage, such a distance, obviously, as that sailed by Odysseus, for immediately upon disembarking he offered the sacrifice to the god, and since evening overtook him he remained on the spot and sailed away the next morning. But the distance from Amaxidus is scarcely a third of that above mentioned, so that Odysseus could have completed the sacrifice and sailed back to the naval station on the same day. There is also a tomb of Silas in the neighborhood of the sanctuary of the Cilian Apollo, a great barrow. He is said to have been the charioteer of Pelops and to have ruled over this region, and perhaps it was after him that Cilicia was named, or vice versa. 1.64 Now the story of the Teucrians and the mice whence the epithet Smynthian, since Smynthi means mice must be transferred to this place. And writers excuse this giving of epithets from small creatures by such examples as the following, it is from locusts, they say, which the Oetians call cornopes, that Heracles is worshipped among the Oetians as cornopian for ridding them of locusts, and he is worshipped among the Erythraeans who live in Mimas as Ipoctonus, because he is the destroyer of the vine-eating Ips, and in fact, they add, these are the only Erythraeans in whose country this creature is not to be found. And the Rhodians, who call Erisib Erithibe, 
have a sanctuary of Apollo Erythibius in their country, and among the Aeolians in Asia a certain month is called Pornopian, since the Boeotians so call the locusts, and a sacrifice is offered to Apollo Pornopian. 1.65 Now the territory round Adramedium is Mesian, though it was once subject to the Lydians, and today there is a gate in Adramedium which is called the Lydian Gate because, as they say, the city was founded by Lydians. And they say that the neighboring village of Styra belongs to Mysia. It was once a small town, where, in a sacred grove, was the sanctuary of the Astyrene Artemis, which was superintended, along with holy rites, by the Antandrians, who were its nearer neighbors. It is twenty stadia distant from the ancient Chrysa, which also had its sanctuary in a sacred precinct. Here too was the palisade of Achilles. And in the interior, fifty stadia away, is Thebe, now deserted, which the poet speaks of as beneath wooded Placus, but, in the first place, the name Placus or Plax is not found there at all, and, secondly, no wooded place lies above it, though it is near Mount Idaho Thebe is as much as seventy stadia distant from Astyra and sixty from Andira. But all these are names of deserted or scantily peopled places, or of winter torrents, and they are often mentioned only because of their ancient history. 1.66 Both Assis and Adramedium are notable cities. But misfortune befell Adramedium in the Mithridatic War, for the members of the city council were slaughtered, to please the king, by Diodorus the general, who pretended at the same time to be a philosopher of the academy, a dispenser of justice, and a teacher of rhetoric. And indeed he also joined the king on his journey to Pontus, but when the king was overthrown he paid the penalty for his misdeeds, for many charges were brought against him, all at the same time, and, being unable to bear the ignominy, he shamefully starved himself to death, in my own city. Another inhabitant of Adramedium was the famous orator Xenocles, who belonged to the Asiatic school and was as able a debater as ever lived, having even made a speech on behalf of Asia before the Senate, at the time when Asia was accused of Mithridatism. 1.67 Near Astyra is an abysmal lake called Sopra, which has an outbreak into a reefy seashore. Below Andira is a sanctuary sacred to the Andirian mother of the gods, and also a cave that runs underground as far as Pali. Pali is a settlement so named, at a distance of 130 stadia from Andira. The underground passage became known through the fact that a goat fell into the mouth of it and was found on the following day near Andira by a shepherd who happened to have come to make sacrifice. Atarnius is the abode of the tyrant Hermaeus, and then one comes to Pitany, an Aeolic city, which has two harbours, and the Avenus River, which flows past it, whence the aqueduct has been built by the Adromedini. From Pitany came Arcesilaus, of the Academy, a fellow student with Zeno of Cetium under Polemon. In Pitany there is also a place on the sea called Atarnius below Pitany, opposite the island called Elusa. It is said that in Pitany bricks float on water, as is also the case with a certain earth in Tyrrhenia, for the earth is lighter than an equal bulk of water, so that it floats. And Poseidonius says that in Iberia he saw bricks molded from a clay-like earth, with which silver is cleaned, and that they floated on water. After Pitany one comes to the Caicus River, which empties at a distance of thirty stadia into the Elatic Gulf, as it is called. On the far side of the Caicus, twelve stadia distant from the river, is Elia, an Aeolic city, which also is a seaport of the Pergamenians, being 120 stadia distant from Pergamum. 1.68 Then, at a distance of a hundred stadia, one comes to Cain, the promontory which rises opposite Lectum and forms the Adromedine Gulf, of which the Elatic Gulf is a part. Cani is a small town of Locrians from Sinus, and lies in the Canian territory opposite the southernmost ends of Lesbos. This territory extends as far as the Arginacy Islands and the promontory above them, which some call Ega, making it the same as the word for the animal, but the second syllable should be pronounced long, that is, Ega, like Acta and Archa, for Ega used to be the name of the whole of the mountain which is now called Cain or Cani. The mountain is surrounded on the south and west by the sea, and on the east by the plain of the Caicus, which lies below it, and on the north by the territory of Elia. This mountain forms a fairly compact mass off to itself, though it slopes towards the Aegean Sea, whence it got its name. Later the promontory itself was called Ega, as in Sappho, but the rest was called Cain or Cani. 1.69 Between Elia, Pitany, Atarnius, and Pergamum lies Tuthrania, which is at no greater distance than seventy stadia from any of them and is this side the Caicus River, and the story told is that Tuthrus was king of the Cilicians and Mysians. Euripides says that Auga, with her child Telephus, was put by Aelius, her father, into a chest and submerged in the sea when he had detected her ruin by Heracles, but that by the providence of Athena the chest was carried across the sea and cast ashore at the mouth of the Caicus, and that Teuthras rescued the prisoners, and treated the mother as his wife and the child as his own son. Now this is the myth, 
but there must have been some other issue of fortune through which the daughter of the Arcadian consorted with the king of the Mysians and her son succeeded to his kingdom. It is believed, at any rate, that both Teuthras and Telephus reigned as kings over the country round Teuthrania and the Caicus, though Homer goes only so far as to mention the story thus, but what a man was the son of Telephus, the hero Eurypolis, whom he slew with the bronze, and round him were slain many comrades, Setians, on account of a woman's gifts. The poet thus sets before us a puzzle instead of making a clear statement, for we neither know whom we should understand the poet to mean by the Setians nor what he means by on account of the gifts of a woman, but the grammarians too throw in petty myths, more to show their inventiveness than to solve questions. 1.70 However, let us dismiss these, and let us, taking that which is more obvious, say that, according to Homer, Eurypolis clearly reigned in the region of the Caicus, so that perhaps a part of the Cilicians were subject to him, in which case there were three dynasties among them and not merely two. This statement is supported by the fact that there is to be seen in the territory of Elia a torrential stream called the Setius. This empties into another like it, and this again into another, and they all end in the Caicus. But the Caicus does not flow from Ida, as Bacchylides states, neither is Euripides correct in saying that Marsyas dwells in widely famed Selene, in the farthermost region of Ida, for Selene is very far from Ida, and the sources of the Caicus are also very far, for they are to be seen in a plain. Timnus is a mountain which forms the boundary between this plain and the plain of Apia, as it is called, which lies in the interior above the plain of Thebe. From Timnus flows a river called Messias, which empties into the Caicus below its sources, and it was from this fact, as some interpret the passage, that Aeschylus said at the opening of the prologue to the Myrmidons, O. Oh, thou Caicus and ye Mesian inflows. Near the sources is a village called Gergitha, to which Attalus transferred the Gergithians of the Trode when he had destroyed their place. 2.1 Lesbos Since Lesbos, an island worthy of a full account, lies alongside and opposite the coast which extends from Lectum to Cany, and also has small islands lying round it, some outside it and some between it and the mainland, it is now time to describe these, for these are Aeolian, and I might almost say that Lesbos is the metropolis of the Aeolian cities. But I must begin at the point whence I began to traverse the coast that lies opposite the island. 2.2 Now as one sails from Lectum to Assis, the Lesbian country begins at Segrium, its promontory on the north. In this general neighborhood is also Methymna, a city of the Lesbians, sixty stadia distant from the coast that stretches from Polymedium to Assis. But while the perimeter which is filled out by the island as a whole is 1100 stadia, the several distances are as follows, from Methymna to Malia, the southernmost promontory to one keeping the island on the right, I mean at the point where Cany lies most directly opposite the island and precisely corresponds with it, the distance is 340 stadia, thence to Segrium, which is the length of the island, 560, and then to Methymna, 210. Metelene, the largest city, lies between Methymna and Malia, being 70 stadia distant from Malia, 120 from Cany, and the same distance from the Arginacy, which are three small islands lying near the mainland alongside Cany. In the interval between Metelene and Methymna, in the neighborhood of a village called Agiris in the Methymnian territory, the island is narrowest, with a passage of only 20 stadia over to the Euripus of the Pyrians. Pyrrha is situated on the western side of Lesbos at a distance of 100 stadia from Malia. Metelene has two harbors, of which the southern can be closed and holds only 50 triremes, but the northern is large and deep, and is sheltered by a mole. Off both lies a small island, which contains a part of the city that is settled there. And the city is well equipped with everything. 2.3 Metelene has produced famous men, in early times, Pittacus, one of the seven wise men, and the poet Alcaeus, and his brother Antimenidas, who, according to Alcaeus, won a great struggle when fighting on the side of the Babylonians, and rescued them from their toils by killing a warrior, the royal wrestler, as he says, who was but one short of five cubits in height. And along with these flourished also Sappho, a marvellous woman, for in all the time of which we have record I do not know of the appearance of any woman who could rival Sappho, even in a slight degree, in the matter of poetry. The city was in those times ruled over by several tyrants because of the dissensions among the inhabitants, and these dissensions are the subject of the Stasiotic poems, as they are called, of Alcaeus. And also Pittacus was one of the tyrants. Now Alcaeus would rail alike at both Pittacus and the rest, Merciless and Melancholous and the Clean Act today and certain others, though even he himself was not innocent of revolutionary attempts, but even Pittacus himself used monarchy for the overthrow of the oligarchs, and then, after overthrowing them, restored to the city its independence. Diophanes the rhetorician was born much later, but Potamon, Lesbocles, Crinagoras, and Theophanes the historian in my time. Theophanes was also a statesman, and he became a friend to Pompey the Great, mostly through his variability, and helped him to succeed in all his achievements, 
whence he not only adorned his native land, partly through Pompey and partly through himself, but also rendered himself the most illustrious of all the Greeks. He left a son, Marcus Pompey, whom Augustus Caesar once set up as procurator of Asia, and who is now counted among the first of the friends of Tiberius. The Athenians were in danger of suffering an irreparable disgrace when they voted that all Mytilenians from youth upward should be slain, but they changed their minds and their counter-decree reached the generals only one day before the order was to be executed. 2.4 Pyrrha has been raised to the ground, but its suburb is inhabited and has a harbour, whence there is a passage of 80 stadia over hills to Mytilene. Then, after Pyrrha, one comes to Eresus, it is situated on a hill and extends down to the sea. Then to Segrium, 28 stadia from Eresus. Both Theophrastus and Phineas, the peripatetic philosophers, disciples of Aristotle, were from Eresus. Theophrastus was at first called Tertimus, but Aristotle changed his name to Theophrastus, at the same time avoiding the cacophony of his name and signifying the fervor of his speech, for Aristotle made all his pupils eloquent, but Theophrastus most eloquent of all. Antissa, a city with a harbor, comes next in order after Segrium. And then Methymna, whence came Arion, who, according to a myth told by Herodotus and his followers, safely escaped on a dolphin to Tynarm after being thrown into the sea by the pirates. Now Arion played, and sang too, the Scythera, and Terpander, also, is said to have been an artist in the same music and to have been born in the same island, having been the first person to use the seven-stringed instead of the four-stringed lyre, as we are told in the verses attributed to him. For the I, having dismissed four-tone song, shall sing new hymns to the tune of a seven-stringed Scythera. Also Hellanicus the historian, and Calias, who interpreted Sappho and Alcaeus, were lesbians. 2.5 In the strait between Asia and Lesbos there are about 20 small islands, but according to Timisthenes, 40. They are called Hecatunzi, a compound name like Peloponnesus, the second letter N being customarily redundant in such compounds, as in the names Myonesis, Proconesis, and Halonesis, and consequently we have Hecatunzi, which means Apollonesi, for Apollo is called Hecatus, for along the whole of this coast, as far as Tenedos, Apollo is highly honored, being called Smynthian or Cilian or Grinian or by some other appellation. Near these islands is Pordosaline, which contains a city of the same name, and also, in front of this city, another island, larger and of the same name, which is uninhabited and has a sanctuary sacred to Apollo. 2.6 Some writers, to avoid the indecency of the names, say that in this place we should read Porosaline, and that we should call Aspordinum, the rocky and barren mountain round Pergamum, Asperinum, and the sanctuary of the mother of the gods there the sanctuary of the Asporine mother. What, then, shall we say of Port Ales and Sapperds and Perdicus, and of the phrase of Simonides, banished, portation clothes and all, instead of wet clothes, and, somewhere in the early comedy, the place is portation, that is, the place that is marshy. Lesbos is equidistant from Tenedos and Limnos and Chios, one might say rather less than 500 stadia. 3.1 Leliges Since the Leliges and the Cilicians were so closely related to the Trojans, people inquire for the reason why they are not included with the Trojans in the catalogue. But it is reasonable to suppose that because of the loss of their leaders and the sacking of their cities the few Cilicians that were left were placed under the command of Hector, for both Aetian and his sons are said to have been slain before the catalogue. Verily my father was slain by the goodly Achilles, who utterly sacked the well-peopled city of Cilicians, Thebe of the lofty gates. And the seven brothers of mine in our halls, all these on the same day went inside the home of Hades, for all were slain by swift-footed, goodly Achilles. And so, in the same way, those subject to Mines lost both their leaders and their city, and he laid low Mines and Epistrophus, and sacked the city of godlike Mines. Ham. Eel. 19. But he makes the Leliges present at the battles when he says as follows, Towards the sea are situated the Carians and the Peonians, with curved bows, and the Leliges and Caucones. And again, he pierced with a sharp spear Satnius, son of Oinops, whom a noble Naiad nymph bore to Oinops, as he tended his herds beside the banks of the Satnius, for they had not so completely disappeared that they did not have a separate organization of their own, since their king still survived, of Altus, who is lord over the war-loving Leliges, and since their city had not been utterly wiped out, for the poet adds, who holds steep pedasus on the Satnius. However, the poet has omitted them in the catalogue, not considering their organization sufficient to have a place in it, or else including them under the command of Hector because they were so closely related, for Lycaon, who was a brother of Hector, says, to a short span of life my mother, daughter of the old man Altus, bore me Altus who was lord over the war-loving Leliges. Such, then, are the probabilities in this matter. 
3.2 and it is also a matter of reasoning from probabilities if one inquires as to the exact bounds to which the poet means that the Cilicians extended, and the Pelasgians, and also the Setians, as they are called, under the command of Eurypolis, who lived between those two peoples. Now as for the Cilicians and the peoples under the command of Eurypolis, all has been said about them that can be said, and that their country is in a general way bounded by the region of the Caicos River. As for the Pelasgians, it is reasonable, both from the words of Homer and from history in general, to place them next in order after these peoples, for Homer says as follows, And Hippothoas led the tribes of the Pelasgians that rage with the spear, them that dwelt in fertile Larissa, these were ruled by Hippothoas and Peleus, scion of Ares, the two sons of Pelasgian Lethus, son of Teutimus. By these words he clearly indicates that the number of Pelasgians was considerable, for he says tribes, not tribe, and he also specifies their abode as in Larissa. Now there are many Larissas, but we must interpret him as meaning one of those that were near, and best of all one might rightly assume the one in the neighborhood of Syme, for of the three Larissas the one near Amaxidus was in plain sight of Ilium and very near it, within a distance of two hundred stadia, and therefore it could not be said with plausibility that Hippothoas fell in the fight over Patroclus far away from this Larissa, but rather from the Larissa near Syme, for the distance between the two is about a thousand stadia. The third Larissa is a village in the territory of Ephesus in the Caster Plain, it is said to have been a city in earlier times, containing a sanctuary of Larissa and Apollo and being situated closer to Mount Molus than to Ephesus. It is 180 stadia distant from Ephesus, and might therefore be placed under the Meonians. But the Ephesians, having grown in power, later cut off for themselves much of the territory of the Meonians, whom we now call Lydians, so that this could not be the Larissa of the Pelasgians either, but rather the one near Syme. In fact we have no strong evidence that the Larissa in the Caster Plain was already in existence at that time, for we have no such evidence as to Ephesus either, but all Aeolian history, which arose but shortly after the Trojan times, bears testimony to the existence of the Larissa near Syme. 3.3 For it is said that the people who set out from Frisham, the Locrian mountain above Thermopylae, put in at the place where Syme now is, and finding the Pelasgians in bad plight because of the Trojan War, though still in possession of Larissa, which was about seventy stadia distant from Syme, built on their frontier what is still today called Neontikos, thirty stadia from Larissa, and that, having captured Larissa, they founded Syme and settled there the survivors. And Syme is called Syme Fraconis after the Locrian mountain, and likewise Larissa is called Larissa Fraconis, but Larissa is now deserted. That the Pelasgians were a great tribe is said also to be the testimony of history in general. Menocrates of Elea, at any rate, in his work on the founding of cities, says that the whole of what is now the Ionian coast, beginning at Mycale, as also the neighboring islands, were in earlier times inhabited by Pelasgians. But the lesbians say that their people were placed under the command of Peleus, the man whom the poet calls the ruler of the Pelasgians, and that it is from him that the mountain in their country is still called Peleus. The Chians, also, say that the Pelasgians from Thessaly were their founders. But the Pelasgian race, ever wandering and quick to migrate, greatly increased and then rapidly disappeared, particularly at the time of the migration of the Aeolians and Ionians to Asia. 3.4 A peculiar thing happened in the case of the Larisians, I mean the Castrian and the Freconian Larisians and, third, those in Thessaly, they all held land that was deposited by rivers, by the Caster and by the Hermus and by the Peneus. It is at the Freconian Larissa that Piasus is said to have been honoured, who, they say, was ruler of the Pelasgians and fell in love with his daughter Larissa, and, having violated her, paid the penalty for the outrage, for, observing him leaning over a cask of wine, they say, she seized him by the legs, raised him, and plunged him into the cask. Such are the ancient accounts. 3.5 To the present Yolian cities we must add e.g., and also Timnus, the birthplace of Hermagoras, who wrote the art of rhetoric. These cities are situated in the mountainous country that lies above the territory of Syme and that of the Phocians and that of the Smyrnians, along which flows the Hermus. Neither is Magnesia, which was under the command of Sepalus and has been adjudged a free city by the Romans, far from these cities. This city too has been damaged by the recent earthquakes. To the opposite parts, which incline towards the Caicos, from Larissa across the Hermus to Syme, the distance is 70 stadia, thence to Myrina, 40 stadia, thence to Grinium, the same, and from there to Elia. But, according to Artemidorus, one goes from Syme to Adae, and then, 40 stadia distant, to a promontory called Hydra, which with the opposite promontory Harmatus forms the Elatic Gulf. Now the width of the mouth of this gulf is about 80 stadia, but, including the sinuosities of the gulf, Myrina, an Aeolian city with a harbour, is at a distance of 60 stadia, and then one comes to the harbour of the Achaeans, where are the altars of the twelve gods, 
and then to a town Grinium and an altar of Apollo and an ancient oracle and a costly temple of white marble, to which the distance is forty stadia, and then seventy stadia to Elia, with harbour and naval station belonging to the Italic kings, which was founded by Menesthes and the Athenians who took the expedition with him to Ilium. I have already spoken of the places that come next, those about Pitany and Atarnius and the others in that region. 3.6 The largest and best of the Aeolian cities is Syme, and this with Lesbos might be called the metropolis of the rest of the cities, about thirty in number, of which not a few have disappeared. Syme is ridiculed for its stupidity, owing to the repute, as some say, that not until three hundred years after the founding of the city did they sell the tolls of the harbour, and that before this time the people did not reap this revenue. They got the reputation, therefore, of being a people who learned late that they were living in a city by the sea. There is also another report of them, that, having borrowed money in the name of the state, they pledged their porticos as security, and then, failing to pay the money on the appointed day, were prohibited from walking in them. When it rained, however, their creditors, through a kind of shame, would bid them through a herald to go under the porticos, so the herald would cry out the words, go under the porticos, but the report went abroad that the Simeons did not understand that they were to go under the porticos when it rained unless they were given notice by the herald. Ephorus, a man indisputably noteworthy, a disciple of Isocrates the Order, and the author of the history and of the work on inventions, was from this city, and so was Hesiod the poet, still earlier than Ephorus, for Hesiod himself states that his father Deus left Aeolian Syme and migrated to Boeotia, and he settled near Helicon in a wretched village, Esker, which is bad in winter, oppressive in summer, and pleasant at no time. But it is not agreed that Homer was from Syme, for many peoples lay claim to him. It is agreed, however, that the name of the city was derived from an Amazon, as was Myrna from the Amazon who lies in the Trojan plain below Batia, which verily men call Batia, but the immortals the tomb of much bounding Myrna. Ephorus, too, is ridiculed because, though unable to tell of deeds of his native land in his enumeration of the other achievements in history, and yet unwilling that it should be unmentioned, he exclaims as follows, at about the same time the Simeons were at peace. Since I have traversed at the same time the Trojan and Aeolian coasts, it would be next in order to treat cursorily the interior as far as the Taurus, observing the same order of approach. 4.1 Pergamum A kind of hegemony is held over these places by Pergamum, which is a famous city and for a long time prospered along with the Italic kings, indeed I must begin my next description here, and first I must show briefly the origin of the kings and the end to which they came. Now Pergamum was a treasure hold of Lysimachus, the son of Agathocles, who was one of the successors of Alexander, and its people are settled on the very summit of the mountain, the mountain is cone-like and ends in a sharp peak. The custody of this stronghold and the treasure, which amounted to nine thousand talents, was entrusted to Philetaris of Tyum, who was a eunuch from boyhood, for it came to pass at a certain burial, when a spectacle was being given at which many people were present, that the nurse who was carrying Philetaris, still an infant, was caught in the crowd and pressed so hard that the child was incapacitated. He was a eunuch, therefore, but he was well trained and proved worthy of this trust. Now for a time he continued loyal to Lysimachus, but he had differences with Arsinoe, the wife of Lysimachus, who slandered him, and so he caused Pergamum to revolt, and governed it to suit the occasion, since he saw that it was ripe for a change, for Lysimachus, beset with domestic troubles, was forced to slay his son Agathocles, and Seleucus Nicator invaded his country and overthrew him, and then he himself was overthrown and treacherously murdered by Ptolemy Cyrannus. During these disorders the eunuch continued to be in charge of the fortress and to manage things through promises and courtesies in general, always catering to any man who was powerful or near at hand. At any rate, he continued lord of the stronghold and the treasure for twenty years. 4.2 He had two brothers, the elder of whom was Eumenes, the younger Attalus. Eumenes had a son of the same name, who succeeded to the rule of Pergamum, and was by this time sovereign of the places round about, so that he even joined battle with Antiochus the son of Seleucus near Sardis and conquered him. He died after a reign of twenty-two years. Attalus, the son of Attalus and Antiochus, daughter of Achaeus, succeeded to the throne and was the first to be proclaimed king, after conquering the Galatians in a great battle. Attalus not only became a friend of the Romans but also fought on their side against Philip along with the fleet of the Rhodians. He died in old age, having reigned as king forty-three years, and he left four sons by Apollonius, a woman from Cyzicus, Eumenes, Attalus, Philetaris, and Athenaeus. Now the two younger sons remained private citizens, but Eumenes, the elder of the other two, reigned as king. Eumenes fought on the side of the Romans against Antiochus the Great and against Perseus, and he received from the Romans all the country this side the Taurus that had been subject to Antiochus. 
But before that time the territory of Pergamum did not include many places that extended as far as the sea at the Elatic and Adromedine Gulfs. He built up the city and planted Nisiphorium with a grove, and the other elder brother, from love of splendor, added sacred buildings and libraries and raised the settlement of Pergamum to what it now is. After a reign of forty-nine years Eumenes left his empire to Attalus, his son by Stratonice, the daughter of Ariathers, king of the Cappadocians. He appointed his brother Attalus as guardian both of his son, who was extremely young, and of the empire. After a reign of twenty-one years, his brother died an old man, having won success in many undertakings. For example, he helped Demetrius, the son of Seleucus, to defeat in war Alexander, the son of Antiochus, and he fought on the side of the Romans against the pseudo-Philip, and in an expedition against Thrace he defeated Degelis the king of the Cini, and he slew Prusias, having incited his son Nicomedes against him, and he left his empire, under a guardian, to Attalus. Attalus, surnamed Philometer, reigned five years, died of disease, and left the Romans his heirs. The Romans proclaimed the country a province, calling it Asia, by the same name as the continent. The Caicus flows past Pergamum, through the Caicus Plain, as it is called, traversing land that is very fertile and about the best in Mysia. 4.3 Pergamenians have become famous in my time, Mithridates the son of Monodotus and of Adobogen. Monodotus was of the family of the Tetrarch of the Galatians, and Adobogen, it is said, was also the concubine of King Mithridates, and for this reason her relatives gave to the child the name of Mithridates, pretending that he was the son of the king. At any rate, he became a friend to the deified Caesar and reached so great preferment with him that he was appointed tetrarch from his mother's family and king both of the Bosporus and other territories. He was overthrown by Asander, who not only slew King Pharnaces but also took possession of the Bosporus. Mithridates, then, has been thought worthy of a great name, as has also Apollodorus the rhetorician, who wrote the work on rhetoric and was the leader of the Apollodorian sect, whatever in the world it is, for numerous philosophies were prevalent, but to pass judgment upon them is beyond my power, and among these are the sects of Apollodorus and Theodorus. But the friendship of Augustus Caesar has most of all exalted Apollodorus, who was his teacher in the art of speech. And Apollodorus had a notable pupil in Dionysius, surnamed Atticus, his fellow citizen, for he was an able sophist and historian and speechwriter. 4.4 As one proceeds from the plain and the city towards the east, one comes to a city called Apollonia, which lies on an elevated site, and also, towards the south, to a mountain range, on crossing which, on the road to Sardis, one comes to Thyatira, on the left-hand side, a settlement of the Macedonians, which by some is called the farthermost city of the Mysians. On the right is Apollonis, which is 300 stadia distant from Pergamum, and the same distance from Sardis, and it is named after the Cyzacene Apollonis. Next one comes to the plain of Hermas and to Sardis. The country to the north of Pergamum is held for the most part by the Mysians, I mean the country on the right of the Abaeti, as they are called, on the borders of which is the Epictetus as far as Bithynia. 4.5 Sardis is a great city, and, though of later date than the Trojan times, is nevertheless old, and has a strong citadel. It was the royal city of the Lydians, whom the poet calls Myonians, and later writers call them Myonians, some identifying them with the Lydians and others representing them as different, but it is better to call them the same people. Above Sardis is situated Mount Molus, a blessed mountain, with a lookout on its summit, an arcade of white marble, a work of the Persians, whence there is a view of the plains below all round, particularly the Caster Plain. And round it dwell Lydians and Mysians and Macedonians. The Pactolus River flows from Mount Molus, in early times a large quantity of gold dust was brought down in it, whence, it is said, arose the fame of the riches of Croesus and his descendants. But the gold dust is given out. The Pactolus runs down into the Hermus, into which also the Hillus, now called the Phrygius, empties. These three, and other less significant rivers with them, meet and empty into the sea near Phocia, as Herodotus says. The Hermus rises in Mysia, in the sacred mountain Dindemony, and flows through the Catechecomeni country into the territory of Sardis and the contiguous plains, as I have already said, to the sea. Below the city lie the plain of Sardis and that of the Cyrus and that of the Hermus and that of the Caster, which are contiguous to one another and are the best of all plains. Within forty stadia from the city one comes to Jigia, which is mentioned by the poet, the name of which was later changed to Kaloe, where is the sanctuary of Kalinian Artemis, which is characterized by great holiness. They say that at the festivals here the baskets dance, though I do not know why in the world they talk marvels rather than tell the truth. 4.6 The verses of Homer are about as follows, Mnestles and Anaphis, the two sons of Talimenes, whose mother was Lake Jigia, who led also the Myonians, who were born at the foot of Molus, but some add the following fourth verse, at the foot of snowy Molus, in the fertile land of Hyde. 
but there is no hide to be found in the country of the Lydians. Some also put Tychius there, of whom the poet says, far the best of workers in hide, who lived in hide. And they add that the place is woody and subject to strokes of lightning, and that the Arimi live there, for after Homer's verse, in the land of the Arimi where men say is the couch of Typhon, they insert the words, in a wooded place, in the fertile land of Hyde. But others lay the scene of this myth in Cilicia, and some lay it in Syria, and still others in the Pithecusi islands, who say that among the Tyrrhenians Pithecusi are called Arimi. Some call Sardis Hyde, while others call its Acropolis Hyde. But the Skepsian thinks that those writers are most plausible who place the Arimi in the Catechecomeni country in Mysia. But Pindar associates the Pithecusi which lie off the Simian territory, as also the territory in Sicily, with the territory in Cilicia, for he says that Typhon lies beneath Etna, once he dwelt in a far-famed Cilician cavern. Now, however, his shaggy breast is oppressed by the Seagirt shores above Cumi and by Sicily. And again, round about him lies Etna with her haughty fetters, and again, but it was Father Zeus that once amongst the Arimi, by necessity, alone of the gods, smote monstrous Typhon of the fifty heads. But some understand that the Syrians are Arimi, who are now called the Arimeans, and that the Cilicians in Troy, forced to migrate, settled again in Syria and cut off for themselves what is now called Cilicia. Callisthenes says that the Arimi, after whom the neighboring mountains are called Arima, are situated near Mount Calicidnus and the promontory of Sarpedon near the Carician cave itself. 4.7 Near Lake Chloe are the monuments of the kings. At Sardis is the great mound, on a lofty base, of al Yats, built, as Herodotus says, by the common people of the city, most of the work on which was done by prostitutes, and he says that all women of that country prostituted themselves, and some call the tomb of Aliats a monument of prostitution. Some report that Lake Chloe is an artificial lake, made to receive the overflows which take place when the rivers are full. Hypaipa is a city which one comes to on the descent from Mount Molus to the Caster Plain. 4.8 Callisthenes says that Sardis was captured first by the Sumerians, and then by the Traers and the Lycians, as is set forth by Callinus the elegiac poet, and lastly in the time of Cyrus and Croesus. But when Callinus says that the incursion of the Sumerians was against the Asianis, at the time of which Sardis was captured, the Skepsian and his followers surmise that the Asianis were by Callinus called the Asianis, in the Ionic dialect, for perhaps Myonia, he says, was called Asia, and accordingly Homer likewise says, on the Asian meat about the streams of the Caster. The city was later restored in a notable way because of the fertility of its territory, and was inferior to none of its neighbors, though recently it has lost many of its buildings through earthquakes. However, the forethought of Tiberius, our present ruler, has, by his beneficence, restored not only this city but many others I mean all the cities that shared in the same misfortune at about the same time. 4.9 Notable men of the same family were born at Sardis, the two Diodoruses, the Orders, of whom the elder was called Zonus, a man who many times pleaded the cause of Asia, and at the time of the attack of King Mithridates, he was accused of trying to cause the cities to revolt from him, but in his defense he acquitted himself of the slander. The younger Diodorus, who was a friend of mine, is the author, not only of many historical treatises, but also of Melek and other poems, which display full well the ancient style of writing. Xanthus, the ancient historian, is indeed called a Lydian, but whether or not he was from Sardis I do not know. 4.10 After the Lydians come the Mysians, and the city Philadelphia, ever subject to earthquakes. Incessantly the walls of the houses are cracked, different parts of the city being thus affected at different times. For this reason but few people live in the city, and most of them spend their lives as farmers in the country, since they have a fertile soil. Yet one may be surprised at the few, that they are so fond of the place when their dwellings are so insecure, and one might marvel still more at those who founded the city. 4.11 After this region one comes to the Catechecomeni country, as it is called, which has a length of 500 stadia and a breadth of 400, whether it should be called Mysia or Myonia, for both names are used, the whole of it is without trees except the vine that produces the Catechecomenite wine, which in quality is inferior to none of the notable wines. The surface of the plain is covered with ashes, and the mountainous and rocky country is black, as though from conflagration. Now some conjecture that this resulted from thunderbolts and from fiery subterranean outbursts, and they do not hesitate to lay there the scene of the mythical story of Typhon, and Xanthus adds that a certain Aramis was king of this region, but it is not reasonable to suppose that all that country was burnt all at once by reason of such disturbances, but rather by reason of an earth-born fire, the sources of which have now been exhausted. Three pits are to be seen there, which are called bellows, and they are forty stadia distant from each other. Above them lie rugged hills, which are reasonably supposed to have been heaped up by the hot masses blown forth from the earth. 
that such soil should be well adapted to the vine one might assume from the land of Katana, which was heaped with ashes and now produces excellent wine in great plenty. Some writers, judging from places like this, wittily remark that there is good reason for calling Dionysus Pyrogenes. 4.12 The part situated next to this region towards the south as far as the Taurus are so enwoven with one another that the Phrygian and the Carian and the Lydian parts, as also those of the Mysians, since they merge into one another, are hard to distinguish. To this confusion no little has been contributed by the fact that the Romans did not divide them according to tribes, but in another way organized their jurisdictions, within which they hold their popular assemblies and their courts. Mount Molus is a quite contracted mass of mountain and is only a moderate circumference, its limits lying within the territory of the Lydians themselves, but the Messages extends in the opposite direction as far as Mycale, beginning at Selene, according to Theopompus. And therefore some parts of it are occupied by the Phrygians, I mean the parts near Selene and Apamea, and other parts by Mysians and Lydians, and other parts by Carians and Ionians. So, also, the rivers, particularly the Meander, form the boundary between some of the tribes, but in cases where they flow through the middle of countries they make accurate distinction difficult. And the same is to be said of the plains that are situated on either side of the mountainous territory and of the riverland. Neither should I, perhaps, attend to such matters as closely as a surveyor must, but sketch them only so far as they have been transmitted by my predecessors. 4.13 Contiguous on the east to the Caster Plain, which lies between the Messages and the Molus, is the Silbian Plain. It is extensive and well settled and has a fertile soil. Then comes the Hyrcanian Plain, a name given it by the Persians, who brought Hyrcanian colonists there, the Plain of Cyrus, likewise, was given its name by the Persians. Then come the Peltine Plain, we are now in Phrygian territory, and the Selanian and the Tabine Plains, which have towns with a mixed population of Phrygians, these towns also containing a Pisidian element, and it is after these that the plains themselves were named. 4.14 When one crosses over the Messages, between the Carians and the territory of Nyssa, which latter is a country on the far side of the Meander extending to Sibiridus and Cabalus, one comes to certain cities. First, near the Messages, opposite Laodicea, to Heropolis, where are the hot springs and the Plutonian, both of which have something marvelous about them, for the water of the spring so easily congeals and changes into stone that people conduct streams of it through ditches and thus make stone fences consisting of single stones, while the Plutonian, Below a small brow of the mountainous country that lies above it, is an opening of only moderate size, large enough to admit a man, but it reaches a considerable depth, and it is enclosed by a quadrilateral handrail, about half a plethrum in circumference, and this space is full of a vapour so misty and dense that one can scarcely see the ground. Now to those who approach the handrail anywhere round the enclosure the air is harmless, since the outside is free from that vapour in calm weather, for the vapour then stays inside the enclosure, but any animal that passes inside meets instant death. At any rate, bulls that are led into it fall and are dragged out dead, and I threw in sparrows and they immediately breathed their last and fell. But the galley, who are eunuchs, pass inside with such impunity that they even approach the opening, bend over it, and descend into it to a certain depth, though they hold their breath as much as they can, for I could see in their countenances an indication of a kind of suffocating attack, as it were, whether this immunity belongs to all who are maimed in this way or only to those round the sanctuary or whether it is because of divine providence, as would be likely in the case of divine obsessions, or whether it is, the result of certain physical powers that are antidotes against the vapour. The changing of water into stone is said also to be the case with the rivers in Laodicea, although their water is potable. The water at Heropolis is remarkably adapted also to the dyeing of wool, so that wool dyed with the roots rival those dyed with the caucus or with the marine purple. And the supply of water is so abundant that the city is full of natural baths. 4.15 4.15 After Heropolis one comes to the parts on the far side of the Meander, I have already described those round Laodicea and Aphrodisias and those extending as far as Carura. The next thereafter are the parts towards the west, I mean the city of the Antiochians on the Meander, where one finds himself already in Caria, and also the parts towards the south, I mean greater Sibiro and Sinda and Cabalus, extending as far as the Taurus and Lycia. Now Antiochia is a city of moderate size, and is situated on the Meander itself in the region that lies near Phrygia, and there is a bridge over the river. Antiochia has considerable territory on each side of the river, which is everywhere fertile, and it produces in greatest quantities the Antiochian dried fig, as it is called, though they also name the same fig three-leaved. This region, too, is much subject to earthquakes. Among these people arose a famous sophist, Diotrephes, whose complete course was taken by Hybrias, who became the greatest order of my time. 4.16 The Cabales are said to be the Salome, at any rate, the hill that lies above the fortress of the Termasians is called Salamis, 
and the Termasians themselves are called Salome. Nearby is the palisade of Bellerophon, and also the tomb of his son Pisander, who fell in the battle against the Salome. This account agrees also with the words of the poet, for he says of Bellerophon, next he fought with the glorious Salome, and of his son, and Pisander his son was slain by Ares, in satiate of war, when he was fighting with the Salome. Termasus is a Pisidian city, which lies directly above Sibiro and very near it. 4.17 It is said that the Sibirati are descendants of the Lydians who took possession of Cabalus, and later of the neighboring Pisidians, who settled there and transferred the city to another site, a site very strongly fortified and about 100 stadia in circuit. It grew strong through its good laws, and its villages extended alongside it from Pisidia and the neighboring Milias as far as Lycia and the Perea of the Rhodians. Three bordering cities were added to it, Buban, Balbura, and Inayandan, and the union was called Tetrapolis, each of the three having one vote, but Sibiro too, for Sibiro could send forth 30,000 foot soldiers and 2,000 horse. It was always ruled by tyrants, but still they ruled it with moderation. However, the tyranny ended in the time of Mojits, when Morena overthrew it and included Balbura and Buban within the territory of the Lycians. But nonetheless the jurisdiction of Sibiro is rated among the greatest in Asia. The Sibirati used four languages, the Pisidian, that of the Salome, Greek, and that of the Lydians, but there is not even a trace of the language of the Lydians in Lydia. The easy embossing of iron is a peculiar thing at Sibiro. Milia is the mountain range extending from the narrows at Termasus and from the pass that leads over through them to the region inside the Taurus towards Asinda, as far as Sigalassus and the country of the Apameans. Book 14. 1.1 .1 Ionia It remains for me to speak of the Ionians and the Carians and the seaboard outside the Taurus, which last is occupied by Lycians, Pamphylians, and Cilicians, for in this way I can finish my entire description of the peninsula, the isthmus of which, as I was saying, is the road which leads over from the Pontic Sea to the Issean Sea. 1.2 The coasting voyage round Ionia is about 3,430 stadia, this distance being so great because of the gulfs and the fact that the country forms a peninsula of unusual extent, but the distance in a straight line across the isthmus is not great. For instance, merely the distance from Ephesus to Smyrna is a journey, in a straight line, of 320 stadia, for the distance to Metropolis is 120 stadia and the remainder to Smyrna, whereas the coasting voyage is but slightly short of 2,200. Be that as it may, the bounds of the Ionian coast extend from the Poseidium of the Milesians, and from the Carian frontiers, as far as Phocia and the Hermus River, which latter is the limit of the Ionian seaboard. 1.3 Pharisaid says concerning this seaboard that Miletus and Myas and the parts round Mycale and Ephesus were in earlier times occupied by Carians, and that the coast next thereafter, as far as Phocia and Chios and Samos, which were ruled by Anchias, was occupied by Lelages, but that both were driven out by the Ionians and took refuge in the remaining parts of Caria. He says that Androclus, legitimate son of Codrus the king of Athens, was the leader of the Ionian colonization, which was later than the Aeolian, and that he became the founder of Ephesus, and for this reason, it is said, the royal seat of the Ionians was established there. And still now the descendants of his family are called kings, and they have certain honors, I mean the privilege of front seats at the games and of wearing purple robes as insignia of royal descent, and staff instead of scepter, and of the superintendence of the sacrifices in honor of the Eleusinian Demeter. Miletus was founded by Neleus, a Pylian by birth. The Messenians and the Pylians pretend a kind of kinship with one another, according to which the more recent poets call Nestor a Messenian, and they say that many of the Pylians accompanied Melanthus, father of Codrus, and his followers to Athens, and that, accordingly, all this people sent forth the colonizing expedition in common with the Ionians. There is an altar, erected by Neleus, to be seen on the Poseidium. Myas was founded by Sidralus, bastard son of Codrus, Lebedus by Andropompus, who seized a place called Artus, Colophon by Andreman Apilion, according to Mimnermus in his Nano, Priene by Epidus the son of Neleus, and then later by Philetus, who brought a colony from Thebes, Teos, at first by Athamas, for which reason it is by Anacreon called Athamantus, and at the time of the Ionian colonization by Nauclus, bastard son of Codrus, and after him by Apicus and Damasus, who were Athenians, and Gears, a Boeotian, Erythrae by Canopus, he too a bastard son of Codrus, Phocia by the Athenians under Philogenes, Clasimenae by Parlus, Chios by Egertius, who brought with him a mixed crowd, Samos by Tembrian, and then later by Procles. 1.4 These are the twelve Ionian cities, but at a later time Smyrna was added, being induced by the Ephesians to join the Ionian League, for the Ephesians were fellow inhabitants of the Smyrnians in ancient times, when Ephesus was also called Smyrna. And Kalinas somewhere so names it, 
when he calls the Ephesians Smyrnians in the prayer to Zeus, and pity the Smyrnians, and again, remember, if ever the Smyrnians burnt up beautiful thighs of oxen in sacrifice to thee. Smyrna was an Amazon who took possession of Ephesus, and hence the name both of the inhabitants and of the city, just as certain of the Ephesians were called Cisurbidi after Cisurb. Also a certain place belonging to Ephesus was called Smyrna, as Hipponax plainly indicates, he lived behind the city in Smyrna between Trachea and Lepra Oct, for the name Lepra Oct was given to Mount Prion, which lies above the present city and has honored a part of the city's wall. At any rate, the possessions behind Prion are still now referred to as in the Opistolprian territory, and the country alongside the mountain round Curacis was called Trachea. The city was in ancient times round the Athenian, which is now outside the city near the High Peleus, as it is called, so that Smyrna was near the present gymnasium, behind the present city, but between Trachea and Lepra Oct. On departing from the Ephesians, the Smyrnians marched to the place where Smyrna now is, which was in the possession of the Lelages, and, having driven them out, they founded the ancient Smyrna, which is about twenty stadia distant from the present Smyrna. But later, being driven out by the Aeolians, they fled for refuge to Colophon, and then with the Colophonians returned to their own land and took it back, as Mimnermus tells us in his Nano, after recalling that Smyrna was always an object of contention. After we left Pylos, the steep city of Neleus, we came by ship to lovely Asia, and with our overweening might settled in beloved Colophon, taking the initiative in grievous insolence. And from there, setting out from the Astias River, by the will of the gods we took Aeolian Smyrna. So much, then, on this subject. But I must again go over the several parts in detail, beginning with the principal places, those where the foundings first took place, I mean those round Miletus and Ephesus, for these are the best and most famous cities. 1.5 Next after the Poseidium of the Milesians, 18 Stadia inland, is the oracle of Apollo Didymius among the Branchidae. It was set on fire by Xerxes, as were also the other sanctuaries, except that at Ephesus. The Branchidae gave over the treasures of the god to the Persian king, and accompanied him in his flight in order to escape punishment for the robbing and the betrayal of the sanctuary. But later the Milesians erected the largest temple in the world, though on account of its size it remained without a roof. At any rate, the circuit of the sacred enclosure holds a village settlement, and there is a magnificent sacred grove both inside and outside the enclosure, and other sacred enclosures contain the oracle and sacred things. Here is laid the scene of the myth of Brancus and the love of Apollo. It is adorned with costliest offerings consisting of early works of art. Thence to the city is no long journey, by land or by sea. 1.6 Ephorus says, Miletus was first founded and fortified above the sea by the Cretans, where the Miletos of olden times is now situated, being settled by Sarpedon, who brought colonists from the Cretan Miletos and named the city after that Miletus, the place formerly being in the possession of the Lelages, but later Neleus and his followers fortified the present city. The present city has four harbours, one of which is large enough for a fleet. Many are the achievements of this city, but the greatest is the number of its colonizations, for the Euxin Pontus has been colonized everywhere by these people, as also the Propontis and several other regions. At any rate, Anaximenes of Lampsicus says that the Milesians colonized the islands Icaros and Leros, and, near the Hellespont, Limni and the Chersonesus, as also Abydus and Arisba and Pisis in Asia, and Artis and Cyzicus in the island of the Cyzacini, and Skepsis in the interior of the Troad. I, however, in my detailed description speak of the other cities, which have been omitted by him. Both Milesians and Delians invoke an Apollo Iulius, that is, as god of health and healing, for the verb Uline means to be healthy, whence the noun Ule and the salutation, both health and great joy to thee, for Apollo is the god of healing. And Artemis has her name from the fact that she makes people Artemis. And both Helios and Selene are closely associated with these, since they are the causes of the temperature of the air and both pestilential diseases and sudden deaths are imputed to these gods. 1.7 Notable men were born at Miletus, Thales, one of the seven wise men, the first to begin the science of natural philosophy and mathematics among the Greeks, and his pupil Anaximander, and again the pupil of the latter, Anaximenes, and also Hecateus, the author of the history, and, in my time, Iskines the Order, who remained in exile to the end, since he spoke freely, beyond moderation, before Pompey the Great but the city was unfortunate, since it shut its gates against Alexander and was taken by force, as was also the case with Halicarnassus, and also, before that time, it was taken by the Persians. And Callisthenes says that Phrynichus the tragic poet was fined a thousand drachmas by the Athenians because he wrote a play entitled The Capture of Miletus by Darius. The island laid lies close in front of Miletus, as do also the isles in the neighborhood of the Tragedy, which afford anchorage for pirates. 1.8 Next comes the Latmian Gulf, 
on which is situated Heraclea below Latmus, as it is called, a small town that has an anchoring place. It was at first called Latmus, the same name as the mountain that lies above it, which Hecateus indicates, in his opinion, to be the same as that which by the poet is called the mountain of the Phthares, for he says that the mountain of the Phthares lies above Latmus, though some say that it is Mount Grium, which is approximately parallel to Latmus and extends inland from Milesia towards the east through Caria to Euromus and Chalcedors. This mountain lies above Heraclea, and at a high elevation. At a slight distance away from it, after one has crossed a little river near Latmus, there is to be seen the sepulchre of Endymion, in a cave. Then from Heraclea to Pyrrha, a small town, there is a voyage of about 100 stadia. 1.9 But the voyage from Miletus to Heraclea, including the sinuosities of the gulfs, is a little more than 100 stadia, though that from Miletus to Pyrrha, in a straight course, is only 30 so much longer as the journey along the coast. But in the case of famous places my reader must needs endure the dry part of such geography as this. 1.10 The voyage from Pyrrha to the outlet of the Meander River is 50 stadia, a place which consists of shallows and marshes, and, traveling in rowboats 30 stadia, one comes to the city Myas, one of the twelve Ionian cities, which, on account of its sparse population, has now been incorporated into Miletus. Xerxes is said to have given this city to Themistocles to supply him with fish, Magnesia to supply him with bread, and Lampsicus with wine. 1.11 Thence, within four stadia, one comes to a village, the Carian Thymbria, near which is Aornum, a sacred cave, which is called Coronium, since it emits deadly vapors. Above it lies Magnesia on the Meander, a colony of the Magnesians of Thessaly and the Cretans, of which I shall soon speak. 1.12 After the outlets of the Meander comes the shore of Priene, above which lies Priene, and also the mountain Mycale, which is well supplied with wild animals and with trees. This mountain lies above the Semyon territory and forms with it, on the far side of the promontory called Trogilion, a strait about seven stadia in width. Priene is by some writers called Cadm, since Philetus, who founded it, was a Boeotian. Bias, one of the seven wise men, was a native of Priene, of whom Hipponax says stronger in the pleading of his cases than Bias of Priene. 1.13 Off the Trogilian promontory lies an isle of the same name. Thence the nearest passage across to Sunio is 1,600 stadia. On the voyage one has at first Samos and Icaria and Corsia on the right, and the Melantian rocks on the left, and the remainder of the voyage is through the midst of the Cyclades Islands. The Trogilian promontory itself is a kind of spur of Mount Mycale. Close to Mycale lies another mountain, in the Ephesian territory, I mean Mount Pactis, in which the messages terminates. 1.14 The distance from the Trogilian promontory to Samos is 40 stadia. Samos faces the south, both it and its harbour, which latter has a naval station. The greater part of it is on level ground, being washed by the sea, but a part of it reaches up into the mountain that lies above it. Now on the right, as one sails towards the city, is the Poseidium, a promontory which with Mount Mycale forms the seven stadia strait, and it has a temple of Poseidon, and in front of it lies an all called Narthesis, and on the left is the suburb near the Horaeon, and also the Imbrasus River, and the Horaeon, an ancient sanctuary and large temple, which is now a picture gallery. Apart from the number of the paintings placed inside, there are other picture galleries and some little temples, Naskoi, full of ancient art. And the area open to the sky is likewise full of most excellent statues. Of these, three of colossal size, the work of Myron, stood upon one base, Antony took these statues away, but Augustus Caesar restored two of them, those of Athena and Heracles, to the same base, although he transferred the Zeus to the Capitolium, having erected there a small chapel for that statue. 1.15 The voyage round the island of the Samians is 600 stadia. In earlier times, when it was inhabited by Carians, it was called Parthenia, then Anthemus, then Melamphilus, and then Samos, whether after some native hero or after someone who colonized it from Ithaca and Cephalonia. Now in Samos there is a promontory approximately facing Drepanum in Icaria which is called Ampelus, but the entire mountain which makes the whole of the island mountainous is called by the same name. The island does not produce good wine, although good wine is produced by the islands all round, and although most of the whole of the adjacent mainland produces the best of wines, for example, Chios and Lesbos and Cus. And indeed the Ephesian and Metropolitan wines are good, and Mount Messages and Mount Molus and the Catechecomeni country and Nidus and Smyrna and other less significant places produce exceptionally good wine, whether for enjoyment or medicinal purposes. Now Samos is not altogether fortunate in regard to wines, but in all other respects it is a blessed country, as is clear from the fact that it became an object of contention and war, and also from the fact that those who praise it do not hesitate to apply to it the proverb that it produces even bird's milk, 
as Menander somewhere says. This was also the cause of the establishment of the tyrannies there, and of their enmity against the Athenians. 1.16 Now the tyrannies reached their greatest height in the time of Polycrates and his brother Silosin. Polycrates was such a brilliant man, both in his good fortune and in his natural ability, that he gained supremacy over the sea, and it is set down, as a sign of his good fortune, that he purposely flung into the sea his ring, a ring of very costly stone and engraving, and that a little later one of the fishermen brought him the very fish that swallowed it, and that when the fish was cut open the ring was found, and that on learning this the king of the Egyptians, it is said, declared in a kind of prophetic way that any man who had been exalted so highly in welfare would shortly come to no happy end of life, and indeed this is what happened, for he was captured by treachery by the satrap of the Persians and hanged. Anacre and the Melic poet lived in companionship with Polycrates, and indeed the whole of his poetry is full of his praises. It was in his time, as we are told, that Pythagoras, seeing that the tyranny was growing in power, left the city and went off to Egypt and Babylon, to satisfy his fondness for learning, but when he came back and saw that the tyranny still endured, he set sail for Italy and lived there to the end of his life. So much for Polycrates. 1.17 Silosin was left a private citizen by his brother, but to gratify Darius, the son of Hestaspes, he gave him a robe which Darius desired when he saw him wearing it, and Darius at that time was not yet king, but when Darius became king, Silosin received as a return gift the tyranny of Samos. But he ruled so harshly that the city became depopulated, and thence arose the proverb, by the will of Silosin there is plenty of room. 1.18 The Athenians at first sent Pericles as general and with him Sophocles the poet, who by a siege put the disobedient Samians in bad plight, but later they sent two thousand Alates from their own people, among whom was Neocles, the father of Epicurus the philosopher, a schoolmaster as they call him. And indeed it is said that Epicurus grew up here and in Teos, and that he became an Ephebus at Athens, and that Menander the comic poet became an Ephebus at the same time. Creophilus, also, was a Simeon, who, it is said, once entertained Homer and received as a gift from him the inscription of the poem called The Capture of Oihalia. But Callimachus clearly indicates dot the contrary in an epigram of his, meaning that Creophilus composed the poem, but that it was ascribed to Homer because of the story of the hospitality shown him, I am the toil of the Simeon, who once entertained in his house the divine Homer. I bemoan Eurydice, for all that he suffered, and golden-haired Aeolia. I am called Homer's writing. For Creophilus, dear Zeus, this is a great achievement. Some call Creophilus Homer's teacher, while others say that it was not Creophilus, but Aristeus the Proconsian, who was his teacher. 1.19 Alongside Samos lies the island Icaria, whence was derived the name of the Icarian Sea. This island is named after Icarus the son of Daedalus, who, it is said, having joined his father in flight, both being furnished with wings, flew away from Crete and fell here, having lost control of their course, for, they add, on rising too close to the sun, his wings slipped off, since the wax melted. The whole island is 300 stadia in perimeter, it has no harbours, but only places of anchorage, the best of which is called Histi. It has a promontory which extends towards the west. There is also on the island a sanctuary of Artemis, called Toropolium, and a small town Oino, and another small town Dracanum, bearing the same name as the promontory on which it is situated and having nearby a place of anchorage. The promontory is 80 stadia distant from the promontory of the Samians called Cantharius, which is the shortest distance between the two. At the present time, however, it has but few inhabitants left, and is used by Samians mostly for the grazing of cattle. 1.20 After the Samian Strait, near Mount Mycale, as one sails to Ephesus, one comes, on the right, to the seaboard of the Ephesians, and a part of this seaboard is held by the Samians. First on the seaboard is the Ponionium, lying three stadia above the sea where the Pan-Ionian, a common festival of the Ionians, are held, and where sacrifices are performed in honour of the Heliconian Poseidon, and Prenians serve as priests at this sacrifice, but I have spoken of them in my account of the Peloponnesus. Then comes Neapolis, which in earlier times belonged to the Ephesians, but now belongs to the Samians, who gave in exchange for it Marathesium, the more distant for the nearer place. Then comes Pigela, a small town, with a sanctuary of Artemis Munyakia, founded by Agamemnon and inhabited by a part of his troops, for it is said that some of his soldiers became afflicted with a disease of the buttocks and were called diseased buttocks, and that, being afflicted with this disease, they stayed there, and that the place thus received this appropriate name. Then comes the harbour called Panormus, with a sanctuary of the Ephesian Artemis, and then the city Ephesus. On the same coast, slightly above the sea, is also Ortigia, which is a magnificent grove of all kinds of trees, of the Cyprus most of all. It is traversed by the Sucreus River, where Leto is said to have bathed herself after her travail. 
For here is the mythical scene of the birth, and of the nurse Ortigia, and of the holy place where the birth took place, and of the olive tree nearby, where the goddess is said first to have taken a rest after she was relieved from her travail. Above the grove lies Mount Solmises, where, it is said, the Curiti stationed themselves, and with the din of their arms frightened Hera out of her wits when she was jealously spying on Leto, and when they helped Leto to conceal from Hera the birth of her children. There are several temples in the place, some ancient and others built in later times, and in the ancient temples are many ancient wooden images, Zoana, but in those of later times there are works of Scopus, for example, Leto holding a scepter and Ortigia standing beside her, with a child in each arm. A general festival is held there annually, and by a certain custom the youths vie for honor, particularly in the splendor of their banquets there. At that time, also, a special college of the Curetes holds symposiums and performs certain mystic sacrifices. 1.21 The city of Ephesus was inhabited both by Carians and by Lelages, but Androclus drove them out and settled the most of those who had come with him round the Athenian and the High Peleus, though he also included a part of the country situated on the slopes of Mount Carissus. Now Ephesus was thus inhabited until the time of Croesus, but later the people came down from the mountainside and abode round the present sanctuary until the time of Alexander. Lysimachus built a wall round the present city, but the people were not agreeably disposed to change their abodes to it, and therefore he waited for a downpour of rain and himself took advantage of it and blocked the sewers so as to inundate the city, and the inhabitants were then glad to make the change. He named the city after his wife Arsinoe, the old name, however, prevailed. There was a senate, which was conscripted, and with these were associated the epicalty, as they were called, who administered all the affairs of the city. 1.22 As for the temple of Artemis, its first architect was Chersiphron, and then another man made it larger. But when it was set on fire by a certain Herostratus, the citizens erected another and better one, having collected the ornaments of the women and their own individual belongings, and having sold also the pillars of the former temple. Testimony is borne to these facts by the decrees that were made at that time. Artemidorus says, Timaeus of Torimenium, being ignorant of these decrees and being any way an envious and slanderous fellow, for which reason he was also called Epitomius, says that they exacted means for the restoration of the temple from the treasures deposited in their care by the Persians, but there were no treasures on deposit in their care at that time, and, even if there had been, they would have been burned along with the temple, and after the fire, when the roof was destroyed, who could have wished to keep deposits of treasure lying in a sacred enclosure that was open to the sky? Now Alexander, Artemidorus adds, promised the Ephesians to pay all expenses, both past and future, on condition that he should have the credit therefore on the inscription, but they were unwilling, just as they would have been far more unwilling to acquire glory by sacrilege and temple plundering. And Artemidorus praises the Ephesian who said to the king that it was inappropriate for a god to dedicate offerings to gods. 1.23 After the completion of the temple of Artemis, which, he says, was the work of Charocrates, the same man who built Alexandria and the same man who proposed to Alexander to fashion Mount Athos into his likeness, representing him as pouring a libation from a kind of ewer into a broad bowl, and to make two cities, one on the right of the mountain and the other on the left, and a river flowing from one to the other, after the completion of the temple, he says, the great number of dedications in general were secured by means of the high honor they paid their artists, but the whole of the altar was filled, one might say, with the works of Praxiteles. They showed me also some of the works of Thracen, who made the chapel of Hecate, the waxen image of Penelope, and the old woman Euryclea. They had eunuchs as priests, whom they called Megabyzi. And they were always in quest of persons from other places who were worthy of this preferment, and they held them in great honor. And it was obligatory for maidens to serve as colleagues with them in their priestly office. But though at the present some of their usages are being preserved, yet others are not, but the sanctuary remains a place of refuge, the same as in earlier times, although the limits of the refuge have often been changed, for example, when Alexander extended them for a stadium, and when Mithridates shot an arrow from the corner of the roof and thought it went a little farther than a stadium, and when Antony doubled this distance and included within the refuge a part of the city. But this extension of the refuge proved harmful, and put the city in the power of criminals, and it was therefore nullified by Augustus Caesar. 1.24 Ephesus has both an arsenal and a harbour. The mouth of the harbour was made narrower by the engineers, but they, along with the king who ordered it, were deceived as to the result, I mean Attalus Philadelphus, for he thought that the entrance would be deep enough for large merchant vessels as also the harbour itself, which formerly had shallow places because of the silt deposited by the Caister River if a mole were thrown up at the mouth, which was very wide, and therefore ordered that the mole should be built. But the result was the opposite, for the silt, thus hemmed in, made the whole of the harbour, as far as the mouth, more shallow. Before this time the ebb and flow of the tides would carry away the silt and draw it to the sea outside. 
Such, then, is the harbor, and the city, because of its advantageous situation in other respects, grows daily, and is the largest emporium in Asia this side the Taurus. 1.25 notable men have been born in this city, in ancient times, Heraclitus the Obscure, as he is called, and Hermodorus, concerning whom Heraclitus himself says, it were right for the Ephesians from youth upwards to be hanged, who banished their most useful man, saying, let no man of us be most useful, otherwise, let him be elsewhere and with other people. Hermodorus is reputed to have written certain laws for the Romans. And Hipponax the poet was from Ephesus, and so were Perhasius the painter and Apelles, and more recently Alexander the Order, surnamed Lichnus, who was a statesman, and wrote history, and left behind him poems in which he describes the position of the heavenly bodies and gives a geographic description of the continents, each forming the subject of a poem. 1.26 After the outlet of the Caister River comes a lake that runs inland from the sea, called Selenusia, and next comes another lake that is confluent with it, both affording great revenues. Of these revenues, though sacred, the kings deprived the goddess, but the Romans gave them back, and again the tax gatherers forcibly converted the tolls to their own use. But when Artemidorus was sent on an embassy, as he says, he got the lakes back for the goddess, and he also won the decision over Heraclitus, which was in revolt, his case being decided at Rome, and in return for this the city erected in the sanctuary a golden image of him. In the innermost recess of the lake there is a sanctuary of a king, which is said to have been built by Agamemnon. 1.27 Then one comes to the mountain Galzius, and to Colophon, an Ionian city, and to the sacred precinct of Apollo Clarius, where there was once an ancient oracle. The story is told that Colchos the prophet, with Amphilochus the son of Amphuraeus, went there on foot on his return from Troy, and that having met near Clarus a prophet superior to himself, Mopsus, the son of Monto, the daughter of Tiresias, he died of grief. Now Hesiod revises the myth as follows, making Colchos propound to Mopsus this question, I am amazed in my heart at all these figs on this wild fig tree, small though it is, can you tell me the number? And he makes Mopsus reply, they are ten thousand in number, and their measure is a medimnus, but there is one over, which you cannot put in the measure. Thus he spake, Hesiod adds, and the number the measure could hold proved true. And then the eyes of Colchos were closed by the sleep of death. But Pharisaid says that the question propounded by Colchos was in regard to a pregnant so, how many pigs she carried, and that Mopsus said, three, one of which is a female, and that when Mopsus proved to have spoken the truth, Colchos died of grief. Some say that Colchos propounded the question in regard to the sow, but that Mopsus propounded the question in regard to the wild fig tree, and that the latter spoke the truth but that the former did not, and died of grief, and in accordance with a certain oracle. Sophocles tells the oracle in his reclaiming of Helen, that Colchos was destined to die when he met a prophet superior to himself, but he transfers the scene of the rivalry and of the death of Colchos to Cilicia. Such are the ancient stories. 1.28 The Colophonians once possessed notable naval and cavalry forces, in which latter they were so far superior to the others that wherever in wars that were hard to bring to an end, the cavalry of the Colophonians served as ally, the war came to an end, whence arose the proverb, he put Colophon to it, which is quoted when a sure end is put to any affair. Native Colophonians, among those of whom we have record, were, Mimnermus, who was both a flute player and elegiac poet, Xenophanes, the natural philosopher, who composed the Celian verse, and Pindar speaks also of a certain Polymnastus as one of the famous musicians, thou knowest the voice, common to all, of Polymnastus the Colophonian. And some say that Homer was from there. On a straight voyage it is seventy stadia from Ephesus, but if one includes the sinuosities of the gulfs it is one hundred and twenty. 1.29 After Colophon one comes to the mountain Corsius and to an all sacred to Artemis, whither dear, it has been believed, swim across and give birth to their young. Then comes Lebedus, which is 120 stadia distant from Colophon. This is the meeting place and settlement of all the Dionysiac artists in Ionia as far as the Hellespont, and this is the place where both games and a general festal assembly are held every year in honor of Dionysus. They formerly lived in Teos, the city of the Ionians that comes next after Colophon, but when the sedition broke out they fled for refuge to Ephesus. And when Attalus settled them in Myonesus between Teos and Lebedus the Teans sent an embassy to beg of the Romans not to permit Myonesus to be fortified against them, and they migrated to Lebedus, whose inhabitants gladly received them because of the dearth of population by which they were then afflicted. Teos, also, is 120 stadia distant from Lebedus, and in the intervening distance there is an island Aspis, by some called Arcanesis. And Myonesus is settled on a height that forms a peninsula. 1.30 Teos also is situated on a peninsula, and it has a harbour. Anacreon the Melic poet was from Teos, in whose time the Teans abandoned their city and migrated to, 
Abdera, a Thracian city, being unable to bear the insolence of the Persians, and hence the verse in reference to Abdera. Abdera, beautiful colony of the Teans. But some of them returned again in later times. As I have already said, a pelican also was a Tian, and Hecateus the historian was from the same city. And there is also another harbour to the north, thirty stadia distant from the city, called Juraidi. 1.31 Then one comes to Chalcidice, and to the Isthmus of the Chersonesus, belonging to the Teans and Erythraeans. Now the latter people live this side the Isthmus, but the Teans and Clazomenians live on the Isthmus itself, for the southern side of the Isthmus, I mean the Chalcidice, is occupied by Teans, but the northern by Clazomenians, where their territory joins the Erythraean Sea. At the beginning of the Isthmus lies the place called Hippocrymus, which lies between the Erythraean Sea territory this side the Isthmus and that of the Clazomenians on the other side. Above the Chalcidice is situated a sacred precinct consecrated to Alexander the son of Philip, and games, called the Alexandria, are proclaimed by the General Assembly of the Ionians and are celebrated there. The passage across the Isthmus from the sacred precinct of Alexander and from the Chalcidice to Hippocrymnus is 50 stadia, but the voyage round by sea is more than 1,000. Somewhere about the middle of the circuit is Erythrae, an Ionian city, which has a harbour, and also four isles lying off it, called Hippi. 1.32 Before coming to Erythrae, one comes first to a small town array belonging to the Teans, and then to Coricus, a high mountain, and to a harbour at the foot of it, Cassists, and to another harbour called Erythrus, and to several others in order thereafter. The waters along the coast of Mount Coricus, they say, were everywhere the haunt of pirates, the Coricians, as they are called, who had found a new way of attacking vessels, for, they say, the Coricians would scatter themselves among the harbours, follow up the merchants whose vessels lay at anchor in them, and overhear what cargoes they had aboard and whither they were bound, and then come together and attack the merchants after they had put to sea and plunder their vessels, and hence it is that we call every person who is a busybody and tries to overhear private and secret conversations a Coricians, and that we say in a proverb, well then, the Corician was listening to this, when one thinks that he is doing or saying something in secret, but fails to keep it hidden because of persons who spy on him and are eager to learn what does not concern them. 1.33 After Mount Coricus one comes to Halinesos, a small island. Then to Arginum, a promontory of the Erythrean territory, it is very close to the Poseidium of the Chians, which latter forms a strait about sixty stadia in width. Between Erythrae and Hippocrymus lies Mimas, a lofty mountain, which is well supplied with game and well wooded. Then one comes to a village Sibelia, and to a promontory Melina, as it is called, which has a millstone quarry. 1.34 Erythrae was the native city of Sibylla, a woman who was divinely inspired and had the gift of prophecy, one of the ancients. And in the time of Alexander there was another woman who likewise had the gift of prophecy, she was called Atanice, and was a native of the same city. And, in my time, Heraclides the Heraphilian physician, fellow. pupil of Apollonius Mies, was born there. 1.35 As for Chios, the voyage rounded along the coast is 900 stadia, and it has a city with a good port and with a naval station for 80 ships. On making the voyage rounded from the city, with the island on the right, one comes first to the Poseidium. Then to Phini, a deep harbour, and to a temple of Apollo and a grove of palm trees. Then to Nodium, a shore suited to the anchoring of vessels. Then to Laius, this too a shore suited to the anchoring of vessels, whence to the city there is an isthmus of 60 stadia, but the voyage round, which I have just now described, is 360 stadia. Then to Melina, a promontory, opposite to which lies Syra, an island 50 stadia distant from the promontory, lofty, and having a city of the same name. The circuit of the island is 40 stadia. Then one comes to Ariasia, a rugged and harborless country, about 30 stadia in extent, which produces the best of the Grecian wines. Then to Pelineus, the highest mountain in the island. And the island also has a marble quarry. Famous natives of Chios are, Ion the tragic poet, and Theopompus the historian, and Theocritus the sophist. The two latter were political opponents of one another. The Chians also claim Homer, setting forth as strong testimony that the men called Homeridae were descendants of Homer's family, these are mentioned by Pindar, whence also the Homeridae, singers of deftly woven lays, most often. The Chians at one time possessed also a fleet, and attained to liberty and to maritime empire. The distance from Chios to Lesbos, sailing southwards, is about 400 stadia. 1.36 After Hippocrymus one comes to Shetrium, the site on which Clausimani was situated in earlier times. Then to the present Clausimani, with eight small islands lying off it that are under cultivation. Anaxagoras, the natural philosopher, an illustrious man and associate of Anaximenes the Malaysian, was a Clazomenian. 
and Archelaus the natural philosopher and Euripides the poet took his entire course. Then to a sanctuary of Apollo and to hot springs, and to the gulf and the city of the Smyrnians. 1.37 Next one comes to another gulf, on which is the old Smyrna, twenty stadia distant from the present Smyrna. After Smyrna had been raised by the Lydians, its inhabitants continued for about four hundred years to live in villages. Then they were reassembled into a city by Antigonus, and afterwards by Lysimachus, and their city is now the most beautiful of all, a part of it is on a mountain and walled, but the greater part of it is in the plain near the harbour and near the metroum and near the gymnasium. The division into streets is exceptionally good, in straight lines as far as possible, and the streets are paved with stone, and there are large quadrangular porticos, with both lower and upper stories. There is also a library, and the homerium, a quadrangular portico containing a temple and wooden statue of Homer for the Smyrnians also lay a special claim to the poet, and indeed a bronze coin of theirs is called Homerium. The river Meles flows near the walls, and, in addition to the rest of the city's equipment, there is also a harbour that can be closed. But there is one error, not a small one, in the work of the engineers, that when they paved the streets they did not give them underground drainage, instead, filth covers the surface, and particularly during rains, when the cast-off filth is discharged upon the streets. It was here that Dolabella captured by siege, and slew, Trebonius, one of the men who treacherously murdered the deified Caesar, and he set free many parts of the city. 1.38 After Smyrna one comes to Luci, a small town, which after the death of Attalus Philometer was caused to revolt by Aristonicus, who was reputed to belong to the royal family and intended to usurp the kingdom. Now he was banished from Smyrna, after being defeated in a naval battle near the Simeon territory by the Ephesians, but he went up into the interior and quickly assembled a large number of resourceless people and also of slaves, invited with a promise of freedom, whom he called Heliopolity. Now he first fell upon Thyatira unexpectedly, and then got possession of Apollonis, and then set his efforts against other fortresses. But he did not last long, the cities immediately sent a large number of troops against him, and they were assisted by Nicomedes the Bithynian and by the kings of the Cappadocians. Then came five Roman ambassadors, and after that an army under Publius Crassus the consul, and after that Marcus Perpernus, who brought the war to an end, having captured Aristonicus alive and sent him to Rome. Now Aristonicus ended his life in prison, Perpernus died of disease, and Crassus, attacked by certain people in the neighbourhood of Luci, fell in battle. And Manius Aquilius came over as consul with ten lieutenants and organised the province into the form of government that still now endures. After Luci one comes to Phocia, on a gulf, concerning which I have already spoken in my account of Massalia. Then to the boundaries of the Ionians and the Aeolians, but I have already spoken of these. In the interior above the Ionian Sea board there remain to be described the places in the neighbourhood of the road that leads from Ephesus to Antiochia and the Meander River. These places are occupied by Lydians and Carians mixed with Greeks. 1.39 The first city one comes to after Ephesus is Magnesia, which is an Aeolian city and is called Magnesia on the Meander, for it is situated near that river. But it is much nearer the Lethaeus River, which empties into the Meander and has its beginning in Mount Pactis, the mountain in the territory of the Ephesians. There is another Lethaeus in Gortina, and another near Trikes, where Asclepius is said to have been born, and still another in the country of the western Libyans. And the city lies in the plain near the mountain called Thorax, on which Daphetas the grammarian is said to have been crucified, because he reviled the kings in a distich, purpled with stripes, mere filings of the treasure of Lysimachus, ye rule the Lydians and Phrygia. It is said that an oracle was given out that Daphetas should be on his guard against Thorax. 1.40 The Magnetans are thought to be descendants of Delphians who settled in the Didyman Hills, in Thessaly, concerning whom Hesiod says, or as the unwedded virgin who, dwelling on the holy Didyman Hills, in the Docian Plain, in front of Amorus, bathed her foot in Lake Bobas. 5 Here was also the sanctuary of Dindemony, mother of the gods. According to tradition, the wife of Themistocles, some say his daughter, served as a priestess there but the sanctuary is not now in existence, because the city has been transferred to another site. In the present city is the sanctuary of Artemis Leucophrene, which in the size of its temple and in the number of its votive offerings is inferior to the temple at Ephesus, but in the harmony and skill shown in the structure of the sacred enclosure is far superior to it. And in size it surpasses all the sacred enclosures in Asia except two, that at Ephesus and that at Didyme. In ancient times, also, it came to pass that the Magnetans were utterly destroyed by the Traers, a Sumerian tribe, although they had for a long time been a prosperous people, but the Milesians took possession of the place in the following year. 
Now Kalinas mentions the Magnetans as still being a prosperous people and as being successful in their war against the Ephesians, but Archilochus is obviously already aware of the misfortune that befell them, to bewail the woes of the Thasians, not those of the Magnetans, whence one may judge that he was more recent than Kalinas. And Kalinas recalls another, and earlier, invasion of the Sumerians when he says, and now the army of the Sumerians, mighty in deeds, advanceth, in which he plainly indicates the capture of Sardis. 1.41 Well-known natives of Magnesia are, Hijijas the Order, who, more than any other, initiated the Asiatic style, as it is called, whereby he corrupted the established Etic custom, and Seamus the Melic poet, he too a man who corrupted the style handed down by the earlier Melic poets and introduced the Semedia, just as that style was corrupted still more by the Lysiodi and the Megodi, and by Cleomachus the pugilist, who, having fallen in love with a certain Sinetus and with a young female slave who was kept as a prostitute by the Sinetus, imitated the style of dialects and mannerisms that was in vogue among the Sinedi. Sotades was the first man to write the talk of the Sinedi, and then Alexander the Aetolian. But though these two men imitated that talk in mere speech, Lysus accompanied it with song, and so did Seamus, who was still earlier than he. As for Anaxner, the sight Herodi, the theatres exalted him, but Antony exalted him all he possibly could, since he even appointed him exactor of tribute from four cities, giving him a body. Guard of soldiers. Further, his native land greatly increased his honours, having clad him in purple as consecrated to Zeus Sisypolis, as is plainly indicated in his painted image in the marketplace. And there is also a bronze statue of him in the theatre, with the inscription, Surely this is a beautiful thing, to listen to a singer such as this man is, like unto the gods in voice. But the engraver, missing his guess, left out the last letter of the second verse, the base of the statue not being wide enough for its inclusion, so that he laid the city open to the charge of ignorance, because of the ambiguity of the writing, as to whether the last word should be taken as in the nominative case or in the dative, for many write the dative case without the iota, and even reject the ordinary usage as being without natural cause. 1.42 After Magnesia comes the road to Tralice, with Mount Messages on the left, and, at the road itself and on the right, the plain of the Meander River, which is occupied by Lydians and Carians, and by Ionians, both Milesians and Mysians, and also by the Aeolians of Magnesia. And the same kind of topographical account applies as far as Nyssa and Antiochia. The city of the Trillans is situated upon a trapezium-shaped site, with a height fortified by nature, and the places all round are well defended. And it is as well peopled as any other city in Asia by people of means, and always some of its men hold the chief places in the province, being called Asiarchs. Among these was Pythodorus, originally a native of Nyssa, but he changed his abode to Tralis because of its celebrity, and with only a few others he stood out conspicuously as a friend of Pompey. And he came into possession of the wealth of a king, worth more than two thousand talents, which, though sold by the deified Caesar, was redeemed by him through his friendship with Pompey and was left by him unimpaired to his children. He was the father of Pythodorus, the present queen in Pontus, of whom I have already spoken. Pythodorus, then, flourished in my time, as also Menadorus, a man of learning, and otherwise August and Grave, who held the priesthood of Zeus Larizaeus. But he was overthrown by a counterparty friendly to Domitius Ahenobarbus, and Domitius, relying on his informers, slew him, as guilty of causing the fleet to revolt. Here were born famous orders, Dionysocles and afterwards Damas Scombrus. Tralice is said to have been founded by Argives and by certain Tralian Thracians, and hence the name. And the city was ruled for a short time by tyrants, the sons of Cratippus, at the time of the Mithridatic War. 1.43 Nyssa is situated near Mount Messages, for the most part lying upon its slopes, and it is a double city, so to speak, for it is divided by a torrential stream that forms a gorge, which at one place has a bridge over it, joining the two cities, and at another is adorned with an amphitheatre, with a hidden underground passage for the torrential waters. Near the theatre are two heights, below one of which is the gymnasium of youths, and below the other is the market place and the gymnasium for older persons. The plain lies to the south of the city, as it does to the south of Tralice. 1.44 On the road between the Trillans and Nyssa is a village of the Nicaeans, not far from the city Acarica, where is the Plutonian, with a luxurious grove and a temple of Pluto and Cor, and also the Coronium, a cave that lies above the sacred precinct, by nature wonderful, for they say that those who are diseased and give heed to the cures prescribed by these gods resort thither and live in the village near the cave among experienced priests, who on their behalf sleep in the cave and through dreams prescribe the cures. These are also the men who invoke the healing power of the gods. And they often bring the sick into the cave and leave them there, to remain in quiet, like animals in their lurking holes, without food for many days. And sometimes the sick give it also to their own dreams, 
but still they use those other men, as priests, to initiate them into the mysteries and to counsel them. To all others the place is forbidden and deadly. A festival is celebrated every year at Acarica, and at that time in particular those who celebrate the festival can see and hear concerning all these things, and at the festival, too, about noon, the boys and young men of the gymnasium, nude and anointed with oil, take up a bull and with haste carry him up into the cave, and, when let loose, the bull goes forward a short distance, falls, and breathes out his life. 1.4530 Stadia from Nyssa, after one crosses over Mount Molus and the mountain called Messages, towards the region to the south of the Messages, there is a place called Laman, whither the Nicaeans and all the people about go to celebrate their festivals. And not far from Laman is an entrance into the earth sacred to the same gods, which is said to extend down as far as Acarica. The poet is said to name this meadow when he says, on the Asian meadow, and they point out a hero sanctuary of Caster and a certain Asius, and the Caster river that streams forth nearby. 1.46 The story is told that three brothers, Athimbris and Athimbratus and Hydralus, who came from Lacedaemon, founded the three cities which were named after them, but that the cities later became scantily populated, and that the city Nyssa was founded by their inhabitants, but that Athimbris is now regarded by them as their original founder. 1.47 Near Nyssa, on the far side of the Meander River, are situated noteworthy settlements, I mean Cocinia and Orthosia, and this side the river, Bryula, Mastora, and Acarica, and above the city, on the mountain, Aroma, in which the letter Rho is short, whence comes the best message in wine, I mean the Aromian. 1.48 Famous men born at Nyssa are, Apollonius the Stoic philosopher, best of the disciples of Panadius, and Menocrates, pupil of Aristarchus, and Aristotemus, his son, whose entire course, in his extreme old age, I in my youth took at Nyssa, and Sostratus, the brother of Aristotemus, and another Aristotemus, his cousin, who trained Pompey the Great, proved themselves notable grammarians. But my teacher also taught rhetoric and had two schools, both in Rhodes and in his native land, teaching rhetoric in the morning and grammar in the evening. At Rome, however, when he was in charge of the children of Pompey the Great, he was content with the teaching of grammar. 2.1 Caria coming now to the far side of the meander, the parts that remain to be described are all Carian, since here the Lydians are no longer intermingled with the Carians, and the latter occupy all the country by themselves, except that a segment of the seaboard is occupied by Milesians and Mysians. Now the beginning of the seaboard is the Perea of the Rhodians on the sea, and the end of it is the Poseidium of the Milesians, but in the interior are the extremities of the Taurus, extending as far as the Meander River. For it is said that the mountains situated above the Chelidonian Islands, as they are called, which islands lie off the confines of Pamphylia and Lycia, form the beginning of the Taurus, for thence the Taurus rises to a height, but the truth is that the whole of Lycia, towards the parts outside and on its southern side, is separated by a mountainous ridge of the Taurus from the country of the Sibirans as far as the Perea of the Rhodians. From here the ridge continues, but is much lower and is no longer regarded as a part of the Taurus, neither are the parts outside the Taurus and this side of it so regarded, because of the fact that the eminences and depressions are scattered equally throughout the breadth and the length of the whole country, and present nothing like a wall of partition. The whole of the voyage round the coast, following the sinuosities of the gulfs, is 4,900 stadia, and merely that round the Perea of the Rhodians is close to 1,500. 2.2 The Perea of the Rhodians begins with Daedala, a place in the Rhodian territory, but ends with Mount Phoenix, as it is called, which is also in the Rhodian territory. Off the Perea lies the island Eleusa, distant 120 stadia from Rhodes. Between the two, as one sails towards the west in a straight line with the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia and Lycia, one comes to a gulf called Glaucus, which has good harbours, then to the Artemisium, a promontory and sanctuary, then to the sacred precinct of Leto, above which, and above the sea, at a distance of sixty stadia, lies Kalinda, a city, then to Conus and to the Calbes, a river near Conus, which is deep and affords passage for merchant vessels, and between the two lies Pisilus. 2.3 The city has dockyards, and a harbour that can be closed. Above the city, on a height, lies Imbrus, a stronghold. Although the country is fertile, the city is agreed by all to have foul air in summer, as also in autumn, because of the heat and the abundance of fruits. And indeed little tales of the following kind are repeated over and over, that Stratonicus the Sitterist, seeing that the Conians were pitiably pale, said that this was the thought of the poet in the verse, even as is the generation of leaves, such as that also of men and when people complained that he was jeering at the city as though it were sickly, he replied, would I be so bold as to call this city sickly, where even the corpses walk about. The Conians once revolted from the Rhodians, but by a judicial decision of the Romans they were restored to them. And there is extant a speech of Molon entitled against the Conians. 
it is said that they speak the same language as the Carians, but that they came from Crete and follow usages of their own. 2.4 Next one comes to Piscus, a small town, which has a harbour and a sacred precinct of Lido, and then to Lorima, a rugged coast, and to the highest mountain in that part of the country, and on top of the mountain is Phoenix, a stronghold bearing the same name as the mountain, and off the mountain, at a distance of four stadia, lies Eleusa, an island, which is about eight stadia in circuit. 2.5 The city of the Rhodians lies on the eastern promontory of Rhodes, and it is so far superior to all others in harbours and roads and walls and improvements in general that I am unable to speak of any other city as equal to it, or even as almost equal to it, much less superior to it. It is remarkable also for its good order, and for its careful attention to the administration of affairs of state in general, and in particular to that of naval affairs, whereby it held the mastery of the sea for a long time and overthrew the business of piracy, and became a friend to the Romans and to all kings who favoured both the Romans and the Greeks. Consequently it not only has remained autonomous, but also has been adorned with many votive offerings, which for the most part are to be found in the Dionysium and the Gymnasium, but partly in other places. The best of these are, first, the Colossus of Helios, of which the author of the iambic verse says, seven times ten cubits in height, the work of carries the Lindian, but it now lies on the ground, having been thrown down by an earthquake and broken at the knees. In accordance with a certain oracle, the people did not raise it again. This, then, is the most excellent of the votive offerings, at any rate, it is by common agreement one of the seven wonders, and there are also the paintings of Protogenes, his Ialysis and also his satyr, the latter standing by a pillar, on top of which stood a male partridge. And at this partridge, as would be natural, the people were so agape when the picture had only recently been set up, that they would behold him with wonder but overlook the satyr, although the latter was a very great success. But the partridge breeders were still more amazed, bringing their tame partridges and placing them opposite the painted partridge, for their partridges would make their call to the painting and attract a mob of people. But when Protogene saw that the main part of the work had become subordinate, he begged those who were in charge of the sacred precinct to permit him to go there and efface the partridge, and so he did. The Rhodians are concerned for the people in general, although their rule is not democratic, still, they wish to take care of their multitude of poor people. Accordingly, the people are supplied with provisions and the needy are supported by the well-to-do, by a certain ancestral custom, and there are certain liturgies that supply provisions, so that at the same time the poor man receives his sustenance and the city does not run short of useful men, and in particular for the manning of the fleets. As for the roadsteads, some of them were kept hidden and forbidden to the people in general, and death was the penalty for any person who spied on them or passed inside them. And here too, as in Massalia and Sisychus, everything relating to the architects, the manufacture of instruments of war, and the stores of arms and everything else are objects of exceptional care, and even more so than anywhere else. 2.6 The Rhodians, like the people of Halicarnassus and Nidus and Cus, are Dorians, for of the Dorians who founded Megara after the death of Cadrus, some remained there, others took part with Althiomenes the Argive in the colonization of Crete, and others were distributed to Rhodes and to the cities just now mentioned. But these events are later than those mentioned by Homer, for Nidus and Halicarnassus were not yet in existence, although Rhodes and Cas were, but they were inhabited by Heraclady. Now when Lepolemus had grown to manhood, he forthwith slew his own father's dear uncle, Lysimnius, who was then growing old, and straightway he built him ships, and when he had gathered together a great host he went in flight. The poet then adds, he came to Rhodes in his wanderings, where his people settled in three divisions by tribes, and he names the cities of that time, Lindus, Ialysis, and Camurus white with chalk, the city of the Rhodians having not yet been founded. The poet, then, nowhere mentions Dorians by name here, but perhaps indicates Aeolians and Boeotians, if it be true that Heracles and Lysimnius settled there. But if, as others say, Lepolemus set forth from Argos and Turins, even so the colonization thence could not have been Dorian, for it must have taken place before the return of the Heraclidae. And of the Cones, also, Homer says, were led by Phoedipus and Anaphis, the two sons of Lord Thessalus, son of Heracles and these names indicate the Aeolian stock of people rather than the Dorian. 2.7 In earlier times Rhodes was called Ophissa and Stadia, and then Telkines, after the Telkines, who took up their abode in the island. Some say that the Telkines are maligners and sorcerers, who pour the water of the sticks mixed with sulfur upon animals and plants in order to destroy them. But others, on the contrary, say that since they excelled in workmanship they were maligned by rival workmen and thus received their bad reputation and that they first came from Crete to Cyprus, and then to Rhodes, and that they were the first to work iron and brass, and in fact fabricated the scythe for Cronus. Now I have already described them before, but the number of the myths about them causes me to resume their description, filling up the gaps, 
if I have omitted anything. 2.8 After the Telkines, the Heliade, according to the mythical story, took possession of the island, and to one of these, Circaphus, and to his wife Sidippe, were born children who founded the cities that are named after them, Lindus, Ialysis, and Camirus White with Chalk. But some say that Lepolemus founded them and gave them the same names as those of certain daughters of Danaeus. 2.9 The present city was founded at the time of the Peloponnesian War by the same architect, as they say, who founded the Piraeus. But the Piraeus no longer endures, since it was badly damaged, first by the Lacedaemonians, who tore down the two walls, and later by Sulla, the Roman commander. 2.10 It is also related of the Rhodians that they have been prosperous by sea, not merely since the time when they founded the present city, but that even many years before the establishment of the Olympian Games they used to sail far away from their homeland to ensure the safety of their people. Since that time, also, they have sailed as far as Iberia, and there they founded Rhode, of which the Massaliots later took possession, among the Opici they founded Parthenope, and among the Donians they, along with the Cones, founded Elpia. Some say that the islands called the Gymnesii were founded by them after their departure from Troy, and the larger of these, according to Timaeus, is the largest of all islands after the seven Sardinia, Sicily, Cyprus, Crete, Euboea, Cyrnos, and Lesbos, but this is untrue, for there are others much larger. It is said that Gymnetes are called Baelorides by the Phoenicians, and that on this account the Gymnesii were called Baelorides. Some of the Rhodians took up their abode round Sybaris and Chonia. The poet, too, seems to bear witness to the prosperity enjoyed by the Rhodians from ancient times, forthwith from the first founding of the three cities, and there is people settled in three divisions by tribes, and were loved of Zeus, who was lord over gods and men, and upon them, wondrous wealth was shed by the son of Cronus. Other writers refer these verses to a myth, and say that gold reigned on the island at the time when Athena was born from the head of Zeus, as Pindar states. The island has a circuit of 920 stadia. 2.11 As one sails from the city, with the island on the right, one comes first to Lindus, a city situated on a mountain and extending far towards the south and approximately towards Alexandria. In Lindus there is a famous sanctuary of Athena Lindia, founded by the daughters of Danaeus. Now in earlier times the Lindians were under a separate government of their own, as were also the Camerians and the Iolysians, but after this they all came together at Rhodes. Cleobulus, one of the seven wise men, was a native of Lindus. 2.12 After Lindus one comes to Ixia, a stronghold, and to Mnesirium, then to Atabarus, the highest of the mountains there, which is sacred to Zeus at Iberius, then to Camirus, then to Ialysis, a village, above which there is an acropolis called Ochiroma, then to the city of the Rhodians, at a distance of about 80 stadia. Between these lies Toantium, a kind of promontory, and it is off Toantium, generally speaking, that Calcia and the Spurads in the neighborhood of Calcia lie, which I have mentioned before. 2.13 Many men worthy of mention were native Rhodians, both commanders and athletes, among whom were the ancestors of Panadius the philosopher, and, among statesmen and rhetoricians and philosophers, Panadius himself and Stratocles and Andronicus, one of the Peripatetics, and Leonides the Stoic, and also, before their time, Praxiphanes and Hieronymus and Eudemus. Poseidonius engaged in affairs of state in Rhodes and taught there, although he was a native of Apamea in Syria, as was also the case with Apollonius Malicus and Molon for they were Alabandians, pupils of Menicles the Order. Apollonius Malicus began his sojourn there earlier than Molon, and when, much later, Molon came, the former said to him, You are a late Molon, instead of saying, late Elthin. And Pisander the poet, who wrote the Heraclea, was also a Rhodian, and so was Simeus the Grammarian, as also Aristocles of my own time. And Dionysius the Thracian and the Apollonius who wrote the Argonauts, though Alexandrians, were called Rhodians. As for Rhodes, I have said enough about it. 2.14 As for the Carian coast that comes after Rhodes, beginning at Elias and Lorima, it bends sharply back towards the north, and the voyage thereafter runs in a straight line as far as the Propontis, forming, as it were, a meridian line about 5,000 stadia long, or slightly short of that distance. Along this line is situated the remainder of Caria, as are also the Ionians and the Aeolians and Troy and the parts round Sisychus and Byzantium. After Lorima, then, one comes to Sinosema and to Syme, an island. 2.15 Then to Nidus, with two harbours, one of which can be closed, can receive triremes, and is a naval station for twenty ships. Off it lies an island which is approximately seven stadia in circuit, rises high, is theatre-like, is connected by moles with the mainland, and in a way makes Nidus a double city, for a large part of its people live on the island, which shelters both harbours. 
opposite it, in the high sea, is Nicerus. Notable Nidians were, first, Eutyxus the mathematician, one of the comrades of Plato, then Agatharchides, one of the Peripatetics, a historian, and, in my own time, Theopompus, the friend of the deified Caesar, being a man of great influence with him, and his son Artemidorus. Thence, also, came Tegius, who served Artaxerxes as physician and wrote the works entitled Assyrica and Persica. Then, after Nidus, one comes to Ceramus and Bargasa, small towns situated above the sea. 2.16 Then to Halicarnassus, the royal residence of the dynasts of Caria, which was formerly called Zephyra. Here is the tomb of Mausolus, one of the seven wonders, a monument erected by Artemisia in honor of her husband, and here is the fountain called Salmachus, which has the slanderous repute, for what reason I do not know, of making effeminate all who drink from it. It seems that the effeminacy of man is laid to the charge of the air or of the water, yet it is not these, but rather riches and one and living, that are the cause of effeminacy. Halicarnassus has an Acropolis, and off the city lies Arcanesus. Its colonizers were, among others, Anthes and a number of Troezenians. Natives of Halicarnassus have been, Herodotus the historian, whom they later called Athurian, because he took part in the colonization of Thurii, and Heraclitus the poet, the comrade of Callimachus, and, in my time, Dionysius the historian. 2.17 This city, too, met a reverse when it was forcibly seized by Alexander. For Hecatomnus, the king of the Carians, had three sons, Mausolus and Hydrius and Pixodorus, and two daughters. Mausolus, the eldest of the brothers, married Artemisia, the elder of the daughters, and Hydrius, the second son, married Ada, the other sister. Mausolus became king and at last, childless, he left the empire to his wife, by whom the above-mentioned tomb was erected. But she pined away and died through grief for her husband, and Hydrius then became ruler. He died from a disease and was succeeded by his wife Ada, but she was banished by Pixodorus, the remaining son of Hecatomnos. Having espoused the side of the Persians, he sent for a satrap to share the empire with him, and when he too departed from life, the satrap took possession of Halicarnassus. And when Alexander came over, the satrap sustained a siege. His wife was Ada, who was the daughter of Pixodorus by Aphenus, a Cappadocian woman. But Ada, the daughter of Hecatomnos, whom Pixodorus had banished, entreated Alexander and persuaded him to restore her to the kingdom of which she had been deprived, having promised to cooperate with him against the parts of the country which were in revolt, for those who held these parts, she said, were her own relations, and she also gave over to him Alinda, where she herself was residing. He assented and appointed her queen, and when the city, except the Acropolis, it was a double Acropolis, had been captured, he assigned to her the siege of the Acropolis. This too was captured a little later, the siege having now become a matter of anger and personal enmity. 2.18 Next one comes to a promontory, Termirium, belonging to the Mindians, opposite which lies Scandaria, a promontory of Kos, forty stadia distant from the mainland. And there is a place called Termirum above the promontory of Kos. 2.19 The city of the Cones was in ancient times called Ostipalaea, and its people lived on another site, which was likewise on the sea. And then, on account of a sedition, they changed their abode to the present city, near Scandarium, and changed the name to Kos, the same as that of the island. Now the city is not large, but it is the most beautifully settled of all, and is most pleasing to behold as one sails from the high sea to its shore. The size of the island is about 550 stadia. It is everywhere well supplied with fruits, but like Chios and Lesbos it is best in respect to its wine. Towards the south it has a promontory, Lassiter, whence the distance to Nisiros is 60 stadia, but near Lassiter there is a place called Halasarna, and on the west it is Drekanum and a village called Stumalim. Now Drekanum is about 200 stadia distant from the city, but Lassiter adds 35 stadia to the length of the voyage. In the suburb is the Asulpeum, a sanctuary exceedingly famous and full of numerous votive offerings, among which is the Antigonus of Apelles. And Aphrodite and Adiamine used to be there, but it is now dedicated to the deified Caesar in Rome, Augustus thus having dedicated to his father the female founder of his family. It is said that the Cones got a remission of 100 talents of the appointed tribute in return for the painting. And it is said that the dietetics practiced by Hippocrates were derived mostly from the cures recorded on the votive tablets there. He, then, is one of the famous men from Cus, and so is Seamus the physician, as also Philetus, at the same time poet and critic, and, in my time, Nicias, who also reigned as tyrant over the Cones, and Ariston, the pupil and heir of the Peripatetic, and Theomnistus, a renowned harper, who was a political opponent of Nicias, was a native of the island. 
2.20 on the coast of the mainland near the Mindian territory lies Ostipalaya, a promontory, and also Zephyrium. Then forthwith one comes to Mindus, which has a harbour, and after Mindus to Bargelia, which is also a city, between the two is Carianda, a harbour, and also an island bearing the same name, where the Cariandians lived. Here was born Silax, the ancient historian. Near Bargelia is the sanctuary of Artemis Sindias, round which the rain is believed to fall without striking it. And there was once a place called Sindhi. From Bargelia there was a man of note, the Epicurean Protarchus, who was the teacher of Demetrius called Lacon. 2.21 Then one comes to Iasus, which lies on an island close to the mainland. It has a harbour, and the people gain most of their livelihood from the sea, for the sea here is well supplied with fish, but the soil of the country is rather poor. Indeed, people fabricate stories of this kind in regard to Iasus. When a site Harodi was giving a recital, the people all listened for a time, but when the bell that announced the sale of fish rang, they all left him and went away to the fish market, except one man who was hard of hearing. The site Harodi, therefore, went up to him and said, Sir, I am grateful to you for the honour you have done me and for your love of music, for all the others except you went away the moment they heard the sound of the bell. And the man said, What's that you say? Has the bell already rung? And when the site Harodi said yes, the man said, Fare thee well, and himself arose and went away. Here was born the dialectician Diodorus, nicknamed Cronus, falsely so at the outset, for it was Apollonius's master who was called Cronus, but the nickname was transferred to him because of the true Cronus lack of repute. 2.22 After Iasus one comes to the Poseidium of the Milesians. In the interior are three noteworthy cities, Mylassa, Stratonicea, and Alabanda. The others are dependencies of these or else of the cities on the coast, among which are Amizon, Heraclea, Euromus, and Chalcedor. As for these, there is little to be said. 2.23 But as for Mylassa, it is situated in an exceedingly fertile plain, and above the plain, towering into a peak, rises a mountain, which has a most excellent quarry of white marble. Now this quarry is of no small advantage, since it is stone in abundance and close at hand, for building purposes and in particular for the building of sanctuaries and other public works, accordingly this city, if any city is, is in every way beautifully adorned with porticos and temples but one may well be amazed at those who so absurdly founded the city at the foot of a steep and commanding crag. Accordingly, one of the commanders, amazed at the fact, is said to have said, if the man who founded this city was not afraid, wasn't he at least ashamed? The Malaysians have two sanctuaries of Zeus, Zeus Asagus, as he is called, and Zeus Labroundinus. The former is in the city, whereas Labrounda is a village far from the city, being situated on the mountain near the pass that leads over from Alabanda to Mylasa. At Labrounda there is an ancient temple and image, Zoanan, of Zeus Stratius. It is honoured by the people all about and by the Malaysians, and there is a paved road of almost sixty stadia from it to Mylasa, called the Sacred Way, on which their sacred processions are conducted. The priestly offices are held by the most distinguished of the citizens, always for life. Now these two are particular to the city, but there is a third sanctuary, that of the Carian Zeus, which is a common possession of all Carians, and in which, as brothers, both Lydians and Mysians have a share. It is related that Mylasa was a mere village in ancient times, but that it was the native land and royal residence of the Carians of the house of Hecatomnos. The city is nearest to the sea at Piscus, and this is their seaport. 2.24 Mylasa has had two notable men in my time, who were at once orders and leaders of the city, Euthydemus and Hybrius. Now Euthydemus, having inherited from his ancestors great wealth and high repute, and having added to these his own cleverness, was not only a great man in his native land, but was also thought worthy of the foremost honour in Asia. As for Hybrius, as he himself used to tell the story in his school and as confirmed by his fellow citizens, his father left him a mule driver and a wood-carrying mule. And, being supported by these, he became a pupil of Diotrephes of Antiochia for a short time, and then came back and surrendered himself to the office of market clerk. But when he had been tossed about in this office and had made but little money, he began to apply himself to the affairs of state and to follow closely the speakers of the forum. He quickly grew in power, and was already an object of amazement in the lifetime of Euthydemus, but in particular after his death, having become master of the city. So long as Euthydemus lived he strongly prevailed, being at once powerful and useful to the city, so that even if there was something tyrannical about him, it was atoned for by the fact that it was attended by what was good for the city. At any rate, people applaud the following statement of Hybrius, made by him towards the end of a public speech, Euthydemus, you are an evil necessary to the city, for we can live neither with you nor without you. However, although he had grown very strong and had the repute of being both a good citizen and order, 
he stumbled in his political opposition to Labienus, for while the others, since they were without arms and inclined to peace, yielded to Labienus when he was coming against them with an army and an allied Parthian force, the Parthians by that time being in possession of Asia, yet Zeno of Laodicea and Hybrias, both orders, refused to yield and cause their own cities to revolt. Hybrias also provoked Labienus, a lad who was irritable and full of folly, by a certain pronouncement, for when Labienus proclaimed himself Parthian emperor, Hybrias said, then I too call myself Carian emperor. Consequently Labienus set out against the city with cohorts of Roman soldiers in Asia that were already organized. Labienus did not seize Hybrias, however, since he had withdrawn to Rhodes, but he shamefully maltreated his home, with its costly furnishings, and plundered it. And he likewise damaged the whole of the city. But though Hybrias abandoned Asia, he came back and rehabilitated both himself and the city. So much, then, for Mylassa. 2.25 Stratonicea is a settlement of Macedonians. And this too was adorned with costly improvements by the kings. There are two sanctuaries in the country of the Stratonicians, of which the most famous, that of Hecate, is at Lagina, and it draws great festal assemblies every year. And near the city is that of Zeus Chrysaorius, the common possession of all Carians, whither they gather both to offer sacrifice and to deliberate on their common interests. Their league, which consists of villages, is called Chrysaorian. And those who present the most villages have a preference in the vote, like, for example, the people of Ceramus. The Stratonicians also have a share in the league, although they are not of the Carian stock, but because they have villages belonging to the Chrysaorian League. Here, too, in the time of our fathers, was born a noteworthy man, Menippus, surnamed Catechus, whom Cicero, as he says in one of his writings, applauded above all the Asiatic orders he had heard, comparing him with Senecles and with the other orders who flourished in the latter's time. But there is also another Stratonicea, Stratonicea near the Taurus, as it is called, it is a small town situated near the mountain. 2.26 Alabanda is also situated at the foot of hills, two hills that are joined together in such a way that they present the appearance of an ass laden with panniers. And indeed Apollonius Malicus, in ridiculing the city both in regard to this and in regard to the large number of scorpions there, said that it was an ass laden with panniers of scorpions. Both this city and Mylassa are full of these creatures, and so is the whole of the mountainous country between them. Alabanda is a city of people who live in luxury and debauchery, containing many girls who play the harp. Alabandians worthy of mention are two orders, brothers, I mean Menacles, whom I mentioned a little above, and Heracles, and also Apollonius and Molon, who changed their abode to Rhodes. 2.27 of the numerous accounts of the Carians, the one that is generally agreed upon is this, that the Carians were subject to the rule of Minas, being called Leliges at that time, and lived in the islands, then, having migrated to the mainland, they took possession of much of the coast and of the interior, taking it away from its previous possessors, who for the most part were Leliges and Pelusgians. In turn these were deprived of a part of their country by the Greeks, I mean Ionians and Dorians. As evidences of their zeal for military affairs, writers adduce shield holders, shield emblems, and crests, for all these are called Carian. At least Anacreon says, Come, put thine arm through the shield holder, work of the Carians. And Alcius says, shaking the Carian crest. 2.28 When the poet says, Mastels in turn led the Carians, of barbarian speech, we have no reason to inquire how it is that, although he knew so many barbarian tribes, he speaks of the Carians alone as of barbarian speech, but nowhere speaks of barbarians. Thucydides, therefore, is not correct, for he says that Homer did not use the term barbarians either, because the Hellenes on their part had not yet been distinguished under one name as opposed to them for the poet himself refutes the statement that the Hellenes had not yet been so distinguished when he says, My husband, whose fame is wide through Hellas and mid-Argos. And again, and if thou dost wish to journey through Hellas and mid-Argos. Further, if they were not called barbarians, how could they properly be called a people of barbarian speech? So neither Thucydides is correct, nor Apollodorus the grammarian, who says that the general term was used by the Hellenes in a peculiar and abusive sense against the Carians, and in particular by the Ionians, who hated them because of their enmity and the continuous military campaigns, for it was right to name them barbarians in this sense. But I raise the question, why does he call them people of barbarian speech, but not even once calls them barbarians? Because, Apollodorus replies, the plural does not fall in with the meter, this is why he does not call them barbarians. But though this case does not fall in with meter, the nominative case does not differ metrically from that of Dardanians, Trojans and Lycians and Dardanians. So, also, the word Trojan, and off what kind the Trojan horses are. 
neither is he correct when he says that the language of the Carians is very harsh, for it is not, but even has very many Greek words mixed up with it, according to the Philip who wrote the Carica. I suppose that the word barbarian was at first uttered onomatopoetically in reference to people who enunciated words only with difficulty and talked harshly and raucously, like our words batarizine, trulizine, and salizine, for we are by nature very much inclined to denote sounds by words that sound like them, on account of their homogeneity. Wherefore onomatopoetic words abound in our language, as, for example, celerisane, and also clang, sophos, bow, and crotos, most of which are by now used in their proper sense. Accordingly, when all who pronounced words thickly were being called barbarians onomatopoetically, it appeared that the pronunciations of all alien races were likewise thick, I mean of those that were not Greek. Those, therefore, they called barbarians in the special sense of the term, at first derisively, meaning that they pronounced words thickly or harshly, and then we misused the word as a general ethnic term, thus making a logical distinction between the Greeks and all other races. The fact is, however, that through our long acquaintance and intercourse with the barbarians this effect was at last seen to be the result, not of a thick pronunciation or any natural defect in the vocal organs, but of the peculiarities of their several languages. And there appeared another faulty and barbarian-like pronunciation in our language, whenever any person speaking Greek did not pronounce it correctly, but pronounce the words like barbarians who are only beginning to learn Greek and are unable to speak it accurately, as is also the case with us in speaking their languages. This was particularly the case with the Carians, for, although the other peoples were not yet having very much intercourse with the Greeks nor even trying to live in Greek fashion or to learn our language with the exception, perhaps, of rare persons who by chance, and singly, mingled with a few of the Greeks yet the Carians roamed throughout the whole of Greece, serving on expeditions for pay. Already, therefore, the barbarous element in their Greek was strong, as a result of their expeditions in Greece, and after this it spread much more, from the time they took up their abode with the Greeks in the islands and when they were driven thence into Asia, even here they were unable to live apart from the Greeks, I mean when the Ionians and Dorians later crossed over to Asia. The term barbarize, also, has the same origin, for we are wont to use this too in reference to those who speak Greek badly, not to those who talk Carian. So, therefore, we must interpret the term speak barbarously and barbarously speaking as applying to those who speak Greek badly. And it was from the term charis that the term barbarize was used in a different sense in works on the art of speaking Greek, and so was the term soloesize, whether derived from soli, or made up in some other way. 2.29 Artemidorus says that, as one goes from Piscus, in the Perea of the Rhodians, to Ephesus, the distance to Lagina is 850 stadia, and thence to Alabanda, 250 more, and to Tralice, 160. But one comes to the road that leads into Tralice after crossing the Meander River, at about the middle of the journey, where are the boundaries of Caria? The distance all told from Piscus to the Meander along the road to Ephesus amounts to 1,180 stadia. Again, from the Meander, traversing next in order the length of Ionia along the same road, the distance from the river to Tralice is 80 stadia, then to Magnesia, 140, to Ephesus, 120, to Smyrna, 320, and to Phocia and the boundaries of Ionia, less than 200, so that the length of Ionia in a straight line would be, according to Artemidorus, slightly more than 800 stadia. Since there is a kind of common road constantly used by all who travel from Ephesus towards the east, Artemidorus traverses this too, from Ephesus to Carura, a boundary of Caria towards Phrygia, through Magnesia, Tralice, Nyssa, and Antiochia, is a journey of 740 stadia, and, from Carura, the journey in Phrygia, through Laodicea, Apamea, Metropolis, and Chelidonia. Now near the beginning of Peroeus, one comes to Holmi, about 920 stadia from Carura, and, near the end of Peroeus near Lycaonia, through Philomelium, to Turion, slightly more than 500. Then Lycaonia, through Laodicea Catechecaumene, as far as Corapassus, 840 stadia, from Corapassus in Lycaonia to Garsora, a small town in Cappadocia, situated on its borders, 120, thence to Mazica, the metropolis of the Cappadocians, through Sondum and Sotacora, 680, and thence to the Euphrates River, as far as Tamiza, a place in Sophene, through Herfe, a small town, 1440. The places on a straight line with these as far as India are the same in Artemidorus as they are in Eratosthenes. But Polybius says that we should rely most on Artemidorus in regard to the places here. He begins with Samosata in Comagene, which lies at the river crossing and at Zugma, and states that the distance to Samosata, across the Taurus, from the boundaries of Cappadocia round to Misa is 450 stadia. 3.1 Lycia after the Perea of the Rhodians, of which Daedala is a boundary, 
sailing next in order towards the rising sun, one comes to Lycia, which extends as far as Pamphylia, then to Pamphylia, extending as far as the Trachean Cilicians, and then to the country of these, extending as far as the other Cilicians living round the Gulf of Essos. These are parts of the peninsula, the isthmus of which, as I was saying, is the road from Issus to Amesis, or, according to some, Sinope, but they lie outside the Taurus on the narrow coast which extends from Lycia as far as the region of Soli, the present Pompeiopolis. Then forthwith the coast in the neighborhood of Soli, beginning at Soli and Tarsus, spreads out into plains. So then, when I have traversed this coast, my account of the whole peninsula will have been completed. Then I shall pass to the other parts of Asia that are outside the Taurus. And lastly I shall set forth my account of Libya. 3.2 After Daedala of the Rhodians, then, one comes to a mountain in Lycia which bears the same name as the city, Daedala, whence the whole voyage along the Lycian coast takes its beginning. This coast extends 1,720 stadia, and is rugged and hard to travel, but is exceedingly well supplied with harbours and inhabited by decent people. Indeed, the nature of the country, at least, is similar to both that of the Pamphylians and the Trachean Cilicians, but the former use their places as bases of operation for the business of piracy, when they engaged in piracy themselves or offered them to pirates as markets for the sale of booty and as naval stations. Inside, at any rate, a city in Pamphylia, the dockyard stood open to the Cilicians, who would sell their captives at auction there, though admitting that these were freemen. But the Lycians continued living in such a civilized and decent way that, although the Pamphylians through their successes gained the mastery of the sea as far as Italy, still they themselves were stirred by no desire for shameful gain, but remained within the ancestral domain of the Lycian League. 3.3 There are 23 cities that share in the vote. They come together from each city to a general congress, after choosing whatever city they approve of. The largest of the cities control three votes each, the medium size two, and the rest one. In the same proportion, also, they make contributions and discharge other liturgies. Artemidorus said that the six largest were Xanthus, Patara, Pinara, Olympus, Myra, and Thlos, the last named being situated near the pass that leads over into Sibiro. At the Congress they first choose a Lysiarch, and then other officials of the League, and general courts of justice are designated. In earlier times they would deliberate about war and peace and alliances, but now they naturally do not do so, since these matters necessarily lie in the power of the Romans, except, perhaps, when the Romans should give them permission or it should be for their benefit. Likewise, judges and magistrates are elected from the several cities in the same proportion. And since they lived under such a good government, they remained ever free under the Romans, thus retaining their ancestral usages, and they saw the pirates utterly wiped out, first by Servilius Isauricus, at the time that he demolished Isaura, and later by Pompey the Great, when he set fire to more than 1300 boats and laid waste their settlements. Of the pirates who survived the fights, he brought some down to Soli, which he named Pompeiopolis, and the others to Dime, where there was a dearth of population, it is now occupied by a colony of Romans. The poets, however, and especially the tragic poets, confuse the tribes, as, for example, the Trojans and the Mysians and the Lydians, whom they call Phrygians, and likewise the Lycians, whom they call Carians. 3.4 After Daedala, then, I mean the mountain in Lycia, one comes to a Lycian town near it, Telmesis, and to Telmesis, a promontory with a harbour. Eumenes received this place from the Romans in the Antiochian War, but when his kingdom was dissolved the Lycians got it back again. 3.5 Then, next, one comes to Anticrigus, a steep mountain, where is Carmelisus, an inhabited place situated in a ravine, and, after this, to Crigus, which has eight promontories and a city of the same name. The scene of the myth of Chimera is laid in the neighborhood of these mountains. Chimera, a ravine extending up from the shore, is not far from them. At the foot of Crigus, in the interior, lies Pinara, one of the largest cities in Lycia. Here Pandarus is held in honor, who may, perhaps, be identical with the Trojan hero, as when the poet says, the daughter of Pandarius, the nightingale of the greenwood, for Pandarius is said to have been from Lycia. 3.6 Then one comes to the Xanthus River, which the people of earlier times called the Serbes. Sailing up this river by rowboat for ten stadia one comes to the Litune, and proceeding sixty stadia beyond the sanctuary one comes to the city of the Xanthians, the largest city in Lycia. After Xanthus, Patara, which is also a large city with a harbour and rites of Apollo, founded by Paterus. When Ptolemy Philadelphus repaired it, he called it Lycian Arsinoe, but the original name prevailed. 3.7 Then one comes to Myra, at a distance of twenty stadia above the sea, on a lofty hill. Then to the outlet of the Limyrus River, and then, going twenty stadia inland on foot, 
to Limira, a small town. In the intervening distance on the coasting voyage there are numerous isles and harbours, among which are the island Megist, with a city of the same name, and Sisthene. And in the interior are places called Phelus and Anaphelus and Chimera, which last I have mentioned above. 3.8 Then one comes to the promontory Hyra and to the Chelidoniae, three rugged islands, which are about equal in size and are about five stadia distant from one another. They lie about six stadia off the shore, and one of them has a landing place for vessels. Here it is, according to the majority of writers, that the tourist takes its beginning, not only because of the loftiness of the promontory and because it extends down from the Pisidian mountains that lie above Pamphylia, but also because of the islands that lie off it, presenting, as they do, a sort of conspicuous sign in the sea, like outskirts of a mountain. But in truth the mountainous tract is continuous from the Perea of the Rhodians to the parts near Pisidia, and this tract too is called the Taurus. The Chelidoniae are likewise thought to lie approximately opposite to Canobus, and the passage thence to Canobus is said to be 4,000 stadia. From the promontory Hyra to Albia there remain 367 stadia, and on this stretch lie, not only Crambusa, but also Olympus, a large city and a mountain of the same name, which latter is also called Phoenicus. Then one comes to Coricus, a tract of seacoast. 3.9 Then one comes to Phasalus, with three harbours, a city of note, and to a lake. Above it lies Salama, a mountain, and also Termasus, a Pisidian city situated near the defiles, through which there is a pass over the mountain to Milius. Alexander destroyed Milius for the reason that he wished to open the defiles. Near Phasalus, by the sea, there are defiles, through which Alexander led his army. And here there is a mountain called Climax, which lies near the Pamphylian Sea and leaves a narrow pass on the shore, and in calm weather this pass is free from water, so that it is passable for travellers, but when the sea is at flood tide it is to a considerable extent hidden by the waves. Now the pass that leads over through the mountain is circuitous and steep, but in fair weather people use the pass along the shore. Alexander, meeting with a stormy season, and being a man who in general trusted to luck, set out before the waves had receded, and the result was that all day long his soldiers marched in water submerged to their navels. Now this city too is Lycian, being situated on the borders towards Pamphylia, but it has no part in the common league and is a separate organization to itself. 3.10 Now the poet makes the Salome different from the Lycians, for when Bellerophon was sent by the king of the Lycians to the second struggle, he fought with the glorious Salome. But others, who assert that the Lycians were in earlier times called Salome, but in later times were called Termali from the Termali who came there from Crete with Sarpedon, and after this were called Lycians, from Lysias the son of Pandion, who, after having been banished from his homeland, was admitted by Sarpedon as a partner in his empire, are not in agreement with Homer. Better is the opinion of those who assert that by Salome the poet means the people who are now called the Milii, of whom I have already spoken. 4.1 Pamphylia After Phasalus one comes to Albia, the beginning of Pamphylia, a large fortress, and after this to the Catarics, as it is called, a river which dashes down in such volume and so impetuously that the noise can be heard from afar. Then to a city, Italia, so named after its founder Attalus Philadelphus, who also sent a colony to Coricus, a small neighboring town, and surrounded it with a greater circuit wall. It is said that both Thebe and Lyrnesus are to be seen between Phasalus and Italia, a part of the Trojan Cilicians having been driven out of the plain of Thebe into Pamphylia, as Callisthenes states. 4.2 Then one comes to the Sistrus River, and, sailing sixty stadia up this river, one comes to Purge, a city, and near Purge, on a lofty site, to the sanctuary of Artemis Pergia, where a general festival is celebrated every year. Then, about forty stadia above the sea, one comes to Cilium, a lofty city that is visible from Purge. Then one comes to a very large lake, Capria, and after this, to the Eurymedon River, and, sailing sixty stadia up this river, to Aspendus, a city with a flourishing population and founded by the Argives. Above Aspendus lies Petnalissus. Then comes another river, and also numerous isles that lie off it. Then side, a colony of the Simeons, which has a sanctuary of Athena, and nearby is the coast of the Lesser Sybarite. Then the Melis River and a mooring place. Then Ptolemaeus, a city. And after this come the boundaries of Pamphylia, and also Corosesium, the beginning of Cilicia Trachea. The whole of the voyage along the coast of Pamphylia is 640 stadia. 4.3 Herodotus says that the Pamphylians are the descendants of the peoples led by Amphilochus and Chalcos, a miscellaneous throng who accompanied them from Troy, and that most of them remained here, but that some of them were scattered to numerous places on earth. Kalinus says that Chalcos died in Clarus, but that the peoples led by Mopsus passed over the Taurus, and that, though some remained in Pamphylia, 
the others were dispersed in Cilicia, and also in Syria as far even as Phoenicia. 5.1 Cilicia as for Cilicia outside the Taurus, one part of it is called Trachea and the other Pedias. As for Trachea, its coast is narrow and has no level ground, or scarcely any, and, besides that, it lies at the foot of the Taurus, which affords a poor livelihood as far as its northern side in the region of Isaura and of the Hominidis as far as Pisidia, and the same country is also called Tracheatis, and its inhabitants Tracheioti. But Cilicia Pedias extends from Soli and Tarsus as far as Issus, and also to those parts beyond which, on the northern side of the Taurus, Cappadocians are situated, for this country consists for the most part of plains and fertile land. Since some parts of this country are inside the Taurus and others outside it, and since I have already spoken of those inside it, let me now speak of those outside it, beginning with the Tracheioti. 5.2 The first place in Cilicia, then, to which one comes, is a stronghold, Corusesium, situated on an abrupt rock, which was used by Diodotus, called Tryphon, as a base of operations at the time when he caused Syria to revolt from the kings and was fighting it out with them, being successful at one time and failing at another. Now Tryphon was hemmed up in a certain place by Antiochus, son of Demetrius, and forced to kill himself, and it was Tryphon, together with the worthlessness of the kings who by succession were then reigning over Syria and at the same time over Cilicia, who caused the Cilicians to organize their gangs of pirates, for on account of his revolutionary attempts others made like attempts at the same time, and thus the dissensions of brethren with one another put the country at the mercy of any who might attack it. The exportation of slaves induced them most of all to engage in their evil business, since it proved most profitable, for not only were they easily captured, but the market, which was large and rich in property, was not extremely far away, I mean Delos, which could both admit and send away ten thousand slaves on the same day, whence arose the proverb, merchant, sail in, unload your ship, everything has been sold. The cause of this was the fact that the Romans, having become rich after the destruction of Carthage and Corinth, used many slaves, and the pirates, seeing the easy profit therein, bloomed forth in great numbers, themselves not only going in quest of booty but also trafficking in slaves. The kings both of Cyprus and of Egypt cooperated with them in this, being enemies to the Syrians. Neither were the Rhodians friendly to the Syrians, and they therefore afforded them no assistance. And at the same time the pirates, pretending to be slave dealers, carried on their evil business unchecked. Neither were the Romans concerning themselves as yet so much about the peoples outside the Taurus, but they sent Scipio Emiljanus, and again certain others, to inspect the tribes and the cities, and they decided that the above-mentioned piracy was due to the incompetence of the rulers, although they were ashamed, since they themselves had ratified the hereditary succession from Seleucus Nicator, to deprive them of it. And this is what made the Parthians masters of the country, who got possession of the region on the far side of the Euphrates, and at last made also the Armenians masters, who not only seized the country outside the Taurus even as far as Phoenicia, but also, so far as they could, overthrew the kings and the whole royal stock, the sea, however, they gave over to the Cilicians. Then, after these people had grown in power, the Romans were forced to destroy them by war and with an army, although they had not hindered their growing power. Now it is hard to condemn the Romans of negligence, since, being engaged with matters that were nearer and more urgent, they were unable to watch those that were farther away. So much I have decided to say by way of a brief digression from my geographical description. 5.3 After Corusesium, one comes to Arsinoe, a city, then to Hemaxia, a settlement on a hill, with a harbour, where shipbuilding timber is brought down. Most of this timber is cedar, and it appears that this region beyond others abounds in cedar wood for ships, and it was on this account that Antony assigned this region to Cleopatra, since it was suited to the building of her fleets. Then one comes to Laertes, a stronghold on a breast-shaped hill, with a mooring place. Then to Salinas, a city and river. Then to Crigus, a rock which is precipitous all round and near the sea. Then to Charadrus, a fortress, which also has a mooring place, above it lies Mount Androclus, and the coast alongside it, called Platonists, is rugged. Then to Anemurium, a promontory, where the mainland approaches closest to Cyprus, in the direction of the promontory of Chromius, the passage across being 350 stadia. Now the coasting voyage along Cilicia from the borders of Pamphylia to Anemurium is 820 stadia, whereas the rest, as far as Soli, is about 500 stadia. On this latter one comes to Nogijus, the first city after Anemurium, then to Arsinoe, which has a landing place, then to a place called Melania, and to Solenderize, a city with a harbour. Some writers, among whom is Artemidorus, make Solenderize, not Corusesium, the beginning of Cilicia. And he says that the distance from the Pelusian mouth to Orthosia is 3,900 stadia, to the Orontes River, 1,130, to the gates next thereafter, 
525, and to the borders of the Cilicians, 1260. 5.4 Then one comes to Holmi, where the present Seleucians formerly lived, but when Seleucia on the Calicidnus was founded, they migrated there, for immediately on doubling the shore, which forms a promontory called Sarpedon, one comes to the outlet of the Calicidnus. Near the Calicidnus is also Zephyrium, likewise a promontory. The river affords a voyage inland to Seleucia, a city which is well peopled and stands far aloof from the Cilician and Pamphylian usages. Here were born in my time noteworthy men of the peripatetic sect of philosophers, Athenaeus and Xenarchus. Of these, Athenaeus engaged also in affairs of state and was for a time leader of the people in his native land, and then, having fallen into a friendship with Morena, he was captured along with Morena when in flight with him, after the plot against Augustus Caesar had been detected, but, being clearly proven guiltless, he was released by Caesar. And when, on his return to Rome, the first men who met him were greeting him and questioning him, he repeated the following from Euripides, I am come, having left the vaults of the dead and the gates of darkness. But he survived his return only a short time, having been killed in the collapse, which took place in the night, of the house in which he lived. Xenarchus, however, of whom I was a pupil, did not tarry long at home, but resided at Alexandria and at Athens and finally at Rome, having chosen the life of a teacher, and having enjoyed the friendship both of Aureus and of Augustus Caesar, he continued to be held in honour down to old age, but shortly before the end he lost his sight, and then died of a disease. 5.5 After the Calicidness one comes to the rock Poesol, as it is called, which has steps hewn in it that lead to Seleucia, then to a Nemurium, a promontory, bearing the same name as the former, and to Crambusa, an island, and to Coricus, a promontory, above which, at a distance of twenty stadia, is the Carician cave, in which the best crocus grows. It is a great circular hollow, with a rocky brow situated all round it that is everywhere quite high. Going down into it, one comes to a floor that is uneven and mostly rocky, but full of trees of the shrub kind, both the evergreen and those that are cultivated. And among these trees are dispersed also the plots of ground which produce the crocus. There is also a cave here, with a great spring, which sends forth a river of pure and transparent water, the river forthwith empties beneath the earth, and then, altar running invisible underground, issues forth into the sea. It is called Picrum Hydor. 5.6 Then, after Coricus, one comes to Eleusa, an island lying close to the mainland, which Archelaus settled, making it a royal residence, after he had received the whole of Cilicia Trachea except Seleucia the same way in which it was obtained formerly by Amentus and still earlier by Cleopatra. For since the region was naturally well adapted to the business of piracy both by land and by sea by land, because of the height of the mountains and the large tribes that live beyond them, tribes which have plains and farmlands that are large and easily overrun, and by sea, because of the good supply, not only of shipbuilding timber, but also of harbours and fortresses and secret recesses with all this in view, I say, the Romans thought that it was better for the region to be ruled by kings than to be under the Roman prefects sent to administer justice, who were not likely always to be present or to have armed forces with them. Thus Archelaus received, in addition to Cappadocia, Cilicia Trachea, and the boundary of the latter, the river Lamus and the village of the same name, lies between Soli and Eleusa. 5.7 Near the mountain ridges of the Taurus lies the piratical stronghold of Xenocetus I mean Olympus, both mountain and fortress, whence are visible all Lycia and Pamphylia and Pisidia and Milius, but when the mountain was captured by Isauricus, Xenocetus burned himself up with his whole house. To him belonged also Coricus and Phasilus and many places in Pamphylia, but all were taken by Isauricus. 5.8 After Lamus I comes to Soli, a noteworthy city, the beginning of the other Cilicia, that which is round Issus, it was founded by Achaeans and Rhodians from Lindus. Since this city was of scant population, Pompey the Great settled in it those survivors of the pirates whom he judged most worthy of being saved and provided for, and he changed its name to Pompeiopolis. Among the famous natives of Soli were, Chrysippus the Stoic philosopher, whose father had moved there from Tarsus, Philemon, the comic poet, and Aratus, who wrote the work entitled The Phenomena, in verse. 5.9 Then to Zephyrium, which bears the same name as the place near Calicidnus. Then, a little above the sea, to Anchiali, which, according to Aristobulus, was founded by Sardana Pallas. Here, he says, is the tomb of Sardana Pallas, and a stone figure which represents the fingers of the right hand as snapping together, and the following inscription in Assyrian letters, Sardana Pallas, the son of Anasindaraxes, built Anchiali and Tarsus in one day. Eat, drink, be merry, because all things else are not worth this, meaning the snapping of the fingers. Chorilus also mentions this inscription, and indeed the following verses are everywhere known, mine are all that I have eaten, 
and the delights of love that I have enjoyed, but those numerous blessings have been left behind. 5.10 Above Ankili lies Sinda, a fortress, which at one time was used as a treasury by the Macedonians. But the treasures were taken away by Eumenes, when he revolted from Antigonus. And still above this and solely is a mountainous country, in which is a city Alb, with a sanctuary of Zeus, founded by Ajax the son of Teucer. The priest of this sanctuary became dynast of Cilicia Trachea, and then the country was beset by numerous tyrants, and the gangs of pirates were organized. And after the overthrow of these they called this country the domain of Teucer, and called the same also the priesthood of Teucer, and most of the priests were named Teucer or Ajax. But Abba, the daughter of Xenophanes, one of the tyrants, came into this family by marriage and herself took possession of the empire, her father having previously received it in the guise of guardian. But later both Antony and Cleopatra conferred it upon her as a favor, being moved by her courteous entreaties. And then she was overthrown, but the empire remained with her descendants. After Ancheli one comes to the outlets of the Sidnus, near the Rigma, as it is called. It is a place that forms into a lake, having also ancient arsenals, and into it empties the Sidnus River, which flows through the middle of Tarsus and has its sources in the city Taurus, which lies above Tarsus. The lake is also the naval station of Tarsus. 5.11 Now thus far the seaboard as a whole, beginning at the Perea of the Rhodians, extends towards the equinoctial east from the equinoctial west, and then bends in the direction of winter sunrise as far as Issus, and then forthwith takes a bend towards the south as far as Phoenicia, and the remainder extends towards the west as far as the pillars and their ends. Now the truth is that the actual isthmus of the peninsula which I have described is that which extends from Tarsus and the outlet of the Sidnus to Amesis, for this is the shortest distance from Amesis to the boundaries of Cilicia, and the distance thence to Tarsus is 120 stadia, and the distance from there to the outlet of the Sidnus is no more than that. And in fact to Issus, and the sea near it, there is no other road from Amesis which is shorter than that through Tarsus, and Tarsus is not nearer to Issus than to the Sidnus, and therefore it is clear that in reality this would be the isthmus but still people call that which extends as far as the Gulf of Esos the true isthmus, thus betraying the facts because of the significance of the Gulf. And it is because of this very thing that I, without making any accurate distinctions, represent the line from Rhodes, which I have prolonged to the Sidnus, to be the same as the line extending as far as Issus, and also assert that the Taurus extends in a straight line with that line as far as India. 5.12 As for Tarsus, it lies in a plain, and it was founded by the Argives who wandered with Triptolemus in quest of Io and it is intersected in the middle by the Sidnus River, which flows past the very gymnasium of the young men. Now inasmuch as the source of the river is not very far away and its stream passes through a deep ravine and then empties immediately into the city, its discharge is both cold and swift, and hence it is helpful both to men and to cattle that are suffering from swollen sinews, if they immerse themselves in its waters. 5.13 The people at Tarsus have devoted themselves so eagerly, not only to philosophy, but also to the whole round of education in general, that they have surpassed Athens, Alexandria, or any other place that can be named where there have been schools and lectures of philosophers. But it is so different from other cities that there the men who are fond of learning, are all natives, and foreigners are not inclined to sojourn there, neither do these natives stay there, but they complete their education abroad, and when they have completed it they are pleased to live abroad, and but few go back home. But the opposite is the case with the other cities which I have just mentioned except Alexandria, for many resort to them and pass time there with pleasure, but you would not see many of the natives either resorting to places outside their country through love of learning or eager about pursuing learning at home. With the Alexandrians, however, both things take place, for they admit many foreigners and also send not a few of their own citizens abroad. Further, the city of Tarsus has all kinds of schools of rhetoric, and in general it not only has a flourishing population but also is most powerful, thus keeping up the reputation of the mother city. 5.14 The following men were natives of Tarsus, among the Stoics, Antipater and Archidemus and Nestor, and also the two Athenodoruses, one of whom, called Cordelion, lived with Marcus Cato and died at his house, and the other, the son of Sandon, called Cananets after some village, was Caesar's teacher and was greatly honored by him, and when he returned to his native land, now an old man, he broke up the government there established, which was being badly conducted by Boethus, among others, who was a bad poet and a bad citizen, having prevailed there by currying the favor of the people. He had been raised to prominence by Antony, who at the outset received favorably the poem which he had written upon the victory at Philippi, but still more by that facility prevalent among the Trojans whereby he could instantly speak offhand and unceasingly on any given subject. Furthermore, Antony promised the Trojans an office of gymnasiarch, but appointed Boethus instead of a gymnasiarch, and entrusted to him the expenditures. But Boethus was caught secreting, 
among other things, the olive oil, and when he was being proven guilty by his accusers in the presence of Antony he deprecated Antony's wrath, saying, among other things, that just as Homer had him the praises of Achilles and Agamemnon and Odysseus, so I have him thine. It is not right, therefore, that I should be brought before you on such slanderous charges. When, however, the accuser caught the statement, he said, yes, but Homer did not steal Agamemnon's oil, nor yet that of Achilles, but you did, and therefore you shall be punished. However, he broke the wrath of Antony by courteous attentions, and no less than before kept on plundering the city until the overthrow of Antony. Finding the city in this plight, Athenodorus for a time tried to induce both Boethus and his partisans to change their course, but since they would abstain from no act of insolence, he used the authority given him by Caesar, condemned them to exile, and expelled them. These at first indicted him with the following inscription on the walls, work for young men, counsels for the middle-aged, and flatulence for old men, and when he, taking the inscription as a joke, ordered the following words to be inscribed beside it, thunder for old men, someone, contemptuous of all decency and afflicted with looseness of the bowels, profusely bespattered the door and wall of Athenodorus' house as he was passing by it at night. Athenodorus, while bringing accusations in the assembly against the faction, said, one may see the sickly plight and the disaffection of the city in many ways, and in particular from its excrements. These men were Stoics, but the Nestor of my time, the teacher of Marcellus, son of Octavia the sister of Caesar, was an academician. He too was at the head of the government of Tarsus, having succeeded Athenodorus, and he continued to be held in honour both by the prefects and in the city. 5.15 Among the other philosophers from Tarsus, whom I could well note and tell their names, are Plutiades and Diogenes, who were among those philosophers that went round from city to city and conducted schools in an able manner. Diogenes also composed poems, as if by inspiration, when a subject was given him for the most part tragic poems, and as for grammarians whose writings are extant, there are Artemidorus and Diodorus, and the best tragic poet among those enumerated in the Pleias was Dionysides. But it is Rome that is best able to tell us the number of learned men from this city, for it is full of Tersians and Alexandrians. Such is Tarsus. 5.16 After the Sidnus River one comes to the Pyramus River, which flows from Cataonia, a river which I have mentioned before. According to Artemidorus, the distance thence to Soli in a straight voyage is 500 stadia. Nearby, also, is Malos, situated on a height, founded by Amphilochus and Mopsus, the latter the son of Apollo and Monto, concerning whom many myths are told. And indeed I, too, have mentioned them in my account of Kalkos and of the quarrel between Kalkos and Mopsus about their powers of divination. For some writers transfer this quarrel, Sophocles, for example, to Cilicia, which he, following the custom of tragic poets, calls Pamphylia, just as he calls Lycia Caria and Troy and Lydia Phrygia. And Sophocles, among others, tells us that Kalkos died there. But, according to the myth, the contest concerned, not only the power of divination, but also the sovereignty, for they say that Mopsus and Amphilochus went from Troy and founded Malos, and that Amphilochus then went away to Argos, and, being dissatisfied with affairs there, returned to Malos, but that, being excluded from a share in the government there, he fought a duel with Mopsus, and that both fell in the duel and were buried in places that were not in sight of one another and today their tombs are to be seen in the neighbourhood of Magersa near the Pyramus River. This was the birthplace of Crates the Grammarian, of whom Panadius is said to have been a pupil. 5.17 Above this coast lies the Aulian Plain, through which Philetus led the cavalry for Alexander, when Alexander led his phalanx from Soli along the coast and the territory of Malos against Issus and the forces of Darius. It is said that Alexander performed sacrifices to Amphilochus because of his kinship with the Argives. Hesiod says that Amphilochus was slain by Apollo at Soli, but others say that he was slain in the neighborhood of the Aulian Plain, and others in Syria, when he was quitting the Aulian Plain because of the quarrel. 5.18 After Malos one comes to Ege, a small town, with a mooring place, and then to the Ammonides' gates, with a mooring place, where ends the mountain Ammonius, which extends down from the Taurus and lies above Cilicia towards the east. It was always ruled by several powerful tyrants, who possessed strongholds, but in my time a notable man established himself as lord of all, and was named king by the Romans because of his manly virtues I refer to Tarkandimotus, who bequeathed the succession to his posterity. 5.19 After E.G., one comes to Issus, a small town with a mooring place, and to the Pinarus River. It was here that the struggle between Alexander and Darius occurred, and the gulf is called the Issian Gulf. On this gulf are situated the city Rossus, the city Meriandrus, Alexandria, Nicopolis, Mopsustia, and Pili as it is called, which is the boundary between the Cilicians and the Syrians. 
In Cilicia is also the sanctuary and oracle of the Sarpedonian Artemis, and the oracles are delivered by persons who are divinely inspired. 5.20 After Cilicia the first Syrian city is Seleucia and Pyria, near which the Orontes River empties. The voyage from Seleucia to Soli, on a straight course, is but little short of 1,000 stadia. 5.21 Since the Cilicians in the Trode whom Homer mentions are far distant from the Cilicians outside the Taurus, some represent those in Troy as original colonizers of the latter, and point out certain places of the same name there, as, for example, Thebe and Lyrnesis in Pamphylia, whereas others of contrary opinion point out also an Aulian plain in the former. Now that the parts of the aforesaid peninsula outside the Taurus have been described, I must add what follows. 5.22 Apollodorus, in his work on the catalogue of ships, goes on to say to this effect, that all the allies of the Trojans from Asia were enumerated by the poet as being inhabitants of the peninsula, of which the narrowest isthmus is that between the innermost recess at Sinope and Issus. And the exterior sides of this peninsula, he says, which is triangular in shape, are unequal in length, one of them extending from Cilicia to the Chelidonian Islands, another from the Chelidonian Islands to the mouth of the Euxin, and the third thence back to Sinope. Now the assertion that the Allies were alone those who lived in the peninsula can be proved wrong by the same arguments by which I have previously shown that the Allies were not alone those who lived this side the Elise River. For just as the places round Pharnacia, in which, as I said, the Elizoni lived, are outside the Elise River, so also they are outside the Isthmus, if indeed they are outside the narrows between Sinope and Issus, and not outside these alone, but also outside the true narrows between Amesis and Issus, for he too incorrectly defines the Isthmus and its narrows, since he substitutes the former for the latter. But the greatest absurdity is this, that, after calling the peninsula triangular in shape, he represents the exterior sides as three in number, for when he speaks of the exterior sides he seems privily to exclude the side along the narrows, as though this too were a side, but not exterior or on the sea. If, then, these narrows were so shortened that the exterior side ending at Issus and that ending at Sinope lacked but little of joining one another, one might concede that the peninsula should be called triangular, but, as it is, since the narrows mentioned by him leave a distance of 3,000 stadia between Issus and Sinope, it is ignorance and not knowledge of choreography to call such a four-sided figure triangular. Yet he published in the Meter of Comedy a work on choreography entitled A Description of the Earth. The same ignorance still remains even though one should reduce the isthmus to the minimum distance, I mean, to one half of the whole distance, as given by those who have most belied the facts, among whom is also Artemidorus, that is, 1500 stadia for even this does contract the side along the narrows enough to make the peninsula a triangular figure. Neither does Artemidorus correctly distinguish the exterior sides when he speaks of the side that extends from Issus as far as the Chelidonian Islands, for there still remains to this side the whole of the Lycian coast, which lies in a straight line with the side he mentions, as does also the Perea of the Rhodians as far as Piscus. And thence the mainland bends and begins to form the second, or westerly, side extending as far as the Propontis and Byzantium. 5.23 But though Ephorus said that this peninsula was inhabited by sixteen tribes, of which three were Hellenic and the rest barbarian, except those that were mixed, adding that the Cilicians, Pamphylians, Lycians, Bithynians, Paplagonians, Marianians, Trojans, and Carians lived on the sea, but the Pisidians, Mysians, Chalabians, Phrygians, and Millians in the interior, Apollodorus, who passes judgment upon this matter, says that the tribe of the Galatians, which is more recent than the time of Ephorus, is a seventeenth, and that, of the aforesaid tribes, the Hellenic had not yet, in the time of the Trojan War, settled there, and that the barbarian tribes are much confused because of the lapse of time, and that the poet names in his catalogue the tribes of the Trojans and of the Paplagonians, as they are now named, and of the Mysians and Phrygians and Carians and Lycians, as also the Myonians, instead of the Lydians, and other unknown peoples, as, for example, the Halizones and Caucones and, outside the catalogue, the Setians and the Salami and the Cilicians from the plain of Thebe and the Leliges, but nowhere names the Pamphylians, Bithynians, Marianians, Pisidians, Chalabians, Millians, or Cappadocians some because they had not yet settled in this region, and others because they were included among other tribes, as, for example, the Hydraeus and the Termali among the Carians, and the Doliones and Bebrises among the Phrygians. 5.24 But obviously Apollodorus does not pass a fair judgment upon the statement of Ephorus, and also confuses and falsifies the words of the poet, for he ought first to have asked Ephorus this question, why he placed the Chalabians inside the peninsula when they were so far distant towards the east from both Sinope and Amesis. For those who say that the isthmus of this peninsula is the line from Issus to the Euxin make this line a kind of meridian, which some think should be the line to Sinope, 
and others, that to Amesis, but no one that to the land of the Chalabians, which is absolutely oblique, in fact, the meridian through the land of the Chalabians would be drawn through Lesser Armenia and the Euphrates, cutting off on this side of it the whole of Cappadocia, Comagene, Mount Amanus, and the Issian Gulf. If, however, we should concede that the oblique line bounds the isthmus, at least most of these places, and Cappadocia in particular, would be cut off on this side, as also the country now called Pontus in the special sense of the term, which is a part of Cappadocia towards the Euxin, so that, if the land of the Chalabians must be set down as a part of the peninsula, much more should Cataonia and both Cappadocia s, as also Lycaonia, which is itself omitted by him. Again, why did Ephorus place in the interior the Chalabians, whom the poet called Halizones, as I have already demonstrated? For it would have been better to divide them and set one part of them on the sea and the other in the interior, as should also be done in the case of Cappadocia and Cilicia, but Ephorus does not even name Cappadocia, and speaks only of the Cilicians on the sea. Now as for the people who were subject to Antipater Derbetes, and the Hominadice and several other peoples who border on the Pisidians, men who do not know the sea and even do not eat food mingled with salt, where are they to be placed? Neither does he say in regard to the Lydians or Myones whether they are two peoples or the same, or whether they live separately by themselves or are included within another tribe. For it would be impossible to lose from sight so significant a tribe, and if Ephorus says nothing about it, would he not seem to have omitted something most important? 5.25 And who are the mixed tribes? For we would be unable to say that, as compared with the aforesaid places, others were either named or omitted by him which we shall assign to the mixed tribes, neither can we call mixed any of these peoples themselves whom he has mentioned or omitted, for, even if they had become mixed, still the predominant element has made them either Hellenes or barbarians, and I know nothing of a third tribe of people that is mixed. 5.26 And how can there be three Hellenic tribes that live on the peninsula? For if it is because the Athenians and the Ionians were the same people in ancient times, let also the Dorians and the Aeolians be called the same people, and thus there would be only two tribes. But if one should make distinctions in accordance with the customs of later times, as, for example, in accordance with dialects, then the tribes, like the dialects, would be four in number. But this peninsula, particularly in accordance with the division of Ephorus, is inhabited, not only by Ionians, but also by Athenians, as I have shown in my account of the several places. Now although it is worthwhile to raise such questions as these with reference to Ephorus, yet Apollodorus took no thought for them and also goes on to add to the sixteen tribes a seventeenth, that of the Galatians in general a useful thing to do, but unnecessary for the passing of judgment upon what is said or omitted by Ephorus. But Apollodorus states the reason himself, that all this is later than the time of Ephorus. 5.27 Passing to the poet, Apollodorus rightly says that much confusion of the barbarian tribes has taken place from the Trojan times to the present because of the changes, for some of them have been added to, others have vanished, others have been dispersed, and others have been combined into one tribe. But he incorrectly sets forth as twofold the reason why the poet does not mention some of them, either because a country was not yet inhabited by this or that tribe or because this or that tribe was included within another, for instance, the poet fails to mention Cappadocia, Cataonia, and likewise Lycaonia but for neither of these reasons, for we have no history of this kind in their case. Further, it is ridiculous that Apollodorus should concern himself about the reason why Homer omitted the Cappadocians and Lycaonians and speak in his defense, and yet should himself omit to tell the reason why Ephorus omitted them, and that too when he had cited the statement of the man for the very purpose of examining it and passing judgment upon it, and also to teach us why Homer mentioned Myonians instead of Lydians, but not to remark that Ephorus mentions neither Lydians nor Myonians. 5.28 After saying that the poet mentions certain unknown tribes, Apollodorus rightly names the Cauconians, the Salami, the Setians, the Leliges, and the Cilicians of the plain of Thebe, but the Halizones are a fabrication of his own, or rather of the first men who, not knowing who the Halizones were, wrote the name in several different ways and fabricated the birthplace of silver and many other mines, all of which have given out. And in furtherance of their emulous desire they also collected the stories cited by Demetrius of Skepsis from Callisthenes and certain other writers, who were not free from the false notions about the Halizones. Likewise the wealth of Tantalus and the Pelopidae arose from the mines round Phrygia and Sepolus, that of Cadmus from those round Thrace and Mount Pangaeus, that of Priam from the gold mines at Astyra near Abydus, of which still today there are small remains, here the amount of earth thrown out is considerable and the excavations are signs of the mining in olden times, and that of Midas from those round Mount Bermius, and that of Gygus and Aliots and Croesus from those Lydia and from the region between Atarnius and Pergamum, where is a small deserted town, whose lands have been exhausted of ore. 5.29 Still further one might find fault with Apollodorus, because, when the more recent writers make numerous innovations contrary to the statements of Homer, 
he is wont frequently to put these innovations to the test, but in the present case he not only has made small account of them, but also, on the contrary, identifies things that are not meant alike. For instance, Xanthus the Lydian says that it was after the Trojan War that the Phrygians came from Europe and the left-hand side of the Pontus, and that Scamandrius led them from the Beresins and Ascania. But Apollodorus adds to this the statement that Homer refers to this Ascania that is mentioned by Xanthus, and Phorcys and godlike Ascanius led the Phrygians from afar, from Ascania. However, if this is so, the migration must have taken place later than the Trojan War, whereas the allied force mentioned by the poet came from the opposite mainland, from the Beresins and Ascania. Who, then, were the Phrygians, who were then encamped along the banks of the Singarius, when Priam says, For I too, being an ally, was numbered among these. And how could Priam have sent for Phrygians from the Beresins, with whom he had no compact, and yet leave uninvited those who lived on his borders and to whom he had formerly been ally? And after speaking in this way about the Phrygians, he adds also an account of the Mysians that is not in agreement with this, for he says that there is also a village in Mysia which is called Ascania, near a lake of the same name. Whence flows the Ascanius River, which is mentioned by Euphorion, beside the waters of the Mesian Ascanius, and by Alexander the Aetolian, who have their homes on the Ascanian streams, on the lips of the Ascanian lake, where dwelt Dolian, the son of Silenus and Melia. And he says that the country round Sisychus, as one goes to Miltupolis, is called Dolionis and Mysia. If this is so, then, and if witness thereto is borne both by the places now pointed out and by the poets, what could have prevented Homer from mentioning this Ascania? and not the Ascania spoken of by Xanthus. I have discussed this before, in my account of the Mysians and Phrygians, and therefore let this be the end of that subject. 6.1 Cyprus It remains for me to describe the island which lies alongside this peninsula on the south, I mean Cyprus. I have already said that the sea surrounded by Egypt, Phoenicia, Syria, and the rest of the coast as far as Rhodia consists approximately of the Egyptian and Pamphylian seas and of the sea at the Gulf of Issus. In this last sea lies Cyprus, its northern parts closely approach Cilicia Trachea, where they are closest to the mainland, and its eastern parts border on the Issian Gulf, and its western on the Pamphylian Sea, being washed by that sea, and its southern by the Egyptian Sea. Now the Egyptian Sea is confluent on the west with the Libyan and Carpathian Seas, but in its southern and eastern parts borders on Egypt and the coast next thereafter as far as Seleucia and Issus, and towards the north on Cyprus and the Pamphylian Sea but the Pamphylian Sea is surrounded on the north by the extremities of Cilicia Trachea, of Pamphylia, and of Lycia, as far as Rhodia, and on the west by the island of the Rhodians, and on the east by the part of Cyprus near Paphos and the Acamas, and on the south is confluent with the Egyptian Sea. 6.2 The circuit of Cyprus is 3,420 stadia, including the sinuosities of the gulfs. The length from Clydes to the Acamas by land, traveling from east to west, is 1,400 stadia. The Clydes are two isles lying off Cyprus opposite the eastern parts of the island, which are 700 stadia distant from the Pyramus. The Acamas is a promontory with two breasts and much timber. It is situated at the western part of the island, and extends towards the north, it lies closest to Salinas in Cilicia Trachea, the passage across being 1000 stadia, whereas the passage across to Side in Pamphylia is 1600 and to the Chelidonian Islands 1900. The shape of the island as a whole is oblong and in some places it forms isthmuses on the sides which define its breadth. But the island also has its several parts, which I shall describe briefly, beginning with the point that is nearest to the mainland. 6.3 I have said somewhere that opposite to Anemurium, a cape of Cilicia Trachea, is the promontory of the Cyprians, I mean the promontory of Cromius, at a distance of 350 stadia. Thence forthwith, keeping the island on the right and the mainland on the left, the voyage to the Clydes lies in a straight line towards the northeast, a distance of 700 stadia. In the interval is the city Lapithus, with a mooring place and dockyards, it was founded by Laconians and Praxander, and opposite it lies Nagijus. Then one comes to Aphrodisium, where the island is narrow, for the passage across to Salamis is only 70 stadia. Then to the beach of the Achaeans, where Teucer, the founder of Salamis in Cyprus, first landed, having been banished, as they say, by his father Telamon then to a city Carpasia, with a harbour. It is situated opposite the promontory Sarpedon, and the passage from Carpasia across the Isthmus to the Carpasian Islands and the Southern Sea is 30 stadia. Then to a promontory and mountain. The mountain peak is called Olympus, and it has a sanctuary of Aphrodite Acrea, which cannot be entered or seen by women. Off it, and near it, lie the Clydes, as also several other islands, and then one comes to the Carpasian Islands, and, after these, to Salamis, where Aristus the historian was born. Then to Arsinoe, a city and harbour. Then to another harbour, Lucala. 
then to a promontory, Pedalium, above which lies a hill that is rugged, high, trapezium-shaped, and sacred to Aphrodite, whereto the distance from the Clydes is 600 stadia. Then comes the coasting voyage to Cetium, which for the most part is sinuous and rough. Cetium has a harbour that can be closed, and here were born both Zeno, the original founder of the Stoic sect, and Apollonius, a physician. The distance thence to Berytus is 1,500 stadia. Then to the city Amethus, and, in the interval, to a small town called Pali, and to a breast-shaped mountain called Olympus. Then to Curius, which is peninsula-like, where to the distance from Throni is 700 stadia. Then to a city Curium, which has a mooring place and was founded by the Argives. One may therefore see at once the carelessness of the poet who wrote the elegy that begins, We hinds, sacred to Phoebus, racing across many billows, came hither in our swift course to escape the arrows of our pursuers, whether the author was Hedalus or someone else, for he says that the hinds set out from the Carician heights and swam across from the Cilician shore to the beach of Curius, and further says that it is a matter of untold amazement to men to think how we ran across the impassable stream by the aid of a vernal west wind. For while there is a voyage round the island from Coricus to the beach Curious, which is made neither by the aid of a west wind nor by keeping the island on the right nor on the left, there is no passage across the sea between the two places. At any rate, Curium is the beginning of the westerly voyage in the direction of Rhodes, and immediately one comes to a promontory, whence are flung those who touch the altar of Apollo. Then to Treta, and to Busura, and to Palipaphus, which last is situated at about ten stadia above the sea, has a mooring place, and an ancient sanctuary of the Paphian Aphrodite. Then to the promontory Zephyria, with a landing place, and to another Arsino, which likewise has a landing place and a sanctuary and a sacred grove. And at a little distance from the sea is Hyrosepus. Then to Paphos, which was founded by Agapenor, and has both a harbour and well-built sanctuaries. It is sixty stadia distant from Palipaphos by land, and on this road men together with women, who also assemble here from the other cities, hold an annual procession to Palipaphos. Some say that the distance from Paphos to Alexandria is 3,600 stadia. Then, after Paphos, one comes to the Acamas promontory. Then, after the Acamas, towards the east, one sails to a city Arsino and the sacred grove of Zeus. Then to a city Soli, with a harbour and a river and a sanctuary of Aphrodite and Isis. It was founded by Phileris and Acamas, Athenians, and the inhabitants are called Solians, and here was born Stasaner, one of the comrades of Alexander, who was thought worthy of a chief command, and above it, in the interior, lies a city Laminia. And then to the promontory of Chromius. 6.4 But why should one wonder at the poets, and particularly at writers of the kind that are wholly concerned about style, when we compare the statements of Damists, who gives the length of the island as from north to south, from Hyrasepias, as he says, to Clydes. Neither is Eratosthenes correct, for, although he censures Damists, he says that Hyrasepias is not on the north but on the south, for it is not on the south either, but on the west, since it lies on the western side, where are also Paphos and the Acamas. Such is the geographical position of Cyprus. 6.5 In fertility Cyprus is not inferior to any one of the islands, for it produces both good wine and good oil, and also a sufficient supply of grain for its own use. And at Tamasus there are abundant mines of copper, in which is found chalcanthide and also the rust of copper, which latter is useful for its medicinal properties. Eratosthenes says that in ancient times the plains were thickly overgrown with forests, and therefore were covered with woods and not cultivated, that the mines helped a little against this, since the people would cut down the trees to burn the copper and the silver, and that the building of the fleets further helped, since the sea was now being navigated safely, that is, with naval forces, but that, because they could not thus prevail over the growth of the timber, they permitted anyone who wished, or was able, to cut out the timber and to keep the land thus cleared as his own property and exempt from taxes. 6.6 Now in the earlier times the several cities of the Cyprians were under the rule of tyrants, but from the time the Ptolemaic kings became established as lords of Egypt Cyprus too came into their power, the Romans often cooperating with them. But when the last Ptolemy that reigned, the brother of the father of Cleopatra, the queen in my time, was decreed to be both disagreeable and ungrateful to his benefactors, he was deposed, and the Romans took possession of the island, and it has become a praetorian province by itself. The chief cause of the ruin of the king was Publius Claudius Pulcher, for the latter, having fallen into the hands of the bands of pirates, the Cilicians then being at the height of their power, and, being asked for a ransom, sent a message to the king, begging him to send and rescue him. The king indeed sent a ransom, but so utterly small that the pirates disdained to take it and sent it back again, but released him without ransom. Having safely escaped, he remembered the favour of both, and, when he became tribune of the people, 
he was so powerful that he had Marcus Cato sent to take Cyprus away from its possessor. Now the king killed himself beforehand, but Cato went over and took Cyprus and disposed of the king's property and carried the money to the Roman treasury. From that time the island became a province, just as it is now a Praetorian province. During a short intervening time Antony gave it over to Cleopatra and her sister Arsinoe, but when he was overthrown his whole organization was overthrown with him. Book 15. 1.1 The parts of Asia which remain to be described are those without the Taurus, except Cilicia, Pamphylia, and Lycia, extending from India to the Nile, and situated between the Taurus and the exterior southern sea. Next to Asia is Africa, which I shall describe hereafter. At present I shall begin from India, the first and the largest country situated towards the east. 1.2 The reader must receive the account of this country with indulgence, for it lies at a very great distance, and few persons of our nation have seen it, those also who have visited it have seen only some portions of it, the greater part of what they relate is from report, and even what they saw, they became acquainted with during their passage through the country with an army, and in great haste. For this reason they do not agree in their accounts of the same things, although they write about them as if they had examined them with the greatest care and attention. Some of these writers were fellow soldiers and fellow travelers, as those who belonged to the army which, under the command of Alexander, conquered Asia, yet they frequently contradict each other. If, then, they differ so much respecting things which they had seen, what must we think of what they relate from report? 1.3 Nor do the writers who, many ages since Alexander's time, have given an account of these countries, nor even those who at present make voyages thither, afford any precise information. Apollodorus, for instance, author of the Parthian history, when he mentions the Greeks who occasioned the revolt of Bactriana from the Syrian kings, who were the successors of Seleucus Nicator, says, that when they became powerful they invaded India. He adds no discoveries to what was previously known, and even asserts, in contradiction to others, that the Bactrians had subjected to their dominion a larger portion of India than the Macedonians, for Eucratidas, one of these kings, had a thousand cities subject to his authority but other writers affirm that the Macedonians conquered nine nations situated between the Hydaspes and the Hypanes, and obtained possession of five hundred cities, not one of which was less than Cosmoropus, and that Alexander, after having conquered all this country, delivered it up to Porus. 1.4 Very few of the merchants who now sail from Egypt by the Nile and the Arabian Gulf to India have proceeded as far as the Ganges, and, being ignorant persons, were not qualified to give an account of places they have visited. From one place in India, and from one king, namely, Pandian, or, according to others, Porus, presents and embassies were sent to Augustus Caesar. With the ambassadors came the Indian gymnosophist, who committed himself to the flames at Athens, like Calanus, who exhibited the same spectacle in the presence of Alexander. 1.5 If, then, we set aside these stories, and direct our attention to accounts of the country prior to the expedition of Alexander, we shall find them still more obscure. It is probable that Alexander, elated by his extraordinary good fortune, believe these accounts. According to Nearchus, Alexander was ambitious of conducting his army through Drosia, when he heard that Semiramis and Cyrus had undertaken expeditions against India, through this country, although both had abandoned the enterprise, the former escaping with twenty, and Cyrus with seven men only. For he considered that it would be a glorious achievement for him to lead a conquering army safe through the same nations and countries where Semiramis and Cyrus had suffered such disasters. Alexander, therefore, believed these stories. 1.6 But how can we place any just confidence in the accounts of India derived from such expeditions as those of Cyrus and Semiramis? Megasthenes concurs in this opinion, he advises persons not to credit the ancient histories of India, for, except the expeditions of Hercules, of Bacchus, and the later invasion of Alexander, no army was ever sent out of their country by the Indians, nor did any foreign enemy ever invade or conquer it. Sesistris the Egyptian, he says, and Tirko the Ethiopian, advanced as far as Europe, and Nabucodrosser, who was more celebrated among the Chaldeans than Hercules among the Greeks, penetrated even as far as the Pillars, which Tyrco also reached. Sesistris conducted an army from Iberia to Thrace and Pontus, Idanthyrsus the Scythian overran Asia as far as Egypt, but not one of these persons proceeded as far as India, and Semiramis died before her intended enterprise was undertaken. The Persians had sent for the Hydraces from India, a body of mercenary troops, but they did not lead an army into that country, and only approached it when Cyrus was marching against the Masajdi. 1.7 Megasthenes, and a few others, think the stories respecting Hercules and Bacchus to be credible, but the majority of writers, among whom is Eratosthenes, regard them as incredible and fabulous, like the Grecian stories. Dionysus, in the Bacchae of Euripides, makes this boasting speech, but now from Lydia's field. 
with gold abounding, from the Phrygian realm. And that of Persia scorched by torrid suns. Pressing through Bactrian gates, the frozen land. Of Media, and through Araby the blessed. With Asia's wide extended continent. In Sophocles, also, a person is introduced speaking the praises of Nyssa as being a mountain sacred to Bacchus, whence I beheld the famed Nyssa, the resort of the Bacchanalian bands, which the horned Iacus makes his most pleasant and beloved retreat, where no bird's clang is heard, and so on. He is called also Meritrafes. Homer also mentions Lycurgus the Edonian in these words, who formerly pursued the nurses of the infuriate Bacchus along the sacred mountain Nyssa. So much respecting Bacchus. But with regard to Hercules, some persons say, that he penetrated to the opposite extremities on the west only, while others maintain that he also advanced to those of the east. 1.8 From such stories as those related above, they gave the name of Nicaeans to some imaginary nation, and called their city Nyssa, founded by Bacchus, a mountain above the city they called Marin, alleging as a reason for imposing these names that the ivy and vine grow there, although the latter does not perfect its fruit, for the bunches of grapes, in consequence of excessive rains, drop off before they arrive at maturity. They say, also, that the Cydrici, Oxydrici, are descendants of Bacchus, because the vine grows in their country, and because their kings display great pomp in setting out on their warlike expeditions, after the Bacchi manner, whenever they appear in public, it is with beating of drums, and are dressed in flowered robes, which is the common custom among the other Indians. 13 When Alexander took, on the first assault, Aornos, a fortress on a rock, the foot of which is washed by the Indus near its source, his flatterers exaggerated this act, and said that Hercules thrice assailed this rock and was thrice repulsed. They pretended that the Sibi were descended from the people who accompanied Hercules in his expedition, and that they retained badges of their descent, that they wore skins like Hercules, and carried clubs, and branded with the mark of a club their oxen and mules. They confirmed this fable with stories about Caucasus and Prometheus, for they transferred hither from Pontus these tales, on the slight pretense that they had seen a sacred cave among the Peropomycidae. This they alleged was the prison of Prometheus, that Hercules came hither to release Prometheus, and that this mountain was the Caucasus, to which the Greeks represent Prometheus as having been bound. 1.9 That these are the inventions of the flatterers of Alexander is evident, first, because the writers do not agree with one another, some of whom speak of these things, others make no mention of them whatever. For it is not probable, that actions so illustrious, and calculated to foster pride and vanity, should be unknown, or if known, that they should not be thought worthy of record, especially by writers of the greatest credit. Besides, the intervening people, through whose country the armies of Bacchus and Hercules must have marched in their way to India, do not exhibit any proofs of their passage through the country. The kind of dress, too, of Hercules is much more recent than the memorials of Troy, an invention of those who composed the Heraclea, or exploits of Hercules, whether it were Pisander or someone else who composed it. But the ancient wooden statues do not represent Hercules in that attire. 1.10 Under such circumstances, therefore, we must receive everything that approaches nearest to probability. I have already discussed this subject to the extent of my ability at the beginning of this work, I shall now assume those opinions as clearly proved, and shall add whatever may seem to be required for the sake of perspicuity. It appeared from the former discussion, that in the summary given by Eratosthenes, in the third book of his geography, is contained the most credible account of the country considered as India at the time of its invasion by Alexander. At that period the Indus was the boundary of India and of Ariana, situated towards the west, and in the possession of the Persians, for afterwards the Indians occupied a larger portion of Ariana, which they had received from the Macedonians. The account of Eratosthenes is as follows. 1.11 The boundaries of India, on the north, from Ariana to the eastern sea, are the extremities of Taurus, to the several parts of which the natives give, besides others, the names of Peropomesis, Imagus, and Emmaus, but the Macedonians call them Caucasus, on the west, the river Indus, the southern and eastern sides, which are much larger than the others, project towards the Atlantic Sea, and the figure of the country becomes rhomboidal, each of the greater sides exceeding the opposite by 3,000 stadia, and this is the extent of the extremity, common to the eastern and southern coast, and which projects beyond the rest of that coast equally on the east and south. The western side, from the Caucasian mountains to the southern sea, is estimated at 13,000 stadia, along the river Indus to its mouth, where for the eastern side opposite, with the addition of the 3,000 stadia of the promontory, will be 16,000 stadia in extent. This is both the smallest and greatest breadth of India. The length is reckoned from west to east. The part of this extending, from the Indus, as far as Palabatra we may describe more confidently, for it has been measured by Shoni, and is a royal road of 10,000 stadia. 
The extent of the parts beyond depends upon conjecture derived from the ascent of vessels from the sea by the Ganges to Palabhadra. This may be estimated at 6,000 stadia. The whole, on the shortest computation, will amount to 16,000 stadia, according to Eratosthenes, who says that he took it from the register of the Stathmi, or the several stages from place to place, which was received as authentic, and Megasthenes agrees with him. But Patrocles says, that the sum of the whole is less by 1,000 stadia. If again we add to this distance the extent of the extremity which advances far towards the east, the greatest length of India will be 3,000 stadia. This length is reckoned from the mouths of the river Indus along the coast, in a line with the mouths to the above-mentioned extremity and its eastern limits. Here the people called Koniachi live. 1.12 From what has been said, we may perceive how the opinions of the other writers differ from one another. Tejas says that India is not less than the rest of Asia, one Zikritis regards it as the third part of the habitable world, Nearchus says that it is a march of four months through the plain only. The computations of Megasthenes and Demachus are more moderate, for they estimate the distance from the southern sea to Caucasus at above 20,000 stadia. Demachus says that in some places it exceeds 30,000 stadia. We have replied to these writers in the early part of this work. At present it is sufficient to say that these opinions are in favor of the writers who, in describing India, solicit indulgence if they do not advance anything with confidence. 1.13 The whole of India is watered by rivers, some of which empty themselves into the two largest, the Indus and the Ganges, others discharge themselves into the sea by their own mouths. But all of them have their sources in the Caucasus. At their commencement their course is towards the south, some of them continue to flow in the same direction, particularly those which unite with the Indus, others turn to the east, as the Ganges. This, the largest of the Indian rivers, descends from the mountainous country, and when it reaches the plains, turns to the east, then flowing past Palavatra, a very large city, proceeds onwards to the sea in that quarter, and discharges its waters by a single mouth. The Indus falls into the southern sea, and empties itself by two mouths, encompassing the country called Pataline, which resembles the delta of Egypt. By the exhalation of vapors from such vast rivers, and by the Atesian winds, India, as Eratosthenes affirms, is watered by summer rains, and the plains are overflowed. During the rainy season flax, millet, sesamum, rice, and bosmorum are sowed, and in the winter season, wheat, barley, pulse, and other esculent fruits of the earth with which we are not acquainted. Nearly the same animals are bred in India as in Ethiopia and Egypt, and the rivers of India produce all the animals of those countries, except the hippopotamus, although one Zikritus asserts that even this animal is found in them. The inhabitants of the south resemble the Ethiopians in color, but their countenances and hair are like those of other people. Their hair does not curl, on account of the humidity of the atmosphere. The inhabitants of the north resemble the Egyptians. 1.14 Taprobane is said to be an island, lying out at sea, distant from the most southerly parts of India, which are opposite the Koniachi, seven days sail towards the south. Its length is about 8,000 stadia in the direction of Ethiopia. It produces elephants. This is the account of Eratosthenes. The accounts of other writers, in addition to this, whenever they convey exact information, will contribute to form the description, of India. 1.151 Zikritus, for example, says of Taprobane, that its magnitude is 5,000 stadia, without distinction of length or breadth, and that it is distant 20 days sail from the continent, but that it was a voyage performed with difficulty and danger by vessels with sails ill-constructed, and built with prows at each end, but without holds and keels, that there are other islands between this and India, but that Taprobane lies farthest to the south, that there are found in the sea, about the island, animals of the cetaceous kind, in form like oxen, horses, and other land animals. 1.16 Nearchus, speaking of the accretion of earth formed by the rivers, adduces these instances. The plains of Hermos, Caister, Meander, and Caicus have these names, because they have been formed by the soil which has been carried over the plains by the rivers, or rather they were produced by the fine and soft soil brought down from the mountains, whence the plains are, as it were, the offspring of the rivers, and it is rightly said, that the plains belong to the rivers. What is said by Herodotus of the Nile, and of the land about it, may be applied to this country, namely, that it is the gift of the Nile. Hence Nearchus thinks that the Nile had properly the synonym of Egypt. 1.17 Aristobulus, however, says, that rain and snow fall only on the mountains and the country immediately below them, and that the plains experience neither one nor the other, but are overflowed only by the rise of the waters of the rivers, that the mountains are covered with snow in the winter, that the rains set in at the commencement of spring, and continue to increase, that at the time of the blowing of the Atesian winds they pour down impetuously, without intermission, night and day till the rising of Arcturus, 
and that the rivers, filled by the melting of the snow and by the rains, irrigate the flat grounds. These things, he says, were observed by himself and by others on their journey into India from the Parokami city. This was after the setting of the Pleiades, and during their stay in the mountainous country in the territory of the High Pass Ai, and in that of Asicanus during the winter. At the beginning of spring they descended into the plains to a large city called Tixila, thence they proceeded to the Hydaspes and the country of Porus. During the winter they saw no rain, but only snow. The first rain which fell was at Tixila. After their descent to the Hydaspes and the conquest of Porus, their progress was eastwards to the High Pawnees, and thence again to the Hydaspes. At this time it rained continually, and particularly during the blowing of the Atesian winds, but at the rising of Arcturus the rain ceased. They remained at the Hydaspes while the ships were constructing, and began their voyage not many days before the setting of the Pleiades, and were occupied during the whole autumn, winter, and the ensuing spring and summer, in sailing down the river, and arrived at Pataline about the rising of the Dog Star, during the passage down the river, which lasted ten months, they did not experience rain at any place, not even when the Atesian winds were at their height, when the rivers were full and the plains overflowed, the sea could not be navigated on account of the blowing of contrary winds, but no land breezes succeeded. 1.18 Nearchus gives the same account, but does not agree with Aristobulus respecting the rains in summer, but says that the plains are watered by rain in the summer, and that they are without rain in winter. Both writers, however, speak of the rise of the rivers. Nearchus says, that the men encamped upon the Assisians were obliged to change their situation for another more elevated, and that this was at the time of the rise of the river, and of the summer solstice. Aristobulus gives even the measure of the height to which the river rises, namely, forty cubits, of which twenty would fill the channel beyond its previous depth up to the margin, and the other twenty are the measure of the water when it overflows the plains. They agree also in saying that the cities placed upon mounds become islands, as in Egypt and Ethiopia, and that the inundation ceases after the rising of Arcturus, when the waters recede. They add, that the ground when half dried is sowed, after having been prepared by the commonest labourer, yet the plant comes to perfection, and the produce is good. The rice, according to Aristobulus, stands in water in an enclosure. It is sowed in beds. The plant is four cubits in height, with many ears, and yields a large produce. The harvest is about the time of the setting of the Pleiades, and the grain is beaten out like barley. It grows in Bactriana, Babylonia, Susis, and in the lower Syria. Megillus says that it is sowed before the rains, but does not require irrigation or transplantation, being supplied with water from tanks. The Bosmorum, according to Onesicritus, is a kind of corn smaller than wheat, and grows in places situated between rivers. After it is threshed out, it is roasted, the threshers being previously bound by an oath not to carry it away unroasted from the threshing floor, a precaution to prevent the exportation of the seed. 1.19 Aristobulus, when comparing the circumstances in which this country resembles, and those in which it differs from, Egypt and Ethiopia, and observing that the swelling of the Nile is occasioned by rains in the south, and of the Indian rivers by rains from the north, inquires why the intermediate places have no rain, for it does not rain in the Thebais as far as Syene, nor at the places near Meroe, nor in the parts of India from Pataline to the Hydaspes. But the country situated above these parts, in which both rain and snow occur, is cultivated by the husbandman in the same manner as the country without India, for the rain and the snow supply the ground with moisture. It is probable from what he relates that the country is subject to shocks of earthquakes, that the ground is loose and hollow by excess of moisture, and easily splits into fissures, whence even the course of rivers is altered. He says that when he was dispatched upon some business into the country, he saw a tract of land deserted, which contained more than a thousand cities with their dependent villages, the Indus, having left its proper channel, was diverted into another, on the left hand, much deeper, and precipitated itself into it like a cataract, so that it no longer watered the country by the, usual, inundation on the right hand, from which it had receded, and this was elevated above the level, not only of the new channel of the river, but above that of the, new, inundation. 1.20 The account of Onesicritus confirms the facts of the rising of the rivers and of the absence of land breezes. He says that the seashore is swampy, particularly near the mouths of rivers, on account of the mud, tides, and the force of the winds blowing from the sea. Megasthenes also indicates the fertility of India by the circumstance of the soil producing fruits and grain twice a year. Eratosthenes relates the same facts, for he speaks of a winter and a summer sowing, and of the rain at the same seasons. For there is no year, according to him, which is without rain at both those periods, whence ensues great abundance, the ground never failing to bear crops. An abundance of fruit is produced by trees, and the roots of plants, particularly of large reeds, possess a sweetness, 
which they have by nature and by coction, for the water, both from rains and rivers, is warmed by the sun's rays. The meaning of Eratosthenes seems to be this, that what among other nations is called the ripening of fruits and juices, is called among these coction, and which contributes as much to produce an agreeable flavor as the coction by fire. To this is attributed the flexibility of the branches of trees, from which wheels of carriages are made, and to the same cause is imputed the growth upon some trees of wool. Nearchus says that their fine clothes were made of this wool, and that the Macedonians used it for mattresses and the stuffing of saddles. The serica also are of a similar kind, and are made of dry byssus, which is obtained from some sort of bark of plants. He says that reeds yield honey, although there are no bees, and that there is a tree from the fruit of which honey is procured, but that the fruit eaten fresh causes intoxication. 1.21 India produces many singular trees. There is one whose branches incline downwards, and whose leaves are not less in size than a shield. One Zicritus, describing minutely the country of Musicanus, which he says is the most southerly part of India, relates, that there are some large trees the branches of which extend to the length even of twelve cubits. They then grow downwards, as though bent, by force, till they touch the earth, where they penetrate and take root like layers. They next shoot upwards and form a trunk. They again grow as we have described, bending downwards, and implanting one layer after another, and in the above order, so that one tree forms a long shady roof, like a tent, supported by many pillars. In speaking of the size of the trees, he says their trunks could scarcely be clasped by five men. Aristobulus also, where he mentions the Assisians, and its confluence with the higher Rhodus, speaks of trees with their boughs bent downwards and of a size that fifty, but, according to one Zicritus, four hundred horsemen might take shelter at midday beneath the shade of a single tree. Aristobulus mentions another tree, not large, bearing great pods, like the bean, ten fingers in length, full of honey, and says that those who eat it do not easily escape with life. But the accounts of all these writers about the size of the trees have been exceeded by those who assert that there has been seen, beyond the higher Rhodus, a tree which casts a shade at noon of five stadia. Aristobulus says of the wool-bearing trees, that the flower pod contains a kernel, which is taken out, and the remainder is combed like wool. 1.22 In the country of Musicanus there grows, he says, spontaneously grain resembling wheat, and a vine that produces wine, whereas other authors affirm that there is no wine in India. Hence, according to Anacharsis, they had no pipes, nor any musical instruments, except cymbals, drums, and crotala, which were used by jugglers. Both Aristobulus and other writers relate that India produces many medicinal plants and roots, both of a salutary and noxious quality, and plants yielding a variety of colors. He adds, that, by a law, any person discovering a deadly substance is punished with death unless he also discover an antidote, in case he discovers an antidote, he is rewarded by the king. Southern India, like Arabia and Ethiopia, produces cinnamon, nard, and other aromatics. It resembles these countries as regards the effect of the sun's rays, but it surpasses them in having a copious supply of water, whence the atmosphere is humid, and on this account more conducive to fertility and fecundity, and this applies to the earth and to the water, hence those animals which inhabit both one and the other are of a larger size than are found in other countries. The Nile contributes to fecundity more than other rivers, and among other animals of large bulk, produces the amphibious kind. The Egyptian women also sometimes have four children at a birth, and Aristotle says that one woman had seven children at one birth. He calls the Nile most fecundating and nutritive, on account of the moderate coction affected by the sun's rays, which leave behind the nutritious part of substances, and evaporate that which is superfluous. 1.23 It is perhaps owing to this cause that the water of the Nile boils, as he says, with one half of the heat which other water requires. In proportion however, he says, as the water of the Nile traverses in a straight line, a long and narrow tract of country, passing through a variety of climates and of atmosphere, while the Indian rivers are poured forth into wider and more extensive plains, their course being delayed a long time in the same climate, in the same degree the waters of India are more nutritious than those of the Nile, they produce larger animals of the cetaceous kind, and in greater number, than the Nile, and the water which descends from the clouds has already undergone the process of coction. 1.24 This would not be admitted by the followers of Aristobulus, who say that the plains are not watered by rain. One Zicritus, however, thinks that rainwater is the cause of the peculiar properties of animals, and alleges in proof, that the color of foreign herds which drink of it is changed to that of the native animals. This is a just remark, but it is not proper to attribute to the power of the water merely the cause of the black complexion and the woolly hair of the Ethiopians, and yet he censures Theodex, who refers these peculiarities to the effects of the sun in these words, near these approaching with his radiant car. The sun their skins with dusky tint doth die. 
and sooty hue, and with unvarying forms. Of fire, crisps their tufted hair. There may be reason in this, for he says that the sun does not approach nearer to the Ethiopians than to other nations, but shines more perpendicularly, and that on this account the heat is greater, indeed, it cannot be correctly said that the sun approaches near to the Ethiopians, for he is at an equal distance from all nations. Nor is the heat the cause of the black complexion, particularly of children in the womb, who are out of the reach of the sun. Their opinion is to be preferred, who attribute these effects to the sun and to intense solar heat, causing a great deficiency of moisture on the surface of the skin. Hence we say it is that the Indians have not woolly hair, nor is their color so intensely dark, because they live in a humid atmosphere. With respect to children in the womb, they resemble their parents, in color, according to a seminal disposition and constitution, on the same principle that hereditary diseases, and other likenesses, are explained. The equal distance of the sun from all nations, according to one Zecritus, is an argument addressed to the senses, and not to reason. But it is not an argument addressed to the senses generally, but in the meaning that the earth bears the proportion of a point to the sun, for we may understand such a meaning of an argument addressed to the senses, by which we estimate heat to be more or less, as it is near or at a distance, in which cases it is not the same, and in this meaning, not in that of one Zecritus, the sun is said to be near the Ethiopians. 1.25 It is admitted by those who maintain the resemblance of India to Egypt and Ethiopia, that the plains which are not overflowed do not produce anything for want of water. Nearchus says, that the old question respecting the rise of the Nile is answered by the case of the Indian rivers, namely, that it is the effect of summer rains, when Alexander saw crocodiles in the Hydaspes, and Egyptian beans in the Assisines, he thought that he had discovered the sources of the Nile and was about to equip a fleet with the intention of sailing by this river to Egypt, but he found out shortly afterwards that his design could not be accomplished, for in midway were vast rivers, fearful waters, and first the ocean, into which all the Indian rivers discharged themselves, then Ariana, the Persian and Arabian Gulfs, all Arabia and Troglodytica. The above is what has been said on the subject of winds and rains, the rising of rivers, and the inundation of plains. 1.26 We must describe these rivers in detail, with the particulars, which are useful for the purposes of geography, and which have been handed down to us by historians. Besides this, rivers, being a kind of physical boundaries of the size and figures of countries, are of the greatest use in every part of the present work. But the Nile and the rivers in India have a superiority above the rest, because the country could not be inhabited without them. By means of the rivers it is open to navigation and capable of cultivation, when otherwise it would not be accessible, nor could it be occupied by inhabitants. We shall speak of the rivers deserving notice, which flow into the Indus, and of the countries which they traverse, with regard to the rest we know some particulars, but are ignorant of more. Alexander, who discovered the greatest portion of this country, first of all resolved it to be more expedient to pursue and destroy those who had treacherously killed Darius, and were meditating the revolt of Bactriana. He approached India therefore through Ariana, which he left on the right hand, and crossed the Peropamesis to the northern parts, and to Bactriana having conquered all the country subject to the Persians, and many other places besides, he then entertained the desire of possessing India, of which he had received many, although indistinct, accounts. He therefore returned, crossing over the same mountains by other and shorter roads, having India on the left hand, he then immediately turned towards it, and towards its western boundaries and the rivers Kofis and Coasps. The latter river empties itself into the Kofis, near Plemirium, after passing by another city Gores, in its course through Bandobin and Ganderitis. He was informed that the mountainous and northern parts were the most habitable and fertile, but that the southern part was either without water, or liable to be overflowed by rivers at one time, or entirely burnt up at another, more fit to be the haunts of wild beasts than the dwellings of men. He resolved therefore to get possession of that part of India first which had been well spoken of, considering at the same time that the rivers which it was necessary to pass, and which flowed transversely through the country which he intended to attack, would be crossed with more facility near their sources. He heard also that many of the rivers united and formed one stream, and that this more frequently occurred the farther they advanced into the country, so that from one of boats it would be more difficult to traverse. Being apprehensive of this obstruction, he crossed the Kofis, and conquered the whole of the mountainous country situated towards the east. 1.27 Next to the Kofis was the Indus, then the Hydaspes, the Assisines, the Hyerotus, and last, the Hypanes. He was prevented from proceeding farther, partly from regard to some oracles, and partly compelled by his army, which was exhausted by toil and fatigue, but whose principal distress arose from their constant exposure to rain. Hence we became acquainted with the eastern parts of India on this side the high Pawnees, and whatever parts besides which have been described by those who, after Alexander, advanced beyond the high Pawnees to the Ganges and Palabatra. 
after the river Kofis, follows the Indus. The country lying between these two rivers is occupied by Astaseni, Majani, Nicei, and Hypas Ai. Next is the territory of Asicanus, where is the city Masaga, Masaga? The royal residence of the country. Near the Indus is another city, Pucolates. At this place a bridge which was constructed afforded a passage for the army. 1.28 Between the Indus and the Hydaspes is Tuxila, a large city, and governed by good laws. The neighboring country is crowded with inhabitants and very fertile, and here unites with the plains. The people and their king Taxiles received Alexander with kindness, and obtained in return more presents than they had offered to Alexander, so that the Macedonians became jealous, and observed, that it seemed as if Alexander had found none on whom he could confer favors before he passed the Indus. Some writers say that this country is larger than Egypt. Above this country among the mountains is the territory of Abyssarus, who, as the ambassadors that came from him reported, kept two serpents, one of eighty, and the other, according to one Zecritus, of one hundred forty cubits in length. This writer may as well be called the master fabulist as the master pilot of Alexander. For all those who accompanied Alexander preferred the marvelous to the true, but this writer seems to have surpassed all in his description of prodigies. Some things, however, he relates which are probable and worthy of record, and will not be passed over in silence even by one who does not believe their correctness. Other writers also mention the hunting of serpents in the Amodi mountains, and the keeping and feeding of them in caves. 1.29 Between the Hydaspes and Assisines is the country of Porus, an extensive and fertile district, containing nearly 300 cities. Here also is the forest in the neighborhood of the Amodi mountains in which Alexander cut down a large quantity of fir, pine, cedar, and a variety of other trees fit for shipbuilding and brought the timber down the Hydaspes. With this he constructed a fleet on the Hydaspes, near the cities, which he built on each side of the river where he had crossed it and conquered Porus. One of these cities he called Bucephalia, from the horse Bucephalus, which was killed in the battle with Porus. The name Bucephalus was given to it from the breadth of its forehead. He was an excellent war horse, and Alexander constantly rode him in battle. The other city he called Nicaea from the victory, New Iota Kappa Eta, Nike, which he had obtained. In the forest before mentioned it is said there is a vast number of monkeys, and as large as they are numerous. On one occasion the Macedonians, seeing a body of them standing in array opposite to them, on some bare eminences, for this animal is not less intelligent than the elephant, and presenting the appearance of an army, prepared to attack them as real enemies, but being informed by Taxiles, who was then with the king, of the real fact, they desisted. The chase of this animal is conducted in two different manners. It is an imitative creature, and takes refuge up among the trees. The hunters, when they perceive a monkey seated on a tree, place inside a basin containing water, with which they wash their own eyes, then, instead of water, they put a basin of bird lime, go away, and lie in wait at a distance. The animal leaps down, and besmears itself with the bird lime, and when it winks, the eyelids are fastened together, the hunters then come upon it, and take it. The other method of capturing them is as follows, the hunters dress themselves in bags like trousers, and go away, leaving behind them others which are downy, with the inside smeared over with bird lime. The monkeys put them on, and are easily taken. 1.30 Some writers place Cathaya and the country of Sapiths, one of the nomarchs, in the tract between the rivers, Hydaspes and Assisines, some, on the other side of the Assisines and of the Hierotus, on the confines of the territory of the other Porus, the nephew of Porus who was taken prisoner by Alexander, and call the country subject to him Gandarus. A very singular usage is related of the high estimation in which the inhabitants of Cathaya hold the quality of beauty, which they extend to horses and dogs. According to one Zecritus, they elect the handsomest person as king. The child, selected, two months after birth, undergoes a public inspection, and is examined. They determine whether it has the amount of beauty required by law, and whether it is worthy to be permitted to live. The presiding magistrate then pronounces whether it is to be allowed to live, or whether it is to be put to death. They dye their heads with various and the most florid colors, for the purpose of improving their appearance. This custom prevails elsewhere among many of the Indians, who pay great attention to their hair and dress, and the country produces colors of great beauty. In other respects the people are frugal, but are fond of ornament. A peculiar custom is related of the Kathae. The bride and the husband are respectively the choice of each other, and the wives burn themselves with their deceased husbands. The reason assigned for this practice is, that the women sometimes fell in love with young men, and deserted or poisoned their husbands. This law was therefore established in order to check the practice of administering poison, but neither the existence nor the origin of the law are probable facts. It is said, that in the territory of Sapiths there is a mountain composed of fossil salt, 
sufficient for the whole of India. Valuable mines also both of gold and silver are situated, it is said, not far off among other mountains, according to the testimony of Gorgas, the miner, of Alexander. The Indians, unacquainted with mining and smelting, are ignorant of their own wealth, and therefore traffic with greater simplicity. 1.31 The dogs in the territory of Sapedes are said to possess remarkable courage. Alexander received from Sapedes a present of 150 of them. To prove them, two were set at a lion, when these were mastered, two others were set on. When the battle became equal, Sapedes ordered a man to seize one of the dogs by the leg, and to drag him away, or to cut off his leg, if he still held on. Alexander at first refused his consent to the dog's leg being cut off, as he wished to save the dog. But on Sapedes saying, I will give you four in the place of it, Alexander consented, and he saw the dog permit his leg to be cut off by a slow incision, rather than loose his hold. 1.32 The direction of the march, as far as the Hydaspes, was for the most part towards the south. After that, to the Hypanes, it was more towards the east. The whole of it, however, was much nearer to the country lying at the foot of the mountains than to the plains. Alexander therefore, when he returned from the Hypanes to the Hydaspes and the station of his vessels, prepared his fleet, and set sail on the Hydaspes. All the rivers which have been mentioned, the last of which is the Hypanes, unite in one, the Indus. It is said that there are altogether fifteen considerable rivers which flow into the Indus. After the Indus has been filled by all these rivers, so as to be enlarged in some places to the extent of a hundred stadia, according to writers who exaggerate, or, according to a more moderate estimate, to fifty stadia at the utmost, and at the least to seven, and who speak of many nations and cities about this river, it discharges itself by two mouths into the southern sea, and forms the island called Pataline. Alexander's intention was to relinquish the march towards the part situated to the east, first, because he was prevented from crossing the Hypanes, next, because he learnt by experience the falsehood of the reports previously received, to the effect that the plains were burnt up with fire, and more fit for the haunts of wild beasts than for the habitation of man. He therefore set out in this direction, relinquishing the other track, so that these parts became better known than the other. 1.33 The territory lying between the Hypanes and the Hydaspes is said to contain nine nations and five thousand cities, not less in size than Cosmoropus, but the number seems to be exaggerated. We have already mentioned nearly all the nations deserving of notice, which inhabit the country situated between the Indus and the Hydaspes. Below, and next in order, are the people called Sibi, whom we formerly mentioned, and the great nations, the Mali and Sidraki, Oxydraki. It was among the Mali that Alexander was in danger of losing his life, from a wound he received at the capture of a small city. The Sidraki, we have said, are fabled to be allied to Bacchus. Near Pataline is placed the country of Musicanus, that of Sibus, whose capital is Sindamana, that of Porticanus, and of other princes who inhabited the country on the banks of the Indus. They were all conquered by Alexander, last of all he made himself master of Pataline, which is formed by the two branches of the Indus. Aristobulus says that these two branches are distant 1,000 stadia from each other. Nearchus adds 800 stadia more to this number. One Zecritus reckons each side of the included island, which is of a triangular shape, at 2,000 stadia, and the breadth of the river, where it is separated into two mouths, at about 200 stadia. He calls the island Delta, and says that it is as large as the Delta of Egypt, but this is a mistake. For the Egyptian Delta is said to have a base of 1,300 stadia and each of the sides to be less than the base. In Patalina is Patala, a considerable city, from which the island has its name. 1.341 Zecritus says, that the greatest part of the coast in this quarter abounds with swamps, particularly at the mouths of the river, which is owing to the mud, the tides, and the want of land breezes, for these parts are chiefly under the influence of winds blowing from the sea. He expatiates also in praise of the country of Musicanus, and relates of the inhabitants what is common to other Indian tribes, that they are long-lived, and that life is protracted even to the age of 130 years. The seers, however, are said by some writers to be still longer lived, that they are temperate in their habits and healthy, although the country produces everything in abundance. The following are their peculiarities, to have a kind of Lacedaemonian common meal, where they eat in public. Their food consists of what is taken in the chase. They make no use of gold nor silver, although they have mines of these metals. Instead of slaves, they employed youths in the flower of their age, as the Cretans employ the Ephemiati, and the Lacedaemonians the Helots. They study no science with attention but that of medicine, for they consider the excessive pursuit of some arts, as that of war, and the like, to be committing evil. There is no process at law but against murder and outrage, for it is not in a person's own power to escape either one or the other, but as contracts are in the power of each individual, 
he must endure the wrong, if good faith is violated by another, for a man should be cautious whom he trusts, and not disturb the city with constant disputes in courts of justice. Such are the accounts of the persons who accompanied Alexander in his expedition. 1.35 A letter of Craterus to his mother Aristopatra is circulated, which contains many other singular circumstances, and differs from every other writer, particularly in saying that Alexander advanced as far as the Ganges. Craterus says, that he himself saw the river, and the whales which it produces, and, his account, of its magnitude, breadth, and depth, far exceeds, rather than approximates, probability. For that the Ganges is the largest of known rivers in the three continents, it is generally agreed, next to this is the Indus, and, thirdly, the Danube, and, fourthly, the Nile. But different authors differ in their account of it, some assigning thirty, others three stadia, as the least breadth. But Megasthenes says that its ordinary width is one hundred stadia, and its least depth twenty orgy. 1.36 At the confluence of the Ganges and of another river, the Aranaboas, is situated, the city, Palabatra, in length eighty, and in breadth fifteen stadia. It is in the shape of a parallelogram, surrounded by a wooden wall pierced with openings through which arrows may be discharged. In front is a ditch, which serves the purpose of defense and of a sewer for the city. The people in whose country the city is situated are the most distinguished of all the tribes, and are called Prasii. The king, besides his family name, has the surname of Palabothrus, as the king to whom Megasthenes was sent on an embassy had the name of Sandrocotus. Such also is the custom among the Parthians, for all have the name Arsaki, although each has his peculiar name of Orodes, Phreates, or some other appellation. 1.37 All the country on the other side of the Hypones is allowed to be very fertile, but we have no accurate knowledge of it. Either through ignorance or from its remote situation, everything relative to it is exaggerated or partakes of the wonderful. As, for example, the stories of mermses, or ants, which dig up gold, of animals and men with peculiar shapes, and possessing extraordinary faculties, of the longevity of the seers, whose lives exceed the age of two hundred years. They speak also of an aristocratical form of government, consisting of five hundred counselors, each of whom furnishes the state with an elephant. According to Megasthenes, the largest tigers are found among the Prasii, almost twice the size of lions, and of such strength that a tame one led by four persons seized a mule by its hinder leg, overpowered it, and dragged it to him. The monkeys are larger than the largest dogs, they are of a white color, except the face, which is black. The contrary is observed in other places. Their tails are more than two cubits in length. They are very tame, and not of a mischievous disposition. They neither attack people, nor steal. Stones are found there of the color of frankincense, and sweeter than figs or honey. In some places there are serpents of two cubits in length, with membranous wings like bats. They fly at night, and let fall drops of urine or sweat, which occasions the skin of persons who are not on their guard to putrefy. There are also winged scorpions of great size. Ebony grows there. There are also dogs of great courage, which do not loose their hold till water is poured into their nostrils, some of them destroy their sight, and the eyes of others even fall out, by the eagerness of their bite. Both a lion and a bull were held fast by one of these dogs. The bull was caught by the muzzle, and died before the dog could be loosened. 1.38 In the mountainous country is a river, the Silas, on the surface of which nothing will float. Democritus, who had travelled over a large part of Asia, disbelieves this, and Aristotle does not credit it, although atmospheres exist so rare, that no bird can sustain its flight in them. Vapors also, which ascend, from some substances, attract and absorb, as it were, whatever is flying over them, as amber attracts straw, and the magnet iron, and perhaps there may be in water a similar power. As these matters belong to physics and to the question of floating bodies, these must be referred to them. At present we must proceed to what follows, and to the subjects more nearly relating to geography. 1.39 It is said that the Indians are divided into seven castes. The first in rank, but the smallest in number, are the philosophers. Persons who intend to offer sacrifice, or to perform any sacred rite, have the services of these persons on their private account, but the kings employ them in a public capacity at the time of the great assembly, as it is called, where at the beginning of the new year all the philosophers repair to the king at the gate, and anything useful which they have committed to writing, or observed, tending to improve the productions of the earth or animals, or of advantage to the government of the state, is then publicly declared. Whoever has been detected in giving false information thrice is enjoined silence by law during the rest of his life, but he who has made correct observations is exempted from all contributions and tribute. 1.40 The second caste is that of husbandmen, who constitute the majority of natives, and are a most mild and gentle people, 
as they are exempted from military service, and cultivate their land free from alarm, they do not resort to cities, either to transact private business, or take part in public tumults it therefore frequently happens that at the same time, and in the same part of the country, one body of men are in battle array, and engaged in contests with the enemy, while others are plowing or digging in security, having these soldiers to protect them. The whole of the territory belongs to the king. They cultivate it on the terms of receiving as wages a fourth part of the produce. 1.41 The third caste consists of shepherds and hunters, who alone are permitted to hunt, to breed cattle, to sell and to let out for higher beasts of burden. In return for freeing the country from wild beasts and birds, which infest sown fields, they receive an allowance of corn from the king. They lead a wandering life, and dwell in tents. No private person is allowed to keep a horse or an elephant. The possession of either one or the other is a royal privilege, and persons are appointed to take care of them. 1.42 The manner of hunting the elephant is as follows, round a bare spot a ditch is dug, of about four or five stadia in extent, and at the place of entrance a very narrow bridge is constructed. Into the enclosure three or four of the tamest female elephants are driven. The men themselves lie in wait under cover of concealed huts. The wild elephants do not approach the females by day, but at night they enter the enclosure one by one. When they have passed the entrance, the men secretly close it. They then introduce the strongest of the tame combatants, the drivers of which engage with the wild animals, and also wear them out by famine. When the latter are exhausted by fatigue, the boldest of the drivers gets down unobserved, and creeps under the belly of his own elephant. From this position he creeps beneath the belly of the wild elephant, and ties his legs together. When this is done, a signal is given to the tame elephants to beat those which are tied by the legs, till they fall to the ground. After they have fallen down, they fasten the wild and tame elephants together by the neck with thongs of raw cowhide, and, in order that they may not be able to shake off those who are attempting to mount them, cuts are made round the neck, and thongs of leather are put into these incisions, so that they submit to their bonds through pain, and so remain quiet. Among the elephants which are taken, those are rejected which are too old or too young for service, the remainder are led away to the stables. They tie their feet one to another, and their necks to a pillar firmly fastened in the ground, and tame them by hunger. They recruit their strength afterwards with green cane and grass. They then teach them to obey, some by words, others they pacify by tunes, accompanied with the beating of a drum. Few are difficult to be tamed, for they are naturally of a mild and gentle disposition, so as to approximate to the character of a rational animal. Some have taken up their drivers, who have fallen on the ground lifeless, and carried them safe out of battle. Others have fought, and protected their drivers, who have crept between their forelegs. If they have killed any of their feeders or masters in anger, they feel their loss so much that they refuse their food through grief, and sometimes die of hunger. 1.43 They copulate like horses, and produce young chiefly in the spring. It is the season for the male, when he is in heat and is ferocious. At this period he discharges some fatty matter through an opening in the temples. It is the season also for the females, when this same passage is open, 18 months is the longest, and 16 the shortest period that they go with young. The dam suckles her young six years, many of them live as long as men who attain to the greatest longevity, some even to the protracted age of 200 years. They are subject to many diseases, which are difficult to be cured. A remedy for diseases of the eye is to bathe them with cow's milk. For complaints in general, they drink dark wine. In cases of wounds, they drink butter, for it draws out iron instruments, their sores are fomented with swine's flesh. One Zecritus says, that they live 300 years, and rarely 500 and that they go with young ten years. He and other writers say, that they are larger and stronger than the African elephants. They will pull down with their trunks battlements, and uproot trees, standing erect upon their bind feet. According to Nearchus, traps are laid in the hunting grounds, at certain places where roads meet, the wild elephants are forced into the oils by the tame elephants, which are stronger, and guided by a driver. They become so tame and docile, that they learn even to throw a stone at a mark, to use military weapons, and to be excellent swimmers. A chariot drawn by elephants is esteemed a most important possession, and they are driven without bridles. A woman is greatly honored who receives from her lover a present of an elephant, but this does not agree with what he said before, that a horse and an elephant are the property of kings alone. 1.44 This writer says that he saw skins of the mermses, or ants, which dig up gold, as large as the skins of leopards. Megasthenes, however, speaking of the mermses, says, among the Dirde a populous nation of the Indians, living towards the east, and among the mountains, there was a mountain plain of about 3,000 stadia in circumference, that below this plain were mines containing gold, which the Mermses, in size not less than foxes, dig up. 
They are excessively fleet, and subsist on what they catch. In winter they dig holes, and pile up the earth in heaps, like moles, at the mouths of the openings. The gold dust which they obtain requires little preparation by fire. The neighboring people go after it by stealth, with beasts of burden, for if it is done openly, the mermses fight furiously, pursuing those that run away, and if they seize them, kill them and the beasts. In order to prevent discovery, they place in various parts pieces of the flesh of wild beasts, and when the mermses are dispersed in various directions. They take away the gold dust, and, not being acquainted with the mode of smelting it, dispose of it in its rude state at any price to merchants. 1.45 Having mentioned what Megasthenes and other writers relate of the hunters and the beasts of prey, we must add the following particulars. Nearchus is surprised at the multitude and the noxious nature of the tribe of reptiles. They retreat from the plains to the settlements, which are not covered with water at the period of inundations, and fill the houses. For this reason the inhabitants raise their beds at some height from the ground, and are sometimes compelled to abandon their dwellings, when they are infested by great multitudes of these animals, and, if a great proportion of these multitudes were not destroyed by the waters, the country would be a desert. Both the minuteness of some animals and the excessive magnitude of others are causes of danger, the former, because it is difficult to guard against their attacks, the latter, on account of their strength, for snakes are to be seen of sixteen cubits in length. Charmers go about the country, and are supposed to cure wounds made by serpents. This seems to comprise nearly their whole art of medicine, for disease is not frequent among them, which is owing to their frugal manner of life, and to the absence of wine. Whenever diseases do occur, they are treated by the sophisti, or wise men. Aristobulus says, that he saw no animals of these pretended magnitudes, except a snake, which was nine cubits and a span in length. And I myself saw one in Egypt, nearly of the same size, which was brought from India. He says also, that he saw many serpents of a much inferior size, and asps and large scorpions. None of these, however, are so noxious as the slender small serpents, a span long, which are found concealed in tents, in vessels, and in hedges. Persons wounded by them bleed from every pore, suffering great pain, and die, unless they have immediate assistance, but this assistance is easily obtained, by means of the virtues of the Indian roots and drugs. Few crocodiles, he says, are found in the Indus, and these are harmless, but most of the other animals, except the hippopotamus, are the same as those found in the Nile, but one Zecritus says that this animal also is found there. According to Aristobulus, none of the sea fish ascend the Nile from the sea, except the shad, the grey mullet, and dolphin, on account of the crocodiles, but great numbers ascend the Indus. Small crawfish go up as far as the mountains, and the larger as far as the confluence of the Indus and the Assisians. So much then on the subject of the wild animals of India. We shall return to Megasthenes, and resume our account where we digressed. 1.46 After the hunters and the shepherds, follows the fourth caste, which consists, he says, of those who work at trades, retail wares, and who are employed in bodily labor. Some of these pay taxes, and perform certain stated services. But the armor makers and shipbuilders receive wages and provisions from the king, for whom only they work. The general in chief furnishes the soldiers with arms, and the admiral lets out ships for hire to those who undertake voyages and traffic as merchants. 1.47 The fifth caste consists of fighting men, who pass the time not employed in the field in idleness and drinking, and are maintained at the charge of the king. They are ready whenever they are wanted to march on an expedition for they bring nothing of their own with them, except their bodies. 1.48 The sixth caste is that of the Ephori, or inspectors. They are entrusted with the superintendence of all that is going on, and it is their duty to report privately to the king. The city inspectors employ as their coadjutors the city courtesans, and the inspectors of the camp, the women who follow it. The best and the most faithful persons are appointed to the office of inspector. 1.49 The seventh caste consists of counselors and assessors of the king. To these persons belong the offices of state, tribunals of justice, and the whole administration of affairs. It is not permitted to contract marriage with a person of another caste, nor to change from one profession or trade to another, nor for the same person to undertake several, except he is of the caste of philosophers, when permission is given, on account of his superior qualifications. 1.50 of the magistrates, some have the charge of the market, others of the city, others of the soldiery. Some have the care of the rivers, measure the land, as in Egypt, and inspect the closed reservoirs, from which water is distributed by canals, so that all may have an equal use of it. These persons have charge also of the hunters, and have the power of rewarding or punishing those who merit either. They collect the taxes, and superintend the occupations connected with land, 
as woodcutters, carpenters, workers in brass, and miners. They superintend the public roads, and place a pillar at every ten stadia, to indicate the byways and distances. 1.51 Those who have charge of the city are divided into six bodies of five each. The first has the inspection of everything relating to the mechanical arts, the second entertain strangers, assign lodgings, observe their mode of life, by means of attendants whom they attach to them, escort them out of the country on their departure, if they die, take charge of their property, have the care of them when sick, and when they die, bury them. The third class consists of those who inquire at what time and in what manner births and deaths take place, which is done with a view to tax, on these occasions, and in order that the deaths and births of persons both of good and bad character should not be concealed. The fourth division consists of those who are occupied in sales and exchanges, they have the charge of measures, and of the sale of the products in season, by a signal. The same person is not allowed to exchange various kinds of articles, except he pays a double tax. The fifth division presides over works of artisans, and disposes of articles by public notice. The new are sold apart from the old, and there is a fine imposed for mixing them together. The sixth and last comprises those who collect the tenth of the price of the articles sold. Death is the punishment for committing a fraud with regard to the tax. These are the peculiar duties performed by each class, but in their collective capacity they have the charge both of their own peculiar province and of civil affairs, the repairs of public works, prices of articles, of markets, harbors, and temples. 1.52 Next to the magistrates of the city is a third body of governors, who have the care of military affairs. This class also consists of six divisions, each composed of five persons. One division is associated with the chief naval superintendent, another with the person who has the charge of the bullock teams, by which military engines are transported, of provisions both for the men and beasts, and other requisites for the army. They furnish attendants, who beat a drum, and carry gongs, and besides these, grooms, mechanists, and their assistants. They dispatch by the sound of the gong the foragers for grass, and ensure expedition and security by rewards and punishments. The third division has the care of the infantry, the fourth, of the horses, the fifth, of the chariots, the sixth, of the elephants. There are royal stables for the horses and elephants. There is also a royal magazine of arms, for the soldier returns his arms to the armory, and the horse and elephant to the stables. They use the elephants without bridles. The chariots are drawn on the march by oxen. The horses are led by a halter, in order that their legs may not be chafed and inflamed, nor their spirit damped, by drawing chariots. Besides the charioteer, there are two persons who fight by his side in the chariot. With the elephant are four persons, the driver and three bowmen, who discharge arrows from his back. 1.53 All the Indians are frugal in their mode of life, and especially in camp. They do not tolerate useless and undisciplined multitudes, and consequently observe good order. Theft is very rare among them. Megasthenes, who was in the camp of Sandrocatus, which consisted of 400,000 men, did not witness on any day thefts reported, which exceeded the sum of 200 drammy, and this among a people who have no written laws, who are ignorant even of writing, and regulate everything by memory. They are, however, happy on account of their simple manners and frugal way of life. They never drink wine, but at sacrifices. Their beverage is made from rice instead of barley, and their food consists for the most part of rice pottage. The simplicity of their laws and contracts appears from their not having many lawsuits. They have no suits respecting pledges and deposits, nor do they require witnesses or seals, but make their deposits, and confide in one another. Their houses and property are unguarded. These things denote temperance and sobriety, others no one would approve, as they're eating always alone, and they're not having all of them one common hour for their meals, but each taking it as he likes. The contrary custom is more agreeable to the habits of social and civil life. 1.54 As an exercise of the body they prefer friction in various ways, but particularly by making use of smooth sticks of ebony, which they pass over the surface of the body. Their sepulchres are plain, and the tumuli of earth low. In contrast to their parsimony and other things, they indulge in ornament. They wear dresses worked with gold and precious stones, and flowered, variegated, robes, and are attended by persons following them with umbrellas, for as they highly esteem beauty, everything is attended to, which can improve their looks. They respect alike truth and virtue, therefore they do not assign any privilege to the old, unless they possess superior wisdom. They marry many wives, who are purchased from their parents, and give in exchange for them a yoke of oxen. Some marry wives to possess obedient attendants, others with a view to pleasure and numerous offspring, and the wives prostitute themselves, unless chastity is enforced by compulsion. No one wears a garland when sacrificing, or burning incense, or pouring out a libation. 
They do not stab, but strangle the victim, that nothing mutilated, but that which is entire, may be offered to the deity. A person convicted of bearing false testimony suffers a mutilation of his extremities. He who has maimed another not only undergoes in return the loss of the same limb, but his hand also is cut off. If he has caused a workman to lose his hand or his eye, he is put to death. Megasthenes says, that none of the Indians employ slaves. But, according to Onesicritus, this is peculiar to the people in the territory of Musicanus. He speaks of this as an excellent rule, and mentions many others to be found in that country, as the effects of a government by good laws. 1.55 The care of the king's person is committed to women, who are also purchased of their parents. The bodyguard, and the rest of the military, are stationed without the gates. A woman, who puts to death a king when drunk, is rewarded by becoming the wife of his successor. The sons succeed the father. The king may not sleep during the daytime, and at night he is obliged from time to time to change his bed, from dread of treachery. The king leaves his palace in time of war, he leaves it also when he goes to sit in his court as a judge. He remains there all day thus occupied, not suffering himself to be interrupted even though the time arrives for attending to his person. This attention to his person consists of friction with pieces of wood, and he continues to listen to the cause, while the friction is performed by four attendants who surround him. Another occasion of leaving his palace is to offer sacrifice. The third is a sort of bacchanalian departure to the chase. Crowds of women surround him, and on the outside, of these, are spearmen. The road is set off with ropes, a man, or even a woman, who passes within the ropes is put to death. The king is preceded by drums and gongs. He hunts in the enclosures, and discharges his arrows from a high seat. Near him stand two or three armed women. When hunting in the open ground, he shoots his arrows from an elephant. Of the women some are in chariots, some on horses, and others on elephants. They are provided with all kinds of weapons, as if they were going on a military expedition. 1.56 These customs when compared with ours are very strange, but the following are still more extraordinary. According to Megasthenes, the nations who inhabit the Caucasus have commerce with women in public, and eat the bodies of their relatives, the monkeys climb precipices, and roll down large stones upon their pursuers, most of the animals which are tame in our country are wild in theirs, the horses have a single horn, with heads like those of deer, reeds which grow to the height of thirty orgi, others which grow on the ground, fifty orgi in length, and in thickness some are three and others six cubits in diameter. 1.57 He then deviates into fables, and says that there are men of five, and even three spans in height, some of whom are without nostrils, with only two breathing orifices above the mouth. Those of three spans in height wage war with the cranes, described by Homer, and with the partridges, which are as large as geese, these people collect and destroy the eggs of the cranes which lay their eggs there, and nowhere else are the eggs or the young cranes to be found. Frequently a crane escapes from this country with a brazen point of a weapon in its body, wounded by these people. Similar to this is the account of the Anotokoeti, of the wild men, and of other monsters. The wild men could not be brought to Sandrokotis, for they died by abstaining from food. Their heels are in front, the instep and toes are turned backwards. Some have been taken, which had no mouths, and were tame. They live near the sources of the Ganges, and are supported by the smell of dressed meat and the fragrance of fruits and flowers, having instead of mouths orifices through which they breathe. They are distressed by strong-smelling substances, and therefore their lives are sustained with difficulty, particularly in a camp. With respect to the other singular animals, the philosophers informed him of a people called Osipidae, so swift of foot that they leave horses behind them, of anotokoeti, or persons having ears hanging down to their feet, so that they lie and sleep upon them, and so strong as to be able to pluck up trees and to break the sinew string of a bow, of others, monomati, who have only one eye, and the ears of a dog, the eye placed in the middle of the forehead, the hair standing erect, and the breast shaggy, of others, a mick tears, without nostrils, devouring everything, eaters of raw meat, short-lived, and dying before they arrive at old age, the upper part of their mouths projects far beyond the lower lip. With respect to the Hyperboreans, who live to the age of a thousand years, his description is the same as that of Simonides, Pindar, and other mythological writers. The story told by Timagines of a shower of drops of brass, which were raked together, is a fable. The account of Megasthenes is more probable, namely, that the rivers bring down gold dust, a part of which is paid as a tax to the king, and this is the case in Iberia, of Armenia. 1.58 Speaking of the philosophers, he says, that those who inhabit the mountains are worshippers of Bacchus, and show as a proof, of the god having come among them, the wild vine, which grows in their country only, the ivy, the laurel, the myrtle, the box tree, 
and other evergreens, none of which are found beyond the Euphrates, except a few in parks, which are only preserved with great care. To wear robes and turbans, to use perfumes, and to be dressed in dyed and flowered garments, for their kings to be preceded when they leave their palaces, and appear abroad, by gongs and drums, are bacchanalian customs. But the philosophers who live in the plains worship Hercules. These are fabulous stories, contradicted by many writers, particularly what is said of the vine and wine, for a great part of Armenia, the whole of Mesopotamia and Media, as far as Persia and Carmania, is beyond the Euphrates, the greater part of which countries is said to have excellent vines, and to produce good wine. 1.59 Megasthenes divides the philosophers again into two kinds, the Brahmanes and the Garmanes. The Brahmanes are held in greater repute, for they agree more exactly in their opinions. Even from the time of their conception in the womb they are under the care and guardianship of learned men, who go to the mother, and seem to perform some incantation for the happiness and welfare of the mother and the unborn child, but in reality they suggest prudent advice, and the mothers who listen to them most willingly are thought to be the most fortunate in their offspring. After the birth of the children, there is a succession of persons who have the care of them, and as they advance in years, masters more able and accomplished succeed. The philosophers live in a grove in front of the city within a moderate-sized enclosure. Their diet is frugal, and they lie upon straw pallets and on skins. They abstain from animal food, and from sexual intercourse with women, their time is occupied in grave discourse, and they communicate with those who are inclined to listen to them, but the hearer is not permitted to speak or cough, or even to spit on the ground, otherwise, he is expelled that very day from their society, on the ground of having no control over himself. After living thirty-seven years in this manner, each individual retires to his own possessions, and lives with less restraint, wearing robes of fine linen, and rings of gold, but without profuseness, upon the hands and in the ears. They eat the flesh of animals, of those particularly which do not assist man in his labor, and abstain from hot and seasoned food. They have as many wives as they please with a view to numerous offspring, for from many wives greater advantages are derived. As they have no slaves, they require more the services, which are at hand, of their children. The Brahmanes do not communicate their philosophy to their wives, for fear they should divulge to the profane, if they became depraved, anything which ought to be concealed or lest they should abandon their husbands in case they became good, philosophers, themselves. For no one who despises alike pleasure and pain, life and death, is willing to be subject to the authority of another, and such is the character of a virtuous man and a virtuous woman. They discourse much on death, for it is their opinion that the present life is the state of one conceived in the womb, and that death to philosophers is birth to a real and a happy life. They therefore discipline themselves much to prepare for death, and maintain that nothing which happens to man is bad or good, for otherwise the same things would not be the occasion of sorrow to some and of joy to others, opinions being merely dreams, nor that the same persons could be affected with sorrow and joy by the same things, on different occasions. With regard to opinions on physical phenomena, they display, says Megasthenes, great simplicity, their actions being better than their reasoning for their belief is chiefly founded on fables. On many subjects their sentiments are the same as those of the Greeks. According to the Brahmanes, the world was created, and is liable to corruption, it is of a spheroidal figure, the God who made and governs it pervades the whole of it, the principles of all things are different, but the principle of the world's formation was water, in addition to the four elements there is a fifth nature, of which the heavens and the stars are composed, the earth is situated in the center of the universe. Many other peculiar things they say of the principle of generation and of the soul. They invent fables also, after the manner of Plato, on the immortality of the soul, and on the punishments in Hades, and other things of this kind. This is the account which Megasthenes gives of the Brahmanes. 1.60 of the Garmanes, the most honorable, he says, are the Hylobai, who live in the forests, and subsist on leaves and wild fruits, they are clothed with garments made of the bark of trees, and abstain from commerce with women and from wine. The kings hold communication with them by messengers, concerning the causes of things, and through them worship and supplicate the divinity. Second in honor to the Hylobai, are the physicians, for they apply philosophy to the study of the nature of man. They are of frugal habits, but do not live in the fields, and subsist upon rice and meal, which every one gives when asked, and receive them hospitably. They are able to cause persons to have a numerous offspring, and to have either male or female children, by means of charms. They cure diseases by diet, rather than by medicinal remedies. Among the latter, the most in repute are ungents and cataplasms. All others they suppose partake greatly of a noxious nature. Both this and the other class of persons practice fortitude, as well in supporting active toil as in enduring suffering, so that they will continue a whole day in the same posture, without motion. 
there are enchanters and diviners, versed in the rites and customs relative to the dead, who go about villages and towns begging. There are others who are more civilized and better informed than these, who inculcate the vulgar opinions concerning Hades, which, according to their ideas, tend to piety and sanctity. Women study philosophy with some of them, but abstain from sexual intercourse. 1.61 Aristobulus says, that he saw at Tuxila two sophists, wise men, both Brahmanes, the elder had his head shaved, but the younger wore his hair, both were attended by disciples. When not otherwise engaged, they spent their time in the marketplace. They are honored as public counselors, and have the liberty of taking away, without payment, whatever article they like which is exposed for sale, when any one accosts them, he pours over them oil of jessamine, in such profusion that it runs down from their eyes. Of honey and sesamum, which is exposed for sale in large quantity, they take enough to make cakes, and are fed without expense. They came up to Alexander's table and took their meal standing, and they gave an example of their fortitude by retiring to a neighboring spot, where the elder, falling on the ground supine, endured the sun and the rain, which had now set in, it being the commencement of spring. The other stood on one leg, with a piece of wood three cubits in length raised in both hands, when one leg was fatigued he changed the support to the other, and thus continued the whole day. The younger appeared to possess much more self-command, for, after following the king a short distance, he soon returned to his home. The king sent after him, but he bade the king to come to him, if he wanted anything of him. The other accompanied the king to the last, during his stay he changed his dress, and altered his mode of life, and when reproached for his conduct, answered, that he had completed the forty years of discipline which he had promised to observe, Alexander made presents to his children. 1.62 Aristobulus relates also some strange and unusual customs of the people of Tuxila. Those, who through poverty are unable to marry their daughters, expose them for sale in the marketplace, in the flower of their age, to the sound of shell trumpets and drums, with which the war note is given. A crowd is thus assembled. First her back, as far as the shoulders, is uncovered, then the parts in front, for the examination of any man who comes for this purpose. If she pleases him, he marries her on such conditions as may be determined upon. The dead are thrown out to be devoured by vultures. To have many wives is a custom common to these and to other nations. He says, that he had heard, from some persons, of wives burning themselves voluntarily with their deceased husbands, and that those women who refused to submit to this custom were disgraced. The same things have been told by other writers. 1.631 Zecritus says, that he himself was sent to converse with these wise men. For Alexander heard that they went about naked, practiced constancy and fortitude, and were held in the highest honor, that, when invited, they did not go to other persons, but commanded others to come to them, if they wished to participate in their exercises or their conversation. Such being their character, Alexander did not consider it to be consistent with propriety to go to them, nor to compel them to do anything contrary to their inclination or against the custom of their country, he therefore dispatched one Zecritus to them. One Zecritus found, at the distance of twenty stadia from the city, fifteen men standing in different postures, sitting or lying down naked, who continued in these positions until the evening, and then returned to the city. The most difficult thing to endure was the heat of the sun, which was so powerful, that no one else could endure without pain to walk on the ground at midday with bare feet. 1.64 He conversed with Callinus, one of these sophists, who accompanied the king to Persia, and died after the custom of his country, being placed on a pile of, burning, wood. When one Zecritus came, he was lying upon stones. One Zecritus approached, accosted him, and told him that he had been sent by the king, who had heard the fame of his wisdom, and that he was to give an account of his interview, if there were no objection, he was ready to listen to his discourse. When Callinus saw his mantle, head covering, and shoes, he laughed, and said, Formerly, there was abundance everywhere of corn and barley, as there is now of dust, fountains then flowed with water, milk, honey, wine, and oil, but mankind by repletion and luxury became proud and insolent. Jupiter, indignant at this state of things, destroyed all, and appointed for man a life of toil. On the reappearance of temperance and other virtues, there was again an abundance of good things. But at present the condition of mankind approaches satiety and insolence, and there is danger lest the things which now exist should disappear. When he had finished, he proposed to one Zecritus, if he wished to hear his discourse, to strip off his clothes, to lie down naked by him on the same stones, and in that manner to listen to him. While he was hesitating what to do, Mandanus, who was the oldest and wisest of the sophists, reproached Callinus for his insolence, although he censured such insolence himself. Mandanus called one Zecritus to him, and said, I commend the king, because, although he governs so large an empire, he is yet desirous of acquiring wisdom, 
for he is the only philosopher in arms that I ever saw, it would be of the greatest advantage, if those were philosophers who have the power of persuading the willing and of compelling the unwilling to learn temperance, but I am entitled to indulgence, if, when conversing by means of three interpreters, who, except the language, know no more than the vulgar, I am not able to demonstrate the utility of philosophy. To attempt it is to expect water to flow pure through mud. 1.65 The tendency of his discourse, he said, was this, that the best philosophy was that which liberated the mind from pleasure and grief, that grief differed from labor, in that the former was inimical, the latter friendly to men, for that men exercised their bodies with labor in order to strengthen the mental powers, by which means they would be able to put an end to dissensions, and give good counsel to all, to the public and to individuals, that he certainly should at present advise Taxiles to receive Alexander as a friend, for if he entertained a person better than himself, he might be improved, but if a worse person, he might dispose him to good. After this Mandanus inquired, whether such doctrines were taught among the Greeks. One Zecritus answered, that Pythagoras taught a similar doctrine, and enjoined his disciples to abstain from whatever has life, that Socrates and Diogenes, whose discourses he had heard, held the same opinions. Mandanus replied, that in other respects he thought them wise, but that in one thing they were mistaken, namely, in preferring custom to nature, for otherwise they would not be ashamed of going naked, like himself, and of subsisting on frugal fare, for the best house was that which required least repairs. He says also that they employ themselves much on natural subjects, as prognostics, rain, drought, and diseases. When they repair to the city, they disperse themselves in the marketplaces, if they meet any one carrying figs or bunches of grapes, they take what is offered gratuitously, if it is oil, it is poured over them, and they are anointed with it. Every wealthy house, even to the women's apartment, is open to them, when they enter it, they engage in conversation, and partake of the repast. Disease of the body they regard as most disgraceful, and he who apprehends it, after preparing a pyre, destroys himself by fire, he, previously, anoints himself, and sitting down upon it orders it to be lighted, remaining motionless while he is burning. 1.66 Nearchus gives the following account of the sophists. The Brahmanes engage in public affairs, and attend the kings as counselors, the rest are occupied in the study of nature. Calanus belong to the latter class. Women study philosophy with them, and all lead an austere life. Of the customs of the other Indians, he says, that their laws, whether relating to the community or to individuals, are not committed to writing, and differ altogether from those of other people. For example, it is the practice among some tribes, to propose virgins as prizes to the conquerors in a trial of skill in boxing, wherefore they marry without portions. Among other tribes the ground is cultivated by families and in common, when the produce is collected, each takes a load sufficient for his subsistence during the year, the remainder is burnt, in order to have a reason for renewing their labor, and not remaining inactive. Their weapons consist of a bow and arrows, which are three cubits in length, or a javelin, and a shield, and a sword three cubits long. Instead of bridles, they use muzzles, which differ little from a halter, and the lips are perforated with spikes. 1.67 Nearchus, producing proofs of their skill in works of art, says, that when they saw sponges in use among the Macedonians, they imitated them by sewing hairs, thin threads, and strings in wool, after the wool was felted, they drew out the hairs, threads, and strings, and dyed it with colors. There quickly appeared also manufactures of brushes for the body, and of vessels for oil, lasithi. They write, he says, letters upon cloth, smoothed by being well beaten, although other authors affirm that they have no knowledge of writing. They use brass, which is cast, and not wrought, he does not give the reason of this, although he mentions the strange effect, namely, if that vessels of this description fall to the ground, they break like those made of clay. This following custom also is mentioned in accounts of India, that, instead of prostrating themselves before their kings, it is usual to address them, and all persons in authority and high station, with a prayer. The country produces precious stones, as crystal, carbuncles of all kinds, and pearls. 1.68 is an instance of the disagreement among historians, we may adduce there, different, accounts of Calanus. They all agree that he accompanied Alexander, and underwent a voluntary death by fire in his presence, but they differ as to the manner and cause of his death. Some give the following account. Calanus accompanied the king, as the rehearser of his praises, beyond the boundaries of India, contrary to the common Indian custom, for the philosophers attend upon their kings, and act as instructors in the worship of the gods, in the same manner as the magi attend the Persian kings. When he fell sick at Pasargadi, being then attacked with disease for the first time in his life, he put himself to death at the age of seventy-three years, regardless of the entreaties of the king. A pyre was raised, 
and a golden couch placed upon it. He laid down upon it, and covering himself up, was burnt to death. Others say, that a chamber was constructed of wood, which was filled with the leaves of trees, and a pyre being raised upon the roof, he was shut up in it, according to his directions, after the procession, with which he had been accompanied, had arrived at the spot. He threw himself upon the pyre, and was consumed like a log of wood, together with the chamber. Megasthenes says, that self-destruction is not a dogma of the philosophers, and that those who commit this act are accounted foolhardy, that some, who are by nature harsh, inflict wounds upon their bodies, or cast themselves down precipices, those who are impatient of pain drown themselves, those who can endure pain strangle themselves, and those of ardent tempers throw themselves into the fire. Of this last description was Callinus, who had no control over himself, and was a slave to the table of Alexander. Callinus is censured, while Mandanus is applauded. When Alexander's messengers invited the latter to come to the son of Jove, promising a reward if he would comply, and threatening punishment if he refused, he answered, Alexander was not the son of Jove, for he did not govern even the smallest portion of the earth, nor did he himself desire a gift of one who was satisfied with nothing. Neither did he fear his threats, for as long as he lived India would supply him with food enough, and when he died, he should be delivered from the flesh wasted by old age, and be translated to a better and purer state of existence. Alexander commended and pardoned him. 1.69 Historians also relate that the Indians worship Jupiter Ombrius, or, the rainy, the river Ganges, and the indigenous deities of the country, that when the king washes his hair, a great feast is celebrated, and large presents are sent, each person displaying his wealth in competition with his neighbor. They say, that some of the gold-digging mermses, ants, have wings, and that the rivers, like those of Iberia, bring down gold dust. In processions at their festivals, many elephants are in the train, adorned with gold and silver, numerous carriages drawn by four horses and by several pairs of oxen, then follows a body of attendants in full dress, bearing, vessels of gold, large basins and goblets, an orgia in breadth, tables, chairs of state, drinking cups, and lavers of Indian copper, most of which were set with precious stones, as emeralds, barrels, and Indian carbuncles, garments embroidered and interwoven with gold, wild beasts, as buffaloes, panthers, tame lions, and a multitude of birds of variegated plumage and a fine song. Cletarchus speaks of four-wheeled carriages bearing trees with large leaves, from which were suspended, in cages, different kinds of tame birds, among which the Orion was said to possess the sweetest note, but the Catrius was the most beautiful in appearance, and had the most variegated plumage. In shape it approached nearest to the peacock, but the rest of the description must be taken from Cletarchus. 1.70 Opposed to the Brahmanes there are philosophers, called Pramni, contentious people, and fond of argument. They ridicule the Brahmanes as boasters and fools for occupying themselves with physiology and astronomy. Some of the Pramni are called Pramni of the mountains, others Gymnidi, others again are called townsmen and countrymen. The Pramni of the mountains wear deerskins, and carry scripts filled with roots and drugs, they profess to practice medicine by means of incantations, charms, and amulets. The Gymnidi, as their name imports, are naked and live chiefly in the open air, practicing fortitude for the space of 37 years, this I have before mentioned, women live in their society, but without cohabitation. The Gymnidi are held in singular estimation. 1.71 The, Pramni, townsmen are occupied in civil affairs, dwell in cities, and wear fine linen, or, as countrymen they live, in the fields, clothed in the skins of fawns or antelopes. In short, the Indians wear white garments, white linen and muslin, contrary to the accounts of those who say that they wear garments of a bright color, all of them wear long hair and long beards, plait their hair, and bind it with a fillet. 1.72 Artemidorus says that the Ganges descends from the Amoda Mountains and proceeds towards the south, when it arrives at the city Ganges, it turns to the east, and keeps this direction as far as Palabatra, and the mouth by which it discharges itself into the sea. He calls one of the rivers which flow into it a Danes, which breeds crocodiles and dolphins. Some other circumstances besides are mentioned by him, but in so confused and negligent a manner that they are not to be regarded. To these accounts may be added that of Nicholas Damascenus. 1.73 This writer states that at Antioch, near Daphne, he met with ambassadors from the Indians, who were sent to Augustus Caesar. It appeared from the letter that several persons were mentioned in it, but three only survived, whom he says he saw. The rest had died chiefly in consequence of the length of the journey. The letter was written in Greek upon a skin, the import of it was, that Porus was the writer, that although he was sovereign of six hundred kings, yet that he highly esteemed the friendship of Caesar, that he was willing to allow him a passage through his country, in whatever part he pleased, and to assist him in any undertaking that was just. 
eight naked servants, with girdles round their waists, and fragrant with perfumes, presented the gifts which were brought. The presents were a Hermes, I, E, a man, born without arms, whom I have seen, large snakes, a serpent ten cubits in length, a river tortoise of three cubits in length, and a partridge, larger than a vulture. They were accompanied by the person, it is said, who burned himself to death at Athens. This is the practice with persons in distress, who seek escape from existing calamities, and with others in prosperous circumstances, as was the case with this man. For as everything hitherto had succeeded with him, he thought it necessary to depart, lest some unexpected calamity should happen to him by continuing to live, with a smile, therefore, naked, anointed, and with the girdle round his waist, he leapt upon the pyre. On his tomb was this inscription, Zarmano Shegas, an Indian, a native of Bargosa, having immortalized himself according to the custom of his country, here lies. 2.1 Ariana. Next to India is Ariana, the first portion of the country subject to the Persians, lying beyond the Indus, and the first of the higher satrapies without the Taurus. On the north it is bounded by the same mountains as India, on the south by the same sea, and by the same river Indus, which separates it from India. It stretches thence towards the west as far as the line drawn from the Caspian Gates to Carmania, whence its figure is quadrilateral. The southern side begins from the mouths of the Indus, and from Pataline, and terminates at Carmania and the mouth of the Persian Gulf, by a promontory projecting a considerable distance to the south. It then makes a bend towards the Gulf in the direction of Persia. The Arbis, who have the same name as the river Arbus, are the first inhabitants we meet with in this country. They are separated by the Arbus from the next tribe, the Ordi, and according to Nearchus, occupy a tract of seacoast of about 1,000 stadia in length, this country also is a part of India. Next are the Ordi, a people governed by their own laws. The voyage along the coast belonging to this people extends 1800 stadia, that along the country of the Ichthyophagi, who follow next, extends 7400 stadia, that along the country of the Karmani as far as Persia, 3700 stadia. The whole number of stadia is 13,000. 2.2 The greater part of the country inhabited by the Ichthyophagi is on a level with the sea. No trees, except palms and a kind of thorn, and the tamarisk, grow there. There is also a scarcity of water, and of food produced by cultivation. Both they and their cattle subsist upon fish, and are supplied by rain water and wells. The flesh of the animals has the smell of fish. Their dwellings are built with the bones of large whales and shells, the ribs furnishing beams and supports, and the jaw bones, doorways. The vertebral bones serve as mortars in which fish, which have been previously dried in the sun, are pounded. Of this, with the addition of flour, cakes are made, for they have grinding mills, for corn, although they have no iron. This however is not so surprising, because it is possible for them to import it from other parts. But how do they hollow out the mills again, when worn away? With the same stones, they say, with which their arrows and javelins, which are hardened in the fire, are sharpened. Some fish are dressed in ovens, but the greater part is eaten raw. The fish are taken in nets made of the bark of the palm. 2.3 Above the Ichthyophagi is situated Drosia, a country less exposed to the heat of the sun than India, but more so than the rest of Asia. As it is without fruits and water, except in summer, it is not much better than the country of the Ichthyophagi. But it produces aromatics, particularly nard and myrrh, in such quantity, that the army of Alexander used them on the march for tent coverings and beds, they thus breathed an air full of odors, and at the same time more salubrious. The summer was purposely chosen for leaving India, for at that season it rains in Gdrosia, and the rivers and wells are filled, but in winter they fail. The rain falls in the higher parts to the north, and near the mountains, when the rivers swell, the plains near the sea are watered, and the wells are also filled. Alexander sent persons before him into the desert country to dig wells and to prepare stations for himself and his fleet. 2.4 Having separated his forces into three divisions, he set out with one division through Gdrosia, keeping at the utmost from the sea not more than 500 stadia, in order to secure the coast for his fleet, but he frequently approached the seaside, although the beach was impracticable and rugged. The second division he sent forward under the command of Craterus through the interior, with a view of reducing Ariana, and of proceeding to the same places to which he himself was directing his march. The third division, the fleet he entrusted to Nearchus and Onesicritus, his master pilot, giving them orders to take up convenient positions in following him, and to sail along the coast parallel to his line of march. 2.5 Nearchus says, that while Alexander was on his march, he himself commenced his voyage, in the autumn, about the acronical rising of the Pleiades, the wind not being before favourable. The barbarians however, taking courage at the departure of the king, became daring, 
and attempted to throw off their subjection, attack them, and endeavored to drive them out of the country. But Craterus set out from the Hydaspes, and proceeded through the country of the Arachodi and of the Drangae into Carmania. Alexander was greatly distressed throughout the whole march, as his road lay through a barren country. The supplies of provisions which he obtained came from a distance, and were scanty and unfrequent, so much so that the army suffered greatly from hunger, the beasts of burden dropped down, and the baggage was abandoned, both on the march and in the camp. The army was saved by eating dates and the marrow of the palm tree. Alexander however, says Nearchus, although acquainted with the hardships of the enterprise, was ambitious of conducting this large army in safety, as a conqueror, through the same country where, according to the prevailing report, Semiramis escaped by flight from India with about twenty, and Cyrus with about seven men. 2.6 Besides the one of provisions, the scorching heat was distressing, as also the deep and burning sand. In some places there were sand hills, so that in addition to the difficulty of lifting the legs, as out of a pit, there were ascents and descents. It was necessary also, on account of the watering places, to make long marches of two, four, and sometimes even of six hundred stadia, for the most part during the night. Frequently the encampment was at a distance of thirty stadia from the watering places, in order that the soldiers might not be induced by thirst to drink to excess. For many of them plunged into the water in their armor, and continued drinking until they were drowned, when swollen after death they floated, and corrupted the shallow water of the cisterns. Others, exhausted by thirst, lay exposed to the sun, in the middle of the road. They then became tremulous, their hands and their feet shook, and they died like persons seized with cold and shivering. Some turned out of the road to indulge in sleep, overcome with drowsiness and fatigue, some were left behind, and perished, being ignorant of the road, destitute of everything, and overpowered by heat. Others escaped after great sufferings. A torrent of water, which fell in the night time, overwhelmed and destroyed many persons, and much baggage, a great part even of the royal equipage was swept away. The guides, through ignorance, deviated so far into the interior, that the sea was no longer in sight. The king, perceiving the danger, immediately set out in search of the coast, when he had discovered it, and by sinking wells had found water fit for drinking, he sent for the army, afterwards he continued his march for seven days near the shore, with a good supply of water. He then again returned into the interior. 2.7 There was a plant resembling the laurel, which if eaten by the beasts of burden caused them to die of epilepsy, accompanied with foaming at the mouth. A thorn also, the fruit of which, like gourds, strewed the ground, and was full of a juice, if drops of it fell into the eyes of any kind of animal it became completely blind. Many persons were suffocated by eating unripe dates. Danger also was to be apprehended from serpents, for on the sand hills there grew a plant, underneath which they crept and hid themselves. The persons wounded by them died. The Orti, it was said, smeared the points of their arrows, which were of wood hardened in the fire, with deadly poisons. When Ptolemy was wounded and in danger of his life a person appeared in a dream to Alexander, and showed him a root with leaves and branches, which he told him to bruise and place upon the wound. Alexander awoke from his dream, and remembering the vision, searched and found the root growing in abundance, of which both he and others made use, when the barbarians perceived that the antidote for the poison was discovered, they surrendered to the king. It is probable, however, that some one acquainted with the plan informed the king of its virtues, and that the fabulous part of the story was invented for the purpose of flattery. Having arrived at the palace of the Jidrasii on the sixtieth day after leaving the Ori, and allowed his army a short period of rest, he set out for Carmania. 2.8 The position of the southern side of Ariana is thus situated, with reference to the seacoast, the country of the Jidrasii and the Ori lying near and above it. A great part of Drosia extends into the interior until it touches upon the Drangay, Rakoti, and Peropamisidi, of whom Eratosthenes speaks in the following manner, we cannot give a better description. Ariana, he says, is bounded on the east by the Indus, on the south by the Great Sea, on the north by the Peropamesis and the succeeding chain of mountains as far as the Caspian Gates, on the west by the same limits by which the territory of the Parthians is separated from Media, and Carmania from Peridocene and Persia. The breadth of the country is the length of the Indus, reckoned from the Peropamesis as far as the mouths of that river, and amounts to twelve, or according to others to thirteen, stadia. The length, beginning from the Caspian Gates, as it is laid down in Asiatic Stathmi, is estimated in two different ways. From the Caspian Gates to Alexandria among the Ari through Parthia is one and the same road, then a road leads in a straight line through Bactriana, and over the pass of the mountain to Ordispana, to the meeting of the three roads from Bactra, which is among the Peropamisidae. The other branch turns off a little from Aria towards the south to Prothasia and Drangiana, 
then the remainder leads as far as the confines of India and of the Indus, so that the road through the Drangay and the Arakoti is longer, the whole amounting to 15,000 stadia. But if we deduct 1,300 stadia, we shall have the remainder as the length of the country in a straight line, namely, 14,000 stadia, for the length of the coast is not much less, although some persons increase this sum by adding to the 10,000 stadia Carmania, which is reckoned at 6,000 stadia. For they seem to reckon it either together with the gulfs, or together with the Carmanian coast within the Persian Gulf. The name also of Ariana is extended so as to include some part of Persia, Media, and the north of Bactria and Sogdiana, for these nations speak nearly the same language. 2.9 The order in which these nations are disposed is as follows. Along the Indus are the Peropamesidae, above whom lies the mountain Peropamesis, then towards the south are the Arachodi, then next to these towards the south, the Gdrosini, together with other tribes who occupy the seacoast, the Indus runs parallel along the breadth of these tracks. The Indians occupy, in part, some of the countries situated along the Indus, which formerly belonged to the Persians, Alexander deprived the Ariani of them, and established their settlements of his own. But Seleucus Nicator gave them to Sandrocatus in consequence of a marriage contract, and received in return 500 elephants. The Ari are situated on the west, by the side of the Peropamesidae, and the Drangay by the Arachodi and Gidrasii. The Ari are situated by the side of the Drangay both on the north and west, and nearly encompass them. Bactriana adjoins Arya on the north, and the Peropamesidae, through whose territory Alexander passed when he crossed the Caucasus on his way to Bactra. Towards the west, next to the Ari, are the Parthians, and the parts about the Caspian Gates. Towards the south of Parthia is the desert of Carmania, then follows the remainder of Carmania and Droja. 2.10 We shall better understand the position of the places about the above-mentioned mountainous tract, if we further examine the route which Alexander took from the Parthian territory to Bactriana, when he was in pursuit of Bessus. He came first to Ariana, next to the Drangay, where he put to death Philetus, the son of Parmenio, having detected his traitorous intentions. He dispatched persons to Ekbatana also to put the father to death as an accomplice in the conspiracy. It is said that these persons performed in eleven days, upon dromedaries, a journey of thirty or forty days, and executed their business. The Drangay resemble the Persians in all other respects in their mode of life, except that they have little wine. Tin is found in the country. Alexander next went from the Drangay to the Eurjeti, to whom Cyrus gave this name, and to the Arachodi, then through the territory of the Peropamesidae at the setting of the Pleiad. It is a mountainous country, and at that time was covered with snow, so that the march was performed with difficulty. The numerous villages, however, on their march, which were well provided with everything except oil, afforded relief in their distress. On their left hand were the summits of the mountains. The southern parts of the Peropamesis belong to India and Ariana, the northern parts towards the west belong to Bactriana, towards the east to Sogdiana 132 Bactrian barbarians. Having wintered there, with India above to the right hand, and having founded a city, he crossed the summits of the mountains into Bactriana. The road was bare of everything except a few trees of the bushy termithus, the army was driven from one of food to eat the flesh of the beasts or burthen, and that in a raw state for one of firewood, but silphium grew in great abundance, which promoted the digestion of this raw food. Fifteen days after founding the city and leaving winter quarters, he came to Adropsa, Doropsa, a city of Bactriana, 2.11 Cherine is situated somewhere about this part of the country bordering upon India. This, of all the places subject to the Parthians, lies nearest to India. It is distant 10,000 or 9,000 stadia from Bactriana, through the country of the Arachodi, and the above-mentioned mountainous tract. Craterus traversed this country, subjugating those who refused to submit, and hastened with the greatest expedition to form a junction with the king. Nearly about the same time both armies, consisting of infantry, entered Carmania together, and at a short interval afterwards Nearchus sailed with his fleet into the Persian Gulf, having undergone great danger and distress from wandering in his course, and among other causes, from great whales. 2.12 It is probable that those who sailed in the expedition greatly exaggerated many circumstances, yet their statements prove the sufferings to which they were exposed, and that their apprehensions were greater than the real danger. That which alarmed them the most was the magnitude of the whales, which occasioned great commotion in the sea from their numbers, their blowing was attended with so great a darkness, that the sailors could not see where they stood. But when the pilots informed the sailors, who were terrified at the sight and ignorant of the cause, that they were animals which might easily be driven away by the sound of a trumpet, and by loud noises, Nearchus impelled the vessels with violence in the direction of the impediment, and at the same time frightened the animals with the sound of trumpets. The whales dived, and again rose at the prow of the vessels, so as to give the appearance of a naval combat, 
but they soon made off. 2.13 Those who now sail to India speak of the size of these animals and their mode of appearance, but is coming neither in bodies nor frequently, yet is repulsed by shouts and by the sound of trumpets. They affirm that they do not approach the land, but that the bones of those which die, bared of flesh, are readily thrown up by the waves, and supply the ichthyophagi with the above-mentioned material for the construction of their cabins. According to Nearchus, the size of these animals is three and twenty orgii in length. Nearchus says that he proved the confident belief of the sailors in the existence of an island situated in the passage, and destructive to those who anchored near it, to be false. A bark in its course, when it came opposite to this island, was never afterwards seen, and some men who were sent in search did not venture to disembark upon the island, but shouted and called to the crew, when, receiving no answer, they returned. But as all imputed this disappearance to the island, Nearchus said that he himself sailed to it, went ashore, disembarked with a part of his crew, and went round it. But not discovering any trace of those of whom he was in search, he abandoned the attempt, and informed his men that no fault was to be imputed to the island, for otherwise destruction would have come upon himself and those who disembarked with him, but that some other cause, and innumerable others were possible, might have occasioned the loss of the vessel. 2.14 Carmania is the last portion of the seacoast which begins from the Indus. Its first promontory projects towards the south into the Great Sea. After it has formed the mouth of the Persian Gulf towards the promontory, which is in sight, of Arabia Felix, it bends towards the Persian Gulf, and is continued till it touches Persia. Carmania is large, situated in the interior, and extending itself between Droja and Persia, but stretches more to the north than Droja. This is indicated by its fertility, for it not only produces everything, but the trees are of a large size, excepting however the olive, it is also watered by rivers. Droja also differs little from the country of the Ichthyophagi, so that frequently there is no produce from the ground. They therefore keep the annual produce in store for several years. One Zecritus says, that a river in Carmania brings down gold dust, that there are mines of silver, copper, and minium, and that there are two mountains, one of which contains arsenic, the other salt. There belongs to it a desert tract, which is contiguous to Parthia and Paritocene. The produce of the ground is like that of Persia, and among other productions the vine. The Carmanian vine, as we call it, often bears bunches of grapes of two cubits in size, the seeds are very numerous and very large, probably the plant grows in its native soil with great luxuriance. Asses, on account of the scarcity of horses, are generally made use of even in war. They sacrifice an ass to Mars, who is the only deity worshipped by them, for they are a warlike people. No one marries before he has cut off the head of an enemy and presented it to the king, who deposits the skull in the royal treasury. The tongue is minced and mixed with flour, which the king, after tasting it, gives to the person who brought it, to be eaten by himself and his family. That king is the most highly respected, to whom the greatest number of heads are presented. According to Nearchus, most of the customs and the language of the inhabitants of Carmania resemble those of the Persians and Medes. The passage across the mouth of the Persian Gulf does not occupy more than one day. 3.1 Next to Carmania is Persis. A great part of it extends along the coast of the Gulf, which has its name from the country, but a much larger portion stretches into the interior, and particularly in its length, reckoned from the south, and Carmania to the north, and to the nations of Media. It is of a threefold character, as we regard its natural condition and the quality of the air. First, the coast, extending for about 4,400 or 4,300 stadia, is burnt up with heat, it is sandy, producing little except palm trees, and terminates at the greatest river in those parts, the name of which is Orodes. Secondly, the country above the coast produces everything, and is a plain, it is excellently adapted for the rearing of cattle, and abounds with rivers and lakes. The third portion lies towards the north, and is bleak and mountainous. On its borders live the camel breeders. Its length, according to Eratosthenes, towards the north and media, is about 8,000, or, including some projecting promontories, 9,000 stadia, the remainder, from media, to the Caspian gates is not more than 3,000 stadia. The breadth in the interior of the country from Susa to Persepolis is 4,200 stadia, and thence to the borders of Carmania 1,600 stadia more. The tribes inhabiting this country are those called the Patechures, the Achaemenidae, and Magi, these last affect a sedate mode of life, the Curdii and Marti are robbers, the rest are husbandmen. 3.2 Susis also is almost a part of Persis. It lies between Persis and Babylonia, and has a very considerable city, Susa. For the Persians and Cyrus, after the conquest of the Medes, perceiving that their own country was situated towards the extremities, but Susis more towards the interior, 
nearer also to Babylon and the other nations, there placed the royal seat of the empire. They were pleased with its situation on the confines of Persis, and with the importance of the city, besides the consideration that it had never of itself undertaken any great enterprise, had always been in subjection to other people, and constituted a part of a greater body, except, perhaps, anciently in the heroic times. It is said to have been founded by Tithonus, the father of Memnon. Its compass was 120 stadia. Its shape was oblong. The Acropolis was called Memnonium. The Susians have the name also of Sisii. Aeschylus calls the mother of Memnon, Sisia. Memnon is said to be buried near Paltus in Syria, by the river Badas, as Simonides says in his Memnon, a dithyrambic poem among the Dalaika. The wall of the city, the temples and palaces, were constructed in the same manner as those of the Babylonians, of baked brick and asphaltus, as some writers relate. Polycletus however says, that its circumference was 200 stadia, and that it was without walls. 3.3 They embellished the palace at Susa more than the rest, but they did not hold in less veneration and honour the palaces at Persepolis and Pasargadi. For in these stronger and hereditary places were the treasure house, the riches, and tombs of the Persians. There was another palace at Gabi, in the upper parts of Persia, and another on the seacoast, near a place called Tos. This was the state of things during the empire of the Persians. But afterwards different princes occupied different palaces, some, as was natural, less sumptuous, after the power of Persis had been reduced first by the Macedonians, and secondly still more by the Parthians. For although the Persians have still a kingly government, and a king of their own, yet their power is very much diminished, and they are subject to the king of Parthia. 3.4 Susa is situated in the interior, upon the river Coasps, beyond the bridge, but the territory extends to the sea, and the sea coast of this territory, from the borders of the Persian coast nearly as far as the mouths of the Tigris, is a distance of about 3,000 stadia. The Coasps flows through Susis, terminating on the same coast, and has its source in the territory of the Uxii. For a rugged and precipitous range of mountains lies between the Susians and Persis, with narrow defiles, difficult to pass, they were inhabited by robbers, who constantly exacted payment even from the kings themselves, at their entrance into Persis from Susis. Polycletus says, that the Coasps, and the Euleus, and the Tigris also enter a lake, and thence discharge themselves into the sea, that on the side of the lake is a mart, as the rivers do not receive the merchandise from the sea, nor convey it down to the sea, on account of dams in the river, purposely constructed, and that the goods are transported by land a distance of 800 stadia to Susa. According to others, the rivers which flow through Susis discharge themselves by the intermediate canals of the Euphrates into the single stream of the Tigris, which on this account has at its mouth the name of Passatigris. 3.5 According to Nearchus, the seacoast of Susis is swampy, and terminates at the river Euphrates, at its mouth is a village, which receives the merchandise from Arabia, for the coast of Arabia approaches close to the mouths of the Euphrates and the Passatigris, the whole intermediate space is occupied by a lake which receives the Tigris. On sailing up the Passatigris 150 stadia is the bridge of rafts leading to Susa from Persis, and is distant from Susa 60, 600, stadia, the Passatigris is distant from the Orodes about 2000 stadia, the ascent through the lake to the mouth of the Tigris is 600, 6000, stadia, near the mouth stands the Susian village, Aginis, distant from Susa 500 stadia, the journey by water from the mouth of the Euphrates, up to Babylon, through a well-inhabited tract of country is a distance of more than 3,000 stadia. One Zecritus says that all the rivers discharge themselves into the lake, both the Euphrates and the Tigris, and that the Euphrates, again issuing from the lake, discharges itself into the sea by a separate mouth. 3.6 There are many other narrow defiles in passing out through the territory of the Uxii, and entering Persis. These Alexander forced in his march through the country at the Persian gates, and at other places, when he was hastening to see the principal parts of Persis, and the treasure holds, in which wealth had been accumulated during the long period that Asia was tributary to Persis. He crossed many rivers, which flow through the country and discharge themselves into the Persian Gulf. Next to the Coasps are the Copratas and the Passatigris, which has its source in the country of the Uxii. There is also the river Cyrus, which flows through Coel Persis, as it is called, near Pasargadi. The king changed his name, which was formerly a Gradatus, to that of this river. Alexander crossed the Arashas close to Persepolis. Persepolis was distinguished for the magnificence of the treasures which it contained. The Arashas flows out of the Paritocene, and receives the Medus, which has its source in Media. These rivers run through a very fruitful valley, which, like Persepolis, lies close to Carmania and to the eastern parts of the country. Alexander burnt the palace at Persepolis, to avenge the Greeks, whose temples and cities the Persians had destroyed by fire and sword. 
3.7 he next came to Pasargadi, which also was an ancient royal residence. Here he saw in a park the tomb of Cyrus. It was a small tower, concealed within a thick plantation of trees, solid below, but above consisting of one story and a shrine which had a very narrow opening. Aristobulus says, he entered through this opening, by order of Alexander, and decorated the tomb. He saw there a golden couch, a table with cups, a golden coffin, and a large quantity of garments and dresses ornamented with precious stones. These objects he saw at his first visit, but on a subsequent visit the place had been robbed, and everything had been removed except the couch and the coffin which were only broken. The dead body had been removed from its place, whence it was evident that it was the act not of the satrap, but of robbers, who had left behind what they could not easily carry off. And this occurred although there was a guard of magi stationed about the place, who received for their daily subsistence a sheep, and every month a horse. The remote distance to which the army of Alexander had advanced, to Bactra and India, gave occasion to the introduction of many disorderly acts, and to this among others. Such is the account of Aristobulus, who records the following inscription on the tomb. O oh man, I am Cyrus, I established the Persian Empire and was king of Asia. Grudge me not therefore this monument. One Zecritus however says that the tower had ten stories, that Cyrus lay in the uppermost, and that there was an inscription in Greek, cut in Persian letters, I Cyrus, king of kings, lie here. And another inscription to the same effect in the Persian language. 3.8 One Zecritus mentions also this inscription on the tomb of Darius, I was a friend to my friends, I was the first of horsemen and archers, I excelled as hunter, I could do everything. Aristus of Salamis, a writer of a much later age than these, says, that the tower consisted of two stories, and was large, that it was built at the time the Persians succeeded to the kingdom, of the Medes, that the tomb was preserved, that the above-mentioned inscription was in the Greek, and that there was another to the same purport in the Persian language. Cyrus held in honor Pasargadi, because he there conquered, in his last battle, Astyages the Mede, and transferred to himself the empire of Asia, he raised it to the rank of a city, and built a palace in memory of his victory. 3.9 Alexander transferred everything that was precious in Persis to Susa, which was itself full of treasures and costly materials. He did not, however, consider this place, but Babylon, as the royal residence, and intended to embellish it. There too his treasure was deposited. They say that, besides the treasures in Babylon and in the camp of Alexander, which were not included in the sum, the treasure found at Susa and in Persis was reckoned to amount to 40,000, and according to some writers to 50,000, talents. But others say, that the whole treasure, collected from all quarters, and transported to Ekbatna, amounted to 180,000 talents, and that the 8,000 talents which Darius carried away with him in his flight from Media became the booty of those who put him to death. 3.10 Alexander preferred Babylon, because he saw that it far surpassed the other cities in magnitude, and had other advantages. Although Susis is fertile, it has a glowing and scorching atmosphere, particularly near the city, as he, Aristobulus, says. Lizards and serpents at midday in the summer, when the sun is at its greatest height, cannot cross the streets of the city quick enough to prevent their being burnt to death midway by the heat. This happens nowhere in Persis, although it lies more towards the south. Cold water for baths is suddenly heated by exposure to the sun. Barley spread out in the sun is roasted like barley prepared in ovens. For this reason earth is laid to the depth of two cubits upon the roofs of the houses. They are obliged to construct their houses narrow, on account of the weight placed upon them, and from one of long beams, but, as large dwellings are required to obviate the suffocating heat the houses are long. The beam made of the palm tree has a peculiar property, for although it retains its solidity, it does not as it grows old give way downwards, but curves upwards with the weight, and is a better support to the roof. The cause of the scorching heat is said to be high, overhanging mountains on the north, which intercept the northern winds. These, blowing from the tops of the mountains at a great height, fly over without touching the plains, to the more southern parts of Susis. There the air is still, particularly when the Atesian winds cool the other parts of the country which are burnt up by heat. 3.11 Susis is so fertile in grain, that barley and wheat produce, generally, 100, and sometimes 200 fold. Hence the furrows are not ploughed close together, for the roots when crowded impede the sprouting of the plant. The vine did not grow there before the Macedonians planted it, both there and at Babylon. They do not dig trenches, but thrust down into the ground iron-headed stakes, which when drawn out are immediately replaced by the plants. Such is the character of the inland parts. The sea coast is marshy and without harbours, hence Nearchus says, that he met with no native guides, when coasting with his fleet from India to Babylonia, for nowhere could his vessels put in, nor was he able to procure persons who could direct him by their knowledge and experience. 
3.12 The part of Babylonia formerly called Cytosine, and afterwards Apolloniatus, is situated near Susis. Above both, on the north and towards the east, are the Elimii and the Peridiceni, predatory people relying for security on their situation in a rugged and mountainous country. The Peridiceni lie more immediately above the Apolloniidae, and therefore annoy them the more. The Elimii are at war with this people and with the Susians, and the Uxii with the Elimii, but not so constantly at present as might be expected, on account of the power of the Parthians, to whom all the inhabitants of those regions are under subjection. When therefore the Parthians are quiet, all are tranquil, and their subject nations. But when, as frequently happens, there is an insurrection, which has occurred even in our own times, the event is not the same to all, but different to different people. For the disturbance has benefited some, but disappointed the expectation of others. Such is the nature of the countries of Persis and Susiana. 3.13 The manners and customs of the Persians are the same as those of the Susians and the Medes, and many other people, and they have been described by several writers, yet I must mention what is suitable to my purpose. The Persians do not erect statues nor altars, but, considering the heaven as Jupiter, sacrifice on a high place. They worship the sun also, whom they call Mithras, the moon, Venus, fire, earth, winds, and water. They sacrifice, having offered up prayers, in a place free from impurities, and present the victim crowned. After the Magus, who directs the sacrifice, has divided the flesh, each goes away with his share, without setting apart any portion to the gods, for the god, they say, requires the soul of the victim, and nothing more. Nevertheless, according to some writers, they lay a small piece of the call upon the fire. 3.14 But it is to fire and water especially that they offer sacrifice. They throw upon the fire dry wood without the bark, and place fat over it, they then pour oil upon it, and light it below, they do not blow the flame with their breath, but fan it. Those who have blown the flame with their breath, or thrown any dead thing or dirt upon the fire, are put to death. They sacrifice to water by going to a lake, river, or fountain, having dug a pit, they slaughter the victim over it, taking care that none of the pure water near be sprinkled with blood, and thus be polluted. They then lay the flesh in order upon myrtle or laurel branches, the magi touch it with slender twigs, and make incantations, pouring oil mixed with milk and honey, not into the fire, nor into the water, but upon the earth. They continue their incantations for a long time, holding in the hands a bundle of slender myrtle rods. 3.15 In Cappadocia, for in this country there is a great body of magi, called Pyrethi, and there are many temples dedicated to the Persian deities. The sacrifice is not performed with a knife, but the victim is beaten to death with a log of wood, as with a mallet. The Persians have also certain large shrines, called Pyroethia. In the middle of these is an altar, on which is a great quantity of ashes, where the Magi maintain an unextinguished fire. They enter daily, and continue their incantation for nearly an hour, holding before the fire a bundle of rods, and wear round their heads high turbans of felt, reaching down on each side so as to cover the lips and the sides of the cheeks. The same customs are observed in the temples of Anitus and of Omanus. Belonging to these temples are shrines, and a wooden statue of Omanus is carried in procession. These we have seen ourselves. Other usages, and such as follow, are related by historians. 3.16 The Persians never pollute a river with urine, nor wash nor bathe in it, they never throw a dead body, nor anything unclean, into it. To whatever god they intend to sacrifice, they first address a prayer to fire. 3.17 They are governed by hereditary kings. Disobedience is punished by the head and arms being cut off, and the body cast forth. They marry many women, and maintain at the same time a great number of concubines, with a view to a numerous offspring. The kings propose annual prizes for a numerous family of children. Children are not brought into the presence of their parents until they are four years old. Marriages are celebrated at the beginning of the vernal equinox. The bridegroom passes into the bride chamber, having previously eaten some fruit, or camel's marrow, but nothing else during the day. 3.18 From the age of 5 to 24 years they are taught to use the bow, to throw the javelin, to ride, and to speak the truth. They have the most virtuous preceptors, who interweave useful fables in their discourses, and rehearse, sometimes with sometimes without, music, the actions of the gods and of illustrious men. The youths are called to rise before daybreak, at the sound of brazen instruments, and assemble in one spot, as if for arming themselves or for the chase. They are arranged in companies of fifty, to each of which one of the kings or a satrap's son is appointed as leader, who runs, followed at command by the others, an appointed distance of thirty or forty stadia. They require them to give an account of each lesson, when they practice loud speaking, and exercise the breath and lungs. They are taught to endure heat, cold, 
and rains, to cross torrents, and keep their armor and clothes dry, to pasture animals, to watch all night in the open air, and to eat wild fruits, as the termithus, acorns, and wild pears. These persons are called cardises, who live upon plunder, for carta means a manly and warlike spirit. The daily food after the exercise of the gymnasium is bread, a cake, cardamom, a piece of salt, and dressed meat either roasted or boiled, and their drink is water. Their mode of hunting is by throwing spears from horseback, or with the bow or the sling. In the evening they are employed in planting trees, cutting roots, fabricating armor, and making lines and nets. The youth do not eat the game, but carry it home. The king gives rewards for running, and to the victors in the other contests of the pentathla, or five games. The youths are adorned with gold, esteeming it for its fiery appearance. They do not ornament the dead with gold, nor apply fire to them, on account of its being an object of veneration. 3.19 They serve as soldiers in subordinate stations, and in those of command from 20 to 50 years of age, both on foot and on horseback. They do not concern themselves with the public markets, for they neither buy nor sell. They are armed with a rom-shaped shield. Besides quivers, they have battle axes and short swords. On their heads they wear a cap rising like a tower. The breastplate is composed of scales of iron. The dress of the chiefs consists of triple drawers, a double tunic with sleeves reaching to the knees, the undergarment is white, the upper of a variegated color. The cloak for summer is of a purple or violet color, but for winter of a variegated color. The turbans are similar to those of the magi, and a deep double shoe. The generality of people wear a double tunic reaching to the half of the leg. A piece of fine linen is wrapped round the head. Each person has a bow and a sling. The entertainments of the Persians are expensive. They set upon their table entire animals in great number, and of various kinds. Their couches, drinking cups, and other articles are so brilliantly ornamented that they gleam with gold and silver. 3.20 Their consultations on the most important affairs are carried on while they are drinking, and they consider the resolutions made at that time more to be depended upon than those made when sober. On meeting persons of their acquaintance, and of equal rank with themselves, on the road, they approach and kiss them, but to persons of an inferior station they offer the cheek, and in that manner receive the kiss. But to persons of still lower condition they only bend the body. Their mode of burial is to smear the bodies over with wax, and then to inter them. The magi are not buried, but the birds are allowed to devour them. These persons, according to the usage of the country, espouse even their mothers. Such are the customs of the Persians. 3.21 The following, mentioned by Polycletus, are perhaps customary practices. At Susa each king builds in the citadel, as memorials of the administration of his government, a dwelling for himself, treasure houses, and magazines for tribute collected, in kind. From the sea coast they obtain silver, from the interior the produce of each province, as dyes, drugs, hair, wool, or anything else of this sort, and cattle. The apportionment of the tribute was settled by Darius, Longimanus, who was a very handsome person with the exception of the length of his arms, which reached to his knees. The greater part both of gold and silver is wrought up, and there is not much in coined money. The former they consider as best adapted for presents, and for depositing in storehouses. So much coined money as suffices for their wants they think enough, but, on the other hand, money is coined in proportion to what is required for expenditure. 3.22 Their habits are in general temperate. But their kings, from the great wealth which they possessed, degenerated into a luxurious way of life. They sent for wheat from Assos in Aeolia, for Chalibonian wine from Syria, and water from the Eulaeus, which is the lightest of all, for an attic cotylus measure of it weighs less by a dram, than the same quantity of any other water. 3.23 Of the barbarians the Persians were the best known to the Greeks, for none of the other barbarians who governed Asia governed Greece. The barbarians were not acquainted with the Greeks, and the Greeks were but slightly acquainted, and by distant report only, with the barbarians. As an instance, Homer was not acquainted with the empire of the Syrians nor of the Medes, for otherwise as he mentions the wealth of Egyptian Thebes and of Phoenicia, he would not have passed over in silence the wealth of Babylon, of Ninus, and of Ecbatana. The Persians were the first people that brought Greeks under their dominion, the Lydians, before them, did the same, they were not however masters of the whole, but of a small portion only of Asia, that within the river Elise, their empire lasted for a short time, during the reigns of Croesus and Aliots, and they were deprived of what little glory they had acquired when conquered by the Persians. The Persians, on the contrary, increased in power and, as soon as they had destroyed the Median Empire, subdued the Lydians and brought the Greeks of Asia under their dominion. At a later period they even passed over into Greece and were worsted in many great battles, but still they continued to keep possession of Asia, 
as far as the places on the seacoast, until they were completely subdued by the Macedonians. 3.24 The founder of their empire was Cyrus. He was succeeded by his son Cambyses, who was put to death by the Magi. The seven Persians who killed the Magi delivered the kingdom into the hands of Darius, the son of Hystaspes. The succession terminated with asses, whom Bagus the eunuch having killed set up Darius, who was not of the royal family. Alexander overthrew Darius, and reigned himself twelve years. The empire of Asia was partitioned out among his successors, and transmitted to their descendants, but was dissolved after it had lasted about 250 years. At present the Persians are a separate people, governed by kings, who are subject to other kings, to the kings of Macedon in former times, but now to those of Parthia. Book 16. 1.1. Assyria is contiguous to Persia and Susiana. This name is given to Babylonia, and to a large tract of country around, this tract contains Aturia, in which is Nineveh, the Apolloniatus, the Elimii, the Peridiki, and the Chalonitis about Mount Zagram, the plains about Nineveh, namely, Dolomene, Calachene, Chazine, and Adiabene, the nations of Mesopotamia, bordering upon the Gordiae, the Migdones about Nisibis, extending to the Zugma of the Euphrates, and to the great range of country on the other side that river, occupied by Arabians, and by those people who are properly called Syrians in the present age. This last people extend as far as the Cilicians, Phoenicians, and Jews, to the sea opposite the Sea of Egypt, and to the Bay of Issus. 1.2 The name of Syrians seems to extend from Babylonia as far as the Bay of Issus, and, anciently, from this bay to the Euxine. Both tribes of the Cappadocians, those near the Taurus and those near the Pontus, are called to this time Leuco-Syrians, or White Syrians, as though there existed a nation of Black Syrians. These are the people situated beyond the Taurus, and I extend the name of Taurus as far as the Amanus. When the historians of the Syrian Empire say that the Medes were overthrown by the Persians, and the Syrians by the Medes, they mean no other Syrians than those who built the royal palaces at Babylon and Nineveh, and Ninus, who built Nineveh in Aturia, was one of these Syrians. His wife, who succeeded her husband, and founded Babylon, was Semiramis. These sovereigns were masters of Asia. Many other works of Semiramis, besides those at Babylon, are extant in almost every part of this continent, as, for example, artificial mounds, which are called mounds of Semiramis, and walls and fortresses, with subterraneous passages, cisterns for water, roads to facilitate the ascent of mountains, canals communicating with rivers and lakes, roads and bridges. The empire they left continued with their successors to the time of, the contest between, Sardanopolis and Arbuses. It was afterwards transferred to the Medes. 1.3 The city Nineveh was destroyed immediately upon the overthrow of the Syrians. It was much larger than Babylon, and situated in the plain of Aturia. Aturia borders upon the places about Arbella, between these is the river Lycus. Arbella and the parts about it belong to Babylonia. In the country on the other side of the Lycus are the plains of Aturia, which surround Nineveh. In Aturia is situated Gogamila, a village where Darius was defeated and lost his kingdom. This place is remarkable for its name, which, when interpreted, signifies the camel's house. Darius, the son of Hystaspes, gave it this name, and assigned, the revenues of, the place for the maintenance of a camel, which had undergone the greatest possible labor and fatigue in the journey through the deserts of Scythia, when carrying baggage and provision for the king. The Macedonians, observing that this was a mean village, but Arbella a considerable settlement, founded, as it is said, by Arbalus, son of Athmonius, reported that the battle was fought and the victory obtained near Arbella, which account was transmitted to historians. 1.4 After Arbella and the mountain Nicatorium, a name which Alexander, after the victory at Arbella, superadded, is the river Capris, situated at the same distance from Arbella as the Lycus. The country is called Artesene. Near Arbella is the city Demetrius, next is the spring of Naphtha, the fires, the temple of the goddess Aenea, Sadraki, the palace of Darius, son of Hystaspes, the Cyprusan, or plantation of Cypresses, and the passage across the Capris, which is close to Seleucia and Babylon. 1.5 Babylon itself also is situated in a plain. The wall is 385 stadia in circumference, and 32 feet in thickness. The height of the space between the towers is 50, and of the towers 60 cubits. The roadway upon the walls will allow chariots with four horses when they meet to pass each other with ease. Whence, among the seven wonders of the world, are reckoned this wall and the hanging garden. The shape of the garden is a square, and each side of it measures four plethora. It consists of vaulted terraces, raised one above another, and resting upon cube-shaped pillars. These are hollow and filled with earth to allow trees of the largest size to be planted. 
The pillars, the vaults, and the terraces are constructed of baked brick and asphalt. The ascent to the highest story is by stairs, and at their side are water engines, by means of which persons, appointed expressly for the purpose, are continually employed in raising water from the Euphrates into the garden. For the river, which is a stadium in breadth, flows through the middle of the city, and the garden is on the side of the river. The tomb also of Belus is there. At present it is in ruins, having been demolished, as it is said, by Xerxes. It was a quadrangular pyramid of baked brick, a stadium in height, and each of the sides a stadium in length. Alexander intended to repair it. It was a great undertaking, and required a long time for its completion, for ten thousand men were occupied two months in clearing away the mound of earth, so that he was not able to execute what he had attempted, before disease hurried him rapidly to his end. None of the persons who succeeded him attended to this undertaking, other works also were neglected, and the city was dilapidated, partly by the Persians, partly by time, and, through the indifference of the Macedonians to things of this kind, particularly after Seleucus Nicator had fortified Seleucia on the Tigris near Babylon, at the distance of about 300 stadia. Both this prince and all his successors directed their care to that city, and transferred to it the seat of empire. At present it is larger than Babylon, the other is in great part deserted, so that no one would hesitate to apply to it what one of the comic writers said of Megalopolis in Arcadia, the great city is a great desert. On account of the scarcity of timber, the beams and pillars of the houses were made of palm wood. They wind ropes of twisted reed round the pillars, paint them over with colors, and draw designs upon them, they cover the doors with a coat of asphaltus. These are lofty, and all the houses are vaulted on account of the want of timber. For the country is bare, a great part of it is covered with shrubs, and produces nothing but the palm. This tree grows in the greatest abundance in Babylonia. It is found in Susiana also in great quantity, on the Persian coast, and in Carmania. They do not use tiles for their houses, because there are no great rains. The case is the same in Susiana and in Cytosine. 1.6 In Babylon a residence was set apart for the native philosophers called Chaldeans, who are chiefly devoted to the study of astronomy. Some, who are not approved of by the rest, profess to understand genethleology, or the casting of nativities. There is also a tribe of Chaldeans, who inhabit a district of Babylonia, in the neighborhood of the Arabians, and of the sea called the Persian Sea. There are several classes of the Chaldean astronomers. Some have the name of Orkeni, some Borsipeni, and many others, as if divided into sects, who disseminate different tenets on the same subjects. The mathematicians make mention of some individuals among them, as Sidenas, Naburianus, and Sudanus. Seleucus also of Seleucia is a Chaldean, and many other remarkable men. 1.7 Borsippa is a city sacred to Diana and Apollo. Here is a large linen manufactory. Bats of much larger size than those in other parts abound in it. They are caught and salted for food. 1.8 The country of the Babylonians is surrounded on the east by the Susans, Elimii, and Peridiceni, on the south by the Persian Gulf, and the Chaldeans as far as the Arabian Messenai, on the west by the Arabian Sinidae as far as Adiabene and Gordiaea, on the north by the Armenians and Medes as far as the Zagros, and the nations about that river. 1.9 The country is intersected by many rivers, the largest of which are the Euphrates and the Tigris, next to the Indian rivers, the rivers in the southern parts of Asia are said to hold the second place. The Tigris is navigable upwards from its mouth to Opis, and to the present Seleucia. Opis is a village and a mart for the surrounding places. The Euphrates also is navigable up to Babylon, a distance of more than 3,000 stadia. The Persians, through fear of incursions from without, and for the purpose of preventing vessels from ascending these rivers, constructed artificial cataracts. Alexander, on arriving there, destroyed as many of them as he could, those particularly, on the Tigris from the sea, to Opis but he bestowed great care upon the canals, for the Euphrates, at the commencement of summer, overflows, it begins to fill in the spring, when the snow in Armenia melts, the ploughed land, therefore, would be covered with water and be submerged, unless the overflow of the superabundant water were diverted by trenches and canals, as in Egypt the water of the Nile is diverted. Hence the origin of canals. Great labour is requisite for their maintenance, for the soil is deep, soft, and yielding, so that it would easily be swept away by the stream the fields would be laid bare, the canals filled, and the accumulation of mud would soon obstruct their mouths. Then, again, the excess of water discharging itself into the plains near the sea forms lakes, and marshes, and reed grounds, supplying the reeds with which all kinds of plaited vessels are woven. Some of these vessels are capable of holding water, when covered over with asphaltus, others are used with the material in its natural state. Sails are also made of reeds, these resemble mats or hurdles. 
1.10 It is not, perhaps, possible to prevent inundations of this kind altogether, but it is the duty of good princes to afford all possible assistance. The assistance required is to prevent excessive overflow by the construction of dams, and to obviate the filling of rivers, produced by the accumulation of mud, by cleansing the canals, and removing stoppages at their mouths. The cleansing of the canals is easily performed, but the construction of dams requires the labor of numerous workmen. For the earth being soft and yielding, does not support the superincumbent mass, which sinks, and is itself carried away, and thus a difficulty arises in making dams at the mouth. Expedition is necessary in closing the canals to prevent all the water flowing out. When the canals dry up in the summer time, they cause the river to dry up also, and if the river is low, before the canals are closed, it cannot supply the canals in time with water, of which the country, burnt up and scorched, requires a very large quantity, for there is no difference, whether the crops are flooded by an excess or perish by drought and a failure of water. The navigation up the rivers, a source of many advantages, is continually obstructed by both the above-mentioned causes, and it is not possible to remedy this unless the mouths of the canals were quickly opened and quickly closed, and the canals were made to contain and preserve a mean between excess and deficiency of water. 1.11 Aristobulus relates that Alexander himself, when he was sailing up the river, and directing the course of the boat, inspected the canals, and ordered them to be cleared by his multitude of followers, he likewise stopped up some of the mouths, and opened others. He observed that one of these canals, which took a direction more immediately to the marshes, and to the lakes in front of Arabia, had a mouth very difficult to be dealt with, and which could not be easily closed on account of the soft and yielding nature of the soil, he, therefore, opened a new mouth at the distance of thirty stadia, selecting a place with a rocky bottom, and to this the current was diverted. But in doing this he was taking precautions that Arabia should not become entirely inaccessible in consequence of the lakes and marshes, as it was already almost an island from the quantity of water, which surrounded it. For he contemplated making himself master of this country, and he had already provided a fleet and places of rendezvous, and had built vessels in Phoenicia and at Cyprus, some of which were in separate pieces, others were in parts, fastened together by bolts. These, after being conveyed to Thapsicus in seven distances of a day's march, were then to be transported down the river to Babylon. He constructed other boats in Babylonia, from cypress trees in the groves and parks, for there is a scarcity of timber in Babylonia. Among the Kasa'e, and some other tribes, the supply of timber is not great. The pretext for the war, says Aristobulus, was that the Arabians were the only people who did not send their ambassadors to Alexander, but the true reason was his ambition to be lord of all. When he was informed that they worshipped two deities only, Jupiter and Bacchus, who supply what is most requisite for the subsistence of mankind, he supposed that, after his conquests, they would worship him as a third, if he permitted them to enjoy their former national independence. Thus was Alexander employed in clearing the canals, and in examining minutely the sepulchres of the kings, most of which are situated among the lakes. 1.12 Eratosthenes, when he is speaking of the lakes near Arabia, says, that the water, when it cannot find an outlet, opens passages underground, and is conveyed through these as far as the Coel Syrians, it is also compressed and forced into the parts near Rhinoclura and Mount Cassius, and there forms lakes and deep pits. But I know not whether this is probable. For the overflowings of the water of the Euphrates, which form the lakes and marshes near Arabia, are near the Persian Sea. But the isthmus which separates them is neither large nor rocky, so that it was more probable that the water forced its way in this direction into the sea, either under the ground, or across the surface, than that it traversed so dry and parched a soil for more than six thousand stadia, particularly, when we observe, situated midway in this course, Libanus, Antilibanus, and Mount Cassius. Such, then, are the accounts of Eratosthenes and Aristobulus. 1.13 But Polyclitus says, that the Euphrates does not overflow its banks, because its course is through large plains, that of the mountains, from which it is supplied, some are distant 2,000, and the Kasaian mountains scarcely 1,000 stadia, that they are not very high, nor covered with snow to a great depth, and therefore do not occasion the snow to melt in great masses, for the most elevated mountains are in the northern parts above Ekbatna, towards the south they are divided, spread out, and are much lower, the Tigris also receives the greater part of the water, which comes down from them, and thus overflows its banks. The last assertion is evidently absurd, because the Tigris descends into the same plains, as the Euphrates, and the above-mentioned mountains are not of the same height, the northern being more elevated, the southern extending in breadth, but are of a lower altitude. The quantity of snow is not, however, to be estimated by altitude only, but by aspect. The same mountain has more snow on the northern than on the southern side, and the snow continues longer on the former than on the latter. 
as the Tigris therefore receives from the most southern parts of Armenia, which are near Babylon, the water of the melted snow, of which there is no great quantity, since it comes from the southern side, it should overflow in a less degree than the Euphrates, which receives the water from both parts, northern and southern, and not from a single mountain only, but from many, as I have mentioned in the description of Armenia. To this we must add the length of the river, the large tract of country which it traverses in the greater and in the lesser Armenia, the large space it takes in its course in passing out of the lesser Armenia and Cappadocia, after issuing out of the Taurus in its way to Thapsicus, forming the boundary between Syria below and Mesopotamia, and the large remaining portion of country as far as Babylon and to its mouth, a course in all of 36,000 stadia. This, then, on the subject of the canals, of Babylonia. 1.14 Babylonia produces barley in larger quantity than any other country, for a produce of 300-fold is spoken of. The palm tree furnishes everything else, bread, wine, vinegar, and meal, all kinds of woven articles are also procured from it. Braziers use the stones of the fruit instead of charcoal. When softened by being soaked in water, they are food for fattening oxen and sheep. It is said that there is a Persian song in which are reckoned up 360 useful properties of the palm. They employ for the most part the oil of sesame, a plant which is rare in other places. 1.15 Asphaltus is found in great abundance in Babylonia. Eratosthenes describes it as follows. The liquid asphaltus, which is called naphtha, is found in Susiana, the dry kind, which can be made solid, in Babylonia. There is a spring of it near the Euphrates. When this river overflows at the time of the melting of the snow, the spring also of asphaltus is filled, and overflows into the river, where large clods are consolidated, fit for buildings constructed of baked bricks. Others say that the liquid kind also is found in Babylonia. With respect to the solid kind, I have described its great utility in the construction of buildings. They say that boats, of reeds, are woven, which, when besmeared with asphaltus, are firmly compacted. The liquid kind, called naphtha, is of a singular nature. When it is brought near the fire, the fire catches it, and if a body smeared over with it is brought near the fire, it burns with a flame, which it is impossible to extinguish, except with a large quantity of water, with a small quantity it burns more violently, but it may be smothered and extinguished by mud, vinegar, alum, and glue. It is said that Alexander, as an experiment, ordered naphtha to be poured over a boy in a bath, and a lamp to be brought near his body. The boy became enveloped in flames, and would have perished if the bystanders had not mastered the fire by pouring upon him a great quantity of water, and thus saved his life. Poseidonius says that there are springs of naphtha in Babylonia, some of which produce white, others black, naphtha, the first of these, I mean the white naphtha, which attracts flame, is liquid sulfur, the second, or black naphtha, is liquid asphaltus, and is burnt in lamps instead of oil. 1.16 In former times the capital of Assyria was Babylon, it is now called Seleucia upon the Tigris. Near it is a large village called Tesiphon. This the Parthian kings usually made their winter residence, with a view to spare the Seleucians the burden of furnishing quarters for the Scythian soldiery. In consequence of the power of Parthia, Tesiphon may be considered as a city rather than a village, from its size it is capable of lodging a great multitude of people, it has been adorned with public buildings by the Parthians, and has furnished merchandise, and given rise to arts profitable to its masters. The kings usually pass the winter there, on account of the salubrity of the air, and the summer at Ecbatana and in Hyrcania, induced by the ancient renown of these places. As we call the country Babylonia, so we call the people Babylonians, not from the name of the city, but of the country, the case is not precisely the same, however, as regards even natives of Seleucia, as, for instance, Diogenes, the Stoic philosopher, who had the appellation of the Babylonian, and not the Seleucian. 1.17 At the distance of 500 stadia from Seleucia is Artemida, a considerable city, situated nearly directly to the east, which is the position also of Cytosine. This extensive and fertile tract of country lies between Babylon and Susiana, so that the whole road in travelling from Babylon to Susa passes through Cytosine. The road from Susa into the interior of Persis, through the territory of the Uxii, and from Persis into the middle of Carmania, leads also towards the east. Persis, which is a large country, encompasses Carmania on the, west, and north. Close to it adjoin Peridocene, and the Kasaian territory as far as the Caspian Gates, inhabited by mountainous and predatory tribes. Contiguous to Susiana is Elimes, a great part of which is rugged, and inhabited by robbers. To Elimes adjoin the country about the Zagros and Media. 1.18 The Kasae, like the neighboring mountaineers, are for the most part archers, and are always out on foraging parties. 
for as they occupy a country of small extent, and barren, they are compelled by necessity to live at the expense of others. They are also necessarily powerful, for they are all fighting men. When the Elimii were at war with the Babylonians and Susians, they supplied the Elimii with 13,000 auxiliaries. The Peridiceni attend to the cultivation of the ground more than the Kasae, but even these people do not abstain from robbery. The Elimii occupy a country larger in extent, and more varied, than that of the Peridiceni. The fertile part of it is inhabited by husbandmen. The mountainous tract is a nursery for soldiers, the greatest part of whom are archers. As it is of considerable extent, it can furnish a great military force, their king, who possesses great power, refuses to be subject, like others, to the king of Parthia. The country was similarly independent in the time of the Persians, and afterwards in the time of the Macedonians, who governed Syria. When Antiochus the Great attempted to plunder the temple of Belus, the neighboring barbarians, unassisted, attacked and put him to death. In after times the king of Parthia heard that the temples in their country contained great wealth, but knowing that the people would not submit, and admonished by the fate of Antiochus, he invaded their country with a large army, he took the temple of Minerva, and that of Diana, called Azara, and carried away treasure to the amount of ten thousand talents. Seleucia also, a large city on the river Hedifan, was taken. It was formerly called Solos. There are three convenient entrances into this country, one from Media and the places about the Zagros, through Massabatis, a second from Susis, through the district Gabian. Both Gabian and Massabatis are provinces of Elimia. A third passage is that from Persis. Corbian also is a province of Elimes. Segapini and Silicini, small principalities, border upon Elimes. Such, then, is the number and the character of the nations situated above Babylonia towards the east. We have said that Media and Armenia lie to the north, and Adiabene and Mesopotamia to the west of Babylonia. 1.19 The greatest part of Adiabene consists of plains, and, although it is a portion of Babylon, has its own prince. In some places it is contiguous to Armenia. For the Medes, Armenians, and Babylonians, the three greatest nations in these parts, were from the first in the practice, on convenient opportunities, of waging continual war with each other, and then making peace, which state of things continued till the establishment of the Parthian Empire. The Parthians subdued the Medes and Babylonians, but never at any time conquered the Armenians. They made frequent inroads into their country, but the people were not subdued, and Tigranes, as I have mentioned in the description of Armenia, opposed them with great vigor and success. Such is the nature of Adiabene. The Adiabene are also called Sacopodes. We shall describe Mesopotamia and the nations towards the south, after premising a short account of the customs of the Assyrians. 1.20 Their other customs are like those of the Persians, but this is peculiar to themselves. Three discrete persons, chiefs of each tribe, are appointed, who present publicly young women who are marriageable, and give notice by the crier, beginning with those most in estimation, of a sale of them to men intending to become husbands. In this manner marriages are contracted. As often as the parties have sexual intercourse with one another, they rise, each apart from the other, to burn perfumes. In the morning they wash, before touching any household vessel. For as ablution is customary after touching a dead body, so is it practiced after sexual intercourse. There is a custom prescribed by an oracle for all the Babylonian women to have intercourse with strangers. The women repair to a temple of Venus, accompanied by numerous attendants and a crowd of people. Each woman has a cord round her head, the man approaches a woman, and places on her lap as much money as he thinks proper, he then leads her away to a distance from the sacred grove, and has intercourse with her. The money is considered as consecrated to Venus. There are three tribunals, one consisting of persons who are past military service, another of nobles, and a third of old men, besides another appointed by the king. It is the business of the latter to dispose of the virgins in marriage, and to determine causes respecting adultery, of another to decide those relative to theft, and of the third, those of assault and violence. The sick are brought out of their houses into the highways, and inquiry is made of passengers whether any of them can give information of a remedy for the disease. There is no one so ill-disposed as not to accost the sick person, and acquaint him with anything that he considers may conduce to his recovery. Their dress is a tunic reaching to the feet, an upper garment of wool, and, a white cloak. The hair is long. They wear a shoe resembling a buskin. They wear also a seal, and carry a staff not plain, but with a figure upon the top of it, as an apple, a rose, a lily, or something of the kind. They anoint themselves with oil of sesame. They bewail the dead, like the Egyptians and many other nations. They bury the body in honey, first besmearing it with wax. There are three communities which have no corn. 
They live in the marshes, and subsist on fish. Their mode of life is like that of the inhabitants of Droja. 1.21 Mesopotamia has its name from an accidental circumstance. We have said that it is situated between the Euphrates and the Tigris, that the Tigris washes its eastern side only, and the Euphrates its western and southern sides. To the north is the Taurus, which separates Armenia from Mesopotamia. The greatest distance by which they are separated from each other is that towards the mountains. This distance may be the same which Eratosthenes mentions, and is reckoned from Thapsicus, where there was the, Zugma, old bridge of the Euphrates, to the, Zugma, passage over the Tigris, where Alexander crossed it, a distance, that is, of 2,400 stadia. The least distance between them is somewhere about Seleucia and Babylon, and is a little more than 200 stadia. The Tigris flows through the middle of the lake called Topitis in the direction of its breadth, and after traversing it to the opposite bank, sinks underground with a loud noise and rushing of air. Its course is for a long space invisible, but it rises again to the surface not far from Gordiaea. According to Eratosthenes, it traverses the lake with such rapidity, that although the lake is saline and without fish, yet in this part it is fresh, has a current, and abounds with fish. 1.22 The contracted shape of Mesopotamia extends far in length, and somewhat resembles a ship. The Euphrates forms the larger part of its boundary. The distance from Thapsicus to Babylon, according to Eratosthenes, is 4,800 stadia, and from the, Zugma Bridge in Kamagini, where Mesopotamia begins, to Thapsicus, is not less than 2,000 stadia. 1.23 The country lying at the foot of the mountains is very fertile. The people, called by the Macedonians Migdones, occupy the parts towards the Euphrates, and both Zugmata, that is, the Zugma in Kamagini, and the ancient Zugma at Thapsicus. In their territory is Nisibis, which they called also Antioch in Migdonia, situated below Mount Masius, and Tigranocerta, and the places about Carre, Nisiforium, Corderaza, and Sinica, where Crassus was taken prisoner by stratagem, and put to death by Serena, the Parthian general. 1.24 Near the Tigris are the places belonging to the Gordiae, whom the ancients called Carducci, their cities are Saresa, Satalka, and Pinica, a very strong fortress with three citadels, each enclosed by its own wall, so that it is as it were a triple city. It was, however, subject to the king of Armenia, the Romans also took it by storm, although the Gordiae had the reputation of excelling in the art of building, and to be skillful in the construction of siege engines. It was for this reason Tigranes took them into his service. The rest of Mesopotamia, Gordiaea, was subject to the Romans. Pompey assigned to Tigranes the largest and best portion of the country, for it has fine pastures, is rich in plants, and produces evergreens and an aromatic, the amomum. It breeds lions also. It furnishes naphtha, and the stone called gangitis, which drives away reptiles. 1.25 Gordes, the son of Triptolemus, is related to have colonized Gordine. The Eritreans afterwards, who were carried away by force by the Persians, settled here. We shall soon speak of Triptolemus in our description of Syria. 1.26 The parts of Mesopotamia inclining to the south, and at a distance from the mountains, are an arid and barren district, occupied by the Arabian Cenidae, a tribe of robbers and shepherds, who readily move from place to place, whenever pasture or booty begin to be exhausted. The country lying at the foot of the mountains is harassed both by these people and by the Armenians. They are situated above, and keep them in subjection by force. It is at last subject for the most part to these people, or to the Parthians, who are situated at their side, and possess both Media and Babylonia. 1.27 Between the Tigris and the Euphrates flows a river, called Basileos, or the Royal River, and about Anthemusia another called the Avaris. The road for merchants going from Syria to Seleucia and Babylon lies through the country of the, Arabian, Cenidae, now called Mali, and through the desert belonging to their territory. The Euphrates is crossed in the latitude of Anthemusia, a place in Mesopotamia. Above the river, at the distance of four Shoni, is Bambais, which is called by the names of Edessa and Heropolis, where the Syrian goddess Atar goddess is worshipped. After crossing the river, the road lies through a desert country on the borders of Babylonia to Sini, a considerable city, situated on the banks of a canal. From the passage across the river to Sini is a journey of five and twenty days. There are, on the road, owners of camels, who keep resting places, which are well supplied with water from cisterns, or transported from a distance. The Sinidae exact a moderate tribute from merchants, but, otherwise, do not molest them. The merchants, therefore, avoid the country on the banks of the river, and risk a journey through the desert, leaving the river on the right hand at a distance of nearly three days' march. For the chiefs of the tribes living on both banks of the river, 
who occupy not indeed a fertile territory, yet one less sterile than the rest, of the country, are settled in the midst of their own peculiar domains, and each exacts a tribute of no moderate amount for himself. And it is difficult among so large a body of people, and of such daring habits, to establish any common standard of tribute advantageous to the merchant. Seen as distant from Seleucia 18 Shoni. 1.28 The Euphrates and its eastern banks are the boundaries of the Parthian Empire. The Romans and the chiefs of the Arabian tribes occupy the parts on this side the Euphrates as far as Babylonia. Some of the chiefs attach themselves in preference to the Parthians, others to the Romans, to whom they adjoin. The Cenidae nomads, who live near the river, are less friendly to the Romans than those tribes who are situated at a distance near Arabia Felix. The Parthians were once solicitous of conciliating the friendship of the Romans, but having repulsed Crassus, who began the war with them, they suffered reprisals, when they themselves commenced hostilities, and sent Pacorus into Asia. But Antony, following the advice of the Armenian, was betrayed, and was unsuccessful, against them. Phreates, his successor, was so anxious to obtain the friendship of Augustus Caesar, that he even sent the trophies, which the Parthians had set up as memorials of the defeat of the Romans. He also invited Titius to a conference, who was at that time prefect of Syria, and delivered into his hands, as hostages, four of his legitimate sons, Saraspatanes, Rhodisps, Phreates, and Bonones, with two of their wives and four of their sons, for he was apprehensive of conspiracy and attempts on his life. He knew that no one could prevail against him, unless he was opposed by one of the Ashton family, to which race the Parthians were strongly attached. He therefore removed the sons out of his way, with a view of annihilating the hopes of the disaffected. The surviving sons, who live at Rome, are entertained as princes at the public expense. The other kings, his successors, have continued to send ambassadors, to Rome, and to hold conferences, with the Roman prefects. 2.1 Syria is bounded on the north by Cilicia and the mountain Amanus, from the sea to the bridge on the Euphrates, that is, from the Issean Gulf to the Zugma in Comagene, is a distance of 1,400 stadia, and forms the above-mentioned, northern, boundary, on the east it is bounded by the Euphrates and the Arabian Cenidae, who live on this side the Euphrates, on the south, by Arabia Felix and Egypt, on the west, by the Egyptian and Syrian seas as far as Issus. 2.2 Beginning from Cilicia and Mount Amanus, we set down as parts of Syria, Comagene, and the Seleucids of Syria, as it is called, then Coel Syria, lastly, on the coast, Phoenicia, and in the interior, Judea. Some writers divide the whole of Syria into Coelo Syrians, Syrians, and Phoenicians, and say that there are intermixed with these four other nations, Jews, Idumeans, Gazeans, and Azosii, some of whom are husbandmen, as the Syrians and Coelo Syrians, and others merchants, as the Phoenicians. 2.3 This is the general description, of Syria. In describing it in detail, we say that Kamagini is rather a small district. It contains a strong city, Samosata, in which was the seat of the kings. At present it is a, Roman, province. A very fertile but small territory lies around it. Here is now the Zugma, or bridge, of the Euphrates, and near it is situated Seleucia, a fortress of Mesopotamia, assigned by Pompey to the Comagenians. Here Tigranes confined in prison for some time and put to death Selene, surnamed Cleopatra, after she was dispossessed of Syria. 2.4 Seleucis is the best of the above-mentioned portions of Syria. It is called and is a tetrapolis, and derives its name from the four distinguished cities which it contains, for there are more than four cities, but the four largest are Antioch Epidaphne, Seleucia and Pyria, Apamea, and Laodicea. They were called sisters from the concord which existed between them. They were founded by Seleucus Nicator. The largest bore the name of his father, and the strongest his own. Of the others, Apamea had its name from his wife Apama, and Laodicea from his mother. In conformity with its character of Tetrapolis, Seleucis, according to Poseidonius, was divided into four satrapies, Coel Syria into the same number, but, Comagene, like, Mesopotamia, consisted of one. Antioch also is a Tetrapolis, consisting, as the name implies, of four portions, each of which has its own, and all of them a common wall. Seleucus, Nicator founded the first of these portions, transferring thither settlers from Antigonia, which a short time before Antigonus, son of Philip, had built near it. The second was built by the general body of settlers, the third by Seleucus, the son of Callinicus, the fourth by Antiochus, the son of Epiphanes. 2.5 Antioch is the metropolis of Syria. A palace was constructed there for the princes of the country. It is not much inferior in riches and magnitude to Seleucia on the Tigris and Alexandria in Egypt. Seleucus, 
Nicator settled here the descendants of Triptolemus, whom we have mentioned a little before. On this account the people of Antioch regard him as a hero, and celebrate a festival to his honour on Mount Cassius near Seleucia. They say that when he was sent by the Argives in search of Io, who first disappeared at Tyre, he wandered through Cilicia, that some of his Argive companions separated from him and founded Tarsus, that the rest attended him along the sea coast, and, relinquishing their search, settled with him on the banks of the Orontes, that Gordes the son of Triptolemus, with some of those who had accompanied his father, founded a colony in Gordiaea, and that the descendants of the rest became settlers among the inhabitants of Antioch. 2.6 Daphne, a town of moderate size, is situated above Antioch at the distance of 40 stadia. Here is a large forest, with a thick covert of shade and springs of water flowing through it. In the midst of the forest is a sacred grove, which is a sanctuary, and a temple of Apollo and Diana. It is the custom for the inhabitants of Antioch and the neighboring people to assemble here to celebrate public festivals. The forest is 80 stadia in circumference. 2.7 The river Arandes flows near the city. Its source is in Coel Syria. Having taken its course underground, it reappears, traverses the territory of Apamea to Antioch, approaching the latter city, and then descends to the sea at Seleucia. The name of the river was formerly Typhon, but was changed to Arantes, from the name of the person who constructed the bridge over it. According to the fable, it was somewhere here that Typhon was struck with lightning, and here also was the scene of the fable of the Arimi, whom we have before mentioned. Typhon was a serpent, it is said, and being struck by lightning, endeavoured to make its escape, and sought refuge in the ground, it deeply furrowed the earth, and, as it moved along, formed the bed of the river, having descended underground, it caused a spring to break out, and from Typhon the river had its name. On the west the sea, into which the Orontes discharges itself, is situated below Antioch in Seleucia, which is distant from the mouth of the river 40, and from Antioch 120 stadia. The ascent by the river to Antioch is performed in one day. To the east of Antioch are the Euphrates, Bambais, Baroia, and Heraclea, small towns formerly under the government of Dionysius, the son of Heracleon. Heraclea is distant 20 stadia from the temple of Diana Cerestus. 2.8 then follows the district of Cerestica, which extends as far as that of Antioch. On the north near it are Mount Amanus and Comagene. Cerestica extends as far as these places, and touches them. Here is situated a city, Gindarus, the Acropolis of Cerestica, and a convenient resort for robbers, and near it a place called Heracleum. It was near these places that Pacorus, the eldest of the sons of the Parthian king, who had invaded Syria, was defeated by Ventidius, and killed. Pagre, in the district of Antioch, is close to Gindarus. It is a strong fortress situated on the pass over the Amanus, which leads from the gates of the Amanus into Syria. Below Pagre lies the plain of Antioch, through which flow the rivers Arcoitus, Orontes, and Labatas. In this plain is also the trench of Meliagris, and the river Enoparas, on the banks of which Ptolemy Philometer, after having defeated Alexander Ballas, died of his wounds. Above these places is a hill called Trapezon from its form, and upon it Ventidius engaged Franicates the Parthian general. After these places, near the sea, are Seleucia and Pyria, a mountain continuous with the Amanus and Rossus, situated between Issus and Seleucia. Seleucia formerly had the name of Hydatopotami, rivers of water. It is a considerable fortress, and may defy all attacks, wherefore Pompey, having excluded from it Tigranes, declared it a free city. To the south of Antioch is Apamea, situated in the interior, and to the south of Seleucia, the mountains Cassius and Anti-Cassius. Still further on from Seleucia are the mouths of the Orontes, then the Nymphium, a kind of sacred cave, next Cassium, then follows Poseidium a small city, and Heraclea. 2.9 then follows Laodicea, situated on the sea, it is a very well-built city, with a good harbour, the territory, besides its fertility in other respects, abounds with wine, of which the greatest part is exported to Alexandria. The whole mountain overhanging the city is planted almost to its summit with vines. The summit of the mountain is at a great distance from Laodicea, sloping gently and by degrees upwards from the city, but it rises perpendicularly over Apamea. Laodicea suffered severely when Dolabella took refuge there. Being besieged by Cassius, he defended it until his death, but he involved in his own ruin the destruction of many parts of the city. 2.10 In the district of Apamea is a city well fortified in almost every part. For it consists of a well fortified hill, situated in a hollow plain, and almost surrounded by the Orontes, which, passing by a large lake in the neighborhood, flows through widespread marshes and meadows of vast extent, affording pasture for cattle and horses. The city is thus securely situated, 
and received the name Charonesus, or the peninsula, from the nature of its position. It is well supplied from a very large fertile tract of country, through which the Iranis flows with numerous windings. Seleucus Nicator, and succeeding kings, kept their 500 elephants, and the greater part of their army. It was formerly called Pella by the first Macedonians, because most of the soldiers of the Macedonian army had settled there, for Pella, the native place of Philip and Alexander, was held to be the metropolis of the Macedonians. Here also the soldiers were mustered, and the breed of horses kept up. There were in the royal stud more than 30,000 brood mares and 300 stallions. Here were employed colt breakers, instructors in the method of fighting in heavy armor, and all who were paid to teach the arts of war. The power Trypho, surnamed Diodotus, acquired as a proof of the influence of this place, for when he aimed at the empire of Syria, he made Apamea the center of his operations. He was born at Cagiana, a strong fortress in the Apamean district, and educated in Apamea, he was a favorite of the king and the persons about the court. When he attempted to effect a revolution in the state, he obtained his supplies from Apamea and from the neighboring cities, Larissa, Cagiana, Megara, Apollonia, and others like them, all of which were reckoned to belong to the district of Apamea. He was proclaimed king of this country, and maintained his sovereignty for a long time. Cecilius Bassus, at the head of two legions, caused Apamea to revolt, and was besieged by two large Roman armies, but his resistance was so vigorous and long that he only surrendered voluntarily and on his own conditions. For the country supplied his army with provisions, and a great many of the chiefs of the neighboring tribes were his allies, who possessed strongholds, among which was Lysias, situated above the lake, near Apamea, Arethusa, belonging to Sampsiceramus and Iamblichus his son, chiefs of the tribe of the Amesini. At no great distance were Heliopolis and Chalcis, which were subject to Ptolemy, son of Menius, who possessed the Masias and the mountainous country of the Ituraeans. Among the auxiliaries of Bassus was Alcadamnus, king of the Rambay A, a tribe of the nomads on this side of the Euphrates. He was a friend of the Romans, but, considering himself as having been unjustly treated by their governors, he retired to Mesopotamia, and then became a tributary of Bassus. Poseidonius the Stoic was a native of this place, a man of the most extensive learning among the philosophers of our times. 2.11 The tract called Peripotamia, belonging to the Arab chiefs, and Chalcidica, extending from the Masias, border upon the district of Apamea on the east, and nearly all the country further to the south of Apamea belongs to the Cenidae, who resemble the Namad of Mesopotamia. In proportion as the nations approach the Syrians they become more civilized, while the Arabians and Cenidae are less so. Their governments are better constituted, as that of Arethusa under Sampsiceramus, that of Themela under Gambrus, and other states of this kind. 2.12 Such is the nature of the interior parts of the district of Seleucia. The remainder of the navigation along the coast from Laodicea is such as I shall now describe. Near Laodicea are the small cities, Poseidium, Heracleum, and Gabala. Then follows the maritime tract of the Aradii, where are Paltus, Balania, and Carnus, the arsenal of Eridus, which has a small harbour, then Anidra, and Marathus, an ancient city of the Phoenicians and ruins. The Aradii divided the territory by lot. Then follows the district Simira. Continuous with these places is Orthosia, then the river Eleutherus, which some make the boundary of Seleucus towards Phoenicia and Coel Syria. 2.13 Eridus is in front of a rocky coast without harbours, and situated nearly between its arsenal and Marathus. It is distant from the land 20 stadia. It is a rock, surrounded by the sea, of about seven stadia in circuit, and covered with dwellings. The population even at present is so large that the houses have many stories. It was colonized, it is said, by fugitives from Sidon. The inhabitants are supplied with water partly from cisterns containing rain water, and partly from the opposite coast. In wartime they obtain water a little in front of the city, from the channel, between the island and the mainland, in which there is an abundant spring. The water is obtained by letting down from a boat, which serves for the purpose, and inverting over the spring, at the bottom of the sea, a wide-mouthed funnel of lead, the end of which is contracted to a moderate-sized opening, round this is fastened a, long, leathern pipe, which we may call the neck, and which receives the water, forced up from the spring through the funnel. The water first forced up is sea water, but the boatmen wait for the flow of pure and potable water, which is received into vessels ready for the purpose. In as large a quantity as may be required, and carry it to the city. 2.14 The Aradii were anciently governed by their own kings in the same manner as all the other Phoenician cities. Afterwards the Persians, Macedonians, and now the Romans have changed the government to its present state. 
the Aradii, together with the other Phoenicians, consented to become allies of the Syrian kings, but upon the dissension of the two brothers, Callinicus Seleucus and Antiochus Hyrax, as he was called, they espoused the party of Callinicus, they entered into a treaty, by which they were allowed to receive persons who quitted the king's dominions, and took refuge among them, and were not obliged to deliver them up against their will. They were not, however, to suffer them to embark and quit the island without the king's permission. From this they derived great advantages, for those who took refuge there were not ordinary people, but persons who had held the highest trusts, and apprehended the worst consequences, when they fled. They regarded those who received them with hospitality as their benefactors, they acknowledged their preservers, and remembered with gratitude the kindness which they had received, particularly after their return to their own country. It was thus that the Aradii acquired possession of a large part of the opposite continent, most of which they possess even at present, and were otherwise successful. To this good fortune they added prudence and industry in the conduct of their maritime affairs, when they saw their neighbors, the Cilicians, engaged in piratical adventures, they never on any occasion took part with them in such, a disgraceful, occupation. 2.15 After Orthosia and the river Eleutherus is Tripolis, which has its designation from the fact of its consisting of three cities, Tyre, Sidon, and Eridus. Contiguous to Tripolis is Theoprosopon, where the mountain Libanus terminates. Between them lies a small place called Triers. 2.16 There are two mountains, which form Coel Syria, as it is called, lying nearly parallel to each other. The commencement of the ascent of both these mountains, Libanus and Antilibanus, is a little way from the sea. Libanus rises above the sea near Tripolis and Theoprosopon, and Antilibanus, above the sea near Sidon. They terminate somewhere near the Arabian Mountains, which are above the district of Damascus and the Tracones as they are there called, where they form fruitful hills. A hollow plain lies between them, the breadth of which towards the sea is 200 stadia, and the length from the sea to the interior is about twice that number of stadia. Rivers flow through it, the largest of which is the Jordan, which water a country fertile and productive of all things. It contains also a lake, which produces the aromatic Russian reed. In it are also marshes. The name of the lake is Gennesaritis. It produces also balsamum. Among the rivers is the Chrysoroas, which commences from the city and territory of Damascus, and is almost entirely drained by watercourses, for it supplies with water a large tract of country, with a very deep soil. The Lycus and the Jordan are navigated upwards chiefly by the Aradii, with vessels of burden. 2.17 of the plains, the first reckoning from the sea is called Macras and Macropedium. Here Poseidonius says there was seen a serpent lying dead, which was nearly a plethrum in length, and of such a bulk and thickness that men on horseback standing on each side of its body could not see one another, the jaws when open could take in a man on horseback, and the scales of the skin were larger than a shield. 2.18 Next to the plain of Macras is that of Masias, which also contains some mountainous parts, among which is Chalcis, the Acropolis, as it were, of the Masias. The commencement of this plain is at Laodicea, near Libanus. The Ichiraeans and Arabians, all of whom are freebooters, occupy the whole of the mountainous tracts. The husbandmen live in the plains, and when harassed by the freebooters, they require protection of various kinds. The robbers have strongholds from which they issue forth, those, for example, who occupy Libanus have high up on the mountain the fortresses Sina, Barama, and some others like them, lower down, Botrys and Gigertus, caves also near the sea, and the castle on the promontory Theoprosopon. Pompey destroyed these fastnesses, from whence the robbers overran Byblus, and Beritus situated next to it, and which lie between Sidon and Theoprosopon. Byblus, the royal seat of Cyrus, is sacred to Adonis. Pompey delivered this place from the tyranny of Cyrus by striking off his head. It is situated upon an eminence at a little distance from the sea. 2.19 After Byblus is the river Adonis, and the mountain Climax, and Pali Byblus, then the river Lycus, and Beritus. This latter place was raised by Tryphon, but now the Romans have restored it, and two legions were stationed there by Agrippa, who also added to it a large portion of the territory of Masias, as far as the sources of the Orontes. These sources are near Libanus, the Paradisus, and the Egyptian fort near the district of Apamea. These places lie near the sea. 2.20 Above the Masias is the Royal Valley, as it is called, and the territory of Damascus, so highly extolled. Damascus is a considerable city, and in the time of the Persian Empire was nearly the most distinguished place in that country. Above Damascus are the two, hills, called Tracones, then, towards the parts occupied by Arabians and Ichiraeans promiscuously, are mountains of difficult access, in which were caves extending to a great depth. 
one of these caves was capable of containing 4,000 robbers, when the territory of Damascus was subject to incursions from various quarters. The barbarians used to rob the merchants most generally on the side of Arabia Felix, but this happens less frequently since the destruction of the bands of the robbers under Xenodorus, by the good government of the Romans, and in consequence of the security afforded by the soldiers stationed and maintained in Syria. 2.21 The whole country above Seleucus, extending towards Egypt and Arabia, is called Coel Syria, but peculiarly the tract bounded by Libanus and Antilibanus, of the remainder one part is the coast extending from Orthosia as far as Pelusium and is called Phoenicia, a narrow strip of land along the sea, the other, situated above Phoenicia in the interior between Gaza and Antilibanus, and extending to the Arabians, called Judea. 2.22 Having described Coel Syria properly so called, we pass on to Phoenicia, of which we have already described the part extending from Orthosia to Berytus. Next to Berytus is Sidon, at the distance of 400 stadia. Between these places is the river Tamiras, and the grove of Asclepius and Leontopolis. Next to Sidon is Tyre, the largest and most ancient city of the Phoenicians. This city is the rival of Sidon in magnitude, fame, and antiquity, as recorded in many fables. For although poets have celebrated Sidon more than Tyre, Homer, however, does not even mention Tyre, yet the colony sent into Africa and Spain, as far as, and beyond the pillars, extol much more the glory of Tyre. Both however were formerly, and are at present, distinguished and illustrious cities, but which of the two should be called the capital of Phoenicia is a subject of dispute among the inhabitants. Sidon is situated upon a fine naturally formed harbour on the mainland. 2.23 Tyre is wholly an island, built nearly in the same manner as Eridus. It is joined to the continent by a mound, which Alexander raised, when he was besieging it. It has two harbours, one close, the other open, which is called the Egyptian harbour. The houses here, it is said, consist of many stories, of more even than at Rome, on the occurrence, therefore, of an earthquake, the city was nearly demolished. It sustained great injury when it was taken by siege by Alexander, but it rose above these misfortunes, and recovered itself both by the skill of the people in the art of navigation, in which the Phoenicians in general have always excelled all nations, and by, the export of, purple dyed manufactures, the Tyrian purple being in the highest estimation. The shellfish from which it is procured is caught near the coast, and the Tyrians have in great abundance other requisites for dyeing. The great number of dyeing works renders the city unpleasant as a place of residence, but the superior skill of the people in the practice of this art is the source of its wealth. Their independence was secured to them at a small expense to themselves, not only by the kings of Syria, but also by the Romans, who confirmed what the former had conceded. They pay extravagant honours to Hercules. The great number and magnitude of their colonies and cities are proofs of their maritime skill and power. Such then are the Tyrians. 2.24 The Sidonians are said by historians to excel in various kinds of art, as the words of Homer also imply. Besides, they cultivate science and study astronomy and arithmetic, to which they were led by the application of numbers, in accounts, and night sailing, each of which, branches of knowledge, concerns the merchant and seaman. In the same manner the Egyptians were led to the invention of geometry by the mensuration of ground, which was required in consequence of the Nile confounding, by its overflow, the respective boundaries of the country. It is thought that geometry was introduced into Greece from Egypt, and astronomy and arithmetic from Phoenicia. At present the best opportunities are afforded in these cities of acquiring a knowledge of these, and of all other branches of philosophy. If we are to believe Poseidonius, the ancient opinion about Adams originated with Mochus, a native of Sidon, who lived before the Trojan times. Let us, however, dismiss subjects relating to antiquity. In my time there were distinguished philosophers, natives of Sidon, as Boethus, with whom I studied the philosophy of Aristotle, and Diodotus's brother. Antipater was of Tyre, and a little before my time Apollonius, who published a table of the philosophers of the school of Zeno, and of their writings. Tyre is distant from Sidon not more than 200 stadia. Between the two is situated a small town, called Ornithopolis, the city of birds, next a river which empties itself near Tyre into the sea. Next after Tyre is Palaetyrus, ancient Tyre, at the distance of 30 stadia. 2.25 then follows Ptolemaeus, a large city, formerly called Ace. It was the place of rendezvous for the Persians in their expeditions against Egypt. Between Ace and Tyre is a sandy beach, the sand of which is used in making glass. The sand, it is said, is not fused there, but carried to Sidon to undergo the process. Some say that the Sidonians have, in their own country, the vitrifiable sand, according to others, the sand of every place can be fused. I heard at Alexandria from the glassworkers, that there is in Egypt a kind of vitrifiable earth, 
without which expensive works in glass of various colors could not be executed, but in other countries other mixtures are required, and at Rome, it is reported, there have been many inventions both for producing various colors, and for facilitating the manufacture, as for example in glass wares, where a glass bowl may be purchased for a copper coin, and glass is ordinarily used for drinking. 2.26 A phenomenon of the rarest kind is said to have occurred on the shore between Tyre and Ptolemaeus. The people of Ptolemaeus had engaged in battle with Sarpedon the general, and after a signal defeat were left in this place, when a wave from the sea, like the rising tide, overwhelmed the fugitives, some were carried out to sea and drowned, others perished in hollow places, then again the ebb succeeding, uncovered and displayed to sight the bodies lying in confusion among dead fish. A similar phenomenon took place at Mount Cassium in Egypt. The ground, to a considerable distance, after a violent and single shock fell in parts, at once exchanging places, the elevated parts opposed the access of the sea, and parts which had subsided admitted it. Another shock occurred, and the place recovered its ancient position, except that there was an alteration, in the surface of the ground, in some places, and none in others. Perhaps such occurrences are connected with periodical returns the nature of which is unknown to us. This is said to be the case with the rise of the waters of the Nile, which exhibits a variety in its effects, but observes, in general, a certain order, which we do not comprehend. 2.27 Next to Ace is the Tower of Strato, with a station for vessels. Between these places is Mount Carmel, and cities of which nothing but the names remain, as Sycamonopolis, Bucolopolis, Crocodilopolis, and others of this kind. Next is a large forest. 2.28 Then Joppa, where the coast of Egypt, which at first stretches towards the east, makes a remarkable bend towards the north. In this place, according to some writers, Andromeda was exposed to the sea monster. It is sufficiently elevated, it is said to command a view of Jerusalem, the capital of the Jews, who, when they descended to the sea, used this place as a naval arsenal. But the arsenals of robbers are the haunts of robbers. Carmel, and the forest, belong to the Jews. The district was so populous that the neighboring village Iamia, and the settlements around, could furnish 40,000 soldiers. Thence to Cassium, near Pelusium, are little more than 1,000 stadia, and 1,300 to Pelusium itself. 2.29 In the interval is Gadaris, which the Jews have appropriated to themselves, then Azotus and Ascalon. From Iamia to Azotus and Ascalon are about 200 stadia. The country of the Ascalonidae produces excellent onions, the town is small. Antiochus the philosopher, who lived a little before our time, was a native of this place. Philodemus the Epicurean was a native of Gadara, as also Meliagrus, Menippus the satirist, and Theodorus the rhetorician, my contemporary. 2.30 Next and near Ascalon is the harbour of the Gazii. The city is situated inland at the distance of seven stadia. It was once famous, but was raised by Alexander, and remains uninhabited. There is said to be a passage thence across, of 1,260 stadia, to the city Isla, Alana, situated on the innermost recess of the Arabian Gulf. This recess has two branches, one, in the direction of Arabia and Gaza, is called Elanites, from the city upon it, the other is in the direction of Egypt, towards Heroopolis, to which from Pelusium is the shortest road, between the two seas. Traveling is performed on camels, through a desert and sandy country, in the course of which snakes are found in great numbers. 2.31 Next to Gaza is Raphia, where a battle was fought between Ptolemy IV and Antiochus the Great. Then Rhinoclera, so called from the colonists, whose noses had been mutilated. Some Ethiopian invaded Egypt, and, instead of putting the malefactors to death, cut off their noses, and settled them at Rhinoclera, supposing that they would not venture to return to their own country, on account of the disgraceful condition of their faces. 2.32 The whole country from Gaza is barren and sandy, and still more so is that district next to it, which contains the Lake Syrbanus, lying above it in a direction almost parallel to the sea, and leaving a narrow pass between, as far as what is called the Ekrigma. The length of the pass is about 200, and the greatest breadth 50 stadia. The Ekrigma is filled up with earth. Then follows another continuous tract of the same kind to Cassium, and thence to Pelusium. 2.33 The Cassium is a sandy hill without water, and forms a promontory, the body of Pompey the Great is buried there, and on it is a temple of Jupiter Cassius. Near this place Pompey the Great was betrayed by the Egyptians, and put to death. Next is the road to Pelusium, on which is situated Jera, and the rampart, as it is called, of Shabrias, and the pits near Pelusium, formed by the overflowing of the Nile in places naturally hollow and marshy. Such is the nature of Phoenicia. Artemidorus says, 
that from Orthosia to Pelusium is 3,650 stadia, including the winding of the bays, and from Melini or Melania in Cilicia to Solenderize, on the confines of Cilicia and Syria, are 1,900 stadia, thence to the Orontes 520 stadia, and from Orontes to Orthosia 1,130 stadia. 2.34 The western extremities of Judea towards Cassius are occupied by Idemians, and by the lake, Syrbanus. The Idemians are Nabataeans. When driven from their country by sedition, they passed over to the Jews, and adopted their customs. The greater part of the country along the coast to Jerusalem is occupied by the lake Syrbanus, and by the tract contiguous to it, for Jerusalem is near the sea, which, as we have said, may be seen from the arsenal of Joppa. These districts, of Jerusalem and Joppa, lie towards the north, they are inhabited generally, and each place in particular, by mixed tribes of Egyptians, Arabians, and Phoenicians. Of this description are the inhabitants of Galilee, of the plain of Jericho, and of the territories of Philadelphia and Samaria, surnamed Sebaste by Herod. But although there is such a mixture of inhabitants, the report most credited, one, among many things believed respecting the temple, and the inhabitants, of Jerusalem, is, that the Egyptians were the ancestors of the present Jews. 2.35 An Egyptian priest named Moses, who possessed a portion of the country called the Lower, Egypt, being dissatisfied with the established institutions there, left it and came to Judea with a large body of people who worshipped the divinity. He declared and taught that the Egyptians and Africans entertained erroneous sentiments, in representing the divinity under the likeness of wild beasts and cattle of the field, that the Greeks also were in error in making images of their gods after the human form. For God, said he, may be this one thing which encompasses us all, land and sea, which we call heaven, or the universe, or the nature of things. Who then of any understanding would venture to form an image of this deity, resembling anything with which we are conversant? On the contrary, we ought not to carve any images, but to set apart some sacred ground and a shrine worthy of the deity, and to worship him without any similitude. He taught that those who made fortunate dreams were to be permitted to sleep in the temple, where they might dream both for themselves and others, that those who practice temperance and justice, and none else, might expect good, or some gift or sign from the God, from time to time. 2.36 By such doctrine Moses persuaded a large body of right-minded persons to accompany him to the place where Jerusalem now stands. He easily obtained possession of it, as the spot was not such as to excite jealousy, nor for which there could be any fierce contention, for it is rocky, and, although well supplied with water, it is surrounded by a barren and waterless territory. The space within, the city, is sixty stadia, in circumference, with rock underneath the surface. Instead of arms, he taught that their defense was in their sacred things and the divinity, for whom he was desirous of finding a settled place, promising to the people to deliver such a kind of worship and religion as should not burthen those who adopted it with great expense, nor molest them with, so-called, divine possessions, nor other absurd practices. Moses thus obtained their good opinion, and established no ordinary kind of government. All the nations around willingly united themselves to him, allured by his discourses and promises. 2.37 2.37 His successors continued for some time to observe the same conduct, doing justly, and worshipping God with sincerity. Afterward superstitious persons were appointed to the priesthood, and then tyrants. From superstition arose abstinence from flesh, from the eating of which it is now the custom to refrain, circumcision, excision, and other practices which the people observe. The tyrannical government produced robbery, for the rebels plundered both their own and the neighboring countries those also who shared in the government seized upon the property of others, and ravaged a large part of Syria and of Phoenicia. Respect, however, was paid to the Acropolis, it was not abhorred as the seat of tyranny, but honored and venerated as a temple. 2.38 This is according to nature, and common both to Greeks and barbarians. 4. As members of a civil community, they live according to a common law, otherwise it would be impossible for the mass to execute any one thing in concert, in which consists a civil state, or to live in a social state at all. Law is twofold, divine and human. The ancients regarded and respected divine, in preference to human, law, in those times, therefore, the number of persons was very great who consulted oracles, and, being desirous of obtaining the advice of Jupiter, hurried to Dodona, to hear the answer of Joe from the lofty oak. The parent went to Delphi, anxious to learn whether the child which had been exposed, to die, was still living while the child itself was gone to the temple of Apollo, with the hope of discovering its parents. And Minos among the Cretans, the king who in the ninth year enjoyed converse with great Jupiter, every nine years, as Plato says, ascended to the cave of Jupiter, received ordinances from him, and conveyed them to men. Lycurgus, his imitator, acted in a similar manner, 
for he was often accustomed, as it seemed, to leave his own country to inquire of the Pythian goddess what ordinances he was to promulgate to the Lacedaemonians. 2.39 What truth there may be in these things I cannot say, they have at least been regarded and believed as true by mankind. Hence prophets receive so much honour as to be thought worthy even of thrones, because they were supposed to communicate ordinances and precepts from the gods, both during their lifetime and after their death, as for example Tiresias, to whom alone Proserpine gave wisdom and understanding after death, the others flit about as shadows. Such were Amphuraeus, Trophonius, Orpheus, and Masaeus. In former times there was Zamolxus, a Pythagorean, who was accounted a god among the Gedi, and in our time, Dicenius, the diviner of Byrbistas. Among the Bosporani, there was Achaeacharus, among the Indians, were the Gymnosophists, among the Persians, the Magi and Nisiamantis, and besides these the Lacanomantis and Hydromantis, among the Assyrians, were the Chaldeans, and among the Romans, the Tyrrhenian diviners of dreams. Such was Moses and his successors, their beginning was good, but they degenerated. 2.40 When Judea openly became subject to a tyrannical government, the first person who exchanged the title of priest for that of king was Alexander. His sons were Hyrcanus and Aristobulus. While they were disputing the succession to the kingdom, Pompey came upon them by surprise, deprived them of their power, and destroyed their fortresses, first taking Jerusalem itself by storm. It was a stronghold, situated on a rock, well fortified and well supplied with water within, but externally entirely parched with drought. A ditch was cut in the rock, sixty feet in depth, and in width two hundred fifty feet. On the wall of the temple were built towers, constructed of the materials procured when the ditch was excavated. The city was taken, it is said, by waiting for the day of fast, on which the Jews were in the habit of abstaining from all work. Pompey, availing himself of this, filled up the ditch, and threw bridges over it. He gave orders to raise all the walls, and he destroyed, as far as was in his power, the haunts of the robbers and the treasure holds of the tyrants. Two of these forts, Thrax and Taurus, were situated in the passes leading to Jericho. Others were Alexandrium, Hyrcanium, Machaerus, Lysias, and those about Philadelphia, and Scythopolis near Galilee. 2.41 Jericho is a plain encompassed by a mountainous district, which slopes towards it somewhat in the manner of a theatre. Here is the Phoenician, or palm plantation, which contains various other trees of the cultivated kind, and producing excellent fruit, but its chief production is the palm tree. It is 100 stadia in length, the whole is watered with streams, and filled with dwellings. Here also is a palace and the garden of the balsamum. The latter is a shrub with an aromatic smell, resembling the cytisus and the termenthus. Incisions are made in the bark, and vessels are placed beneath to receive the sap, which is like oily milk. After it is collected in vessels, it becomes solid. It is an excellent remedy for headache, incipient suffusion of the eyes, and dimness of sight. It bears therefore a high price, especially as it is produced in no other place. This is the case also with the phoenician, which alone contains the Karyot's palm, if we accept the Babylonian plain, and the country above it towards the east, a large revenue is derived from the palms and balsamum. Xylobalsamum is also used as a perfume. 2.42 The Lake Syrbanus is of great extent. Some say that it is 1,000 stadia in circumference. It stretches along the coast, to the distance of a little more than 200 stadia. It is deep, and the water is exceedingly heavy, so that no person can dive into it if any one wades into it up to the waist, and attempts to move forward, he is immediately lifted out of the water it abounds with asphaltus, which rises, not however at any regular seasons, in bubbles, like boiling water, from the middle of the deepest part. The surface is convex, and presents the appearance of a hillock. Together with the asphaltus, there ascends a great quantity of sooty vapor, not perceptible to the eye, which tarnishes copper, silver, and everything bright even gold. The neighboring people know by the tarnishing of their vessels that the asphaltus is beginning to rise, and they prepare to collect it by means of rafts composed of reeds. The asphaltus is a clot of earth, liquefied by heat, the air forces it to the surface, where it spreads itself. It is again changed into so firm and solid a mass by cold water, such as the water of the lake, that it requires cutting or chopping, for use. It floats upon the water, which, as I have described, does not admit of diving or immersion, but lifts up the person who goes into it. Those who go on rafts for the asphalt is cut it in pieces, and take away as much as they are able to carry. 2.43 Such are the phenomena. But Posidonius says, that the people being addicted to magic, and practicing incantations, by these means, consolidate the asphaltus, pouring upon it urine and other fetid fluids, and then cut it into pieces. Incantations cannot be the cause, but perhaps urine may have some peculiar power, 
in effecting the consolidation, in the same manner that chrysocala is formed in the bladders of persons who labor under the disease of the stone, and in the urine of children. It is natural for these phenomena to take place in the middle of the lake, because the source of the fire is in the center, and the greater part of the asphaltus comes from thence. The bubbling up, however, of the asphaltus is irregular, because the motion of fire, like that of many other vapors, has no order perceptible to observers. There are also phenomena of this kind at Apollonia and Epirus. 2.44 Many other proofs are produced to show that this country is full of fire. Near Moasada are to be seen rugged rocks, bearing the marks of fire, fissures in many places, a soil like ashes, pitch falling in drops from the rocks, rivers boiling up, and emitting a fetid odor to a great distance, dwellings in every direction overthrown. Whence we are inclined to believe the common tradition of the natives, that thirteen cities once existed there, the capital of which was Sodom, but that a circuit of about sixty stadia around it escaped uninjured, shocks of earthquakes, however, eruptions of flames and hot springs, containing asphaltus and sulfur, caused the lake to burst its bounds, and the rocks took fire, some of the cities were swallowed up, others were abandoned by such of the inhabitants as were able to make their escape. But Eratosthenes asserts, on the contrary, that the country was once a lake, and that the greater part of it was uncovered by the water discharging itself through a breach, as was the case in Thessaly. 2.45 In the Gadaris, also, there is a lake of noxious water. If beasts drink it, they lose their hair, hoofs, and horns. At the place called Terakii, the lake supplies the best fish for curing. On its banks grow trees which bear a fruit like the apple. The Egyptians use the asphaltus for embalming the bodies of the dead. 2.46 Pompey curtailed the territory which had been forcibly appropriated by the Jews, and assigned to Hyrcanus the priesthood. Some time afterwards, Herod, of the same family, and a native of the country, having surreptitiously obtained the priesthood, distinguished himself so much above his predecessors, particularly in his intercourse, both civil and political, with the Romans, that he received the title and authority of king, first from Antony, and afterwards from Augustus Caesar. He put to death some of his sons, on the pretext of their having conspired against him, other sons he left at his death, to succeed him, and assigned to each, portions of his kingdom. Caesar bestowed upon the sons also of Herod marks of honor, on his sister Salome, and on her daughter Berenice. The sons were unfortunate, and were publicly accused. One of them died in exile among the Galatea Labroges, whose country was assigned for his abode. The others, by great interest and solicitation, but with difficulty, obtained leave to return to their own country, each with his tetrarchy restored to him. 3.1 Above Judea and Coel Syria, as far as Babylonia and the river tract, along the banks of the Euphrates towards the south, lies the whole of Arabia, except the Cenity in Mesopotamia. We have already spoken of Mesopotamia, and of the nations that inhabit it. The parts on the other, the eastern, side of the Euphrates, towards its mouth, are occupied by Babylonians and the nation of the Chaldeans. We have spoken of these people also. Of the rest of the country which follows after Mesopotamia, and extends as far as Coel Syria, the part approaching the river, as well as, a part of, Mesopotamia, are occupied by Arabian Cenity, who are divided into small sovereignties, and inhabit tracts which are barren from want of water. They do not till the land at all, or only to a small extent, but they keep herds of cattle of all kinds, particularly of camels. Above these is a great desert, but the parts lying still more to the south are occupied by the nations inhabiting Arabia Felix, as it is called. The northern side of this tract is formed by the above-mentioned desert, the eastern by the Persian, the western by the Arabian Gulf, and the southern by the Great Sea lying outside of both the gulfs, the whole of which is called the Erythrean Sea. 3.2 The Persian Gulf has the name also of the Sea of Persia. Eratosthenes speaks of it in this manner, they say that the mouth is so narrow, that from Harmazi, the promontory of Carmania, may be seen the promontory at Mace, in Arabia. From the mouth, the coast on the right hand is circular, and at first inclines a little from Carmania towards the east, then to the north, and afterwards to the west as far as Turton and the mouth of the Euphrates. In an extent of about 10,000 stadia, it comprises the coast of the Carmanians, Persians, and Susians, and in part of the Babylonians. Of these we ourselves have before spoken, hence directly as far as the mouth are 10,000 stadia more, according, it is said, to the computation of Androsthenes of Thassos, who not only had accompanied Nearchus, but had also alone sailed along the sea coast of Arabia. It is hence evident that this sea is little inferior in size to the Euxine. He says that Androsthenes, who had navigated the gulf with a fleet, relates, that in sailing from Turton with the continent on the right hand, an island Icaros is met with, lying in front, which contained a temple sacred to Apollo, and an oracle of, Diana, Toropolis. 
3.3 having coasted the shore of Arabia to the distance of 2,400 stadia, there lies, in a deep gulf, a city of the name of Jera, belonging to Chaldean exiles from Babylon, who inhabit the district in which salt is found, and who have houses constructed of salt, as scales of salt separated by the burning heat of the sun are continually falling off, the houses are sprinkled with water, and the walls are thus kept firm together. The city is distant 200 stadia from the sea. The merchants of Jera generally carry the Arabian merchandise and aromatics by land, but Aristobulus says, on the contrary, that they frequently travel into Babylonia on rafts, and then sail up the Euphrates to Thapsacus with their cargoes, but afterwards carry them by land to all parts of the country. 3.4 On sailing further, there are other islands, Tyre and Eridus, which have temples resembling those of the Phoenicians. The inhabitants of these islands, if we are to believe them, say that the islands and cities bearing the same name as those of the Phoenicians are their own colonies. These islands are distant from Turdan ten days sail, and from the promontory at the mouth of the gulf at Maka'a one day's sail. 3.5 Nearchus and Orthagoras relate, that an island Ogyrus lies to the south, in the open sea, at the distance of 2,000 stadia from Carmania. In this island is shown the sepulchre of Erythrus, a large mound, planted with wild palms. He was king of the country, and the sea received its name from him. It is said that Mithropastes, the son of Assites, satrap of Phrygia, pointed out these things to them. Mithropastes was banished by Darius, and resided in this island, he joined himself to those who had come down to the Persian Gulf, and hoped through their means to have an opportunity of returning to his own country. 3.6 Along the whole coast of the Red Sea, in the deep part of the water grow trees resembling the laurel and the olive. When the tide ebbs, the whole trees are visible above the water, and at the full tide they are sometimes entirely covered. This is the more singular because the coast inland has no trees. This is the description given by Eratosthenes of the Persian Sea, which forms, as we have said, the eastern side of Arabia Felix. 3.7 Nearchus says, that they were met by Mithropastes, in company with Mazines, who was governor of one of the islands, called Doracta, or Acta. In the Persian Gulf, that Mithropastes, after his retreat from Ogyrus, took refuge there, and was hospitably received, that he had an interview with Mazines, for the purpose of being recommended to the Macedonians, in the fleet of which Mazines was the guide. Nearchus also mentions an island, met with at the recommencement of the voyage along the coast of Persia, where are found pearls in large quantities and of great value, in other islands there are transparent and brilliant pebbles, in the islands in front of the Euphrates there are trees which send forth the odour of frankincense, and from their roots, when bruised, a, perfumed, juice flows out, the crabs and sea hedgehogs are of vast size, which is common in all the exterior seas, some being larger than Macedonian hats, others of the capacity of two cotyle. he says also that he had seen driven on shore a whale fifty cubits in length. 4.1 Arabia commences on the side of Babylonia with Mycenae. In front of this district, on one side lies the desert of the Arabians, on the other are the marshes opposite to the Chaldeans, formed by the overflowing of the Euphrates, and in another direction is the Sea of Persia. This country has an unhealthy and cloudy atmosphere, it is subject to showers, and also to scorching heat, still its products are excellent. The vine grows in the marshes, as much earth as the plant may require is laid upon hurdles of reeds, the hurdle is frequently carried away by the water, and is then forced back again by poles to its proper situation. 4.2 I return to the opinions of Eratosthenes, which he next delivers respecting Arabia. He is speaking of the northern and desert part, lying between Arabia Felix, Coel Syria, and Judea, to the recess of the Arabian Gulf. From Heroopolis, situated in that recess of the Arabian Gulf which is on the side of the Nile, to Babylon, towards Petra of the Nabataei, are 5,600 stadia. The whole tract lies in the direction of the summer solstice, I, E, east and west, and passes through the adjacent Arabian tribes, namely Nabate, Chalatai, and Agra. Above these people is Arabia Felix, stretching out 12,000 stadia towards the south to the Atlantic Sea. The first people, next after the Syrians and Jews, who occupy this country are husbandmen. These people are succeeded by a barren and sandy tract, producing a few palms, the acanthus, and tamarisk. Water is obtained by digging, wells, as in Gdrosia. It is inhabited by Arabian Sinidae, who breed camels. The extreme parts towards the south, and opposite to Ethiopia, are watered by summer showers, and are sowed twice, like the land in India. Its rivers are exhausted in watering plains, and by running into lakes. The general fertility of the country is very great, among other products, there is in particular an abundant supply of honey, except horses, there are numerous herds of animals, mules, asses, and swine, birds also of every kind, except geese and the Galanaceous tribe. 
Four of the most populous nations inhabit the extremity of the above-mentioned country, namely, the Mini I the part towards the Red Sea, whose largest city is Karna or Karnana. Next to these are the Sabians, whose chief city is Mariaba. The third nation are the Katabanis, extending to the Straits and the passage across the Arabian Gulf. Their royal seat is called Tamna. The Chatramadati are the furthest of these nations towards the east. Their city is Sabata. 4.3 All these cities are governed by one monarch, and are flourishing. They are adorned with beautiful temples and palaces. Their houses, in the mode of binding the timbers together, are like those in Egypt. The four countries comprise a greater territory than the delta of Egypt. The son does not succeed the father in the throne, but the son who is born in a family of the nobles first after the accession of the king. As soon as any one is invested with the government, the pregnant wives of the nobles are registered, and guardians are appointed to watch which of them is first delivered of a son. The custom is to adopt and educate the child in a princely manner as the future successor to the throne. 4.4 Catabania produces frankincense, and Chatramatitis myrrh, these and other aromatics are the medium of exchange with the merchants. Merchants arrive in 70 days at Minea from Alana. Alana is a city on the other recess of the Arabian Gulf, which is called Alanites, opposite to Gaza, as we have before described it. The Jerii arrive in Chatramatitis in 40 days. The part of the Arabian Gulf along the side of Arabia, if we reckon from the recess of the Alanitic Bay, is, according to the accounts of Alexander and Anaxocrates, 14,000 stadia in extent, but this computation is too great. The part opposite to Troglodytica, which is on the right hand of those who are sailing from Heroopolis to Ptolemaeus, to the country where elephants are taken, extends 9,000 stadia to the south, and inclines a little towards the east. Thence to the straits are about 4,500 stadia, in a direction more towards the east. The straits at Ethiopia are formed by a promontory called Dira. There is a small town upon it of the same name. The Ichthyophagi inhabit this country. Here it is said is a pillar of Sesistris the Egyptian, on which is inscribed, in hieroglyphics, an account of his passage, across the Arabian Gulf. For he appears to have subdued first Ethiopia and Troglodytica, and afterwards to have passed over into Arabia. He then overran the whole of Asia. Hence in many places there are dikes called the dikes of Sesistris, and temples built in honor of Egyptian deities. The straits at Dira are contracted to the width of sixty stadia, not indeed that these are now called the straits, for ships proceed to a further distance, and find a passage of about two hundred stadia between the two continents, six islands contiguous to one another leave a very narrow passage through them for vessels, by filling up the interval between the continents. Through these goods are transported from one continent to the other on rafts, it is this passage which is called the straits. After these islands, the subsequent navigation is among bays along the Mer country, in the direction of south and east, as far as the Cinnamon country, a distance of about 5,000 stadia, beyond this district no one to this time, it is said, has penetrated. There are not many cities upon the coast, but in the interior they are numerous and well inhabited. Such is the account of Arabia given by Eratosthenes. We must add what is related also by other writers. 4.5 Artemidorus says, that the promontory of Arabia, opposite to Dira, is called Asila, and that the persons who live near Dira deprive themselves of the prepuce. In sailing from Heroopolis along Troglodytica, a city is met with called Philatera, after the sister of the second Ptolemy, it was founded by Satyrus, who was sent to explore the hunting ground for the elephants, and Troglodytica itself. Next to this is another city, Arsinoe, and next to this, springs of hot water, which are salt and bitter, they are precipitated from a high rock, and discharge themselves into the sea. There is in a plain near, these springs, a mountain, which is of a red color like minium. Next is Maius Hormus, which is also called Aphrodite's Hormus, it is a large harbor with an oblique entrance. In front are three islands, two are covered with olive trees, and one, the third, is less shaded with trees, and abounds with guinea fowls. Then follows a Cathartus, or Fowl Bay, which, like Maius Hormus, is in the latitude of the Thebais. The bay is really foul, for it is very dangerous from rocks, some of which are covered by the sea, others rise to the surface, as also from almost constant and furious tempests. At the bottom of the bay is situated the city Berenice. 4.6 After the bay is the island off Iodes, so called from the accidental circumstance, of its having once been infested with serpents. It was cleared of the serpents by the king, on account of the destruction occasioned by those noxious animals to the persons who frequented the island, and on account of the topazes found there. The topaz is a transparent stone, sparkling with a golden luster, which however is not easy to be distinguished in the daytime, on account of the brightness of the surrounding light, but at night the stones are visible to those who collect them. 
the collectors place a vessel over the spot, where the topazes are seen, as a mark, and dig them up in the day. A body of men was appointed and maintained by the kings of Egypt to guard the place where these stones were found, and to superintend the collection of them. 4.7 Next after this island follow many tribes of Ichthyophagi and of nomads, then succeeds the harbour of the goddess Satera, the preserver, which had its name from the circumstance of the escape and preservation of some masters, of vessels, from great dangers by sea. After this the coast and the gulf seem to undergo a great change, for the voyage along the coast is no longer among rocks, and approaches almost close to Arabia, the sea is so shallow as to be scarcely of the depth of two orgi, and has the appearance of a meadow, in consequence of the seaweeds, which abound in the passage, being visible through and under the water. Even trees here grow from under the water, and the sea abounds with sea dogs. Next are two mountains, the Towery, or the Bulls, presenting at a distance a resemblance to these animals. Then follows another mountain, on which is a temple of Isis, built by Sesestris, then an island planted with olive trees, and at times overflowed. This is followed by the city Ptolemaeus, near the hunting grounds of the elephants, founded by Eumides, who was sent by Philadelphus to the hunting ground. He enclosed, without the knowledge of the inhabitants, a kind of peninsula with a ditch and wall, and by his courteous address gained over those who were inclined to obstruct the work, and instead of enemies made them his friends. 4.8 In the intervening space, a branch of the river Estabras discharges itself. It has its source in a lake, and empties part of its waters, into the bay, but the larger portion it contributes to the Nile. Then follow six islands, called Latamii, after these the Sabatic Mouth, as it is called, and in the inland parts a fortress built by Suchus. Then a lake called Alia, and the island of Strato, next Saba a port, and a hunting ground for elephants of the same name. The country deep in the interior is called Tenesis. It is occupied by those Egyptians who took refuge from the government of Somaticus. They are surnamed Sembriti, as being strangers. They are governed by a queen, to whom also Meroe, an island in the Nile near these places, is subject. Above this, at no great distance, is another island in the river, a settlement occupied by the same fugitives. From Meroe to this sea is a journey of fifteen days for an active person. Near Meroe is the confluence of the Estabaras, the Estapas, and of the Estasibas with the Nile. 4.9 On the banks of these rivers live the Rhizophagi, or root eaters, and Hale, or marsh men. They have their name from digging roots in the adjacent marsh, bruising them with stones, and forming them into cakes, which they dry in the sun for food. These countries are the haunts of lions. The wild beasts are driven out of these places, at the time of the rising of the dog star, by large gnats. Near these people live the Spermophagi, or seed eaters, who, when seeds of plants fail, subsist upon seeds of trees, which they prepare in the same manner as the Rhizophagi prepare their roots. Next to Aliyah are the watchtowers of Demetrius, and the altars of Conan. In the interior Indian reeds grow in abundance. The country there is called the country of Corusius. Far in the interior was a place called Endera, inhabited by a naked tribe, who use bows and reed arrows, the points of which are hardened in the fire. They generally shoot the animals from trees, sometimes from the ground. They have numerous herds of wild cattle among them, on the flesh of which they subsist, and on that of other wild animals. When they have taken nothing in the chase, they dress dried skins upon hot coals, and are satisfied with food of this kind. It is their custom to propose trials of skill in archery for those who have not attained manhood. Next to the altars of Conan is the port of Molinus, and above it is a fortress called that of Korows and the chase of Korows, also another fortress and more hunting grounds. Then follows the harbour of Antiphilus, and above this a tribe, the Creophagi, deprived of the prepuce, and the women are excised after the Jewish custom. 4.10 Further still towards the south are the Sinamalgi, called by the natives Agrai, with long hair and long beards, who keep a breed of very large dogs for hunting the Indian cattle which come into their country from the neighbouring district, driven thither either by wild beasts or by scarcity of pasturage. The time of their incursion is from the summer solstice to the middle of winter. Next to the harbour of Antiphilus is a port called the Grove of the Calabi, or the Mutilated, the city Berenice of Sabai, and Sabai a considerable city, then the Grove of Eumenes. Above is the city Dorada, and a hunting ground for elephants, called at the well. The district is inhabited by the Elephantophagi, or elephant eaters, who are occupied in hunting them. When they descry from the trees a herd of elephants directing their course through the forest, they do not, then, attack, but they approach by stealth and hamstring the hindmost stragglers from the herd. Some kill them with bows and arrows, the latter being dipped in the gall of serpents. The shooting with the bow is performed by three men, two, advancing in front, hold the bow, and one draws the string. 
others remark the trees against which the elephant is accustomed to rest, and, approaching on the opposite side, cut the trunk of the tree low down. When the animal comes and leans against it, the tree and the elephant fall down together. The elephant is unable to rise, because its legs are formed of one piece of bone which is inflexible. The hunters leap down from the trees, kill it, and cut it in pieces. The Namad call the hunters a cathardi, or impure. 4.11 Above this nation is situated a small tribe the Struthophagi, or bird eaters, in whose country are birds of the size of deer, which are unable to fly, but run with the swiftness of the ostrich. Some hunt them with bows and arrows, others covered with the skins of birds. They hide the right hand in the neck of the skin, and move it as the birds move their necks. With the left hand they scatter grain from a bag suspended to the side, they thus entice the birds, till they drive them into pits, where the hunters dispatch them with cudgels. The skins are used both as clothes and as coverings for beds. The Ethiopians called Simi are at war with these people, and use as weapons the horns of antelopes. 4.12 Bordering on this people is a nation blacker in complexion than the others, shorter in stature, and very short-lived. They rarely live beyond 40 years, for the flesh of their bodies is eaten up with worms. Their food consists of locusts, which the southwest and west winds, when they blow violently in the springtime, drive in bodies into the country. The inhabitants catch them by throwing into the ravines materials which cause a great deal of smoke, and light them gently. The locusts, as they fly across the smoke, are blinded and fall down. They are pounded with salt, made into cakes, and eaten as food. Above these people is situated a desert tract with extensive pastures. It was abandoned in consequence of the multitudes of scorpions and tarantulas, called tetragnati, or forejawed, which formerly abounded to so great a degree as to occasion a complete desertion of the place long since by its inhabitants. 4.13 Next to the harbour of Eumenes, as far as Dira and the straits opposite the six islands, live the Ichthyophagi, Creophagi, and Colobi, who extend into the interior. Many hunting grounds for elephants, and obscure cities and islands, lie in front of the coast. The greater part are Namad, husbandmen are few in number. In the country occupied by some of these nations Styrax grows in large quantity. The Ichthyophagi, on the ebbing of the tide, collect fish, which they cast upon the rocks and dry in the sun. When they have well broiled them, the bones are piled in heaps, and the flesh trodden with the feet is made into cakes, which are again exposed to the sun and used as food. In bad weather, when fish cannot be procured, the bones of which they have made heaps are pounded, made into cakes and eaten, but they suck the fresh bones. Some also live upon shellfish, when they are fattened, which is done by throwing them into holes and standing pools of the sea, where they are supplied with small fish, and used as food when other fish are scarce. They have various kinds of places for preserving and feeding fish, from whence they derive their supply. Some of the inhabitants of that part of the coast which is without water go inland every five days, accompanied by all their families, with songs and rejoicings, to the watering places, where, throwing themselves on their faces, they drink as beasts until their stomachs are distended like a drum. They then return again to the seacoast. They dwell in caves or cabins, with roofs consisting of beams and rafters made of the bones and spines of whales, and covered with branches of the olive tree. 4.14 The Chelinophagi, or turtle eaters, live under the cover of shells, of turtles, which are large enough to be used as boats. Some make of the seaweed, which is thrown up in large quantities, lofty and hill-like heaps, which are hollowed out, and underneath which they live. They cast out the dead, which are carried away by the tide, as food for fish. There are three islands which follow in succession, the island of tortoises, the island of seals, and the island of hawks. Along the whole coast there are plantations of palm trees, olive trees, and laurels, not only within, but in a great part also without the straits. There is also an island, called the island, of Philip, opposite to it inland is situated the hunting ground for elephants, called the Chase of Pythangelus, then follows Arsino, a city with a harbour, after these places is Dira, and beyond them is a hunting ground for elephants. From Dira, the next country is that which bears aromatic plants. The first produces myrrh, and belongs to the Ichthyophagi and the Creophagi. It bears also the Persia, peach or Egyptian almond, and the Egyptian figure beyond is Lecha, a hunting ground for elephants. There are also in many places standing pools of rainwater. When these are dried up, the elephants, with their trunks and tusks, dig holes and find water. On this coast there are two very large lakes extending as far as the promontory Pythalos. One of them contains salt water, and is called a sea, the other, fresh water, and is the haunt of hippopotami and crocodiles. On the margin grows the papyrus. The ibis is seen in the neighborhood of this place. The people who live near the promontory of Pythalos, 
and beginning from this place, do not undergo any mutilation in any part of their body. Next is the country which produces frankincense, it has a promontory and a temple with a grove of poplars. In the inland parts is a tract along the banks of a river bearing the name of Isis, and another that of Nilus, both of which produce myrrh and frankincense. Also a lagoon filled with water from the mountains, next the watch post of the lion, and the port of Pythangelus. The next tract bears the false cassia. There are many tracts in succession on the sides of rivers on which frankincense grows, and rivers extending to the cinnamon country. The river which bounds this tract produces, fliss, rushes in great abundance. Then follows another river, and the port of Daphnis, and a valley called Apollos, which bears, besides frankincense, myrrh and cinnamon. The latter is more abundant in places far in the interior. Next is the mountain Elephos, a mountain projecting into the sea, and a creek, then follows the large harbour of Sigmus, a watering place called that of Sinocephaly, and the last promontory of this coast, Notusiris, or the Southern Horn. After doubling this cape towards the south, we have no more descriptions, he says, of harbours or places, because nothing is known of the seacoast beyond this point. 4.15 Along the coast there are both pillars and altars of Pythalos, Lycus, Pythangelus, Leon, and Corimertus, that is, along the known coast from Dira as far as Notusiris, but the distance is not determined. The country abounds with elephants and lions called mermses, ants. They have their genital organs reversed. Their skin is of a golden color, but they are more bare than the lions of Arabia. It produces also leopards of great strength and courage, and the rhinoceros. The rhinoceros is little inferior to the elephant, not, according to Artemidorus, in length to the crest, although he says he had seen one at Alexandria, but it is somewhat about, less, in height, judging at least from the one I saw. Nor is the color the pale yellow of boxwood, but like that of the elephant. It was of the size of a bull. Its shape approached very nearly to that of the wild boar, and particularly the forehead, except the front, which is furnished with a hooked horn, harder than any bone. It uses it as a weapon, like the wild boar its tusks. It has also two hard welts, like folds of serpents, encircling the body from the chine to the belly, one on the withers, the other on the loins. This description is taken from one which I myself saw. Artemidorus adds to his account of this animal, that it is peculiarly inclined to dispute with the elephant for the place of pasture, thrusting its forehead under the belly, of the elephant, and ripping it up, unless prevented by the trunk and tusks of his adversary. 4.16 Camel leopards are bred in these parts, but they do not in any respect resemble leopards, for their variegated skin is more like the streaked and spotted skin of fallow deer. The hinder quarters are so very much lower than the fore quarters, that it seems as if the animal sat upon its rump, which is the height of an ox, the fore legs are as long as those of the camel. The neck rises high and straight up, but the head greatly exceeds in height that of the camel. From this one of proportion, the speed of the animal is not so great, I think, as it is described by Artemidorus, according to whom it is not to be surpassed. It is not however a wild animal, but rather like a domesticated beast, for it shows no signs of a savage disposition. This country, continues Artemidorus, produces also sphinxes, cynocephaly, and chevy, which have the face of a lion, and the rest of the body like that of a panther, they are as large as deer. There are wild bulls also, which are carnivorous, and greatly exceed ours in size and swiftness. They are of a red color. The crocodus is, according to this author, the mixed progeny of a wolf and a dog. What Metrodorus the Skepsian relates, in his book on custom, is like fable, and is to be disregarded. Artemidorus mentions serpents also of thirty cubits in length, which can master elephants and bulls, in this he does not exaggerate. But the Indian and African serpents are of a more fabulous size, and are said to have grass growing on their backs. 4.17 The mode of life among the troglodyte is nomadic. Each tribe is governed by tyrants. Their wives and children are common, except those of the tyrants. The offense of corrupting the wife of a tyrant is punished with the fine of a sheep. The women carefully paint themselves with antimony. They wear about their necks shells, as a protection against fascination by witchcraft. In their quarrels, which are for pastures, they first push away each other with their hands, they then use stones, or, if wounds are inflicted, arrows and daggers. The women put an end to these disputes, by going into the midst of the combatants and using prayers and entreaties. Their food consists of flesh and bones pounded together, wrapped up in skins and then baked, or prepared after many other methods by the cooks, who are called a cathartic, or impure. In this way they eat not only the flesh, but the bones and skins also. They use, as an ointment for the body? A mixture of blood and milk, the drink of the people in general is an infusion of the paliurus, buckthorn, that of the tyrants is mead, 
The honey being expressed from some kind of flower. Their winter sets in when the Atesian winds begin to blow, for they have rain, and the remaining season is summer. They go naked, or wear skins only, and carry clubs. They deprive themselves of the prepuce, but some are circumcised like Egyptians. The Ethiopian Megabari have their clubs armed with iron knobs. They use spears and shields which are covered with raw hides. The other Ethiopians use bows and lances. Some of the troglodyte, when they bury their dead, bind the body from the neck to the legs with twigs of the buckthorn. They then immediately throw stones over the body, at the same time laughing and rejoicing, until they have covered the face. They then place over it a ram's horn, and go away. They travel by night, the male cattle have bells fastened to them, in order to drive away wild beasts with the sound. They use torches also and arrows in repelling them. They watch during the night, on account of their flocks, and sing some peculiar song around their fires. 4.18 Having given this account of the troglodyte and of the neighboring Ethiopians, Artemidorus returns to the Arabians. Beginning from Poseidium, he first describes those who border upon the Arabian Gulf, and are opposite to the troglodyte. He says that Poseidium is situated within the Bay of, Heroopolis, and that contiguous to Poseidium is a grove of palm trees, well supplied with water, which is highly valued, because all the district around is burnt up and is without water or shade. But there the fertility of the palm is prodigious. A man and a woman are appointed by hereditary right to the guardianship of the grove. They wear skins, and live on dates. They sleep in huts built on trees, the place being infested with multitudes of wild beasts. Next is the island of Faki, seals, which has its name from those animals, which abound there. Near it is a promontory, which extends towards Petra, of the Arabians called Nabatai, and to the country of Palestine, to this, island, the Minii, Jerii, and all the neighboring nations repair with loads of aromatics. Next is another tract of seacoast, formerly called the coast of the Moranity, some of whom were husbandmen, others Cenidae, but it presented as occupied by Gurindei, who destroyed the former possessors by treachery. They attacked those who were assembled to celebrate some quinquennial festival, and put them to death, they then attacked and exterminated the rest of the tribe. Next is the Elenitic Gulf and Nabatea, a country well peopled, and abounding in cattle. The islands which lie near, and opposite, are inhabited by people who formerly lived without molesting others, but latterly carried on a piratical warfare in rafts against vessels on their way from Egypt. But they suffered reprisals, when an armament was sent out against them, which devastated their country. Next is a plain, well wooded and well supplied with water, it abounds with cattle of all kinds, and, among other animals, mules, wild camels, harts, and hinds, lions also, leopards, and wolves are frequently to be found. In front lies an island called Dia. Then follows a bay of about 500 stadia in extent, closed in by mountains, the entrance into which is of difficult access. About it live people who are hunters of wild animals. Next are three desert islands, abounding with olive trees, not like those in our own country, but an indigenous kind, which we call Ethiopic olives, the tears, or gum, of which have a medicinal virtue. Then follows a stony beach, which is succeeded by a rugged coast, not easily navigated by vessels, extending about 1,000 stadia. It has few harbors and anchorages, for a rugged and lofty mountain stretches parallel to it, then the parts at its base, extending into the sea, form rocks underwater, which, during the blowing of the Atesian winds and the storms of that period, present dangers, when no assistance can be afforded to vessels. Next is a bay in which are some scattered islands, and continuous with the bay, are three very lofty mounds of black sand. After these is Charmouth as a harbour, about 100 stadia in circumference, with a narrow entrance very dangerous for all kinds of vessels. A river empties itself into it. In the middle is a well-wooded island, adapted for cultivation. Then follows a rugged coast, and after that are some bays and a country belonging to Namad, who live by their camels. They fight from their backs, they travel upon them, and subsist on their milk and flesh. A river flows through their country, which brings down gold dust, but they are ignorant how to make any use of it. They are called Debi, some of them are Namad, others husbandmen. I do not mention the greater part of the names of these nations, on account of the obscurity of the people, and because the pronunciation of them is strange, and uncouth. Near these people is a nation more civilized, who inhabit a district with a more temperate climate, for it is well watered, and has frequent showers. Fossil gold is found there, not in the form of dust, but in lumps, which do not require much purification. The least pieces are of the size of a nut, the middle size of a meddler, the largest of a walnut. These are pierced and arranged alternately with transparent stones strung on threads and formed into collars. They are worn round the neck and wrists. 
they sell the gold to their neighbors at a cheap rate, exchanging it for three times the quantity of brass, and double the quantity of iron, through ignorance of the mode of working the gold, and the scarcity of the commodities received in exchange, which are more necessary for the purposes of life. 4.19 The country of the Sabae, a very populous nation, is contiguous, and is the most fertile of all, producing myrrh, frankincense, and cinnamon. On the coast is found balsamum and another kind of herb of a very fragrant smell, but which is soon dissipated. There are also sweet-smelling palms in the calamus. There are snakes also of a dark red color, a span in length, which spring up as high as a man's waist, and whose bite is incurable. On account of the abundance which the soil produces, the people are lazy and indolent in their mode of life. The lower class of people live on roots, and sleep on the trees. The people who live near each other receive, in continued succession, the loads, of perfumes, and deliver them to others, who convey them as far as Syria and Mesopotamia. When the carriers become drowsy by the odor of the aromatics, the drowsiness is removed by the fumes of asphaltus and of goat's beard. Mariaba, the capital of the Sabians, is situated upon a mountain, well wooded. A king resides there, who determines absolutely all disputes and other matters, but he is forbidden to leave his palace, or if he does so, the rabble immediately assail him with stones, according to the direction of an oracle. He himself, and those about his person, pass their lives in effeminate voluptuousness. The people cultivate the ground, or follow the trade of dealing in aromatics, both the indigenous sort and those brought from Ethiopia, in order to procure them, they sail through the straits in vessels covered with skins. There is such an abundance of these aromatics, that cinnamon, cassia, and other spices are used by them instead of sticks and firewood. In the country of the Sabians is found the larimnum, a most fragrant perfume. By the trade, in these aromatics, both the Sabians and the Jerii have become the richest of all the tribes, and possess a great quantity of wrought articles in gold and silver, as couches, tripods, basins, drinking vessels, to which we must add the costly magnificence of their houses, for the doors, walls, and roofs are variegated with inlaid ivory, gold, silver, and precious stones. This is the account of Artemidorus. The rest of the description is partly similar to that of Eratosthenes, and partly derived from other historians. 4.20 Some of these say, that the sea is red from the color arising from reflection either from the sun, which is vertical, or from the mountains, which are red by being scorched with intense heat, for the color, it is supposed, may be produced by both these causes. Tegius of Nida speaks of a spring which discharges into the sea a red and ochreous water. Agatharchides, his fellow citizen, relates, on the authority of a person of the name of Boxus, of Persian descent, that when a troop of horses was driven by a lioness in heat as far as the sea, and had passed over to an island, a Persian of the name of Erythrus constructed a raft, and was the first person who crossed the sea to it, perceiving the island to be well adapted for inhabitants, he drove the herd back to Persia, and sent out colonists both to this and the other islands and to the coast. He, thus, gave his own name to the sea. But according to others, it was Erythrus the son of Perseus who was the king of this country. According to some writers, from the straits in the Arabian Gulf to the extremity of the cinnamon country is a distance of 5,000 stadia, without distinguishing whether, the direction is, to the south or to the east. It is said also that the emerald and the beryl are found in the gold mines. According to Poseidonius, an odiferous salt is found in Arabia. 4.21 The Nabataeans and Sabaeans, situated above Syria, are the first people who occupy Arabia Felix. They were frequently in the habit of overrunning this country before the Romans became masters of it, but at present both they and the Syrians are subject to the Romans. The capital of the Nabataeans is called Petra. It is situated on a spot which is surrounded and fortified by a smooth and level rock, Petra, which externally is abrupt and precipitous, but within there are abundant springs of water both for domestic purposes and for watering gardens. Beyond the enclosure the country is for the most part a desert, particularly towards Judea. Through this is the shortest road to Jericho, a journey of three or four days, and five days to the Phoenician, or palm plantation. It is always governed by a king of the royal race. The king has a minister who is one of the companions, and is called brother. It has excellent laws for the administration of public affairs. Athenodorus, a philosopher, and my friend, who had been at Petra, used to relate with surprise, that he found many Romans and also many other strangers residing there. He observed the strangers frequently engaged in litigation, both with one another and with the natives, but the natives had never any dispute amongst themselves, and lived together in perfect harmony. 4.22 The late expedition of the Romans against the Arabians, under the command of Aelius Gallus, has made us acquainted with many peculiarities of the country. 
Augustus Caesar dispatched this general to explore the nature of these places and their inhabitants, as well as those of Ethiopia, for he observed that Troglodytica, which is contiguous to Egypt, bordered upon Ethiopia, and that the Arabian Gulf was extremely narrow, where it separates the Arabians from the Troglodyte. It was his intention either to conciliate or subdue the Arabians. He was also influenced by the report, which had prevailed from all time, that this people were very wealthy, and exchanged their aromatics and precious stones for silver and gold, but never expended with foreigners any part of what they received in exchange. He hoped to acquire either opulent friends, or to overcome opulent enemies. He was moreover encouraged to undertake this enterprise by the expectation of assistance from the Nabataeans, who promised to cooperate with him in everything. 4.23 Upon these inducements Gallus set out on the expedition. But he was deceived by Sileus, the, king's, minister of the Nabataeans, who had promised to be his guide on the march, and to assist him in the execution of his design. Sileus was however treacherous throughout, for he neither guided them by a safe course by sea along the coast, nor by a safe road for the army, as he promised, but exposed both the fleet and the army to danger, by directing them where there was no road, or the road was impracticable, where they were obliged to make long circuits, or to pass through tracts of country destitute of everything. He led the fleet along a rocky coast without harbours, or to places abounding with rocks concealed under water, or with shallows. In places of this description particularly, the flowing and ebbing of the tide did them the most harm. The first mistake consisted in building long vessels, of war, at a time when there was no war, nor any likely to occur by sea. For the Arabians, being mostly engaged in traffic and commerce, are not a very warlike people even on land, much less so at sea. Gallus, notwithstanding, built not less than eighty biremes and triremes and galleys, Faisley, at Cleopatras, near the old canal which leads from the Nile. When he discovered his mistake, he constructed a hundred and thirty vessels of burden, in which he embarked with about ten thousand infantry, collected from Egypt, consisting of Romans and allies, among whom were five hundred Jews and a thousand Nabataeans, under the command of Sileus. After enduring great hardships and distress, he arrived on the fifteenth day at Luce Come, a large mart in the territory of the Nabataeans, with the loss of many of his vessels, some with all their crews, in consequence of the difficulty of the navigation, but by no opposition from an enemy. These misfortunes were occasioned by the perfidy of Sileus, who insisted that there was no road for an army by land to loose come, to which and from which place the camel traders travel with ease and in safety from Petra, and back to Petra, with so large a body of men and camels as to differ in no respect from an army. 4.24 Another cause of the failure of the expedition was the fact of King Abodas not paying much attention to public affairs, and especially to those relative to war, as is the custom with all Arabian kings, but placed everything in the power of Sileus the minister. His whole conduct in command of the army was perfidious, and his object was, as I suppose, to examine as a spy the state of the country, and to destroy, in concert with the Romans, certain cities and tribes, and when the Romans should be consumed by famine, fatigue, and disease, and by all the evils which he had treacherously contrived, to declare himself master of the whole country. Gallus however arrived at Luce Cum, with the army labouring under stomachaches and salotherb, diseases of the country, the former affecting the mouth, the other the legs, with a kind of paralysis, caused by the water and the plants, which the soldiers had used in their food. He was therefore compelled to pass the summer and the winter there, for the recovery of the sick. Merchandise is conveyed from Luce Cum to Petra, thence to Rhinoclura in Phoenicia, near Egypt, and thence to other nations. But at present the greater part is transported by the Nile to Alexandria. It is brought down from Arabia and India to Myas Hormus, it is then conveyed on camels to Coptus of the Thebais, situated on a canal of the Nile, and to Alexandria. Gallus, setting out again from Luce come on his return with his army, and through the treachery of his guide, traversed such tracts of country, that the army was obliged to carry water with them upon camels. After a march of many days, therefore, he came to the territory of Aretas, who was related to Abodas. Aretas received him in a friendly manner, and offered presents. But by the treachery of Sileus, Gallus was conducted by a difficult road through the country, for he occupied thirty days in passing through it. It afforded barley, a few palm trees, and butter instead of oil. The next country to which he came belonged to Namad, and was in great part a complete desert. It was called Ararin. The king of the country was Sabos. Gallus spent fifty days in passing through this territory, for want of roads, and came to a city of the Nigrani, and to a fertile country peacefully disposed. The king had fled, and the city was taken at the first onset. After a march of six days from thence, he came to the river. Here the barbarians attacked the Romans, and lost about ten thousand men, the Romans lost only two men. 
for the barbarians were entirely inexperienced in war, and used their weapons unskillfully, which were bows, spears, swords, and slings, but the greater part of them wielded a double-edged axe. Immediately afterwards he took the city called Aska, which had been abandoned by the king. He thence came to a city Athrula, and took it without resistance, having placed a garrison there, and collected provisions for the march, consisting of corn and dates, he proceeded to a city Marsiaba, belonging to the nation of the Ramanidae, who were subjects of Ilazarus. He assaulted and besieged it for six days, but raised the siege in consequence of a scarcity of water. He was two days' march from the aromatic region, as he was informed by his prisoners. He occupied in his marches a period of six months, in consequence of the treachery of his guides. This he discovered when he was returning, and although he was late in discovering the design against him, he had time to take another road back, for he arrived in nine days at Nigrana, where the battle was fought, and thence in eleven days he came to the seven wells, as the place is called from the fact of their existing there. Thence he marched through a desert country, and came to Chala a village, and then to another called Malothas, situated on a river. His road then lay through a desert country, which had only a few watering places, as far as Igra a village. It belongs to the territory of Abodas, and is situated upon the sea. He accomplished on his return the whole distance in sixty days, in which, on his first journey, he had consumed six months. From there he conducted his army in eleven days to Myas Hormus, thence across the country to Coptus, and arrived at Alexandria with so much of his army as could be saved. The remainder he lost, not by the enemy, but by disease, fatigue, famine, and marches through bad roads, for seven men only perished in battle. For these reasons this expedition contributed little in extending our knowledge of the country. It was however of some small service. Sileus, the author of these disasters, was punished for his treachery at Rome. He affected friendship, but he was convicted of other offences, besides perfidy in this instance, and was beheaded. 4.25 The aromatic country, as I have before said, is divided into four parts. Of aromatics, the frankincense and myrrh are said to be the produce of trees, but cassia the growth of bushes, yet some writers say, that the greater part, of the cassia, is brought from India, and that the best frankincense is that from Persia. According to another partition of the country, the whole of Arabia Felix is divided into five kingdoms, or portions, one of which comprises the fighting men, who fight for all the rest, another contains the husbandmen, by whom the rest are supplied with food, another includes those who work at mechanical trades. One division comprises the myrrh region, another the frankincense region, although the same tracts produce cassia, cinnamon, and nard. Trades are not changed from one family to another, but each workman continues to exercise that of his father. The greater part of their wine is made from the palm. A man's brothers are held in more respect than his children. The descendants of the royal family succeed as kings, and are invested with other governments, according to primogeniture. Property is common among all the relations. The eldest is the chief. There is one wife among them all. He who enters the house before any of the rest, has intercourse with her, having placed his staff at the door, for it is a necessary custom, which every one is compelled to observe, to carry a staff. The woman however passes the night with the eldest. Hence the male children are all brothers. They have sexual intercourse also with their mothers. Adultery is punished with death, but an adulterer must belong to another family. A daughter of one of the kings was of extraordinary beauty, and had fifteen brothers, who were all in love with her, and were her unceasing and successive visitors. She, being at last weary of their importunity, is said to have employed the following device. She procured staves to be made similar to those of her brothers. When one left the house, she placed before the door a staff similar to the first, and a little time afterwards another, and so on in succession, but making her calculation so that the person who intended to visit her might not have one similar to that at her door. On an occasion when the brothers were all of them together at the marketplace, one left it, and came to the door of the house, seeing the staff there, and conjecturing some one to be in her apartment, and having left all the other brothers at the marketplace, he suspected the person to be an adulterer, running therefore in haste to his father, he brought him with him to the house, but it was proved that he had falsely accused his sister. 4.26 The Nabataeans are prudent, and fond of accumulating property. The community fine a person who has diminished his substance, and confer honours on him who has increased it. They have few slaves, and are served for the most part by their relations, or by one another, or each person is his own servant, and this custom extends even to their kings. They eat their meals in companies consisting of thirteen persons. Each party is attended by two musicians. But the king gives many entertainments in great buildings. No one drinks more than eleven, appointed, cupfuls, from separate cups, each of gold. The king courts popular favour so much, 
that he is not only his own servant, but sometimes he himself ministers to others. He frequently renders an account, of his administration, before the people, and sometimes an inquiry is made into his mode of life. The houses are sumptuous, and of stone. The cities are without walls, on account of the peace, which prevails among them. A great part of the country is fertile, and produces everything except oil of olives. Instead of it, the oil of sesame is used. The sheep have white fleeces, their oxen are large, but the country produces no horses. Camels are the substitute for horses, and perform the, same kind of, labor. They wear no tunics, but have a girdle about the loins, and walk abroad in sandals. The dress of the kings is the same, but the color is purple. Some merchandise is altogether imported into the country, others are not altogether imports, especially as some articles are native products, as gold and silver, and many of the aromatics, but brass and iron, purple garments, styrax, saffron, and costus, or white cinnamon, pieces of sculpture, paintings, statues, are not to be procured in the country. They look upon the bodies of the dead as no better than dung, according to the words of Heraclitus, dead bodies more fit to be cast out than dung, wherefore they bury even their kings beside dung heaps. They worship the sun, and construct the altar on the top of a house, pouring out libations and burning frankincense upon it every day. 4.27 When the poet says, I went to the country of the Ethiopians, Sidonians, and Arambi, it is doubtful, what people he means by Sidonians, whether those who lived near the Persian Gulf, a colony from which nation are the Sidonians in our quarter, in the same manner as historians relate, that some Tyrian islanders are found there, and Aradii, from whom the Aradii in our country derive their origin, or whether the poet means actually the Sidonians themselves. But there is more doubt about the Arambi, whether we are to suppose that he means the Troglodyte, according to the opinion of those who, by a forced etymology, derive the word Arambi from Rho Alpha Nu Mu Beta Alpha Nu Epsilon Iota Nu, that is, entering into the earth, or whether he means the Arabians. Zeno the philosopher of our sect alters the reading in this manner, and Sidoni, and Arabes, but Poseidonius alters it with a small variation, and Sidonii, and Arambi, as if the poet gave the name Arambi to the present Arabians, from their being so called by others in his time. He says also, that the situation of these three nations close to one another indicates a descent from some common stock, and that on this account they are called by names having a resemblance to one another, as Armenii, Aramii, Arambi. For as we may suppose one nation to have been divided into three, according to the differences of latitude, in which they lived, which successively became more marked, in proceeding from one to the other, so in like manner we may suppose that several names were adopted in place of one. The proposed change of reading to Aramni is not probable, for that name is more applicable to the Ethiopians. The poet mentions also the Arimi, whom Poseidonius says are meant here, and not a place in Syria or Cilicia, or any other country, but Syria itself. For the Aramei live there. Perhaps these are the people whom the Greeks called Aramae or Arimi. But the alterations of names, especially of barbarous nations, are frequent, thus Darius was called Darisus, Perisatus, Pharsiris, Athara, Atargata, whom Tejas again calls Dursato. Alexander might be adduced to bear witness to the wealth of the Arabians, for he intended, it is said, after his return from India, to make Arabia the seat of empire. All his enterprises terminated with his death, which happened suddenly, but certainly one of his projects was to try whether the Arabians would receive him voluntarily, or resist him by force of arms, for having found that they did not send ambassadors to him, either before or after his expedition to India, he was beginning to make preparations for war, as we have said in a former part of this work. Book 17. 1.1. When we were describing Arabia, we included in the description the gulfs which compress and make it a peninsula, namely the gulfs of Arabia and of Persis. We described at the same time some parts of Egypt, and those of Ethiopia, inhabited by the Troglodyte, and by the people situated next to them, extending to the confines of the cinnamon country. We are now to describe the remaining parts contiguous to these nations, and situated about the Nile. We shall then give an account of Africa, which remains to complete this treatise on geography. And here we must previously adduce the opinions of Eratosthenes. 1.2 He says, that the Nile is distant from the Arabian Gulf towards the west 1000 stadia, and that it resembles, in its course, the letter N reversed. For after flowing, he says, about 2700 stadia from Meroe towards the north, it turns again to the south, and to the winter sunset, continuing its course for about 3700 stadia, when it is almost in the latitude of the places about Meroe. Then entering far into Africa, and having made another bend, it flows towards the north, a distance of 5300 stadia, to the great cataract, and inclining a little to the east, 
traverses a distance of 1,200 stadia to the smaller cataract at Syene, and 5,300 stadia more to the sea. Two rivers empty themselves into it, which issue out of some lakes towards the east, and encircle Meroe, a considerable island. One of these rivers is called Astaborus, flowing along the eastern side of the island. The other is the Astapus, or, as some call it, Astasibas. But the Astapus is said to be another river, which issues out of some lakes on the south, and that this river forms nearly the body of the, stream of the, Nile, which flows in a straight line, and that it is filled by the summer rains, that above the confluence of the Astaborus and the Nile, at the distance of 700 stadia, is Meroe, a city having the same name as the island, and that there is another island above Meroe, occupied by the fugitive Egyptians, who revolted in the time of Samaticus, and are called Sembriti, or foreigners. Their sovereign is a queen, but they obey the king of Meroe. The lower parts of the country on each side Meroe, along the Nile towards the Red Sea, are occupied by Megabari and Blemis, who are subject to the Ethiopians, and border upon the Egyptians, about the sea are Troglodyte. The Troglodyte, in the latitude of Meroe, are distant 10 or 12 days' journey from the Nile. On the left of the course of the Nile live Nubi and Libya, a populous nation. They begin from Meroe, and extend as far as the bends, of the river. They are not subject to the Ethiopians, but live independently, being distributed into several sovereignties. The extent of Egypt along the sea, from the Pelusiac to the Canobic mouth, is 1,300 stadia. Such is the account of Eratosthenes. 1.3 We must, however, enter into a further detail of particulars. And first, we must speak of the parts about Egypt, proceeding from those that are better known to those which follow next in order. The Nile produces some common effects in this and the contiguous tract of country, namely, that of the Ethiopians above it, in watering them at the time of its rise, and leaving those parts only habitable which have been covered by the inundation, it intersects the higher lands, and all the tract elevated above its current on both sides, which however are uninhabited and a desert, from an absolute one of water. But the Nile does not traverse the whole of Ethiopia, nor alone, nor in a straight line, nor a country which is well inhabited but Egypt it traverses both alone and entirely, and in a straight line, from the lesser cataract above Syene and Elephantine, which are the boundaries of Egypt and Ethiopia, to the mouths by which it discharges itself into the sea. The Ethiopians at present lead for the most part a wandering life, and are destitute of the means of subsistence, on account of the barrenness of the soil, the disadvantages of climate, and their great distance from us. Now the contrary is the case with the Egyptians in all these respects. For they have lived from the first under a regular form of government, they were a people of civilized manners, and were settled in a well-known country, their institutions have been recorded and mentioned in terms of praise, for they seem to have availed themselves of the fertility of their country in the best possible manner by the partition of it, and by the classification of persons, which they adopted, and by their general care. When they had appointed a king, they divided the people into three classes, into soldiers, husbandmen, and priests. The latter had the care of everything relating to sacred things, of the gods, the others of what related to man, some had the management of warlike affairs, others attended to the concerns of peace, the cultivation of the ground, and the practice of the arts, from which the king derived his revenue. The priests devoted themselves to the study of philosophy and astronomy, and were companions of the kings. The country was at first divided into nomes. The Thebais contained ten, the delta ten, and the intermediate tract sixteen. But according to some writers, all the nomes together amounted to the number of chambers in the labyrinth. Now these were less than thirty, six. The nomes were again divided into other sections. The greater number of the nomes were distributed into toparchies, and these again into other sections, the smallest portions were the araure. An exact and minute division of the country was required by the frequent confusion of boundaries occasioned at the time of the rise of the Nile, which takes away, adds, and alters the various shapes of the bounds, and obliterates other marks by which the property of one person is distinguished from that of another. It was consequently necessary to measure the land repeatedly. Hence it is said geometry originated here, as the art of keeping accounts and arithmetic originated with the Phoenicians, in consequence of their commerce. As the whole population of the country, so the separate population in each gnome, was divided into three classes, the territory also was divided into three equal portions. The attention and care bestowed upon the Nile is so great as to cause industry to triumph over nature. The ground by nature, and still more by being supplied with water, produces a great abundance of fruits. By nature also a greater rise of the river irrigates a larger tract of land, but industry has completely succeeded in rectifying the deficiency of nature, so that in seasons when the rise of the river has been less than usual, 
as large a portion of the country is irrigated by means of canals and embankments, as in seasons when the rise of the river has been greater. Before the times of Petronius there was the greatest plenty, and the rise of the river was the greatest when it rose to the height of fourteen cubits, but when it rose to eight only, a famine ensued. During the government of Petronius, however, when the Nile rose twelve cubits only, there was a most abundant crop, and once when it mounted to eight only, no famine followed. Such then is the nature of this provision for the physical state of the country. We shall now proceed to the next particulars. 1.4 The Nile, when it leaves the boundaries of Ethiopia, flows in a straight line towards the north, to the tract called the delta, then cloven at the head, according to the expression of Plato, makes this point the vertex, as it were, of a triangle, the sides of which are formed by the streams, which separate on each side, and extend to the sea, one on the right hand to Pelusium, the other on the left to Canobus and the neighboring Heracleum, as it is called, the base is the coast lying between Pelusium and the Heracleum. An island was therefore formed by the sea and by both streams of the river, which is called delta from the resemblance of its shape to the letter, delta, of that name. The spot at the vertex of the triangle has the same appellation, because it is the beginning of the above-mentioned triangular figure. The village, also, situated upon it is called delta. These then are two mouths of the Nile, one of which is called the Pelusiac, the other the Canobic and Heracleotic mouth. Between these are five other outlets, some of which are considerable, but the greater part are of inferior importance. For many others branch off from the principal streams, and are distributed over the whole of the island of the delta, and form many streams and islands, so that the whole delta is accessible to boats, one canal succeeding another, and navigated with so much ease, that some persons make use of rafts floated on earthen pots, to transport them from place to place. The whole island is about 3,000 stadia in circumference, and is called, as also the lower country, with the land on the opposite sides of the streams, the delta. But at the time of the rising of the Nile, the whole country is covered, and resembles a sea, except the inhabited spots, which are situated upon natural hills or mounds, and considerable cities and villages appear like islands in the distant prospect. The water, after having continued on the ground more than forty days in summer, then subsides by degrees, in the same manner as it rose. In sixty days the plain is entirely exposed to view, and dries up. The sooner the land is dry, so much the sooner the ploughing and sowing are accomplished, and it dries earlier in those parts where the heat is greater. The country above the delta is irrigated in the same manner, except that the river flows in a straight line to the distance of about 4,000 stadia in one channel, unless where some island intervenes, the most considerable of which comprises the Heracleotic gnome, or, where it is diverted by a canal into a large lake, or a tract of country which it is capable of irrigating, as the Lake Moiris and the Asinoite gnome, or where the canals discharge themselves into the Mariotis. In short, Egypt, from the mountains of Ethiopia to the vertex of the delta, is merely a river tract on each side of the Nile, and rarely if anywhere comprehends in one continued line a habitable territory of 300 stadia in breadth. It resembles, except the frequent diversions of its course, a bandage rolled out. The mountains on each side, of the Nile, which descend from the parts about Syene to the Egyptian sea, give this shape to the river tract of which I am speaking, and to the country. For in proportion as these mountains extend along that tract, or recede from each other, in the same degree as the river contracted or expanded, and they impart to the habitable country its variety of shape. But the country beyond the mountains is in a great measure uninhabited. 1.5 The ancients understood more by conjecture than otherwise, but persons in later times learnt by experience as eyewitnesses, that the Nile owes its rise to summer rains, which fall in great abundance in upper Ethiopia, particularly in the most distant mountains. On the rains ceasing, the fullness of the river gradually subsides. This was particularly observed by those who navigated the Arabian Gulf on their way to the cinnamon country, and by those who were sent out to hunt elephants, or for such other purposes as induced the Ptolemies, kings of Egypt, to dispatch persons in that direction. These sovereigns had directed their attention to objects of this kind, particularly Ptolemy surnamed Philadelphus, who was a lover of science, and on account of bodily infirmities always in search of some new diversion and amusement. But the ancient kings paid little attention to such inquiries, although both they and the priests, with whom they passed the greater part of their lives, professed to be devoted to the study of philosophy. Their ignorance therefore is more surprising, both on this account and because Sesistris had traversed the whole of Ethiopia as far as the cinnamon country, of which expedition monuments exist even to the present day, such as pillars and inscriptions. Cambyses also, when he was in possession of Egypt, had advanced with the Egyptians as far even as Meroe, and it is said that he gave this name both to the island and to the city, because his sister, or according to some writers his wife, Meroe died there. For this reason therefore he conferred the appellation on the island, and in honour of a woman. 
It is surprising how, with such opportunities of obtaining information, the history of these reigns should not have been clearly known to persons living in those times, especially as the priests registered with the greatest diligence in the sacred books all extraordinary facts, and preserved records of everything which seemed to contribute to an increase of knowledge. And, if this had been the case, would it be necessary to inquire what is even still a question, what can possibly be the reason why rain falls in summer, and not in winter, in the most southerly parts of the country, but not in the Thebais, nor in the country about Syene. Nor should we have to examine whether the rise of the water of the Nile is occasioned by rains, nor require such evidence for these facts as Poseidonius adduces. For he says, that Callisthenes asserts that the cause of the rise of the river is the rain of summer. This he borrows from Aristotle, who borrowed it from Thrasilsus the Thasian, one of the ancient writers on physics, Thrasilsus from some other person, and he from Homer, who calls the Nile heaven descended, back to Egypt's heaven descended stream. But I quit this subject, since it has been discussed by many writers, among whom it will be sufficient to specify two, who have, each, composed in our times a treatise on the Nile, Eudorus and Aristo the peripatetic philosopher. They differ little from each other, except in the order and disposition of the works, for the phraseology and execution is the same in both writers. I can speak with some confidence in this matter, for when at a loss, for manuscripts, for the purpose of comparison and copy, I collated both authors. But which of them surreptitiously substituted the other's account as his own, we may go to the temple of Ammon to be informed. Eudorus accused Aristo, but the style is more like that of Aristo. The ancients gave the name of Egypt to that country only which was inhabited and watered by the Nile, and the extent they assigned to it was from the neighborhood of Syene to the sea. But later writers, to the present time, have included on the eastern side almost all the tract between the Arabian Gulf and the Nile, the Ethiopians however do not make much use of the Red Sea, on the western side, the tract extending to the Oasis and the parts of the sea coast from the Canobic mouth of the Nile to Catabathmus, and the kingdom of Cyrenea. For the kings who succeeded the race of the Ptolemies had acquired so much power, that they became masters of Cyrenea, and even joined Cyprus to Egypt. The Romans, who succeeded to their dominions, separated Egypt, and confined it within the old limits. The Egyptians give the name of Oasis, Oases, to certain inhabited tracts, which are surrounded by extensive deserts, and appear like islands in the sea. They are frequently met with in Libya, and there are three contiguous to Egypt, and dependent upon it. This is the account which we have to give of Egypt in general and summarily. I shall now describe the separate parts of the country and their advantages. 1.6 As Alexandria and its neighborhood occupy the greatest and principal portion of the description, I shall begin with it. In sailing towards the west, the seacoast from Pelusium to the Canobic mouth of the Nile is about 1,300 stadia in extent, and constitutes, as we have said, the base of the delta. Thence to the island Pharos are 150 stadia more. Pharos is a small oblong island, and lies quite close to the continent, forming towards it a harbour with a double entrance. For the coast abounds with bays, and has two promontories projecting into the sea. The island is situated between these, and shuts in the bay, lying lengthways in front of it. Of the extremities of the Pharos, the eastern is nearest to the continent and to the promontory in that direction, called Lachias, which is the cause of the entrance to the port being narrow. Besides the narrowness of the passage, there are rocks, some under water, others rising above it, which at all times increase the violence of the waves rolling in upon them from the open sea. This extremity itself of the island is a rock, washed by the sea on all sides, with a tower upon it of the same name as the island, admirably constructed of white marble, with several stories. Sostratus of Nidus, a friend of the king's, erected it for the safety of mariners, as the inscription imports. For as the coast on each side is low and without harbours, with reefs and shallows, an elevated and conspicuous mark was required to enable navigators coming in from the open sea to direct their course exactly to the entrance of the harbour. The western mouth does not afford an easy entrance, but it does not require the same degree of caution as the other. It forms also another port, which has the name of Eunostus, or Happy Return, it lies in front of the artificial and close harbour. That which has its entrance at the above-mentioned tower of Pharos is the Great Harbour. These, too, lie contiguous in the recess called Heptastadium, and are separated from it by a mound. This mound forms a bridge from the continent to the island, and extends along its western side, leaving two passages only through it to the harbour of Eunostus, which are bridged over. But this work served not only as a bridge, but as an aqueduct also, when the island was inhabited. Divus Caesar devastated the island, in his war against the people of Alexandria, when they espoused the party of the kings. A few sailors live near the tower. The great harbour, in addition to its being well enclosed by the mound and by nature, 
is of sufficient depth near the shore to allow the largest vessel to anchor near the stairs. It is also divided into several ports. The former kings of Egypt, satisfied with what they possessed, and not desirous of foreign commerce, entertained a dislike to all mariners, especially the Greeks, who, on account of the poverty of their own country, ravaged and coveted the property of other nations, and stationed a guard here, who had orders to keep off all persons who approached. To the guard was assigned as a place of residence the spot called Rakotis, which is now a part of the city of Alexandria, situated above the arsenal. At that time, however, it was a village. The country about the village was given up to herdsmen, who were also able, from their numbers, to prevent strangers from entering the country. When Alexander arrived, and perceived the advantages of the situation, he determined to build the city on the, natural, harbour. The prosperity of the place, which ensued, was intimated, it is said, by a presage which occurred while the plan of the city was tracing. The architects were engaged in marking out the line of the wall with chalk, and had consumed it all, when the king arrived, upon which the dispensers of flour supplied the workmen with a part of the flour, which was provided for their own use, and this substance was used in tracing the greater part of the divisions of the streets. This, they said, was a good omen for the city. 1.7 The advantages of the city are of various kinds. The site is washed by two seas, on the north, by what is called the Egyptian Sea, and on the south, by the Sea of the Lake Maria, which is also called Mariotis. This lake is filled by many canals from the Nile, both by those above and those at the sides, through which a greater quantity of merchandise is imported than by those communicating with the sea. Hence the harbour on the lake is richer than the maritime harbour. The exports by sea from Alexandria exceed the imports. This any person may ascertain, either at Alexandria or Dicaearchia, by watching the arrival and departure of the merchant vessels, and observing how much heavier or lighter their cargoes are when they depart or when they return. In addition to the wealth derived from merchandise landed at the harbours on each side, on the sea and on the lake, its fine air is worthy of remark, this results from the city being on two sides surrounded by water, and from the favourable effects of the rise of the Nile. For other cities, situated near lakes, have, during the heats of summer, a heavy and suffocating atmosphere, and lakes at their margins become swampy by the evaporation occasioned by the sun's heat. When a large quantity of moisture is exhaled from swamps, a noxious vapour rises, and is the cause of pestilential disorders. But at Alexandria, at the beginning of summer, the Nile, being full, fills the lake also, and leaves no marshy matter which is likely to occasion malignant exhalations. At the same period, the Atesian winds blow from the north, over a large expanse of sea, and the Alexandrines in consequence pass their summer very pleasantly. 1.8 The shape of the site of the city is that of a clamus or military cloak. The sides, which determine the length, are surrounded by water, and are about 30 stadia in extent, but the isthmuses, which determine the breadth of the sides, are each of 7 or 8 stadia, bounded on one side by the sea, and on the other by the lake. The whole city is intersected by roads for the passage of horsemen and chariots. Two of these are very broad, exceeding a plethrum in breadth, and cut one another at right angles. It contains also very beautiful public grounds and royal palaces, which occupy a fourth or even a third part of its whole extent. For as each of the kings was desirous of adding some embellishment to the places dedicated to the public use, so, besides the buildings already existing, each of them erected a building at his own expense, hence the expression of the poet may be here applied, one after the other springs. All the buildings are connected with one another and with the harbour, and those also which are beyond it. The museum is a part of the palaces. It has a public walk and a place furnished with seats, and a large hall, in which the men of learning, who belong to the museum, take their common meal. This community possesses also property in common, and a priest, formerly appointed by the kings, but at present by Caesar, presides over the museum. A part belonging to the palaces consists of that called Sema, an enclosure, which contained the tombs of the kings and that of Alexander, the Great. For Ptolemy the son of Logus took away the body of Alexander from Perdiccas, as he was conveying it down from Babylon, for Perdiccas had turned out of his road towards Egypt, incited by ambition and a desire of making himself master of the country. When Ptolemy had attacked, and made him prisoner, he intended to, spare his life and, confine him in a desert island, but he met with a miserable end at the hand of his own soldiers, who rushed upon and dispatched him by transfixing him with the long Macedonian spears. The kings who were with him, Aridaeus, and the children of Alexander, and Roxana his wife, departed to Macedonia. Ptolemy carried away the body of Alexander, and deposited it at Alexandria in the place where it now lies, not indeed in the same coffin, for the present one is of Hylas, alabaster? Whereas Ptolemy had deposited it in one of gold, it was plundered by Ptolemy surnamed Cox's son and Perisectus, 
who came from Syria and was quickly deposed, so that his plunder was of no service to him. 1.9 In the great harbour at the entrance, on the right hand, are the island and the Pharos Tower, on the left are the reef of rocks and the promontory Lachias, with a palace upon it, at the entrance, on the left hand, are the inner palaces, which are continuous with those on the Lachias, and contain numerous painted apartments and groves. Below lies the artificial and close harbour, appropriated to the use of the kings, and Anarotus a small island, facing the artificial harbour, with a palace on it, and a small port. It was called Anarotus, a rival as it were of Rhodes. Above this is the theatre, then the Poseidium, a kind of elbow projecting from the emporium, as it is called, with a temple of Neptune upon it. To this Antony added a mound, projecting still further into the middle of the harbour, and built at the extremity a royal mansion, which he called Timonium. This was his last act, when, deserted by his partisans, he retired to Alexandria after his defeat at Actium, and intended, being forsaken by so many friends, to lead the, solitary, life of Timon for the rest of his days. Next are the Caesarium, the Emporium, and the Apostasis, or magazines, these are followed by docks, extending to the Heptastadium. This is the description of the Great Harbour. 1.10 Next after the Heptastadium is the harbour of Eunostus, and above this the artificial harbour, called Sibitus, or the Ark, which also has docks. At the bottom of this harbour is a navigable canal, extending to the Lake Mariotis. Beyond the canal there still remains a small part of the city. Then follows the suburb Necropolis, in which are numerous gardens, burial places, and buildings for carrying on the process of embalming the dead. On this side the canal is the Serapium and other ancient sacred places, which are now abandoned on account of the erection of the temples at Nicopolis, for, there are situated, an amphitheatre and a stadium, and there are celebrated quinquennial games, but the ancient rites and customs are neglected. In short, the city of Alexandria abounds with public and sacred buildings. The most beautiful of the former is the gymnasium, with porticos exceeding a stadium in extent. In the middle of it are the court of justice and groves. Here also is a panium, an artificial mound of the shape of a fir cone, resembling a pile of rock, to the top of which there is an ascent by a spiral path. From the summit may be seen the whole city lying all around and beneath it. The wide street extends in length along the gymnasium from the necropolis to the Canobic Gate. Next is the Hippodromos, or Racecourse, as it is called, and other buildings near it, and reaching to the Canobic Canal. After passing through the Hippodromos is the Nicopolis, which contains buildings fronting the sea not less numerous than a city. It is thirty stadia distant from Alexandria. Augustus Caesar distinguished this place, because it was here that he defeated Antony and his party of adherents. He took the city at the first onset, and compelled Antony to put himself to death, but Cleopatra to surrender herself alive. A short time afterwards, however, she also put an end to her life secretly, in prison, by the bite of an asp, or, for there are two accounts, by the application of a poisonous ointment. Thus the empire of the Lagidae, which had subsisted many years, was dissolved. 1.11 Alexander was succeeded by Ptolemy the son of Logus, the son of Logus by Philadelphus, Philadelphus by Eurgetes, next succeeded Philopator the lover of Agathoclea, then Epiphanes, afterwards Philometer, the son, thus far, always succeeding the father. But Philometer was succeeded by his brother, the second Eurgetes, who was also called Phascon. He was succeeded by Ptolemy surnamed Lathyrus, Lathyrus by Alites of our time, who was the father of Cleopatra. All these kings, after the third Ptolemy, were corrupted by luxury and effeminacy, and the affairs of government were very badly administered by them, but worst of all by the fourth, the seventh, and the last, all eats, or the piper, who, besides other deeds of shamelessness, acted the piper, indeed he gloried so much in the practice, that he scrupled not to appoint trials of skill in his palace, on which occasions he presented himself as a competitor with other rivals. He was deposed by the Alexandrines, and of his three daughters, one, the eldest, who was legitimate, they proclaimed queen, but his two sons, who were infants, were absolutely excluded from the succession. As a husband for the daughter established on the throne, the Alexandrines invited one Sibiasax from Syria, who pretended to be descended from the Syrian kings. The queen after a few days, unable to endure his coarseness and vulgarity, rid herself of him by causing him to be strangled. She afterwards married Archelaus, who also pretended to be the son of Mithridates Eupater, but he was really the son of that Archelaus who carried on war against Sulla, and was afterwards honorably treated by the Romans. He was grandfather of the last king of Cappadocia in our time, and priest of Camana in Pontus. He was then, at the time we are speaking of, the guest of Gabinius, and intended to accompany him in an expedition against the Parthians, but unknown to Gabinius, he was conducted away by some, friends, to the queen, 
and declared king. At this time Pompey the Great entertained all eats as his guest on his arrival at Rome, and recommended him to the Senate, negotiated his return, and contrived the execution of most of the deputies, in number a hundred, who had undertaken to appear against him. At their head was Dion the academic philosopher. Ptolemy, all eats, on being restored by Gabinius, put to death both Archelaus and his daughter, but not long after he was reinstated in his kingdom, he died a natural death, leaving two sons and two daughters, the eldest of whom was Cleopatra. The Alexandrines declared as sovereigns the eldest son and Cleopatra. But the adherents of the son excited a sedition, and banished Cleopatra, who retired with her sister into Syria. It was about this time that Pompey the Great, in his flight from Pelepharsalus, came to Pelusium and Mount Cassium. He was treacherously slain by the king's party. When Caesar arrived, he put the young prince to death, and sending for Cleopatra from her place of exile, appointed her queen of Egypt, declaring also her surviving brother, who was very young, and herself joint sovereigns. After the death of Caesar and the battle at Pharsalia, Antony passed over into Asia, he raised Cleopatra to the highest dignity, made her his wife, and had children by her. He was present with her at the Battle of Actium, and accompanied her in her flight. Augustus Caesar pursued them, put an end to their power, and rescued Egypt from misgovernment and revelry. 1.12 At present Egypt is a, Roman, province, pays considerable tribute, and is well governed by prudent persons, who are sent there in succession. The governor thus sent out has the rank of king. Subordinate to him is the administrator of justice, who is the supreme judge in many causes. There is another officer, who is called ideologus, whose business it is to inquire into property for which there is no claimant, and which of right falls to Caesar. These are accompanied by Caesar's freedmen and stewards, who are entrusted with affairs of more or less importance. Three legions are stationed in Egypt, one in the city, the rest in the country. Besides these there are also nine Roman cohorts, three quartered in the city, three on the borders of Ethiopia and Syene, as a guard to that tract, and three in other parts of the country. There are also three bodies of cavalry distributed in convenient posts. Of the native magistrates in the cities, the first is the expounder of the law, who is dressed in scarlet, he receives the customary honors of the country, and has the care of providing what is necessary for the city. The second is the writer of records, the third is the chief judge. The fourth is the commander of the night guard. These magistrates existed in the time of the kings, but in consequence of the bad administration of affairs by the latter, the prosperity of the city was ruined by licentiousness. Polybius expresses his indignation at the state of things when Lie was there, he describes the inhabitants of the city to be composed of three classes, the, first, Egyptians and natives, acute but indifferent citizens, and meddling with civil affairs. Tal second, the mercenaries, a numerous and undisciplined body, for it was an ancient custom to maintain foreign soldiers, who, from the worthlessness of their sovereigns, knew better how to govern than to obey. The third were the Alexandrines, who, for the same reason, were not orderly citizens, but still they were better than the mercenaries, for although they were a mixed race, yet being of Greek origin, they retained the customs common to the Greeks. But this class was extinct nearly about the time of Eurogetes Fuscon, in whose reign Polybius came to Alexandria. For Fuscon, being distressed by factions, frequently exposed the multitude to the attacks of the soldiery, and thus destroyed them. By such a state of things in the city the words of the poet, says Polybius, were verified, the way to Egypt is long and vexatious. 1.13 Such then, if not worse, was the condition of the city under the last kings. The Romans, as far as they were able, corrected, as I have said, many abuses, and established an orderly government, by appointing vice-governors, nomarchs, and ethnarchs, whose business it was to superintend affairs of minor importance. The greatest advantage which the city possesses arises from its being the only place in all Egypt well situated by nature for communication with the sea by its excellent harbour, and with the land by the river, by means of which everything is easily transported and collected together into the city, which is the greatest mart in the habitable world. These may be said to be the superior excellencies of the city. Cicero, in one of his orations, in speaking of the revenues of Egypt, states that an annual tribute of 12,000 talents was paid to all eats, the father of Cleopatra. If then a king, who administered his government in the worst possible manner, and with the greatest negligence, obtained so large a revenue, what must we suppose it to be at present, when affairs are administered with great care, and when the commerce with India and with Troglodytica has been so greatly increased? For formerly not even twenty vessels ventured to navigate the Arabian Gulf, or advance to the smallest distance beyond the straits at its mouth, but now large fleets are dispatched as far as India and the extremities of Ethiopia, from which places the most valuable freights are brought to Egypt, and are thence exported to other parts, so that a double amount of custom is collected, 
arising from imports on the one hand, and from exports on the other. The most expensive description of goods is charged with the heaviest impost, for in fact Alexandria has a monopoly of trade, and is almost the only receptacle for this kind of merchandise and place of supply for foreigners. The natural convenience of the situation is still more apparent to persons traveling through the country, and particularly along the coast which commences at the Catabathmus, for to this place Egypt extends. Next to it is Cyrenia, and the neighboring barbarians, the Marmoridae. 1.14 from the Catabathmus to Peritonium is a run of 900 stadia for a vessel in a direct course. There is a city and a large harbor of about 40 stadia in extent, by some called the city Peritonium, by others, Ammonia. Between these is the village of the Egyptians, and the promontory Nisisphera, and the Tindarian rocks, four small islands, with a harbor, then Drepanum a promontory, and Enisipia an island with a harbor, and Apis a village, from which to Peritonium are 100 stadia. From thence, to the temple of Ammon is a journey of five days. From Peritonium to Alexandria are about 1,300 stadia. Between these are, first, a promontory of white earth, called Leuki Acta, then Phoenicus a harbor, and Nigeus a village, after these the island Sidonia, Padonia, with a harbor, then a little further off from the sea, and a fray. The whole of this country produces no wine of a good quality, and the earthen jars contain more seawater than wine, which is called Libyan. This and beer are the principal beverage of the common people of Alexandria. Antifray in particular was a subject of ridicule, on account of its bad wine. Next is the harbor Darius, which has its name from an adjacent black rock, resembling Delta Iota Sigma, a hide. The neighboring place is called Zephyrium. Then follows another harbor, Lucaspis, the White Shield, and many others, then the Sinish Sema, or Dog's Monument, then Tapasiris, not that situated upon the sea, here is held a great public festival. There is another Tapasiris, situated at a considerable distance beyond the city, Alexandria. Near this, and close to the sea, is a rocky spot, which is the resort of great numbers of people at all seasons of the year, for the purpose of feasting and amusement. Next is Plinthine, and the village of Nishim, and Cherenesis a fortress, distant from Alexandria and the necropolis about seventy stadia. The Lake Maria, which extends as far as this place, is more than 150 stadia in breadth, and in length less than 300 stadia. It contains eight islands. The whole country about it is well inhabited. Good wine also is produced here, and in such quantity that the Mariotic wine is racked in order that it may be kept to be old. 1.15 The Biblis and the Egyptian bean grow in the marshes and lakes, from the latter the Siborium is made. The stalks of the bean are nearly of equal height, and grow to the length of 10 feet. The Biblis is a bare stem, with a tuft on the top. But the bean puts out leaves and flowers in many parts, and bears a fruit similar to our bean, differing only in size and taste. The bean grounds present an agreeable sight, and afford amusement to those who are disposed to recreate themselves with convivial feasts. These entertainments take place in boats with cabins, they enter the thickest part of the plantation, where they are overshadowed with the leaves, which are very large, and serve for drinking cups and dishes, having a hollow which fits them for the purpose. They are found in great abundance in the shops in Alexandria, where they are used as vessels. One of the sources of land revenue is the sale of these leaves. Such then is the nature of this bean. The Biblis does not grow here in great abundance, for it is not cultivated. But it abounds in the lower parts of the delta. There is one sort inferior to the other. The best is the hieratica. Some persons intending to augment the revenue, employed in this case a method which the Jews practiced with the palm, especially the karyotic, and with the balsamum. In many places it is not allowed to be cultivated, and the price is enhanced by its rarity, the revenue is indeed thus increased, but the general consumption, of the article, is injured. 1.16 On passing through the Kenobic gate of the city, on the right hand is the canal leading to Kenobus, close to the lake. They sail by this canal to Skidia, to the great river, and to Kenobus, but the first place at which they arrive is Eleusis. This is a settlement near Alexandria and Nicopolis, and situated on the Kenobic Canal. It has houses of entertainment which command beautiful views, and hither resort men and women who are inclined to indulge in noisy revelry, a prelude to Kenobic life, and the dissolute manners of the people of Kenobus. At a little distance from Eleusis, on the right hand, is the canal leading toward Skidia. Skidia is distant four Shoni from Alexandria. It is a suburb of the city, and has a station for the vessels with cabins, which convey the governors when they visit the upper parts of the country. Here is collected the duty on merchandise, as it is transported up or down the river. For this purpose a bridge of boats is laid across the river, and from this kind of bridge the place has the name of Skidia. Next after the canal leading to Skidia, 
the navigation thence to Kanobus is parallel to the sea coast, extending from Pharos to the Kanobic mouth. For between the sea and the canal, is a narrow band of ground, on which is situated the smaller Zephyrium, which lies next after Nicopolis, and Zephyrium a promontory, on which is a small temple dedicated to Venus Arsinoe. Anciently, it is said, a city called Thana stood there, which bears the name of the king, who entertained as his guests Menelaus and Helen. The poet thus speaks of the drugs which were given to Helen, the potent drugs, which Polydamna, the wife of Thon, gave to Helen. 1.17 Kenobus is a city, distant by land from Alexandria 120 stadia. It has its name from Kenobus, the pilot of Menelaus, who died there. It contains the temple of Serapis, held in great veneration, and celebrated for the cure of diseases, persons even of the highest rank confide in them, and sleep there themselves on their own account, or others for them. Some persons record the cures, and others the veracity of the oracles which are delivered there. But remarkable above everything else is the multitude of persons who resort to the public festivals, and come from Alexandria by the canal. For day and night there are crowds of men and women in boats, singing and dancing, without restraint, and with the utmost licentiousness. Others, at Kenobus itself, keep hostelries situated on the banks of the canal, which are well adapted for such kind of diversion and revelry. 1.18 Next to Kenobus is Heracleum, in which is a temple of Hercules, then follows the Kenobic mouth, and the commencement of the delta. On the right of the Kenobic canal is the Menelaic gnome, so called from the brother of the first Ptolemy, but certainly not from the hero, Menelaus, as some writers assert, among whom is Artemidorus. Next to the Kenobic mouth is the Bolbitine, then the Sabenitic, and the Fatnitic, which is the third in magnitude compared with the first two, which form the boundaries of the delta. For it branches off into the interior, not far from the vertex of the delta. The Mendesian is very near the Fatnitic mouth, next is the Tinitic, and lastly the Pelusiac mouth. There are others, which are of little consequence, between these, since they are as it were false mouths. The mouths have entrances which are not capable of admitting large vessels, but lighters only, on account of the shallows and marshes. The Canobic mart is principally used as a mart for merchandise, the harbours at Alexandria being closed, as I have said before. After the Bolbitine mouth there runs out to a great distance a low and sandy promontory. It is called Agnew Cirrus, or Willow Point. Then follows the watchtower of Perseus, and the fortress of the Milesians. For in the time of Somaticus, and when Syaxares was king of the Medes, some Milesians with thirty vessels steered into the Bolbitine mouth, disembarked there, and built the above-mentioned fortress. Some time afterwards they sailed up to the Satic Nome. And having conquered Inarus in an engagement at sea, founded the city Nocritus, not far above Scythia. Next after the fortress of the Milesians, in proceeding towards the Sabenitic mouth, are lakes, one of which is called Butus, from the city Butus, then the city Sabenitus and Say, the capital of the lower country, here Minerva is worshipped. In the temple there of this goddess, is the tomb of Somaticus. Near Butus is Hermopolis, situated in an island, and at Butus is an oracle of Latona. 1.19 In the interior above the Sabenitic and Fatnitic mouths is Zois, both an island and a city in the Sabenitic gnome. There are also Hermopolis, Lycopolis, and Mendes, where Pan is worshipped, and of animals a goat. Here, according to Pindar, goats have intercourse with women. Near Mendes are Diospolis, and the lakes about it, and Leontopolis, then further on, the city Busiris, in the Bizrite gnome, and Sinishpolis. Eratosthenes says, that to repel strangers is a practice common to all barbarians, but that this charge against the Egyptians is derived from fabulous stories related of, 1, Busiris and his people in the Bizrite gnome, as some persons in later times were disposed to charge the inhabitants of this place with inhospitality, although in truth there was neither king nor tyrant of the name of Busiris, that besides there was a common saying, the way to Egypt is long and vexatious, which originated in the one of harbours, and in the state of the harbour at Pharos, which was not a free access, but watched and guarded by herdsmen, who were robbers, and attacked those who attempted to sail into it. The Carthaginians drown, he says, any strangers who sail past, on their voyage to Sardinia or to the Pillars. Hence much of what is related of the parts towards the west is discredited. The Persians also were treacherous guides, and conducted the ambassadors along circuitous and difficult ways. 1.20 Contiguous to the Bizrite Nome are the Athribite Nome and the city Athribis, next the Prosopite Nome, in which latter is Aphroditopolis, the city of Venus. Above the Mendesian and the Tinitic mouths are a large lake, and the Mendesian and Leontopolite Nomes, and a city of Aphrodite, or Venus, and the Farbatite Nome. Then follows the Tinitic, which some call the Satic Mouth, and the Tanite Nome, and in it Tanis a large city. 
1.21 between the Tanitic and the Pelusiac mouths are lakes and large and continuous marshes, among which are numerous villages. Pelusium itself has many marshes lying around it, which some call Barathra, or water holes, and swamps. It is situated at a distance of more than 20 stadia from the sea. The circumference of the wall is 20 stadia. It has its name from the mud, Pi Eta Lambda Omicron, of the swamps. On this quarter Egypt is difficult of access, I. E. From the eastern side towards Phoenicia and Judea, and on the side of Arabia and Abatia, which is contiguous, through which countries the road to Egypt lies. The country between the Nile and the Arabian Gulf is Arabia, and at its extremity is situated Pelusium. But the whole is desert, and not passable by an army. The isthmus between Pelusium and the recess of the Arabian Gulf near Heroopolis is 1,000 stadia, but, according to Poseidonius, less than 1,500 stadia in extent. Besides its being sandy and without water, it abounds with reptiles, which burrow in the sand. 1.22 In sailing up the river from Scythia to Memphis, on the right hand, are a great many villages extending as far as the Lake Maria, among which is that called the village of Shabrias. Upon the river is Hermopolis, then Gynecopolis, and the Gynecopolite Nome, next to Memphis and the Momemphite Nome. Between these places are many canals, which empty themselves into the Lake Mariotis. The Momemphiti worship Venus, and a sacred cow is kept there, as Apis is maintained at Memphis, and Mneus at Heliopolis. These animals are regarded as gods, but there are other places, and these are numerous, both in the delta and beyond it, in which a bull or a cow is maintained, which are not regarded as gods, but only as sacred. 1.23 Above Momemphis are two nitre mines, which furnish nitre in large quantities, and the nitriote gnome. Here Sarapis is worshipped, and they are the only people in Egypt who sacrifice a sheep. In this gnome and near this place is a city called Menelaus. On the left hand in the delta, upon the river, is Nocritus. At the distance of two Shoni from the river is Say, and a little above at the asylum of Osiris, in which it is said Osiris is buried. This, however, is questioned by many persons, and particularly by the inhabitants of Philae, which is situated above Syene and Elephantine. These people tell this tale, that Isis placed coffins of Osiris in various places, but that one only contained the body of Osiris, so that no one knew which of them it was, and that she did this with the intention of concealing it from Typhon, who might come and cast the body out of its place of deposit. 1.24 This is the description of the country from Alexandria to the vertex of the delta. Artemidorus says, that the navigation up the river is 28 shoni, which amount to 840 stadia, reckoning the shonis at 30 stadia. When we ourselves sailed up the river, shoni of different measures were used at different places in giving the distances, so that sometimes the received shonis was a measure of 40 stadia and even more. That the measure of the shonis was unsettled among the Egyptians, Artemidorus himself shows in a subsequent place. In reckoning the distance from Memphis to Thebes, he says that each shonis consists of 120 stadia, and from the Thebes to Syene of 60 stadia. In sailing up from Pelusium to the same vertex of the delta, is a distance, he says, of 25 shoni, or 750 stadia, and he employs the same measure. On setting out from Pelusium, the first canal met with is that which fills the lakes, near the marshes, as they are called. There are two of these lakes, situated upon the left hand of the great stream above Pelusium in Arabia. He mentions other lakes also, and canals in the same parts beyond the delta. The Sethroit Nome extends along one of the two lakes. He reckons this is one of the ten nomes in the delta. There are two other canals, which discharge themselves into the same lakes. 1.25 There is another canal also, which empties itself into the Red Sea, or Arabian Gulf, near the city Arsino, which some call Cleopatras. It flows through the bitter lakes, as they are called, which were bitter formerly, but when the above-mentioned canal was cut, the bitter quality was altered by their junction with the river, and at present they contain excellent fish, and abound with aquatic birds. The canal was first cut by Sesistris before the Trojan times, but according to other writers, by the son of Somaticus, who only began the work, and afterwards died. Lastly, Darius I succeeded to the completion of the undertaking, but he desisted from continuing the work, when it was nearly finished, influenced by an erroneous opinion that the level of the Red Sea was higher than Egypt, and that if the whole of the intervening isthmus were cut through, the country would be overflowed by the sea. The Ptolemaic kings however did cut through it, and place locks upon the canal, so that they sailed, when they pleased, without obstruction into the outer sea, and back again, into the canal. We have spoken of the surfaces of bodies of water in the first part of this work. 
1.26 near Arsino are situated in the recess of the Arabian Gulf towards Egypt, Hieroopolis and Cleopatras, harbors, suburbs, many canals, and lakes are also near. There also is the Fagroriopolite Nome, and the city Fagroriopolis. The canal, which empties itself into the Red Sea, begins at the village Fakusa, to which the village of Philon is contiguous. The canal is 100 cubits broad, and its depth sufficient to float a vessel of large burden. These places are near the apex of the delta. 1.27 There also are the city Bubastis and the Bubastit Nome, and above at the Heliopolite Nome. There too is Heliopolis, situated upon a large mound. It contains a temple of the sun, and the Oxmnius, which is kept in a sanctuary, and is regarded by the inhabitants as a god, as Apis is regarded by the people of Memphis. In front of the mound are lakes, into which the neighboring canal discharges itself. At present the city is entirely deserted. It has an ancient temple constructed after the Egyptian manner, bearing many proofs of the madness and sacrilegious acts of Cambyses, who did very great injury to the temples, partly by fire, partly by violence, mutilating, in some, cases, and applying fire, in others. In this manner he injured the obelisks, two of which, that were not entirely spoilt, were transported to Rome. There are others both here and at Thebes, the present Diospolis, some of which are standing, much corroded by fire, and others lying on the ground. 1.28 The plan of the temples is as follows. At the entrance into the Temenus is a paved floor, in breadth about a plethrum, or even less, its length is three or four times as great, and in some instances even more. This part is called Dromos, and is mentioned by Callimachus, this is the Dromos, sacred to Anubis. Throughout the whole length on each side are placed stone sphinxes, at the distance of twenty cubits or a little more from each other, so that there is one row of sphinxes on the right hand, and another on the left. Next after the sphinxes is a large propylon, then on proceeding further, another propylon, and then another. Neither the number of the propylon nor of the sphinxes is determined by any rule. They are different in different temples, as well as the length and breadth of the drami. Next to the propyla is the naos, which has a large and considerable pronaos, the sanctuary in proportion, there is no statue, at least not in human shape, but a representation of some of the brute animals. On each side of the pronaos project what are called the wings. These are two walls of equal height with the naos. At first the distance between them is a little more than the breadth of the foundation of the naos. As you proceed onwards, the, base, lines incline towards one another till they approach within 50 or 60 cubits. These walls have large sculptured figures, very much like the Tyrrhenian, Etruscan, and very ancient works among the Greeks. There is also a building with a great number of pillars, as at Memphis, in the barbaric style, for, except the magnitude and number and rows of pillars, there is nothing pleasing nor easily described, but rather a display of labor wasted. 1.29 At Heliopolis we saw large buildings in which the priests lived. For it is said that anciently this was the principal residence of the priests, who studied philosophy and astronomy. But there are no longer either such a body of persons or such pursuits. No one was pointed out to us on the spot, as presiding over these studies, but only persons who performed sacred rites, and who explained to strangers, the peculiarities of, the temples. A person of the name of Cheriman accompanied the governor, Ilius Gallus, in his journey from Alexandria into Egypt, and pretended to some knowledge of this kind but he was generally ridiculed for his boasting and ignorance. The houses of the priests, and the residences of Plato and of Eutyxus, were shown to us. Eutyxus came here with Plato, and, according to some writers, lived thirteen years in the society of the priests. For the latter were distinguished for their knowledge of the heavenly bodies, but were mysterious and uncommunicative, yet after a time were prevailed upon by courtesy to acquaint them with some of the principles of their science, but the barbarians concealed the greater part of them. They had, however, communicated the knowledge of the additional portions of the day and night, in the space of 365 days, necessary to complete the annual period, and, at that time, the length of the year was unknown to the Greeks, as were many other things, until later astronomers received them from the persons who translated the records of the priests into the Greek language, and even now derive knowledge from their writings and from those of the Chaldeans. 1.30 After Heliopolis is the Nile above the delta. The country on the right hand, as you go up the Nile, is called Libya, as well as that near Alexandria and the Lake Mariotis. The country on the left hand is called Arabia. The territory belonging to Heliopolis is in Arabia, but the city Sertsasura is in Libya, and situated opposite to the observatory of Eutyxus. For there is shown an observing station in front of Heliopolis, as there is in front of Nidus, where Eutyxus marks certain motions of the heavenly bodies. This is the Letopolite gnome. In sailing up the river we meet with Babylon, a strong fortress, 
built by some Babylonians who had taken refuge there, and had obtained permission from the kings to establish a settlement in that place. At present it is an encampment for one of the three legions which garrison Egypt. There is a mountainous ridge, which extends from the encampment as far as the Nile. At this ridge are wheels and screws, by which water is raised from the river, and 150 prisoners are, thus, employed. The pyramids on the other side, of the river, at Memphis may be clearly discerned from this place, for they are not far off. 1.31 Memphis itself also, the residence of the kings of Egypt, is near, being only three shoni distant from the delta. It contains temples, among which is that of Apis, who is the same as Osiris. Here the ox Apis is kept in a sort of sanctuary, and is held, as I have said, to be a god. The forehead and some other small parts of its body are white, the other parts are black. By these marks the fitness of the successor is always determined, when the animal to which they pay these honors dies. In front of the sanctuary is a court, in which there is another sanctuary for the dam of Apis. Into this court the Apis is let loose at times, particularly for the purpose of exhibiting him to strangers. He is seen through a door in the sanctuary, and he is permitted to be seen also out of it. After he has frisked about a little in the court, he is taken back to his own stall. The temple of Apis is near the Hephaestium, or temple of Vulcan. The Hephaestium itself is very sumptuously constructed, both as regards the size of the Naos and in other respects. In front of the Dromos is a colossal figure consisting of a single stone. It is usual to celebrate bullfights in this Dromos. The bulls are bred expressly for this purpose, like horses. They are let loose, and fight with one another, the conqueror receiving a prize. At Memphis also there is a temple of Venus, who is accounted a Grecian deity. But some say that it is a temple dedicated to Selene, or the moon. 1.32 There is also a temple of Sarapis, situated in a very sandy spot, where the sand is accumulated in masses by the wind. Some of the sphinxes which we saw were buried in this sand up to the head, and one half only of others was visible. Hence we may conceive the danger, should any one, in his way to the temple, be surprised by a, sand, storm. The city is large and populous, it ranks next to Alexandria, and, like that place, is inhabited by mixed races of people. There are lakes in front of the city and of the palaces, which at present are in ruins and deserted. They are situated upon an eminence, and extend as far as the lower part of the city. Close to this place are a grove and a lake. 1.33 At the distance of forty stadia from Memphis is a brow of a hill, on which are many pyramids, the tombs of the kings. Three of them are considerable. Two of these are reckoned among the seven wonders, of the world. They are a stadium in height, and of a quadrangular shape. Their height somewhat exceeds the length of each of the sides. One pyramid is a little larger than the other. At a moderate height in one of the sides is a stone, which may be taken out, when that is removed, there is an oblique passage, leading, to the tomb. They are near each other, and upon the same level. Farther on, at a greater height of the mountain, is the third pyramid, which is much less than the two others, but constructed at much greater expense, for from the foundation nearly as far as the middle, it is built of black stone. Mortars are made of this stone, which is brought from a great distance, for it comes from the mountains of Ethiopia, and being hard and difficult to be worked, the labor is attended with great expense. It is said to be the tomb of a courtesan, built by her lovers, and whose name, according to Sappho the poetess, was Doriche. She was the mistress of her brother Caraxus, who traded to the port of Naucratus with wine of Lesbos. Others call her Rhodopis. A story is told of her, that, when she was bathing, an eagle snatched one of her sandals from the hands of her female attendant and carried it to Memphis, the eagle soaring over the head of the king, who was administering justice at the time, let the sandal fall into his lap. The king, struck with the shape of the sandal, and the singularity of the accident, sent over the country to discover the woman to whom it belonged. She was found in the city of Naucratus, and brought to the king, who made her his wife. At her death she was honoured with the above-mentioned tomb. 1.341 Extraordinary thing which I saw at the pyramids must not be omitted. Heaps of stones from the quarries lie in front of the pyramids. Among these are found pieces which in shape and size resemble lentils. Some contain substances like grains half-peeled. These, it is said, are the remnants of the workmen's food converted into stone, which is not probable. For at home in our country, Amasia, there is a long hill and a plain, which abounds with pebbles of a porous stone, resembling lentils. The pebbles of the seashore and of rivers suggest somewhat of the same difficulty, respecting their origin, some explanation may indeed be found in the motion, to which these are subject, in flowing waters, but the investigation of the above fact presents more difficulty. I have said elsewhere, that in sight of the pyramids, on the other side in Arabia, 
and near the stone quarries from which they are built, is a very rocky mountain, called the Trojan Mountain. Beneath it there are caves, and near the caves and the river a village called Troy, an ancient settlement of the captive Trojans who had accompanied Menelaus and settled there. 1.35 Next to Memphis is the city Acanthus, situated also in Libya, and the temple of Osiris, and the grove of the Thebaic Akanda, from which gum is procured. Next is the Aphroditopolite Nome, and the city in Arabia of the same name, where is kept a white cow, considered sacred. Then follows the Heracleot Nome, in a large island, near which is the canal on the right hand, which leads into Libya, in the direction of the Asinoite Nome, so that the canal has two entrances, a part of the island on one side being interposed between them. This Nome is the most considerable of all in appearance, natural properties, and embellishment. It is the only known planted with large, full-grown olive trees, which bear fine fruit. If the produce were carefully collected, good oil might be obtained, but this care is neglected, and although a large quantity of oil is obtained, yet it has a disagreeable smell. The rest of Egypt is without the olive tree, except the gardens near Alexandria, which are planted with olive trees, but do not furnish any oil, it produces wine in abundance, corn, pulse, and a great variety of other grains. It is also the remarkable Lake Moeris, which in extent is a sea, and the color of its waters resembles that of the sea. Its borders also are like the seashore, so that we may make the same suppositions respecting these as about the country near Ammon. For they are not very far distant from one another and from Peritonium, and we may conjecture from a multitude of proofs, that as the temple of Ammon was once situated upon the sea, so this tract of country also bordered on the sea at some former period. But Lower Egypt and the country as far as the Lake Syrbanus were sea, and confluent perhaps with the Red Sea at Heroopolis, and the Elenitic recess of the Gulf. 1.36 We have treated these subjects at length in the first book of the geography. At present we shall make a few remarks on the operations of nature and of providence conjointly. On the operations of nature, that all things converge to a point, namely, the center of the whole, and assume a spherical shape around it. The earth is the densest body, and nearer the center than all others, the less dense and next to it is water, but both land and water are spheres, the first solid, the second hollow, containing the earth within it. On the operations of providence, that it has exercised a will, is disposed to variety, and is the artificer of innumerable works. In the first rank, as greatly surpassing all the rest, is the generation of animals, of which the most excellent are gods and men, for whose sake the rest were formed. To the gods providence assigned heaven, and the earth to men, the extreme parts of the world, for the extreme parts of the sphere are the center and the circumference. But since water encompasses the earth, and man is not an aquatic, but a land animal, living in the air, and requiring much light, providence formed many eminences and cavities in the earth, so that these cavities should receive the whole or a great part of the water which covers the land beneath it, and that the eminences should rise and conceal the water beneath them, except so much as was necessary for the use of the human race, the animals and plants about it. But as all things are in constant motion, and undergo great changes, for it is not possible that things of such a nature, so numerous and vast, could be otherwise regulated in the world, we must not suppose the earth or the water always to continue in this state, so as to retain perpetually the same bulk, without increase or diminution, or that each preserves the same fixed place, particularly as the reciprocal change of one into the other is most consonant to nature from their proximity, but that much of the land is changed into water, and a great portion of water becomes land, just as we observe great differences in the earth itself. For one kind of earth crumbles easily, another is solid and rocky, and contains iron, and so of others. There is also a variety in the quality of water, for some waters are saline, others sweet and potable, others medicinal, and either salutary or noxious, others cold or hot is it therefore surprising that some parts of the earth which are now inhabited should formerly have been occupied by sea, and that what are now sea should formerly have been inhabited land? So also fountains once existing have failed, and others have burst forth, and similarly in the case of rivers and lakes, again, mountains and plains have been converted reciprocally one into the other. On this subject I have spoken before at length, and now let this be said. 1.37 The Lake Moeris, by its magnitude and depth, is able to sustain the superabundance of water which flows into it at the time of the rise of the river, without overflowing the inhabited and cultivated parts of the country. On the decrease of the water of the river, it distributes the excess by the same canal at each of the mouths, and both the lake and the canal preserve a remainder, which is used for irrigation. These are the natural and independent properties of the lake, but in addition, on both mouths of the canal are placed locks, by which the engineers store up and distribute the water which enters or issues from the canal. We have here also the labyrinth, a work equal to the pyramids, and adjoining to it the tomb of the king who constructed the labyrinth. 
After proceeding beyond the first entrance of the canal about 30 or 40 stadia, there is a table-shaped plain, with a village and a large palace composed of as many palaces as there were formerly nomes. There are an equal number of Ali, surrounded by pillars, and contiguous to one another, all in one line and forming one building, like a long wall having the Ali in front of it. The entrances into the Ali are opposite to the wall. In front of the entrances there are long and numerous covered ways, with winding passages communicating with each other, so that no stranger could find his way into the Ali or out of them without a guide. The, most, surprising circumstance is that the roofs of these dwellings consist of a single stone each, and that the covered ways through their whole range were roofed in the same manner with single slabs of stone of extraordinary size, without the intermixture of timber or of any other material. On ascending the roof, which is not of great height for it consists only of a single story, there may be seen a stone field, thus composed of stones. Descending again and looking into the alley, these may be seen in a line supported by 27 pillars, each consisting of a single stone. The walls also are constructed of stones not inferior in size to these. At the end of this building, which occupies more than a stadium, is the tomb, which is a quadrangular pyramid, each side of which is about four plethora in length, and of equal height. The name of the person buried there is Imans. They built, it is said, this number of Ali, because it was the custom for all the nomes to assemble there together according to their rank, with their own priests and priestesses, for the purpose of performing sacrifices and making offerings to the gods, and of administering justice in matters of great importance. Each of the nomes was conducted to the Allah appointed for it. 1.38 Sailing along to the distance of 100 stadia, we come to the city Arsino, formerly called Crocodilopolis, for the inhabitants of this gnome worship the crocodile. The animal is accounted sacred, and kept apart by himself in a lake, it is tame, and gentle to the priests, and is called suchus. It is fed with bread, flesh, and wine, which strangers who come to see it always present. Our host, a distinguished person, who was our guide in examining what was curious, accompanied us to the lake, and brought from the supper table a small cake, dressed meat, and a small vessel containing a mixture of honey and milk. We found the animal lying on the edge of the lake. The priests went up to it, some of them opened its mouth, another put the cake into it, then the meat, and afterwards poured down the honey and milk. The animal then leapt into the lake, and crossed to the other side. When another stranger arrived with his offering, the priests took it, and running round the lake, caught the crocodile, and gave him what was brought, in the same manner as before. 1.39 Next after the Asinoite and Heracleotic Nomes, is the city of Hercules, in which the Ichneumon is worshipped, in opposition to the Arsinoites, who worship crocodiles, hence the canal and the lake Moeris is full of these animals, for they venerate them, and are careful to do them no harm, but the Heracleotic worship the Ichneumon, which is most destructive both to crocodiles and asps. The Ichneumons destroy not only the eggs of the latter, but the animals themselves. The Ichneumons are protected by a covering of mud, in which they roll, and then dry themselves in the sun. They then seize the asps by the head or tail, and dragging them into the river, so kill them. They lie in wait for the crocodiles, when the latter are basking in the sun with their mouths open, they then drop into their jaws, and eating through their intestines and belly, issue out of the dead body. 1.40 Next follows the Sinopolite gnome and Sinopolis, where they worship the dog Anubis, and pay certain honors to dogs, a subsistence is there provided for them, as sacred animals. On the other side of the river is the city Oxyrhynchus, and a gnome of the same name. They worship the Oxyrhynchus, and have a temple dedicated to this animal, but all the other Egyptians worship the Oxyrhynchus. For all the Egyptians worship in common certain animals, three among the land animals, the ox, the dog, and the cat, two among the winged tribe, the hawk and the ibis, and two of the aquatic animals, the fish Lepidatus and the Oxyrhynchus. There are also other animals which each people, independently of others, worship, as the Sidi and Thebati, a sheep, the Latipolity, the Latus, a fish inhabiting the Nile, the people of Lycopolis, a wolf, those of Hermopolis, the Sinocephalus, those of Babylon, near Memphis, a Cephas, which has the countenance of a satyr, and in other respects is between a dog and a bear, it is bred in Ethiopia. The inhabitants of Thebes worship an eagle, the Leonopolity, a lion, the Mendesians, a male and female goat, the Athribidae, a shrew mouse, different people worshipping different animals. They do not, however, assign the same reasons for this difference of worship. 1.41 then follows the Hermopolite castle, a place where is collected the toll on merchandise brought down from the Thebes. At this place begins the reckoning by Shoni of sixty stadia each, which is continued to Syene and Elephantine. Next is the the Baic Keep, and a canal leading to Tanis. Then follow Lycopolis, Aphroditopolis, and Panopolis, 
an old settlement belonging to masons and weavers of linen. 1.42 then follows Ptolemaeus, the largest city in the Thebais, not inferior to Memphis, with a form of government after the Grecian mode. Above this city is Abydus, where is the palace of Memnon, constructed in a singular manner, entirely of stone, and after the plan of the labyrinth, which we have described, but not composed of many parts. It has a fountain situated at a great depth. There is a descent to it through an arched passage built with single stones, of remarkable size and workmanship. There is a canal which leads to this place from the great river. About the canal is a grove of Egyptian acanthus, dedicated to Apollo. Abida seems once to have been a large city, second to Thebes. At present it is a small town. But if, as they say, Memnon is called Ismans by the Egyptians, the labyrinth might be a Memnonium, and the work of the same person who constructed those at Abidus and at Thebes, for in those places, it is said, are some Memnonia. In the latitude of Abidus is the first oasis, oasis, of the three which are said to be in Africa. It is distant from Abidus a journey of seven days through a desert. It is an inhabited place, well supplied with good water and wine, and sufficiently provided with other articles. The second is that near the Lake Moiris. The third is that at the Oracle of Ammon, these are considerable settlements. 1.43 Having before spoken at length of the Temple of Ammon, we wish to add this only, that in ancient times divination in general and oracles were held in greater esteem than at present. Now they are greatly neglected, for the Romans are satisfied with the oracles of the Sibyl, and with Tyrrhenian divination by the entrails of animals, the flight of birds, and portentous appearances. Hence the Oracle of Ammon, which was formerly held in great esteem, is now nearly deserted. This appears chiefly from the historians who have recorded the actions of Alexander, adding, indeed, much that has the appearance of flattery, but yet relating what is worthy of credit. Callisthenes, for instance, says that Alexander was ambitious of the glory of visiting the oracle, because he knew that Perseus and Hercules had before performed the journey thither. He set out from Peritonium, although the south winds were blowing, and succeeded in his undertaking by vigor and perseverance. When out of his way on the road, he escaped being overwhelmed in a sandstorm by a fall of rain, and by the guidance of two crows, which directed his course. These things are stated by way of flattery, as also what follows, that the priest permitted the king alone to pass into the temple in his usual dress, whereas the others changed theirs, that all heard the oracles on the outside of the temple, except Alexander, who was in the interior of the building, that the answers were not given, as at Delphi and at Branchidae, in words, but chiefly by nods and signs, as in Homer, the son of Saturn nodded with his sable brows, the prophet imitating Jupiter. This, however, the man told the king, in express terms, that he was the son of Jupiter. Callisthenes adds, after the exaggerating style of tragedy, that when Apollo had deserted the oracle among the Branchidae, on the temple being plundered by the Branchidae, who espoused the party of the Persians in the time of Xerxes, and the spring had failed, it then reappeared, on the arrival of Alexander that the ambassadors also of the Milesians carried back to Memphis numerous answers of the oracle respecting the descent of Alexander from Jupiter, and the future victory which he should obtain at Arbella, the death of Darius, and the political changes at Lacedaemon. He says also that the Erythrean Atanice, who resembled the ancient Erythrean Sibyl, had declared the high descent of Alexander. Such are the accounts of historians. 1.44 At Abydus Osiris is worshipped, but in the temple of Osiris no singer, nor player on the pipe, nor on the cithara, is permitted to perform at the commencement of the ceremonies celebrated in honor of the god, as is usual in rites celebrated in honor of the other gods. Next to Abydus is the lesser Diospolis, then the city Tentyra, where the crocodile is held in peculiar abhorrence, and is regarded as the most odious of all animals. For the other Egyptians, although acquainted with its mischievous disposition, and hostility towards the human race, yet worship it, and abstain from doing it harm. But the people of Tentyra track and destroy it in every way. Some however, as they say of the Scyllians of Cyrenia, possess a certain natural antipathy to snakes, and the people of Tentyra have the same dislike to crocodiles, yet they suffer no injury from them, but dive and cross the river when no other person ventures to do so. When crocodiles were brought to Rome to be exhibited, they were attended by some of the Tentyrity. A reservoir was made for them with a sort of stage on one of the sides, to form a basking place for them on coming out of the water, and these persons went into the water, drew them in a net to the place, where they might sun themselves and be exhibited, and then drag them back again to the reservoir. The people of Tentyra worship Venus. At the back of the fane of Venus is a temple of Isis, then follow what are called the Typhonia, and the canal leading to Coptus, a city common both to the Egyptians and Arabians. 1.45 then follows the Isthmus, extending to the Red Sea near Berenice, which has no harbour, 
but good landing places, because the isthmus is conveniently situated. Philadelphus is said to be the first person that opened, by means of his army, this road, which had no supply of water, and to have provided stations. This he did because the navigation of the Red Sea was difficult, particularly to those who set out from the recess of the bay. Experience showed the great utility of this plan, and it present all the Indian, Arabian, and such Ethiopian merchandise as is imported by the Arabian Gulf is carried to Coptus, which is the mart for such commodities. Not far from Berenice is Myos Hormus, a city with a naval station for vessels which navigate this sea, at no great distance from Coptus is the city of Apollo, so that two cities are the boundaries of the isthmus, one on each side. But at present Coptus and Myos Hormus are in repute, and they are frequented. Formerly, the camel merchants travelled in the night, directing their course by observing the stars, and, like mariners, carried with them a supply of water. But now watering places are provided, water is also obtained by digging to a great depth, and rainwater is found, although rain rarely falls, which is also collected in reservoirs. It is a journey of six or seven days. On this isthmus are mines, in which the emeralds and other precious stones are found by the Arabians, who dig deep subterraneous passages. 1.46 Next to the city of Apollo is Thebes, now called Diospolis, with her hundred gates, through each of which issue two hundred men, with horses and chariots, according to Homer, who mentions also its wealth, not all the wealth the palaces of Egyptian Thebes contain. Other writers use the same language, and consider Thebes as the metropolis of Egypt. Vestiges of its magnitude still exist, which extend eighty stadia in length. There are a great number of temples, many of which Cambyses mutilated. The spot is at present occupied by villages. One part of it, in which is the city, lies in Arabia, another is in the country on the other side of the river, where is the Memnonium. Here are two colossal figures near one another, each consisting of a single stone. One is entire, the upper parts of the other, from the chair, are fallen down, the effect, it is said, of an earthquake. It is believed, that once a day a noise as of a slight blow issues from the part of the statue which remains in the seat and on its base. When I was at those places with Ilius Gallus, and numerous friends and soldiers about him, I heard a noise at the first hour, of the day, but whether proceeding from the base or from the Colossus, or produced on purpose by some of those standing around the base, I cannot confidently assert. For from the uncertainty of the cause, I am disposed to believe anything rather than that stones disposed in that manner could send forth sound. Above the Memnonium are tombs of kings in caves, and hewn out of the stone, about forty in number, they are executed with singular skill, and are worthy of notice. Among the tombs are obelisks with inscriptions, denoting the wealth of the kings of that time, and the extent of their empire, as reaching to the Scythians, Bactrians, Indians, and the present Ionia, the amount of tribute also, and the number of soldiers, which composed an army of about a million of men. The priests there are said to be, for the most part, astronomers and philosophers. The former compute the days, not by the moon, but by the sun, introducing into the twelve months of thirty days each five days every year. But in order to complete the whole year, because there is, annually, an excess of a part of a day, they form a period from out of whole days and whole years, the supernumerary portions of which in that period, when collected together, amount to a day. They ascribe to Mercury all knowledge of this kind. To Jupiter, whom they worship above all other deities, a virgin of the greatest beauty and of the most illustrious family, such persons the Greeks call Pallades, is dedicated. She prostitutes herself with whom she pleases, until the time occurs for the natural purification of the body, she is afterwards married, but before her marriage, and after the period of prostitution, they mourn for her as for one dead. 1.47 Next after Thebes is the city Hermonthus, in which both Apollo and Jupiter are worshipped. They also keep an ox there, for worship. Next is the city of crocodiles, the inhabitants of which worship this animal, then Aphroditopolis, and next to it, Latopolis, where Minerva is worshipped, and the, fish, Latus, next, the Ilithia is Polis, and a temple. In the country on the other side of the river is Hierocompolis, the city of hawks, where a hawk is worshipped, then Apollonopolis, the inhabitants of which are at war with crocodiles. 1.48 Syene is a city situated on the borders of Ethiopia and Egypt. Elephantine is an island in the Nile, at the distance of half a stadium in front of Syene. In this island is a city with a temple of Canufus, and a Nilometer like that at Memphis. The Nilometer is a well upon the banks of the Nile, constructed of close-fitting stones, on which are marked the greatest, least, and mean risings of the Nile, for the water in the well and in the river rises and subsides simultaneously. Upon the wall of the well are lines, which indicate the complete rise of the river, and other degrees of its rising. 
those who examine these marks communicate the result to the public for their information. For it is known long before, by these marks, and by the time elapsed from the commencement, what the future rise of the river will be, and notice is given of it. This information is of service to the husbandman with reference to the distribution of the water, for the purpose also of attending to the embankments, canals, and other things of this kind. It is of use also to the governors, who fix the revenue, for the greater the rise of the river, the greater it is expected will be the revenue. At Syene there is a well which indicates the summer solstice, because these places lie under the tropical circle, and occasions the nomons to cast no shadows at midday. For on proceeding from the places in our country, in Greece I mean, towards the south, the sun is there first over our head, and occasions the nomons to be without shadows at noon. When the sun is vertical to us, it must necessarily cast its rays down wells, however deep they may be, to the water. For we ourselves stand in a perpendicular position, and wells are dug perpendicular to the surface. Here are stationed three Roman cohorts as a guard. 1.49 A little above Elephantine is the lesser cataract, where the boatmen exhibit a sort of spectacle to the governors. The cataract is in the middle of the river, and is formed by a ridge of rock, the upper part, or commencement, of which is level, and thus capable of receiving the river, but terminating in a precipice, where the water dashes down. On each side towards the land there is a stream, up which is the chief ascent for vessels. The boatmen sail up by this stream, and, dropping down to the cataract, are impelled with the boat to the precipice, the crew and the boats escaping unhurt. A little above the cataract is Philae, a common settlement, like Elephantine, of Ethiopians and Egyptians, and equal in size, containing Egyptian temples, where a bird, which they call Hyrax, the hawk, is worshipped, but it did not appear to me to resemble in the least the hawks of our country nor of Egypt, for it was larger, and very different in the marks of its plumage. They said that the bird was Ethiopian, and is brought from Ethiopia when its predecessor dies, or before its death. The one shown to us when we were there was sick and nearly dead. 1.50 We came from Syene to Philae in a wagon, through a very flat country, a distance of about 100 stadia. Along the whole road on each side we could see, in many places, very high rocks, round, very smooth, and nearly spherical, of black hard stone, of which mortars are made, each rested upon a greater stone, and upon this another, they were like Hermia. Sometimes these stones consisted of one mass. The largest was not less than 12 feet in diameter, and all of them exceeded this size by one half. We crossed over to the island in a pactin, which is a small boat made of rods, whence it resembles woven work. Standing then in the water, at the bottom of the boat, or sitting upon some little planks, we easily crossed over, with some alarm indeed, but without good cause for it, as there is no danger if the boat is not overloaded. 1.51 Throughout the whole of Egypt, the palm tree is of a bad species, and produces no good edible fruit in the places about the Delta and Alexandria yet the best kind is found in the Thebais. It is a subject of surprise how countries in the same latitude as Judea, and bordering upon the Delta and Alexandria, should be so different, for Judea, in addition to other kinds of date palms, produces the Karyotic, which is not inferior to the Babylonian. There are, however, two kinds of dates in the Thebais and in Judea, the Karyotic and another. The the bake is firmer, but the flavor is more agreeable. There is an island remarkable for producing the best dates, and it also furnishes the largest revenue to the governors. It was appropriated to the kings, and no private person had any share in the produce, at present it belongs to the governors. 1.52 Herodotus and other writers trifle very much when they introduce into their histories the marvelous, like, an interlude of, music and song, or some melody, for example, in asserting that the sources of the Nile are near the numerous islands, at Syene and Elephantine, and that at this spot the river has an unfathomable depth. In the Nile there are many islands scattered about, some of which are entirely covered, others in part only, at the time of the rise of the waters. The very elevated parts are irrigated by means of screw pumps. 1.53 Egypt was from the first disposed to peace, from having resources within itself, and because it was difficult of access to strangers. It was also protected on the north by a harborless coast in the Egyptian Sea, on the east and west by the desert mountains of Libya and Arabia, as I have said before. The remaining parts towards the south are occupied by Troglodyte, Blemis, Nubi, and Megabari, Ethiopians above Syene. These are nomads, and not numerous nor warlike, but accounted so by the ancients, because frequently, like robbers, they attack defenseless persons. Neither are the Ethiopians, who extend towards the south and Meroe, numerous nor collected in a body, for they inhabit a long, narrow, and winding tract of land on the riverside, such as we have before described, 
nor are they well prepared either for war or the pursuit of any other mode of life. At present the whole country is in the same pacific state, a proof of which is, that the upper country is sufficiently guarded by three cohorts, and these not complete. Whenever the Ethiopians have ventured to attack them, it has been at the risk of danger to their own country. The rest of the forces in Egypt are neither very numerous, nor did the Romans ever once employ them collected into one army. For neither are the Egyptians themselves of a warlike disposition, nor the surrounding nations, although their numbers are very large. Cornelius Gallus, the first governor of the country appointed by, Augustus, Caesar, attacked the city Heroopolis, which had revolted, and took it with a small body of men. He suppressed also in a short time an insurrection in the Thebais, which originated as to the payment of tribute. At a later period Petronius resisted, with the soldiers about his person, a mob of myriads of Alexandrines, who attacked him by throwing stones. He killed some, and compelled the rest to desist. We have before related how Ilius Gallus, when he invaded Arabia with a part of the army stationed in Egypt, exhibited a proof of the unwarlike disposition of the people, and if Sileus had not betrayed him, he would have conquered the whole of Arabia Felix. 1.54 The Ethiopians, emboldened in consequence of a part of the forces in Egypt being drawn off by Ilius Gallus, who was engaged in war with the Arabs, invaded the Thebais, and attacked the garrison, consisting of three cohorts, near Syene, surprised and took Syene, Elephantine, and Philae, by a sudden inroad, enslaved the inhabitants, and threw down the statues of Caesar. But Petronius, marching with less than 10,000 infantry and 800 horse against an army of 30,000 men, first compelled them to retreat to Sulchis, an Ethiopian city. He then sent deputies to demand restitution of what they had taken, and the reasons which had induced them to begin the war. On their alleging that they had been ill-treated by the nomarchs, he answered, that these were not the sovereigns of the country, but Caesar. When they desired three days for consideration, and did nothing which they were bound to do, Petronius attacked and compelled them to fight. They soon fled, being badly commanded, and badly armed, for they carried large shields made of raw hides, and hatchets for offensive weapons, some, however, had pikes, and others swords. Part of the insurgents were driven into the city, others fled into the uninhabited country, and such as ventured upon the passage of the river escaped to a neighboring island, where there were not many crocodiles on account of the current. Among the fugitives, were the generals of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians in our time, a masculine woman, and who had lost an eye. Petronius, pursuing them in rafts and ships, took them all and dispatched them immediately to Alexandria. He then attacked Sulchis and took it. If we add the number of those who fell in battle to the number of prisoners, few only could have escaped. From Sulchis Petronius went to Primnes, a strong city, travelling over the hills of sand, beneath which the army of Cambyses was overwhelmed by the setting in of a whirlwind. He took the fortress at the first onset, and afterwards advanced to Napata. This was the royal seat of Candace, and her son was there, but she herself was in a neighbouring stronghold. When she sent ambassadors to treat of peace, and to offer the restitution of the prisoners brought from Syene, and the statues, Petronius attacked and took Napata, from which her son had fled, and then raised it. He made prisoners of the inhabitants, and returned back again with the booty, as he judged any farther advance into the country impracticable on account of the roads. He strengthened, however, the fortifications of Primnes, and having placed a garrison there, with two years' provisions for four hundred men, returned to Alexandria. Some of the prisoners were publicly sold as booty, and a thousand were sent to Caesar, who had lately returned from the Cantabrians, others died of various diseases. In the meantime Candace attacked the garrison with an army of many thousand men. Petronius came to its assistance, and entering the fortress before the approach of the enemy, secured the place by many expedients. The enemy sent ambassadors, but he ordered them to repair to Caesar, on their replying, that they did not know who Caesar was, nor where they were to find him. Petronius appointed persons to conduct them to his presence. They arrived at Samos, where Caesar was at that time, and from whence he was on the point of proceeding into Syria, having already dispatched Tiberius into Armenia. The ambassadors obtained all that they desired, and Caesar even remitted the tribute which he had imposed. 2.1 In the preceding part of this work we have spoken at length of Ethiopia, so that its description may be said to be included in that of Egypt. In general, then, the extreme parts of the habitable world adjacent to the intemperate region, which is not habitable by reason either of heat or cold, must necessarily be defective and inferior, in respect to physical advantages, to the temperate region. This is evident from the mode of life of the inhabitants, and their one of what is requisite for the use and subsistence of man. For the mode of life, of the Ethiopians, is wretched, they are for the most part naked, and wander from place to place with their flocks. Their flocks and herds are small in size, whether sheep, goats, 
or oxen, the dogs also, though fierce and quarrelsome, are small. It was perhaps from the diminutive size of these people, that the story of the pygmies originated, whom no person, worthy of credit, has asserted that he himself has seen. 2.2 They live on millet and barley, from which also a drink is prepared. They have no oil, but use butter and fat instead. There are no fruits, except the produce of trees in the royal gardens. Some feed even upon grass, the tender twigs of trees, the lotus, or the roots of reeds. They live also upon the flesh and blood of animals, milk, and cheese. They reverence their kings as gods, who are for the most part shut up in their palaces. Their largest royal seat is the city of Meroe, of the same name as the island. The shape of the island is said to be that of a shield. Its size is perhaps exaggerated. Its length is about 3,000, and its breadth 1,000 stadia. It is very mountainous, and contains great forests. The inhabitants are nomads, who are partly hunters and partly husbandmen. There are also mines of copper, iron, gold, and various kinds of precious stones. It is surrounded on the side of Libya by great hills of sand, and on that of Arabia by continuous precipices. In the higher parts on the south, it is bounded by the confluent streams of the rivers Astaburus, Astapus, and Astasibus. On the north is the continuous course of the Nile to Egypt, with its windings, of which we have spoken before. The houses in the cities are formed by interweaving split pieces of palm wood or of bricks. They have fossil salt, as in Arabia. Palm, the Persia, peach, ebony, and carob trees are found in abundance. They hunt elephants, lions, and panthers. There are also serpents, which encounter elephants, and there are many other kinds of wild animals, which take refuge, from the hotter and parched districts, in watery and marshy districts. 2.3 Above Meroe is Spo, a large lake, containing a well-inhabited island. As the Libyans occupy the western bank of the Nile, and the Ethiopians the country on the other side of the river, they thus dispute by turns the possession of the islands and the banks of the river, one party repulsing the other, or yielding to the superiority of its opponent. The Ethiopians use bows of wood four cubits long, and hardened in the fire. The women also are armed, most of whom wear in the upper lip a copper ring. They wear sheepskins, without wool, for the sheep have hair like goats. Some go naked, or wear small skins or girdles of well-woven hair round the loins. They regard as God one being who is immortal, the cause of all things, another who is mortal, a being without a name, whose nature is not clearly understood. In general they consider as God's benefactors and royal persons, some of whom are their kings, the common saviors and guardians of all, others are private persons, esteemed as gods by those who have individually received benefits from them. Of those who inhabit the torrid region, some are even supposed not to acknowledge any god, and are said to abhor even the sun, and to apply opprobrious names to him, when they behold him rising, because he scorches and tortures them with his heat, these people take refuge in the marshes. The inhabitants of Meroe worship Hercules, Pan, and Isis, besides some other barbaric deity. Some tribes throw the dead into the river, others keep them in the house, enclosed in hyalus, oriental alabaster. Some bury them around the temples in coffins of baked clay. They swear an oath by them, which is reverenced as more sacred than all others. Kings are appointed from among persons distinguished for their personal beauty, or by their breeding of cattle, or for their courage, or their riches. In Meroe the priests anciently held the highest rank, and sometimes sent orders even to the king, by a messenger, to put an end to himself, when they appointed another king in his place. At last one of their kings abolished this custom, by going with an armed body to the temple where the golden shrine is, and slaughtering all the priests. The following custom exists among the Ethiopians. If a king is mutilated in any part of the body, those who are most attached to his person, as attendants, mutilate themselves in the same manner, and even die with him. Hence the king is guarded with the utmost care. This will suffice on the subject of Ethiopia. 2.4 To what has been said concerning Egypt, we must add these peculiar products, for instance, the Egyptian bean, as it is called, from which is obtained the ciborium, and the papyrus, for it is found here and in India only, the persia, peach, grows here only, and in Ethiopia, it is a lofty tree, and its fruit is large and sweet, the sycamine, which produces the fruit called the sycamorus, or fig mulberry, for it resembles a fig, but its flavor is not esteemed. The corsium also, the root of the Egyptian lotus, grows there, a condiment like pepper, but a little larger. There are in the Nile fish in great quantity and of different kinds, having a peculiar and indigenous character. The best known are the oxyrhynchus, and the lepidotus, the latus, the alabes, the corosinus, the curus, the phagrorius, called also the phagrus. Besides these are the siluru's, the cytharus, the thrissa, the cistrius, 
the lichness, the fisa, the boo, or ox, and large shellfish which emit a sound like that of wailing. The animals peculiar to the country are the ichneumon and the Egyptian asp, having some properties which those in other places do not possess. There are two kinds, one a span in length, whose bite is more suddenly mortal than that of the other, the second is nearly an orgia in size, according to Nicander. The author of the Thoraica. Among the birds, are the ibis and the Egyptian hawk, which, like the cat, is more tame than those elsewhere. The Nykshkorax is here peculiar in its character, for with us it is as large as an eagle, and its cry is harsh, but in Egypt it is the size of a jay, and has a different note. The tamest animal, however, is the ibis, it resembles a stork in shape and size. There are two kinds, which differ in color, one is like a stork, the other is entirely black. Every street in Alexandria is full of them. In some respects they are useful, in others troublesome. They are useful, because they pick up all sorts of small animals and the offal thrown out of the butchers and cooks shops. They are troublesome, because they devour everything, are dirty, and with difficulty prevented from polluting in every way what is clean and what is not given to them. 2.5 Herodotus truly relates of the Egyptians, that it is a practice peculiar to them to knead clay with their hands, and the dough for making bread with their feet. Cases is a peculiar kind of bread which restrains fluxes. Kiki, the castor oil bean, is a kind of fruit sowed in furrows. An oil is expressed from it which is used for lamps almost generally throughout the country, but for anointing the body only by the poorer sort of people and laborers, both men and women. The coccina are Egyptian textures made of some plant, woven like those made of rushes, or the palm tree. Barley beet is a preparation peculiar to the Egyptians. It is common among many tribes, but the mode of preparing it differs in each. This, however, of all their usages is most to be admired, that they bring up all children that are born. They circumcise the males, and spay the females, as is the custom also among the Jews, who are of Egyptian origin, as I said when I was treating of them. According to Aristobulus, no fishes ascend the Nile from the sea, except the Cistrius, the Thrissa, and dolphins, on account of the crocodiles, the dolphin, because it can get the better of the crocodile, the Cistrius, because it is accompanied by the quarry along the bank, in consequence of some physical affinity subsisting between them. The crocodiles abstain from doing any hurt to the quarry, because they are of a round shape, and have spines on their heads, which are dangerous to them. The Cistrius runs up the river in spring, when in spawn, and descends a little before the setting of the Pleiad, in great numbers, when about to cast it, at which time they are taken in shoals, by falling into enclosures, made for catching them. Such also, we may conjecture, is the reason why the Thrissa is found there. So much then on the subject of Egypt, 3.1 we shall next describe Africa, which is the remaining portion of the whole description of the earth. We have before said much respecting it, but at present I shall further describe what suits my purpose, and add what has not been previously mentioned. The writers who have divided the habitable world according to continents, divide it unequally. But a threefold division denotes a division into three equal parts. Africa, however, wants so much of being a third part of the habitable world, that, even if it were united to Europe, it would not be equal to Asia, perhaps it is even less than Europe, in resources it is very much inferior, for a great part of the inland and maritime country is desert. It is spotted over with small habitable parts, which are scattered about, and mostly belonging to nomad tribes. Besides the desert state of the country, its being a nursery of wild beasts is a hindrance to settlement in parts which could be inhabited. It comprises also a large part of the torrid zone. All the sea coast in our quarter, situated between the Nile and the Pillars, particularly that which belonged to the Carthaginians, is fertile and inhabited. And even in this tract, some spots destitute of water intervene, as those about the Seerts, the Marmoridae, and the Catabathmus. The shape of Africa is that of a right-angled triangle, if we imagine its figure to be drawn on a plain surface. Its base is the coast opposite to us, extending from Egypt and the Nile to Mauritania and the Pillars, at right angles to this is a side formed by the Nile to Ethiopia, which side we continue to the ocean, the hypothenuse of the right angle is the whole tract of sea coast lying between Ethiopia and Mauritania. As the part situated at the vertex of the above-mentioned figure, and lying almost entirely under the torrid zone, is inaccessible, we speak of it from conjecture, and therefore cannot say what is the greatest breadth of the country. In a former part of this work we have said, that the distance proceeding from Alexandria southwards to Meroe, the royal seat of the Ethiopians, is about 10,000 stadia, thence in a straight line to the borders of the torrid zone and the habitable country, 3,000 stadia. The sum, therefore, may be assumed as the greatest breadth of Africa, which is 13,000 or 14,000 stadia, its length may be a little less than double this sum. 
So much then on the subject of Africa in general. I am now to describe its several parts, beginning from the most celebrated on the west. 3.2 Here dwell a people called by the Greeks Morusii, and by the Romans and the natives Maori, a populous and flourishing African nation, situated opposite to Spain, on the other side of the strait, at the Pillars of Hercules, which we have frequently mentioned before. On proceeding beyond the strait at the Pillars, with Africa on the left hand, we come to a mountain which the Greeks call Atlas, and the barbarians Deirus. Thence projects into the sea a point formed by the foot of the mountain towards the west of Mauritania, and called the Cotes. Near it is a small town, a little above the sea, which the barbarians call Trinx, Artemidorus, Lynx, and Eratosthenes, Lyxus. It lies on the side of the strait opposite to Gadira, from which it is separated by a passage of 800 stadia, the width of the strait at the pillars between both places. To the south, near Lyxus and the Cotes, is a bay called Emporicus, having upon it Phoenician mercantile settlements. The whole coast continuous with this bay abounds with them. Subtracting these bays, and the projections of land in the triangular figure which I have described, the continent may rather be considered as increasing in magnitude in the direction of south and east. The mountain which extends through the middle of Mauritania, from the Cotes to the Sirts, is itself inhabited, as well as others running parallel to it, first by the Morusii, but deep in the interior of the country by the largest of the African tribes, called Gaichali. 3.3 Historians, beginning with the voyage of Aphelas, Apelles, have invented a great number of fables respecting the seacoast of Africa beyond the pillars. We have mentioned them before, and mention them now, requesting our readers to pardon the introduction of marvelous stories, whenever we may be compelled to relate anything of the kind, being unwilling to pass them over entirely in silence, and so in a manner to mutilate our account of the country. It is said, that the Sinus Emporicus, or Merchant's Bay, has a cave which admits the sea at high tide to the distance even of seven stadia, and in front of this bay a low and level tract with an altar of Hercules upon it, which, they say, is not covered by the tide. This I, of course, consider to be one of the fictitious stories. Like this is the tale, that on other bays in the succeeding coast there were ancient settlements of Tyrians, now abandoned, which consisted of not less than three hundred cities, and were destroyed by the Ferusii and the Nigridi. These people, they say, are distant thirty days' journey from Lynx. 3.4 Writers in general are agreed that Mauritania is a fertile country, except a small part which is desert, and is supplied with water by rivers and lakes. It has forests of trees of vast size, and the soil produces everything. It is this country which furnishes the Romans with tables, formed of one piece of wood, of the largest dimensions, and most beautifully variegated. The rivers are said to contain crocodiles and other kinds of animals similar to those in the Nile. Some suppose that even the sources of the Nile are near the extremities of Mauritania. In a certain river leeches are bred seven cubits in length, with gills, pierced through with holes, through which they respire. This country is also said to produce a vine, the girth of which two men can scarcely compass, and bearing bunches of grapes of about a cubit in size. All plants and potherbs are tall, as the arum and dracontium, the stalks of the staphylinus, the hippomerathum, and the scolimus are twelve cubits in height, and four palms in thickness. The country is the fruitful nurse of large serpents, elephants, antelopes, buffaloes, and similar animals, of lions also, and panthers. It produces weasels, jerboas, equal in size and similar to cats, except that their noses are more prominent, and multitudes of apes, of which Poseidonius relates, that when he was sailing from Goddess to Italy, and approached the coast of Africa, he saw a forest low upon the seashore full of these animals, some on the trees, others on the ground, and some giving suck to their young. He was amused also with seeing some with large dugs, some bald, others with ruptures, and exhibiting to view various effects of disease. 3.5 Above Mauritania, on the exterior sea, the Atlantic, is the country of the Western Ethiopians, as they are called, which, for the most part, is badly inhabited. Iphicrate says, that camel leopards are bred here, and elephants, and the animals called rhizice, which in shape are like bulls, but in manner of living, in size, and strength in fighting, resemble elephants. He speaks also of large serpents, and says that even grass grows upon their backs, that lions attack the young of the elephants, and that when they have wounded them, they fly on the approach of the dams, that the latter, when they see their young besmeared with blood, kill them, and that the lions return to the dead bodies, and devour them, that bogus king of the Mortanians, during his expedition against the western Ethiopians, sent, as a present to his wife, canes similar to the Indian canes, each joint of which contained eight shonuses, and asparagus of similar magnitude. 3.6 On sailing into the interior sea, from Lynx, 
there is zealous a city in Tingis, then the monuments of the seven brothers, and the mountain lying below, of the name of Abile, abounding with wild animals and trees of a great size. They say, that the length of the strait at the pillars is 120 stadia, and the least breadth at Eliphaz 60 stadia on sailing further along the coast, we find cities and many rivers, as far as the river Malakath, which is the boundary between the territories of the Mortanians and of the Mosuli. Near the river is a large promontory, and Metagonium, a place without water and barren. The mountain extends along the coast, from the Cotes nearly to this place. Its length from the Cotes to the borders of the Mosuli is 5,000 stadia. Metagonium is nearly opposite to New Carthage. Timisthenes is mistaken in saying that it is opposite to Massalia. The passage across from New Carthage to Metagonium is 3,000 stadia, but the voyage along the coast to Massalia is above 6,000 stadia. 3.7 Although the Mortanians inhabit a country, the greatest part of which is very fertile, yet the people in general continue even to this time to live like nomads. They bestow care to improve their looks by plaiting their hair, trimming their beards, by wearing golden ornaments, cleaning their teeth, and paring their nails, and you would rarely see them touch one another as they walk, lest they should disturb the arrangement of their hair. They fight for the most part on horseback, with a javelin, and ride on the bare back of the horse, with bridles made of rushes. They have also swords. The foot soldiers present against the enemy, as shields, the skins of elephants. They wear the skins of lions, panthers, and bears, and sleep in them. These tribes, and the Mausolei next to them, and for the most part the Africans in general, wear the same dress and arms, and resemble one another in other respects, they ride horses which are small, but spirited and tractable, so as to be guided by a switch. They have collars made of cotton or of hair, from which hangs a leading rein. Some follow, like dogs, without being led. They have a small shield of leather, and small lances with broad heads. Their tunics are loose, with wide borders, their cloak is a skin, as I have said before, which serves also as a breastplate. The Ferusii and Negrites, who live above these people, near the western Ethiopians, use bows and arrows, like the Ethiopians. They have chariots also, armed with scythes. The Ferusii rarely have any intercourse with the Mortanians in passing through the desert country, as they carry skins filled with water, fastened under the bellies of their horses. Sometimes, indeed, they come to Sirta, passing through places abounding with marshes and lakes. Some of them are said to live like the Troglodyte, in caves dug in the ground. It is said that rain falls there frequently in summer, but that during the winter drought prevails. Some of the barbarians in that quarter wear the skins of serpents and fishes, and use them as coverings for their beds. Some say that the Mortanians are Indians, who accompanied Hercules hither. A little before my time, the kings Bogus and Bacchus, allies of the Romans, possessed this country. After their death, Juba succeeded to the kingdom, having received it from Augustus Caesar, in addition to his paternal dominions. He was the son of Juba who fought, in conjunction with Scipio, against Divus Caesar. Juba died lately, and was succeeded by his son Ptolemy, whose mother was the daughter of Antony and Cleopatra. 3.8 Artemidorus censures Eratosthenes for saying that there is a city called Lyxus, and not Lynx, near the extremities of Mauritania, that there are a very great number of Phoenician cities destroyed, of which no traces are to be seen, and that among the western Ethiopians, in the evenings and the mornings, the air is misty and dense, for how could this take place where there is drought and excessive heat? but he himself relates of these same parts what is much more liable to objection. For he speaks of some tribes of Latophagi, who had left their own country, and might have occupied the tract destitute of water, whose food might be a lotus, a sort of herb, or root, which would supply the want of drink, that these people extend as far as the places above Cyrene, and that they live there on milk and flesh, although they are situated in the same latitude. Gabinius, the Roman historian, indulges in relating marvelous stories of Mauritania. He speaks of a sepulchre of Antaeus at Lynx, and a skeleton of sixty feet in length, which Sertorius exposed, and afterwards covered it with earth. His stories also about elephants are fabulous. He says, that other animals avoid fire, but that elephants resist and fight against it, because it destroys the forests, that they engage with men in battle, and send out scouts before them, that when they perceive their enemies fly, they take to flight themselves, and that when they are wounded, they hold out as suppliants branches of a tree, or a plant, or throw up dust. 3.9 Next to Mauritania is the country of the Mesalii, beginning from the river Molokath, and ending at the promontory which is called Tritum, the boundary of the country of the Mosuli and of the Mesiles. From Metagonium to Tritum are 6,000 stadia, according to others, the distance is less. Upon the sea coast are many cities and rivers, and a country which is very fertile. It will be sufficient to mention the most renowned. The city of Sega. 
the royal seat of Sifax, is at the distance of 1,000 stadia from the above-mentioned boundaries. It is now raised. After Sifax, the country was in the possession of Maznesses, then of Misipsa, next of his successors, and in our time of Juba, the father of the Juba who died lately. Zama, which was Juba's palace, was destroyed by the Romans. At the distance of 600 stadia from Siga is Theon Lyman, port of the gods, next are some other obscure places. Deep in the interior of the country are mountainous and desert tracts scattered here and there, some of which are inhabited and occupied by Gachely extending to the Seerts. But the parts near the sea are fertile plains, in which are numerous cities, rivers, and lakes. 3.10 Poseidonius says, but I do not know whether truly, that Africa is traversed by few, and those small rivers, yet he speaks of the same rivers, namely those between Lynx and Carthage, which Artemidorus describes as numerous and large. This may be asserted with more truth of the interior of the country, and he himself assigns the reason of it, namely, that in the northern parts of Africa, and the same is said of Ethiopia, there is no rain, in consequence therefore of the drought, pestilence frequently ensues, the lakes are filled with mud only, and locusts appear in clouds. Poseidonius besides asserts that the eastern parts are moist, because the sun quickly changes its place after rising, and that the western parts are dry, because the sun there turns in his course. Now, drought and moisture depend upon the abundance or scarcity of water, and on the presence or absence of the sun's rays. But Poseidonius means to speak of the effects produced by the sun, which all writers determine by the latitude, north or south, but east and west, as applied to the residence of men, differ in different places, according to the position of each inhabited spot and the change of horizon, so that it cannot be asserted generally of places indefinite in number, that those lying to the east are moist, and those to the west dry, but as applied to the whole earth and such extremes of it as India and Spain, his expressions, east and west, may be just, yet what truth or probability is there in his, attempted, explanation, of the causes of drought and moisture? For in the continuous and unceasing circuit of the sun, what turn can there be in his course? the rapidity too of his passage through every part is equal. Besides, it is contrary to evidence to say, that the extreme parts of Spain or Mauritania towards the west are drier than all other places, when at the same time they are situated in a temperate climate and have water in great abundance. But if we are to understand the turning of the sun in this way, that there at the extremities of the habitable world he is above the earth, how does that tend to produce drought? For there, and in other places situated in the same latitude, he leaves them for an equal portion of the night and returns again and warms the earth. 3.11 Somewhere there, also, are copper mines, and a spring of asphaltus, scorpions of enormous size, both with and without wings, are said to be found there, as well as tarantulas, remarkable for their size and numbers. Lizards also are mentioned of two cubits in length. At the base of the mountains precious stones are said to be found, as those called the lichnitis, the ruby, and the carchedonius, the carbuncle, in the plains are found great quantities of oyster and mussel shells, similar to those mentioned in our description of Ammon. There is also a tree called Melolotus, from which a wine is made. Some obtain two crops from the ground and have two harvests, one in the spring, the other in the summer. The straw is five cubits in height, and of the thickness of the little finger, the produce is two hundred fifty fold. They do not sow in the spring, but bush harrow the ground with bundles of the palyurus, and find the seed grain sufficient which falls from the sheaves during harvest to produce the summer crop. In consequence of the number of reptiles, they work with coverings on the legs, other parts of the body also are protected by skins. 3.12 On this coast was a city called Eel, which Juba, the father of Ptolemy, rebuilt and changed its name to Caesarea. It has a harbour and a small island in front of it. Between Caesarea and Tritum is a large harbour called Salda, which now forms the boundary between the territories subject to Juba and the Romans, for the country has been subject to many changes, having had numerous occupants, and the Romans, at various times, have treated some among them as friends, others as enemies, conceding or taking away territories without observing any established rule. The country on the side of Mauritania produced a greater revenue and was more powerful, whilst that near Carthage and of the Messiles was more flourishing and better furnished with buildings, although it suffered first in the Carthaginian wars, and subsequently during the war with Jugurtha, who successfully besieged Adarbal in Idica, Utica, and put him to death as a friend of the Romans, and thus involved the whole country in war. Other wars succeeded one another, of which the last was that between Divus Caesar and Scipio, in which Juba lost his life. The death of the leaders was accompanied by the destruction of the cities Tigeus, Vaga, Thala, Capsa, the treasure hold of Jugurtha, Zama, and Zinca. To these must be added those cities in the neighborhood of which Divus Caesar obtained victories over Scipio, namely, first at Ruspinum, then at Uzida, 
then at Thapsus and the neighboring lake, and at many others. Near are the free cities Zella and Aquila. Caesar also captured at the first onset the island Circina, and Thena, a small city on the seacoast. Some of these cities utterly disappeared, and others were abandoned, being partly destroyed. Phara was burnt by the cavalry of Scipio. 3.13 After Tritum follows the territory of the Messiles, and that of the Carthaginians which borders upon it. In the interior is Sirta, the royal residence of Maesonesses and his successors. It is a very strong place and well provided with everything, which it principally owes to Misipsa, who established a colony of Greeks in it, and raised it to such importance, that it was capable of sending out 10,000 cavalry and twice as many infantry. Here, besides Sirta, are the two cities Hippo, one of which is situated near Idica, the other further off near Tritum, both royal residences. Idica is next to Carthage in extent and importance. On the destruction of Carthage it became a metropolis to the Romans, and the headquarters of their operations in Africa. It is situated in the very bay itself of Carthage, on one of the promontories which form it, of which the one near Idica is called Apollonium, the other Hermia. Both cities are in sight of each other. Near Idica flows the river Bagratus. From Tritum to Carthage are 2,000 stadia, but authors are not agreed upon this distance, nor on the distance, of Carthage, from the Sirts. 3.14 Carthage is situated upon a peninsula, comprising a circuit of 360 stadia, with a wall, of which 60 stadia in length are upon the neck of the peninsula, and reach from sea to sea. Here the Carthaginians kept their elephants, it being a wide open place. In the middle of the city was the Acropolis, which they called Birsa, a hill of tolerable height with dwellings round it. On the summit was the temple of Aesculapius, which was destroyed when the wife of Asdrubas burnt herself to death there, on the capture of the city. Below the Acropolis were the harbours and the Cothon, a circular island, surrounded by a canal communicating with the sea, Euripus, and on every side of it, upon the canal, were situated sheds for vessels. 3.15 Carthage was founded by Dido, who brought her people from Tyre. Both this colony and the settlements in Spain and beyond the pillars proved so successful to the Phoenicians, that even to the present day they occupy the best parts on the continent of Europe and the neighbouring islands. They obtained possession of the whole of Africa, with the exception of such parts as could only be held by nomad tribes. From the power they acquired they raised a city to rival Rome, and waged three great wars against her. Their power became most conspicuous in the last war, in which they were vanquished by Scipio Emiljanus, and their city was totally destroyed. For at the commencement of this war, they possessed 300 cities in Africa, and the population of Carthage amounted to 700,000 inhabitants. After being besieged and compelled to surrender, they delivered up 200,000 complete suits of armor and 3,000 engines for throwing projectiles, apparently with the intention of abandoning all hostilities, but having resolved to recommence the war, they at once began to manufacture arms, and daily deposited in store 140 finished shields, 300 swords, 500 lances, and 1,000 projectiles for the engines, for the use of which the women servants contributed their hair. In addition to this, although at this moment they were in possession of only 12 ships, according to the terms of the treaty concluded in the Second War, and had already taken refuge in a body at the Birsa, yet in two months they equipped 120 decked vessels, and, as the mouth of the Cothon was closed against them, cut another outlet, to the sea, through which the fleet suddenly made its appearance. For what had been collected for a long time, and a multitude of workmen were constantly employed, who were maintained at the public expense. Carthage, though so great, was yet taken and leveled to the ground. The Romans made a province of that part of the country which had been subject to Carthage, and appointed ruler of the rest Maesonesses and his descendants, beginning with Misipsa. For the Romans paid particular attention to Maesonesses on account of his great abilities and friendship for them. For he it was who formed the nomads to civil life, and directed their attention to husbandry. Instead of robbers he taught them to be soldiers. A peculiarity existed among these people, they inhabited a country favoured in everything except that it abounded with wild beasts, these they neglected to destroy, and so to cultivate the soil in security, but turning their arms against each other, abandoned the country to the beasts of prey. Hence their life was that of wanderers and of continual change, quite as much as that of those who are compelled to it by one and barrenness of soil or severity of climate. An appropriate name was therefore given to the Mausolee, for they were called nomads. Such persons must necessarily be sparing livers, eaters of roots more than of flesh, and supported by milk and cheese. Carthage remained a desolate place for a long time, for nearly the same period, indeed, as Corinth, until it was restored about the same time, as the latter city, by Divus Caesar, who sent thither such Romans to colonize it as elected to go there, and also some soldiers. At present it is the most populous city in Africa. 
3.16 about the middle of the Gulf of Carthage is the island Corsura. On the other side of the strait opposite to these places is Sicily and Lilibium, at the distance of, about, 1,500 stadia, for this is said to be the distance from Lilibium to Carthage. Not far from Corsura and Sicily are other islands, among which is Ejimurus. From Carthage there is a passage of 60 stadia to the nearest opposite coast, from whence there is an ascent of 120 stadia to Nepherus, a fortified city built upon a rock. On the same gulf as Carthage, is situated a city Tunis, hot springs and stone quarries are also found there, then the rugged promontory Hermia, on which is a city of the same name, then Neapolis, then Cape Taphitus, on which is a hillock named Aspis, from its resemblance, to a shield, at which place Agathocles, tyrant of Sicily, collected inhabitants when he made his expedition against Carthage. These cities were destroyed by the Romans, together with Carthage. At the distance of 400 stadia from Taphitus is an island Casuros, with a city of the same name, lying opposite to the river Salinas in Sicily. Its circuit is 150 stadia, and its distance from Sicily about 600 stadia. Militi, an island, is 500 stadia distant from Casuros. Then follows the city of Drums, with a naval arsenal, then the Terashai, numerous small islands, then the city Thapsus. And near it Lopadusa, an island situated far from the coast, then the promontory of Ammon Belithan, near which is a lookout for the approach of Tunny, then the city Thena, lying at the entrance of the little Sirtis. There are many small cities in the intervening parts, which are not worthy of notice. At the entrance of the Sirtis, a long island stretches parallel to the coast, called Sersina, it is of considerable size, with a city of the same name, there is also another smaller island Sersinitis. 3.17 Close, in the neighborhood, of these islands, is the little Sirtis, which is also called the Sirtis Lotophagitis, or the Lotus Eating Sirtis. The circuit of this gulf is 1,600, and the breadth of the entrance 600 stadia. At each of the promontories which form the entrance and close to the mainland is an island, one of which, just mentioned, is Sersina, and the other Meninx, they are nearly equal in size. Meninx is supposed to be the land of the Lotus Eaters mentioned by Homer. Certain tokens, of this, are shown, such as an altar of Ulysses and the fruit itself. For the tree called the lotus tree is found in abundance in the island, and the fruit is very sweet to the taste. There are many small cities in it, one of which bears the same name as the island. On the coast of the Sirtis itself are also some small cities. In the recess, of the Sirtis, is a very considerable mart for commerce, where a river discharges itself into the gulf. The effects of the flux and reflux of the tides extend up to this point, and at the proper moment the neighboring inhabitants eagerly rush, to the shore, to capture the fish, thrown up. 3.18 After the Sirtis, follows the Lake Zuchis, 400 stadia, in circuit? With a narrow entrance, where is situated a city of the same name, containing factories for purple dyeing and for salting of all kinds, then follows another lake much smaller, after this the city of Rotanan and some others. Close by is Neapolis, which is also called Leptis. From hence the passage across to the Lacri Epizephrii is a distance of 3,600 stadia. Next is the river, Sinops. Afterwards is a walled dam, constructed by the Carthaginians, who thus bridged over some deep swamps which extend far into the country. There are some places here without harbours, although the rest of the coast is provided with them. Next is a lofty wooded promontory, which is the commencement of the Great Sirtis, and called Cephali, the heads, from whence to Carthage is a distance of a little more than 5,000 stadia. 3.19 Above the seacoast from Carthage to Cephali, on the one hand, and to the territory of the Mosuli, on the other, lies the territory of the Libophoenicians, extending, into the interior, to the mountainous country of the Gaechali, which belongs to Africa proper. Above the Gaechali is the country of the Garamants, lying parallel to the former, and from whence are brought the Carthaginian pebbles, carbuncles. The Garamants are said to be distant from the Ethiopians, who live on the borders of the ocean, nine or ten days' journey, and from the Temple of Ammon fifteen days. Between the Gaechali and the coast of our sea, the Mediterranean, there are many plains and many mountains, great lakes and rivers, some of which sink into the earth and disappear. The inhabitants are simple in their mode of life and in their dress, they marry numerous wives, and have a numerous offspring, in other respects they resemble the nomad Arabians. The necks both of horses and oxen are longer than in other countries. The breeding of horses is most carefully attended to by the kings, of the country, so much so, that the number of colts is yearly calculated at 100. Sheep are fed with milk and flesh, particularly near Ethiopia. These are the customs of the interior. 3.20 The circuit of the Great Sirtis is about 3,930 stadia, 
Its depth to the recess is 1,500 stadia, and its breadth at the mouth is also nearly the same. The difficulty of navigating both these and the lesser Sirtis, arises from the circumstances of, the soundings in many parts being soft mud. It sometimes happens, on the ebbing and flowing of the tide, that vessels are carried upon the shallows, settle down, and are seldom recovered. Sailors therefore, in coasting, keep at a distance, from the shore, and are on their guard, lest they should be caught by a wind unprepared, and driven into these gulfs. Yet the daring disposition of man induces him to attempt everything, and particularly the coasting along a shore. On entering the great Sirtis on the right, after passing the promontory Cephali, is a lake of about 300 stadia in length, and 70 stadia in breadth, which communicates with the gulf, and has at its entrance small islands and an anchorage. After the lake follows a place called Aspis, and a harbour, the best of all in the Sirtis. Near this place is the Tower Euphrates, the boundary between the former territory of Carthage and Cyrenaica under Ptolemy, Soter. Then another place, called Cherax, which the Carthaginians frequented as a place of commerce, with cargoes of wine, and loaded in return with silphium and its juice, which they received from merchants who brought it away clandestinely from Cyrene, then the altars of the Fellini, after these Automola, a fortress defended by a garrison, and situated in the recess of the whole gulf. The parallel passing through this recess is more to the south than that passing through Alexandria by 1,000 stadia, and then that passing through Carthage by less than 2,000 stadia, but it would coincide with the parallel passing, on one side, through Heroopolis, which is situated in the recess of the Arabian Gulf, and passing, on the other, through the interior of the territory of the Mausolei and the Mortanians. The rest of the seacoast, to the city Berenice, is 1,500 stadia in length. Above this length of coast, and extending to the altars of the Fellini, are situated an African nation called Nasimones. The intervening distance, between the recess of the Sirtis and Berenice, contains but few harbours, and watering places are rare. On a promontory called Pseudopenias is situated Berenice, near a lake Tritonus, in which is to be observed a small island with a temple of Venus upon it. There also is a lake of the Hesperides, into which flows a river, called, Lathan. On this side of Berenice is a small promontory called Borion, or North Cape, which with Cephali forms the entrance of the Sirtis. Berenice lies opposite to the promontories of Peloponnesus, namely, those called Ichthys and, Chelonatus, and also to the island Zacanthus, at an interval of 3,600 stadia. Marcus Cato marched from this city, round the Sirtis, in thirty days, at the head of an army composed of more than 10,000 men, separated into divisions on account of the watering places, his course lay through deep sand, under burning heat. After Berenice is a city Takera, called also Arsino, then Barca, formerly so called, but now Ptolemaeus, then the promontory Ficus, which is low, but extends further to the north than the rest of the African coast, it is opposite to Tynarum, in Laconia, at the distance of 2,800 stadia, on it there is also a small town of the same name as the promontory. Not far from Ficus, at a distance of about 170 stadia, is Apollonia, the naval arsenal of Cyrene, from Berenice it is distant 1,000 stadia, and 80 stadia from Cyrene, a considerable city situated on a tableland, as I observed it from the sea. 3.21 Cyrene was founded by the inhabitants of Thera, a Lacedaemonian island which was formerly called Callist, as Callimachus says, Callist wants its name, but Thera in later times, the mother of my home, famed for its steeds. The harbour of Cyrene is situated opposite to Cryumitopin, the western cape of Crete, distant 2000 stadia. The passage is made with a south-southwest wind. Cyrene is said to have been founded by Batu, whom Callimachus claims to have been his ancestor. The city flourished from the excellence of the soil, which is peculiarly adapted for breeding horses, and the growth of fine crops. It has produced many men of distinction, who have shown themselves capable of worthily maintaining the freedom of the place, and firmly resisting the barbarians of the interior, hence the city was independent in ancient times, but subsequently it was attacked, successfully, by the Macedonians, who had conquered Egypt, and thus increased their power, under the command of Thybron the murderer of Harpalus, having continued for some time to be governed by kings, it finally came under the power of the Romans, and with Crete forms a single province. In the neighborhood of Cyrene are Apollonia, Barca, Takera, Berenice, and other small towns close by. 3.22 Bordering upon Cyrenaica is the district which produces silphium, and the juice called Cyrenaic, which the silphium discharges from incisions made in it. The plant was once nearly lost, in consequence of a spiteful incursion of barbarians, who attempted to destroy all the roots. The inhabitants of this district are nomads. Remarkable persons of Cyrene were Aristippus, the Socratic philosopher, 
who established the Cyrenaic philosophy, and his daughter named Aridi, who succeeded to his school, she again was succeeded by her son Aristippus, who was called Metrodidactos, mother taught, and Anisiris, who is supposed to have reformed the Cyrenaic sect, and to have introduced in its stead the Anisaric sect. Callimachus and Eratosthenes were also of Cyrene, both of whom were held in honor by the kings of Egypt, the former was both a poet and a zealous grammarian, the latter followed not only these pursuits, but also philosophy, and was distinguished above all others for his knowledge of mathematics. Carneades also came from thence, who by common consent was the first of the academic philosophers, and Apollonius Cronos, the master of Diodorus the dialectician, who was also called Cronos, for the epithet of the master was by some transferred to the scholar. The rest of the seacoast of Cyrene from Apollonia to Catabathmus is 2,200 stadia in length, it does not throughout afford facilities for coasting along it, for harbors, anchorage, habitations, and watering places are few. The places most in repute along the coast are the Nostamus, and Zephyrium with an anchorage, also another Zephyrium, and a promontory called Chersonesus, with a harbor situated opposite to and to the south of Coricus in Crete, at the distance of 2,500 stadia, then a temple of Hercules, and above it a village Palaeurus, then a harbor Menelaus, and a low promontory Ardanixus, Ardanes, with an anchorage, then a great harbor, which is situated opposite to Chersonesus in Crete, at a distance of about 3,000, 2,000. Stadia, for the whole of Crete, which is, a, long and narrow, island, lies opposite and nearly parallel to this coast. After the great harbor is another harbor, Plinos, and about it Tetrapyrgia, the four towers. The place is called Catabathmus. Cyrenia extends to this point, the remainder, of the coast, to Peritonium, and from thence to Alexandria, we have spoken of in our account of Egypt. 3.23 The country deep in the interior, and above the Syrtis and Cyrenia, a very sterile and dry tract, is in the possession of Libyans. First are the Nasimones, then Scilly, and some Gaechali, then Garamants, somewhat more towards the east, then the Nasimones, are the Marmoridae, who are situated for the most part on the boundaries of Cyrenia, and extend to the Temple of Ammon. It is asserted, that persons directing their course from the recess of the great Syrtis, namely, from about the neighborhood of Automala, in the direction of the winter sunrise, arrive on the fourth day at Augila. This place resembles Ammon, and is productive of palm trees, and is well supplied with water. It is situated beyond Cyrenia to the south, for 100 stadia the soil produces trees, for another 100 stadia the land is only sown, but from excessive heat does not grow rice. Above these parts is the district which produces silphium, then follows the uninhabited tract, and the country of the Garamants. The district which produces silphium is narrow, long, and dry, extending in an easterly direction about 1,000 stadia, but in breadth 300 stadia, or rather more, at least as far as has been ascertained. For we may conjecture that all countries which lie on the same parallel, of latitude, have the same climate, and produce the same plants, but since many deserts intervene, we cannot know every place. In like manner, we have no information respecting the country beyond, the temple of, Ammon, nor of the oases, as far as Ethiopia, nor can we state distinctly what are the boundaries of Ethiopia, nor of Africa, nor even of the country close upon Egypt, still less of the parts bordering on the ocean. 3.24 Such, then, is the disposition of the parts of the world which we inhabit. But since the Romans have surpassed, in power, all former rulers of whom we have any record, and possess the choicest and best known parts of it, it will be suitable to our subject briefly to refer to their empire. It has been already stated how this people, beginning from the single city of Rome, obtained possession of the whole of Italy, by warfare and prudent administration, and how, afterwards, following the same wise course, they added the countries all around it to their dominion. Of the three continents, they possess nearly the whole of Europe, with the exception only of the parts beyond the Danube, to the north, and the tracks on the verge of the ocean, comprehended between the Rhine and the Tanais. Of Africa, the whole seacoast on the Mediterranean is in their power, the rest of that country is uninhabited, or the inhabitants only lead a miserable and nomad life. Of Asia likewise, the whole seacoast in our direction, on the west, is subject to them, unless indeed any account is to be taken of the Achaei, Zygi, and Heniaki, who are robbers and nomads, living in confined and wretched districts. Of the interior, and of the parts far inland, the Romans possess one portion, and the Parthians, or the barbarians beyond them, the other, on the east and north are Indians, Bactrians, and Scythians, then, on the south, Arabians and Ethiopians, but territory is continually being abstracted from these people by the Romans. Of all these countries some are governed by, native, kings, but the rest are under the immediate authority of Rome, under the title of provinces, 
to which are sent governors and collectors of tribute, there are also some free cities, which from the first sought the friendship of Rome, or obtained their freedom as a mark of honor. Subject to her also are some princes, chiefs of tribes, and priests, who, are permitted, to live in conformity with their national laws. 3.25 3.25 The division into provinces has varied at different periods, but it presented is that established by Augustus Caesar, for after the sovereign power had been conferred upon him by his country for life, and he had become the arbiter of peace and war, he divided the whole empire into two parts, one of which he reserved to himself, the other he assigned to the, Roman, people. The former consisted of such parts as required military defense, and were barbarian, or bordered upon nations not as yet subdued, or were barren and uncultivated which though ill provided with everything else, were yet well furnished with strongholds. And might thus dispose the inhabitants to throw off the yoke and rebel. All the rest, which were peaceable countries, and easily governed without the assistance of arms, were given over to the, Roman, people. Each of these parts was subdivided into several provinces, which received respectively the titles of provinces of Caesar and provinces of the people. To the former provinces Caesar appoints governors and administrators, and divides the, various, country sometimes in one way, sometimes in another, directing his political conduct according to circumstances. But the people appoint commanders and consuls to their own provinces, which are also subject to divers divisions when expediency requires it. Augustus Caesar, in his first organization of, the empire, created two consular governments, namely, the whole of Africa in possession of the Romans, excepting that part which was under the authority, first of Juba, but now of his son Ptolemy, and Asia within the Elise and Taurus, except the Galatians and the nations under Amentus, Bithynia, and the Propontis. He appointed also ten consular governments in Europe and in the adjacent islands. Iberia Ulterior, further Spain, about the river Betis and Celtica Narbonensis, composed the two first. The third was Sardinia, with Corsica, the fourth Sicily, the fifth and sixth Illyria, districts near Epirus, and Macedonia, the seventh Achaia, extending to Thessaly, the Aetolians, Acarnanians, and the Epirotic nations who border upon Macedonia, the 8th Crete, with Cyrenia, the 9th Cyprus, the 10th Bithynia, with the Propontis and some parts of Pontus. Caesar possesses other provinces, to the government of which he appoints men of consular rank, commanders of armies, or knights, and in his, peculiar, portion, of the empire, there are and ever have been kings, princes, and, municipal, magistrates.